What's your I hated that person, but they didn't deserve that story. When I was in my first year of high school, I was placed into an intermediate class due to my special needs, autism, Asperger's, and a few behavioral tics that I have since grown out of. I would have an older boy sit with me on the bus ride to and from, and a special teacher sit with me during class to keep me from going off. There were about five boys who took turns sitting with me, and while most of them were nice blokes, there was also Jay. Oh, boy, Jay was not good. He was significantly older, he was attending senior year at 23, and I have since learned that he also had his challenges. He would physically hold me in my bus seat, arms clenched at the side, if I even got up to stretch, and would yell and swear at me, to the point that I would walk an hour to school and back on the days that he was rostered. The other guys would tell him off, and he eventually was given one detention. Not much else, in comparison to what happened. Flash forward about five years, I had since graduated high school, attending culinary school in the same town, and was attending a worship service at my local church. We were singing the final hymn, when suddenly the back glass door to the church slams open, scaring everyone out of their wits. I turn around to see what happened. It was Jay, and he looked horrible. He was wearing shorts and a t-shirt in the dead of winter, he reeked of pee and vomit, and he was swaying back and forth heavily. He shuffled into the bathroom, and audibly threw up heavily, standing 100 meters away, I could hear it. He then stumbled out afterwards when we were having supper, and pulled my minister aside for a chat. First he tried to kiss the minister, but my minister recognizing that Jay was out of his mind decided not to throw him out for it. At this point Jay got on his knees attempting to do you know what. The minister pulled Jay up and dragged him by the ear into the back room. Ten minutes later they came out. Apparently they talked and Jay mentioned me a lot, so my minister told me later what he had said. He had been completely unemployed since high school, was drinking heavily every day, and was about to be kicked out of home. He was also battling his conditions, which is what he wanted to talk to me about. He had heard that I was adjusted and getting along well, and wanted guidance. I felt so conflicted, part of me thinking oh, you poor thing and another part of me feeling like telling him to go rot. Eventually through the advice of others, I reached out to him, and we started talking. Three years later, he has a steady job as a grocery cashier, and has been clean for a little while. I don't consider him a friend yet, as I still hurt from what happened, but it's getting better. I never really realized what mercy was until I saw Jay for the second time. Has a dirty secret of yours ever been exposed? Three years ago, I had a girlfriend who had a very high drive for bedroom activity. I had a low drive for it. She would offer me morning noggin but I would refuse. To make her feel good, I bought a large variety of adult toys using my Christmas money so that I could make her feel good without shoving my PP in anything when I wasn't feeling up for intimacy. I stored that box under my bed, which my mom never checked because she has back problems. Upon graduating, I went on a four-day graduation trip with my friends, and I stored the box in a hidden region of our garage, just in case my mom decided to surprise me with a room rearrangement while I was gone. When I got back, I had to move the box back to my room, but as I was doing so, my mom started walking towards the garage, so I had to store the box in the pantry in a panic. I waited in my room for her to go back to bed and fall asleep. She didn't. Instead, as I got to my room, she walked into the pantry and discovered my massive box of worse than entry-level adult gear. There was even kitten muffins and panda-themed ropes in there. She got so mad. She basically had steam coming out of her ears. She sent pictures of my adult toy box to my entire extended family and called my sister and her husband to ask them to shame me. I heard my sister concerningly say there's some pretty hardcore stuff in there while my mom put her on speaker. Unluckily for me, I realized now at age 20 that I was always, in fact, not into sleeping with people. But now, the men in my extended family often ask me about whether or not I'm getting it on at college, and I'm a bit too pressured by the consequences of my mess up to ever come out to them. Would I be the a-hole if I break up with my fiancé because of his past as a cheater? I met my fiancé, Jamie a year ago through a friend. We instantly clicked and started dating. After one year he proposed to me and I said yes. But here is the thing. Before proposing he told me the truth about his past relationship. He was married to a woman, Cynthia three years ago and they divorced because he started cheating on her with a co-worker. He regrets ever doing that. He has been on a healing journey from that. He has told me that the affair was a mistake and that he would never do it again. He just wants to be honest with me before we take this relationship to the next level. I understand what he meant. He is obviously remorseful and I have seen his ex-wife. She seems happier with someone else. And everyone makes mistakes or take decisions that they regret. I trust him and love him a lot. But I can't shake off this feeling that he would not do this to me. This started when he was being secretive about his phone. He would smile at the screen often. I asked him what it is, he just showed me his phone and he was looking at a meme. He probably sensed that I was doubting him. So he let me check his phone. There was nothing in there. But still I couldn't trust him. Few days after our engagement he had a work party. He took me to that party as well. I saw that he was being a bit friendly to some woman. I went there and introduced myself. Later I got to know she was the same girl he cheated with. I confronted him about it. He said that he doesn't talk to her. They broke up shortly after their divorce. And he cannot avoid her because he worked with her. I told him I am not comfortable with him hanging out with someone who was his mistress. He respected my decision and as far as I know he has not contacted her outside of work. I know I have no reason to doubt him. He doesn't give off any signs of infidelity yet I have a hard time trusting him. He is loving and caring. He supports me and my dreams. He is patient and kind. I know it is unfair of me to judge him based on just that. Few weeks ago, a friend of mine asked me to meet her and she told me the whole truth about Jamie. 
She knows Cynthia because she and her brother were college friends. She told me to be careful of Jamie because he cheated on his ex-wife. I told her I already know that. She further told me he started cheating on Cynthia right after she had a miscarriage. He was upset that Cynthia was depressed and he started to feel neglected. After talking to my friend I confronted Jamie. He told me this was the truth. He was still in grief because he lost his child. He didn't know what he was thinking. He started to feel resentful towards her but he never meant to hurt her. I asked him that I need a break from all of this. It is just too much for me. He said he understands and I still haven't talked to him. I don't know if I should break up with him just because of this. Update, would I be the a-hole if I break up with my fiancé because of his past as a cheater? I talked to him. I explained that his past bothers me. I mean he cheated on his wife when she was going through something so traumatic. I brought up the fact that I am also in high risk when it comes to pregnancy. I told him I cannot fully trust him that he will not cheat on me as well. He told me he has learned his lesson from the previous time. When his infidelity got exposed he had people around him calling him a monster. His parents still don't talk to him directly. He feels guilty because of it and regrets it then I told him that maybe we should date more rather than rushing into marriage and maybe to go couples counseling. That's when he got slightly mad. He said that if I don't trust him then there is no point in being together. I tried to fight and say it is not like that. We just need some time. He has to understand that. He told me again that it was not fair for me to judge him when he never judged me because of my past. I asked what he means by that. He pointed out that he knows how in the past I used to sleep around a lot. Okay, let me be clear to you. Yes when I was in college I did have few ons and few serious relationships. I told him he was being illogical because even though I have a sexual history, I never cheated on any of my boyfriends. I always called it quits when I realized it was not meant to be. He kept pressing the matter and says I should let it go because he let go of my past. I said my past is in the past, and now I am thinking about my future and he is so pathetic to even compare his immoral cheating with my past. He argued that I was immoral too. It felt like a dead end road. We both shouted and fought and eventually I took the ring off and said goodbye. The last thing he said that his past and baggage aren't as big as mine and that I am a hypocrite for judging him. That I will have a hard time finding a partner who is willing to be with a loose girl like me. It hurts. I never thought he would act like that. I am trying my best to move on by still stuck in a limbo and his words are repeating inside my head. I am hours away from engaging in group bedroom activities and losing my V card. My roommate, who I've been sharing an apartment with for the past 6 months, approached me a few weeks ago to discuss the possibility of hosting a group bedroom party. I can imagine most people in my situation being surprised or disturbed or whatever if their roommate asked for permission to allow random people to sleep together in their personal space. I was not too surprised or disturbed because 6 months has been more than enough time for me to realize that my roommate is an extremely intimate person and she's not shy about showing it. I have my V card. My roommate is aware of that, and even though from time to time she teases me about it, she's never made me feel bad and always seemed proud of me for being so chilled about it. My roommate asked if it was okay if the event could happen at our apartment. She said seven people were expected to participate, all friends, and she would be the eighth. She answered all of my questions regarding the logistics and promised to leave the place spotless when it was over. To be honest, I didn't really care as long as no one did anything in my room or touched my gaming console. My roommate was over the moon when I said yes. I arranged to sleep at my mom's house on the night of the event to avoid any awkwardness, which made my roommate feel somewhat guilty for kicking me out, but I encouraged her to focus on the deed because I'll be focusing on my mom's good cooking. A few days after that conversation my roommate asked if I was interested in taking part. I said if this was about me staying at my mom's house for one night, she really shouldn't feel bad. My roommate said it's not only about that, but also about hospitality. She said the group agreed that I was more than welcome to join if I wanted. I laughed and said, thanks but no thanks. My roommate advised me to think about it and said I should keep in mind that a V-card guy would be very cool for the group and I would most likely receive special treatment. She also added that before I made a final decision, I should forget what I've seen in movies and therefore should not be expecting everyone to have perfect bodies. I said I would think about it. The event is happening tonight. I eventually agreed to participate. It wasn't a quick decision. I did have time. It's been weeks of talking. Update, I am hours away from engaging in group bedroom activities and losing my V card. By the time I've added this update, the event would have been over for less than two hours. I helped my roommate set up the space in the apartment we were all going to use for the intimacy. My roommate was running me through the process one on one for the final time and once again made sure I understood that I should never feel pressured to perform anything or to make anyone feel good regardless of prior agreements. The group arrived sometime afterwards. All of us socialized at first. I learned a lot about the group. Everyone was friendly and interested to know how I was feeling. I realized very quickly that I was attracted to one of the girls in the group more than the others, but none of them were bad looking. Once the socializing was out of the way, my roommate explained what the rules and the safe words were before formally introducing me to the group and reminding everyone that I skipped my mom's cooking to be there so I needed to be treated with extra care and appreciation. So much was discussed before anything intimate happened. Most of it was information everyone already knew based on previous discussions. But some of it was new to me like the conversational intimacy option, which basically meant you could have an intimate conversation with one or more people who had no desire to partake yet, but don't mind saying filthy things to one another to get them in the mood. Boundaries were discussed. Questions were answered. Challenges in the past were addressed. It was a proper meeting. 
My legs were shaking when that meeting eventually came to an end. My roommate gave everyone the green light to proceed and she wasted no time taking me under wing. My roommate and I were sitting on the couch while the others were beginning to touch and kiss one another. She was holding my hand and telling me how nice I smelled. I said, thank you and returned the compliment. We continued complimenting each other until we were both comfortable enough to kiss. I can't tell you how long we kissed, but when my roommate and I were no longer locking lips, I noticed some of the other people were wearing a lot less. This might sound weird, but seeing unclothed bodies on full display like that became uncomfortable and overwhelming. I told my roommate how I was feeling and she asked me to follow her to the balcony to get some fresh air and for a change of scenery. During my time on the balcony, the girl who I was most attracted to in the group, before I kissed my roommate at least, decided to join my roommate and I on the balcony and find out how I was doing. Her hair was shorter than mine, but it was hot. The three of us talked for a few minutes before I said I was willing to continue. Short-haired girl gave noggin to me when I finally managed to get a stiffy. I never reached the finish line, my nerves got the best of me. I apologized to the group and said I would feel much better if I could go to my room because I'm struggling to relax. I made it clear to all of them that they did nothing wrong, but it just wasn't for me, at least not for now. Everyone was really understanding and wished me good night. I've been in my room ever since. The apartment is quiet now. I have no idea how many people have gone home and how many are sleeping over, but I'm sure I'll find out in the morning. Update 2. I am hours away from engaging in group bedroom activities and losing my V-card. I got a girlfriend. A couple of nights ago my girlfriend was supposed to meet my friends. I've been delaying the process for months because I knew I had to have an uncomfortable conversation first. I met my friends at the group bedroom event. My roommate at the time asked for my permission to host it at our flat. I said yes, as long as my room and my belongings were off limits and the flat was cleaned properly afterwards. My plan was to spend the night at my mom's house and be out of everyone's way during the event, but my roommate encouraged me to stay and participate. I had a V-card back then. The thought of sleeping with one person was overwhelming enough, let alone a group of people. However, my roommate eventually convinced me to take part. I was added to a group chat with all the people who were going to be involved in the event. All of them made me feel really comfortable. That being said, when the event finally happened, I was unable to sleep with anyone. My anxiety won. Everyone was understanding though. Life went on. My roommate became my ex-roommate after a few months, but we never stopped being friends. The connections I made with the people at the event also developed into friendships. We're still friends now. My girlfriend didn't know my history with them until earlier this week when I finally had the courage to explain the story. She was shocked and disturbed and asked if I lied to her about being a V-card when we met. I said no. She struggled to believe that a V-card guy would walk away from that with his V-card still intact. She made it clear that she was no longer interested in meeting my friends. She said she didn't know how she could be in a relationship with someone who was friends with people who shared him. I asked my girlfriend if she was breaking up with me and she said she was gonna need some time to decide what to do. Last night she decided. Our relationship is over. This haunted house will literally torture you for hours without a break. If you make it through you will win 20,000, but nobody ever has. McCammy Manor is a haunted house situated in Alabama and is run by a sadist named Russ McCammy who enjoys torturing people via waterboarding, burning, and other sick stuff. The house promises once-in-a-lifetime attractions such as a 200-yard underwater swimming pool, a two-and-a-half-mile long zip line and a 40-foot no-safety harness rock climbing wall. It also promises you $20,000 if you can make it through without giving up, but nobody ever has, and for good reason. Here's what will happen to you if you decide to attempt to go through it. You will first be given a contract to sign, and the contract will state that you agree to be tortured and this is all done under your own wish. The torture is brutal, and it will scar you for life. The contract also states that you agree to the fact that your death is a possibility. Should you go on to sign the contract, you will pay an entry fee, which is a literal bag of dog food. Upon this, you will be out through challenges which are meant to first annoy you. These challenges will also be filmed and live streamed to an audience. The challenges will consist of doing jumping jacks, walking with bags of dog food, sit-ups, wearing humiliating onesies, things like that. After some amount of time, when the owner decides that's enough, you will be brought on to the other challenges. These challenges are the tests done in order to ensure you can even enter the house, and in these tests the torture will begin. You will first be waterboarded for however long they deem necessary, then you will be encapsulated in a device placed around your head which will be filled with water. You will be held there to within an inch of your life, then given a second to breathe, and put through it again. After the water stuff is done, burning comes next. After you're now covered in burns, comes the beating. Literal beating. The owner Russ, who is a sadist, will proceed to meticulously lay hands on you over and over again to within an inch of your life. This whole proceeds will be live streamed don't forget that. On top of this will come the mental humiliation, as he will never fail to let you know what a piece of poop you are, what a failure you are, how you deserve this and how he is your master. All disgusting things designed to break you. Bear in mind you're not even at the house yet. After being put through the beatings, the process will repeat and you will be waterboarded yet again. This torture cycle of physical and mental torment as well as humiliation will repeat over and over. And here's the real kicker. The haunted house doesn't even exist. Nobody has ever made it into the house because the owner will not let you. The owner will repeat the torture until you give up. If you are a girl, chances are you will be shaved bald, even against your will. Even if you make it through 5 hours of torture, which people literally have, he will keep going. This will be done until you quit. And you can't just quit either. You must ask him to stop specifically the way he wants you to, which will usually be something like, yes master I quit I'm a piece of poop please stop. 
if you somehow go through 20 hours of this, he will pull a stunt like saying you're having too much fun and this isn't designed for people like you. If you ever get annoyed at him after going through 10 hours of torture and ask him to see the house, he will deem you uncooperative and stop the whole thing then disqualify you. You cannot win. The effects of this have been demonstrated online, with accounts of victims saying they will never be the same and wake up the feeling of him torturing them. The owner is also friends with the local police, so good luck trying to pursue a legal case. If you are stupid enough to believe you can win the 20,000 Russ advertises be my guest, it's just natural. Selection. My substance addict neighbor has been breaking into my house and estimizing herself with my guitar, so I'm getting her arrested. So I have a neighbor who is borderline psychotic, and is clearly very much on substances all the time. I don't see her a lot, but when I do she is usually outside smoking grass or just doing blow on the side of the road. She literally uses her credit card to make lines on the pathwalk, that's the level of crazy I deal with. That's not the full extent of it either, whenever I walk by her she does one of two things. She either yells at me to play my guitar or she just stares at me really creepily. As to why she yells at me to play the guitar, this story starts two months ago. So I play the guitar for fun and have for the better part of the last two decades and I would say I'm pretty good at it. I also play it in my room and the way I am set up, I am playing in view of the window. I usually do it during the daytime with an open window, but I always make sure not to play too loudly so as to not disrupt anyone. Well, two months ago while playing, I looked out my window and saw her staring at me through her window, fully unclothed, her saggy substance addict honkers flashing me in all their pasty glory. I quickly covered my blinds and stopped playing. I have not played the guitar by the window since. Now every time she sees me I am hit with a barrage of incoherent yelling from her about how I need to play my guitar again. I still do, I just make sure my blinds are closed when I do it. At first I figured that she would yell this for a while then eventually blow over, but boy was I wrong. I came home from the gym one day and entered my house, then walked into the living room only for my nostrils to be greeted by the stench of poop. I inspected and realized it came from the tip of my guitar, as indeed there was some poop on my guitar. I stood back in disgust and cleaned it. I took some time after to ponder what the F could have happened. All my doors were locked, nothing in the house was taken and was left exactly the same as it was when I left. I decided not to stress about it further and put the explanation down to me sleepwalking and pooping on my guitar. I know that's not what happened but it's the best I could come up with and I wasn't bothered to pursue this. This happened one month ago. I let it go and figured it was a freak accident, but a week later, the exact same thing happened again. Once again I came home to find the tip of my guitar covered in poop. Once again I cleaned it, but this time I started to seriously ponder the possibilities. But yet again there was nothing that stood out as even a guess, as everything was left the exact same and all the doors were locked. I thoroughly inspected the house and found nothing. I was now skeptical but I decided to leave it be. For the next two weeks life went without a hitch. My guitar was poop free. Until it wasn't. One week ago I came home and again, I found the tip of my guitar with some poop on it. I was now seriously mad. However this was happening, I was going to find out. I didn't bother contacting authorities or any of the sort, instead opting to install some security cameras into my house. They arrived three days ago and I set them up, as well as connected them to my phone to alert me if any motion is detected. Whoever was messing with my guitar was going to be caught the next time they did it. Well, today it happened. I was out grocery shopping when I got a notification that motion has been detected. I was finally going to catch the perpetrator. But what I saw was not something I was expecting at all. I turned on my phone and watched Liv as my substance addict neighbor walked into my house, proceeded to look around, then took my guitar. When she picked it up I was fearing the worst, the possibilities of what she was going to do with it running through my mind. She proceeded to unzip her pants, and I watched in horror as she proceeded to push the tip of the guitar into her back door and open her mouth agape as if she was really enjoying this. After a few minutes of this, she placed the guitar back and left my house. I left the grocery store and threw up on the sidewalk, the horror of what I just saw fresh as a daisy in my mind. This guitar was handed to me by my dad, and this woman used it to estimize herself with. I rushed home and proceeded to inspect my guitar, and found the tip covered in a small amount of poop again. This time I called the police. I explained the situation and despite sounding very taken aback, they came quickly. They knocked on the door of the woman who opened it with a cat in her hand and wearing nothing but undies. I was there with the officers and I confronted her. She of course denied it, but the proof was there. She tried to resist as the cops were putting her into the back of the car, and they told me they were taking her to a psychiatric ward where they will be involuntarily admitting her. She will be out in 21 days however, and I think she might come back for revenge, I'm not sure. Update my substance addict neighbor has been breaking into my house and estimizing herself with my guitar, so I'm getting her arrested. Unfortunately, my crazy neighbor is back and she has moved on to messing with me in different ways. I don't know who gave her the go-ahead to be released, and I'm seriously considering pressing charges on her. I know I could have done it originally and got her for breaking and entering, but I don't really have the effort to go through a court process to be honest. Anyway, since being released she has stopped breaking in and using my guitar as her personal and intimacy toy, and has instead reverted to harassing me in every way possible. I think she has recently discovered social media, as I got an Instagram friend request off her, and curiosity got the better of me and I accepted. I was instantly met with a message from her about how I'm going to pay for reporting her. I proceeded to block her, but she made a new account and tried to befriend me. Her new account was her name with six after it, so I declined her friend request. It seems like she got smarter after that, trying to use accounts not with her name, but I declined those too. When harassing me online didn't work, she moved on to trying to get to me in real life. 
she started leaving random notes about how I'm going to pay for all of this around my property. However, I still didn't pay much attention to it. That was until she broke in again. I don't know if she's an idiot, but while I was out she decided to pick my lock. Of course my motion sensors went off and I logged on to see what was happening. This time however, she wasn't alone. She had brought a friend with her. He also looked in quite bad shape and I got seriously worried, thinking what they were going to do. I got in my car and started speeding home while occasionally looking over to see what was happening. Not in a million years would I have guessed what they were going to do. They decided to make an omelette on my frying. Pan. The drive home was quite long so by the time I was home they had already left, but the pan wasn't even washed. This happened earlier today. I think I'm going to press charges to be honest. I really don't have any understanding of how to go about this, but there's no way breaking into my house and harassing me will be taken lightly by a judge. Got ambushed and coerced into having a three-way with two lesbians and embarrassed myself in every way imaginable. A three-way was never something I expected to experience, but somehow I became the prime candidate to sleep with two girls who could have chosen anyone else. The way it came about was I was friends with one of the girls and she told me on more than one occasion that she wanted to share her girlfriend with a guy. She said her girlfriend actually put the idea in her head and she never stopped thinking about how hot that might be. Our conversations regarding the three-way would always end the same way, she would ask me what I thought, I would encourage her to set boundaries, then she would ask me if I had any guys in mind, and then I would share names of single guys in my social circle that I knew were popular with girls. Cut to New Year's Eve. I was at a rooftop party when my friend approached me with her girlfriend. My friend said she ran out of signs and hints so now she was finally gonna spell it out for me. What she spelled out was the following, I was the guy and I've always been the guy she wanted to have a three-way with. She said she thought she was being as obvious as possible during all our three-way conversations, but she eventually realized I was oblivious as f. My friend's girlfriend confirmed what my friend was saying and added that the two of them were willing to skip the countdown to 2024 and jump into bed with me at that moment. I had so many questions and my friend agreed to answer all of them if I followed her and her girlfriend to the Uber that was apparently going to take us to their apartment. I let the girls lead the way. On our way to the apartment, my friend explained the boundaries. She was sitting in the back of the Uber with her girlfriend while I was sitting next to the driver who looked as uncomfortable as I was feeling during that discussion. The fact that the driver was playing gospel music and low-key turning up the volume when he thought. None of us noticed, made the drive even more awkward, at least for me. Thankfully I had enough alcohol in my system to diffuse some of my anxiety when we entered the apartment. At that point, the three of us kind of knew what to do and what not to do based on the boundaries we touched on in the car. Cue kissing, touching, unclothing and. My inhaler. My lungs attempted to pee-pee block me with an asthma attack. I used my inhaler and assured the girls that it was no big deal, which was true, and that we could continue, which we did. Cue aggressive touching and. Premature nutting on my end. I apologized to the girls and blamed my nut on overstimulation. I promised them that my stiffy would return when the time came, but until then, my plan was to do both of them without my member. My friend's girlfriend said she was a pro at doing my friend with no PPs in the picture before she actually showed me how much of a pro she was. I knew I had to make sure I'm stiff again soon, otherwise my presence kind of defeated the purpose, so I vigorously went at my soft PP while giving brain on the girlfriend from the back while she was giving brain to my friend. Sadly, I was unable to get a stiffy again. The girls took turns playing with my member, but nothing worked. It was embarrassing. I apologized. My friend said that she should be the one apologizing because of the way she pulled me into this without leaving with me room to breathe and come prepared. In spite of my failure to get it up, the best part of the night for me was cuddling with them girls and falling asleep together. However, I managed to F that up too because when I woke up, both girls were sleeping in another room. When I eventually asked them mid-breakfast what made them switch beds in the middle of the night, my girlfriend's friend gave me the UN sugar-coated version and said I freaked them out because I not only sleep with my eyes wide open, but apparently I also spell random words in my sleep. My boyfriend made fun of my handmade anniversary present for him that I spent a year working on, and he did this in front of our friends to make them laugh. My boyfriend Mike and I celebrated our two-year anniversary yesterday. Mike was the perfect boyfriend, even though we met through an online blind date arranged by our common friends, he always made it a point to treat me nicely and communicate with me calmly. But everything literally came crumbling down on me yesterday at our lunch celebration with our friends. The first time we celebrated our anniversary last year, we made it into a promise to celebrate each year of our relationship with each other alone, but our friends decided to arrange a celebratory lunch for us this time. Naturally, we felt thrilled to celebrate with them since they were the ones who set us up on an online blind date. They were so supportive ever since, they even paid for the reservation and food to make this special for us. It was in the middle of lunch when this happened, his other friend cleared his throat and looked at Mike meaningfully. Mike then reached for something underneath the table and gave me a small box containing a dainty gold necklace with a diamond heart pendant in the middle that I've been eyeing since I saw it a few months ago. I was so happy that I hugged him so tight and kissed him, because of how thoughtful he was and how beautiful the necklace was. I was literally so shocked and giddy. I felt so happy that I then told him he was not the only one with a gift, and I grabbed the book I wrote and bookbinder for him and for our anniversary. You see, earlier last year I started composing a book inspired by our story. I plan to give it to him on our second anniversary as a way of remembering and cherishing our bizarre, rom-com love story, and some few poetries in there, focusing on the things in our relationship that only us knows about like our inside jokes, experiences, challenges, and how much I love and adore him as a person. This was all dedicated to him. 
I handed the gift to him and told him how much I love him and our table was so noisy from all the squealing and cheers from our friends. I was so excited to give this to him because I was so proud of my work and I poured my heart out into this gift because I genuinely loved him and everything about him. I spent my time proofreading and rewriting each page to make it perfect but all he did was look at my gift with a, what the f is that? Kind of face. He then proceeded to ask me how much my gift was and bragged that he bought the necklace from a very expensive brand. He told me that he was disappointed at my gift and that I am embarrassing myself. He proceeded to criticize the book's interior and exterior design saying that it looks wonky and that I shouldn't force myself to do things I clearly have no talent for. Then he bragged about his gift to our friends which made me feel so sick and ashamed of my gift, and also shocked because my boyfriend seemed like another person back there. He was always the soft-spoken one and seeing and hearing him insult my love for him crushed me. They all stayed silent and watched him as he yapped and yapped about my book that I just ended up grabbing my book and started walking out of the restaurant, straight to my apartment. He and our friends have been texting me and I haven't answered anyone yet. One of his texts said that he was just looking out for me and didn't want me to embarrass myself in front of our friends. I just felt so small and stupid for making handmade gifts when I know that I am not an artsy person and I felt embarrassed and sad about how he humiliated me back there. I mean, the book didn't have a fancy exterior, that's true. But what hurts more is the fact that he insulted it immediately without even looking at what I wrote in there first. Today I sharted in class, no one believes how I got away with it. When everyone looked at me I saw them scrunch their noses and instantly knew they could smell the sloshing in my pants. Like many of you, I'm lactose intolerant but me personally, I don't take any medication I just eat like normal. At lunch all I could think about how excited I was to see this girl in my last period class Katie as I scarfed down my mozzarella sticks. I liked her a lot and my best friend Todd sat next to her and said he'd slide her my number on a piece of paper at the end of class, I was too nervous to do it myself, if she rejected me Todd can just say he was pranking me, it's genius. When ninth period class came I got to class and dapped up my boy Todd. I sat down and ripped uncontrollable s. I was trying to force out a silent fart but my insides fell out of me. My pants were wet it was disgusting I broke into tears right there. Todd's dumb ass said Jerry I think you pooped your pants everyone in the room kept telling me that I pooped my pants when I didn't. I just didn't want Katie to know. Everyone kept sniffling and looking at me, the teacher told me to go to the bathroom. I covered my butt with my backpack and walked out. What they didn't know is I had a backup plan for this. Jerry is gone now. Katie will fall in love with my alter ego, Ryan. I put on my varsity jacket and tilted my baseball cap and went right back into the room. I introduced myself as Ryan and included that I liked to skateboard, because skateboarding is very cool. I laughed about how some loser Jerry was just in the room. I thought I pulled it off while I didn't think they could notice me crying. The teacher told me again to leave the room. I left and had my final costume. You don't want Jerry or Ryan? Fine I'm Mr. Brown the principal. If I pull this off I can order Katie to fall in love with Jerry. I mean me. I put on a brown blazer and presented myself to the class while fighting back tears. I give my applause to Ryan the cool kid just in case this doesn't work out. I pace around the room with long strides asserting my dominance. I sit next to Katie and I blow it. My body gave up and released every amount of fecal matter it had left to swish and swash in my pants. I looked Katie in the eye behind Mr. Brown's glasses and I could see the disgust. I had to think quickly. I took off the glasses and blazer. I plopped into the chair next to Katie and looked at her in the eye as Jerry now and saved the day, I think the principal pooped his pants. Shout out if you know this sketch. My best friend of 24 years, born a male, is now a transgender woman. I'm in love with her and I'm not sure if I should tell her. My friend and I have been best friends our entire lives, we're practically brothers. Our parents grew up together so my friend and I have been together ever since we were little babies. We've always had each other's back, protected one another, cared for each other. My friend transitioned to a female a few months ago, she's completely physically a woman. She's been through hormone replacement therapy these past few years, seeing her becoming so much more happier is amazing to see. I'm absolutely proud of her. But I'm falling for her, and these feelings aren't going away. I'll admit that I'm in love with my friend, the friend I've known for 24 years is who is stealing my heart and I don't know what to do. I don't want to lose my friend, but my feelings of friendship for her are turning to romantic attraction. After my friend transitioned, we continued hanging out and talking like nothing changed. We continued going out to clubs slash bars, the movies, restaurants, playing video games, nothing changed. During this time is when my feelings began to change, I started falling in love with her. You know what attracted me? Her, the way she is. My friend is now acting like herself, acting free and full of life, always laughing, dancing and being goofy. It hurts me, because this is someone I grew up with and I'm afraid my feelings are going to push her away or make this awkward. Like always I'm insanely happy being with my friend, but my feelings for her are killing me right now every time we're together again. I've fallen in love with her true self and her true self is absolutely beautiful. I've spoken to another close friend of mine about this, I just got made fun of. Ha ah, You wanna F your bro, seriously? Is practically what I got. They didn't understand where I was coming from, they didn't understand what an insanely amazing person my friend is. This friend of mine feels it's creepy and nasty that I'm falling for my best friend. They also aren't taking my friend's transition seriously, which is another reason why they're acting immature. All he did was make fun of me, so ever since then I haven't spoken to anyone else about how I feel. Aside from being scared of losing my friend, I'm afraid of what our families will think. What happens if my friend and I do end up together, and our families suddenly start to panic? 
I'm afraid of not only ruining my friendship, but the friendship our parents have with themselves for many years. Both of our families were completely supportive when my friend transitioned, not a single negative comment. Everyone is proud of her, and the love our families have for her hasn't changed at all. I feel I'm overthinking all of this, especially because being friends is very different from being in a serious relationship. If anything, our families would be insanely happy we're together and be so annoying. But I'm more worried about the negative response, which is why I believe I'm overthinking this whole thing. Plus, if I plan to even confess my feelings for her I have to do it soon. She's always being asked out on dates, but she tells me she's looking for the right person to spend time with. I feel this is my opportunity to confess, but I don't know if I should. I don't just want to confess how I feel about her, I want an actual relationship with her. I'll love to tell my friend how I feel about her, but I don't want to lose or ruin our 24-year friendship. I also don't want to make it seem that I'm falling for her just because she's now a woman, I don't want her to feel that way at all. What should I do? Update, screw it. I'm going for it, I'm going to ask out my friend. It's Saturday, 1pm right now, I'm going to see if she wants to go on a date tonight. My plan is to take her out on a fun date and I'll confess my feelings during the date. She actually lives a few houses. Down the street, we live in the same neighborhood slash street, that's why we're pretty much always together 24-7 every week. I'm going to message her to see if she's home so I can stop by, and while I'm there I'm going to ask her out. Edit, I got a date tonight. I was insanely nervous walking to my friend's house. But I can't stop smiling because wow she said yes. I showed up, started talking like usual and that's when I asked her. I told her I would love to take her out on a date tonight, that I've been wanting to ask her out for the longest time. I definitely tried to hide my face from blushing, because she had a huge smile when I asked her out. She's even extra excited cause we're going to her favorite place. She loves this 80s bar slash grill that has karaoke every night and tacos, so that's where we're going. Sounds like an awesome date. I feel asking her out has made her comfortable to flirt with me since she started complimenting me and even kissed me on the cheek before I left. Things definitely felt more intimate. She even said she's going to get extra pretty for the date tonight. I'll admit, I'm really looking forward to that. Although it's impossible for her to get extra pretty, seeing as she's already so beautiful. I'm still shaking honestly. The shakes are more shakes of excitement. I'm gonna pick her in 2-3 to three hours, so I'll definitely be getting ready soon. I haven't gone on a date in quite some time so I'm really looking forward to tonight, especially with the date being the girl I really love. My best friend of 24 years, born a male, is now a transgender woman. I'm in love with her and I'm not sure if I should tell her. Part 2. I recently asked out my childhood best friend and the date was absolutely amazing, I'll even say it was the greatest night ever. Spending time with a person I really love, it doesn't get better than that. All this made me wish I had asked her out a long time ago, but better late than never. I'm insanely happy I did ask her out. Before the date my friend said she was going to get extra pretty, and wow did she look beautiful. She was breathtaking. I had a lot of butterflies in my stomach. She had a red dress on, wore a blue shade of lipstick and had her hair tied back. She looked incredible, and was without a doubt the most gorgeous girl in the bar we went to. My heart kept pounding though. Seeing as this was a date, I really wanted to flirt, so I kissed her on the cheek and told her she looked gorgeous. Seeing her smile and blush just made me blush as well. I was definitely trying really hard not to screw anything up. I wanted to take things slow, I didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable at all. We got to her favorite bar, and from that moment everything went perfectly. I didn't drink too much, as I was the designated driver. My friend though, she had an insanely fun time. She was jumping around, singing, dancing, she was having a blast, and it was great to see her having so much fun. It was kind of hard to keep her in one place, she was super hyper. Like I said, this is her favorite place. We enjoyed ourselves as if there was no one around, we talked a lot as well, she really appreciated that I asked her out. I admitted I was pretty nervous about everything, but her being such a sweet person really lowered my nerves so much. That's when she admitted that she had dropped so many hints before and I never caught on to them. I admit, I suck at stuff like that. We just laughed it off and were happy to actually finally be on a date. My biggest goal of the night was to kiss her, and she kept winking at me the entire night. I was hesitant to kiss her because I was worried a kiss could be too much. This was me overthinking again, because she was pretty obvious about letting me kiss her. I feel she knew I was being hesitant, so she ended up kissing me and didn't hold back either. She wrapped her arms around me, and I did the same. From the moment we kissed, my nerves the rest of the night were completely gone. We didn't act like friends anymore, we acted a lot more than that. We became more intimate with each other. I kept my arm wrapped around her waist, held her hand everywhere we went and she always kept her arm wrapped around mine. It felt really nice and I didn't want the night to end at all. We kissed a few more times throughout the night. We would give each other a kiss on the cheek or lips any chance we got. Eventually we went back to her place, and that's when I decided to drink a little more as I was close to home. We just continued to sing and dance, acting like it wasn't already one in the morning. We're gamers so we decided to continue the night doctor and can we playing just dance, I'm the king of that game, my friend would disagree. I ended up sleeping at her house because she didn't want me going off intoxicated, even though my house is actually a few houses away. The rest of the night was just fantastic, the entire night was the greatest I've ever had. I regret not asking her out sooner, imagine the incredible dates we would have already had. The following morning we woke up and went to get some breakfast. We just laughed at all the dumb things we did last night. We still continued being super comfortable with each other, hugging, holding hands, keeping ourselves in each other's arms. Neither of us hesitated, we just continued to be how we were last night. 
We had to split up as I had to help my dad with a family barbecue, and my friend was meeting up with her mom. We kissed each other goodbye. And we've been non-stop texting ever since. The only word I can say is wow, that's literally all I can say. Wow, what a beautiful night it was. I didn't tell her my feelings, I felt our actions expressed our feelings perfectly. Eventually I'll tell her the things I said on this post, but for now it's going pretty great. We aren't exactly boyfriend and girlfriend because I'm terrible at these things. But her going to her mom's house has me thinking about our parents' reactions. Knowing my friend, she definitely told her mom. Knowing her mom, I have no doubt she told her husband, who will of course tell my parents about the date. I ended up seeing my friend the next day and she said her mom knows about the date. Even better, she had a great reaction to it. My friend said when she told her, her mom just celebrated, she was insanely happy for the both of us. She said her mom wanted to know every single detail, but also wasn't surprised that I asked her daughter out. Her mom had a huge feeling I liked her daughter, so she was very happy I finally asked her out. Of course her mom is now saying when's the wedding? To my friend constantly. I'm just insanely happy her mom is cheering us on. Her family, mine and some friends are all getting together tonight for a barbecue. Honestly I'm just not ready for when my mom finds out, she's going to be super happy but she's going to be asking me when's the wedding as well. I also plan to ask my friend out on another date tonight, and I want to ask about being in a serious relationship. I'll probably do that tomorrow, I feel tonight might be busy with everyone around. I want to tell her I love her so much, I don't want to keep my feelings inside anymore. I want to tell her I've fallen in love with who she is, her true self. I want her to know what a beautiful, amazing woman she is. I'll love to do that tonight, but I'll hold it off for the next date. She's going to be at the barbecue tonight as well, so we'll definitely be spending time. Together. My manipulative husband called me vain and materialistic just because I like gifts. When I confronted him he cried. I'm very interested in skincare, fashion, makeup, and other feminine things. I work hard to afford the things that I want. I'm not very pretty but I am well put together and many of my friends compliment me on my outfit or other things I'm proud of. It's a hobby I enjoy. My husband Sean has always been my biggest supporter. He would listen to me and he's always surprising me with gifts of things that I've been talking about or what I've expressed interest in. I'm always appreciative of his incredibly thoughtful gifts and I love them. But things have taken a turn for the worse lately. Recently, a friend of Sean contacted me and told me that I should stop being materialistic and making my husband buy things for me. She said he complained about it a lot. I didn't want to accuse Sean without proof so I looked through his phone. We know each other's passwords but I was never given a reason to look through his before. I found countless messages of him calling me vain, materialistic, obsessed with my looks, picky, etc. He also said that I'm not even pretty enough to be that obsessed with myself several times. He was complaining to friends, acquaintances, and people who barely know me. It was so hurtful that I cried for hours. I love my husband and I don't want him of all people to think I'm vain or materialistic. The next day, I decided to give away my stuff, resolved to stop purchasing things, and stop talking to him about them. But then Sean went and gave me a perfume discovery set because I had recently gained an interest in perfume. I thanked him but said I didn't need it. He was confused and asked what was wrong with it. I told him that it was a lovely gift but I didn't need more perfume. I said I didn't want to be materialistic or vain. Sean said that he had seen my textbook on perfume and that I had bookmarked things so he knew that I was interested. In it. He started crying while repeatedly asking what was wrong with his gift and why I didn't like it. He has been very distressed since but I can't stop thinking about what he said about me. Update. Sean kept asking me what exactly I didn't like about his gift and tried to narrow why I didn't accept it. He said it cost a lot of money so the least I could do was accept it. That's when I told him the truth, his friend messaged me about how I was materialistic and forced him to buy me things. He looked furious. I said that I had looked at his phone and saw that he thought I was vain and materialistic so I was trying to change that because I didn't like being called that. He looked even more mad and I was crying at that point. Then he hugged me and apologized. He said he didn't think I was materialistic or vain. He thought my love for my hobbies was cute and inspiring. He loved getting me gifts because I was appreciative and he liked seeing me and things he got me. I asked why he would say those things if he actually didn't think I was materialistic, vain, or self-obsessed. He hugged me tighter and made me promise to still love and stay with him before telling me the real reason he did all this. I was hesitant because I wasn't getting a good feeling about all of this, but I made the promise. He said that he was already fighting for my attention and affection with my friends, family, and my job, so he wasn't going to compete with others too. He pulled out his phone and we read his messages together. When I had first read them, I could barely read them because I was so heartbroken but as we read them together, I realized that he started the complaining and the other person would start calling me things. Then they would walk away with a terrible opinion of me. I started crying again and he apologized. He said he never meant it and the other people would already think people like me were vain and shallow. In the texts, Sean also insinuated that only he could get me. Proper gifts. It's true that he's the one person whose gifts were always incredible but that's because he was very in tune with what I would want, even more than me. I still appreciate other things. I keep every card I've ever gotten and I still have the wrapper of a candy my childhood friend gave me. In the texts, it seems like I'm a shallow, picky person that has high standards only he can reach. 
I asked him not to talk about me like that anymore. He immediately said yes. He said that he would replenish what I had given away and if I tried to reject it he would see it as spurning his affection. My husband was racist to my newborn baby because he thought I cheated. Now that he knows the truth he's begging for my forgiveness. I gave birth to my daughter six months ago and it should have been the happiest moment in my life. When my daughter was born her skin was very dark and looked like she could have two biological parents who were of African descent. My husband Jim was furious so he accused me of cheating and left right then and there. He told everyone on both sides of the family what happened, made posts on social media, and wanted a divorce. His family and a lot of our friends all called to say how upset they were at me and called me really nasty names. My mother was by my side the entire time and I kept professing my innocence. Jim refused to pick me up from the hospital, threw my stuff out on the lawn and changed the locks, so I had to stay with my parents. When my sister called to ask for the baby stuff, Jim texted me pictures of the bare nursery room and said he got rid of everything. He even destroyed my art studio and the art I made. He even told me my work would be too awful to sell. I was distraught and tried to focus on my baby. Weeks went by and Jim refused to speak to me directly. He has never once asked about our child. Eventually he agreed to do a paternity test and he was 100% the father. No one could believe the results so it was done again, Jim's the dad. Around that same time, one of Jim's cousins did the ancestry thing and there was around 30% of African ancestry in the family. This combined with the test, Jim's paternal great-grandmother admitted to having an affair around the time Jim's grandfather was born and because he could pass she just assumed her husband was the father. Since then, Jim has been reaching out and everyone has come to apologize. While it did feel good to feel vindicated, the damage has been done. I can't unhear or unsee all the horrible things that were said and done. Not just to me but to my child as well. Jim. Made some very racist remarks, things that I thought he'd never say and he did it so easily. Regardless of what our daughter looks like I don't want her to be around that. What else will Jim and his family say or do the next time they get mad? How are they going to treat our daughter when she does something that upsets them? Jim has been begging for forgiveness. I said I needed time, he asked to see the baby and I let him but I'm too afraid to physically hand her to him. He's repairing the nursery and keeps asking me what I would like. I cry every time saying we already had what I liked and some of the items that we have can't be replaced. He asked me if I still loved him and I admitted that he showed me his worst self so I don't know if I could live with that image. I didn't mean to be hurtful but it's how I feel. My sister suggested couples therapy but I don't feel like I should have to work to fix something that I didn't break. I've never cheated and have been 100% innocent in all of this the whole. Am I wrong for not wanting to give Jim a second chance? Update, one of the reasons Jim wouldn't pick me up from the hospital was because I wouldn't admit to cheating or give him any details, because there weren't any which made him angrier. Based on the pictures Jim sent me he didn't take a sledgehammer to the crib or anything. He just took stuff down to either return it for the money or gave it away. While deeply hurtful I wouldn't call it violent, but maybe it is. Online he announced that I pushed out a dark-skinned baby and he was going to divorce me. His family started with the racial comments and eventually he started doing it too but only through my family, he refused to speak to me directly. Once the truth came out, everything he and his family posted were taken down but I, and a few friends, still have the screenshots. Jim never wrote down his racial remarks. While he didn't say any of the racist words, he did make comments about our daughter being a welfare princess, and how I was going to be just another baby mama. Just to clarify. Jim is white and I am at least half white. One of my parents is adopted and with everything that's happened, they decided to do the ancestry thing too. My parents had at least 45% American ancestry, which means I have at least 20%. I am legally separated from my husband with primary custody, and I'm living with my parents until further notice. He still keeps apologizing and wants me to come back to the house. He even offered to leave so I could stay with our daughter, but I don't want to and really like having the support of my parents. My dad is retired so he does a lot of the babysitting while my mother and I work remotely. I do go to the house every so often so Jim can see his daughter and for couples counseling via telecom. In one of the sessions, Jim confessed something really hurtful. He cheated. It was while we were dating, before he proposed, and his treatment towards me was a projection. It was with an ex-girlfriend who had cheated on him and he hooked up with her as an ego boost. He started to feel guilty but was too scared that I would walk away to ever confess. Jim also admitted that he was scared when I got pregnant since our baby wasn't planned. He was very anxious about being a father, but just pretended to be excited because he didn't want to look like an a-hole. My husband was so willing to believe that our daughter wasn't his because he thought he had an out. Now that he knows that our child is his and has spent time with her, Jim regrets everything and just wants his family back. He is willing to spend the rest of his life making it up to us. This was all deeply hurtful and I've cried about it more than once. Jim has been lying to me and my ability to trust him hasn't improved at all. When the holidays came around Jim's parents asked about seeing their grandchild and I didn't want to. They told me that it was selfish of me to keep her away and I reminded them of their past. They said that they've already apologized and tried to minimize the situation. They said that I can't be angry forever and that I need to learn to forgive them. I'm so ashamed of ever loving and marrying into this family. 
I've decided to contact the lawyer and will be filing for divorce after my daughter's first birthday. My sister has been lying about our family for years and has made us out to be abusive and extremely homophobic to her friends, and they just contacted me. So about three years ago my older sister Leah's personality basically did a 180 overnight, as she went from being the sweet reliable big sis to very snappy and closed off. She stopped doing chores and would get an attitude if anyone reminded her that she needed to help around the house. She even bit me on one occasion when I asked her to help me with the dishes. I was 12 at the time so I wondered why was she acting like that. In the beginning of her turnaround my parents choked it up to teenage girl hormones, but one night she came out of her room crying and told us she is bi. My parents were extremely supportive of this so was my older brother because he's gay. I wasn't educated on this kind of stuff at the time so I didn't get it until my parents explained it to me and why it was such a big deal to her and I was just like cool good for you sis. Her behavior got better after that and she was being nice to us again. She didn't hang out with me as much though. So fast forward three years later me and my sister are really close again. Or at least I thought we were. One thing my parents and I have noticed is that her friends have started acting very weird towards us. Like they wouldn't talk to us when they came over even if we said hi, or would occasionally make backhanded remarks or roll their eyes when we spoke. It was weird but again this was only when they came over which was rarely, so me and my parents kinda just brushed them off like whatever they don't have to like us. Well, I just found out why they act like this. An hour ago I was peacefully binge watching an anime when my phone started buzzing like crazy, when I checked I was added into a group chat on Instagram by her friends. In this group chat they were basically bashing me for being a horrible person. They were calling me homophobic, a spoiled brat, terrible sister, golden child, home wrecker. Kept telling me I need to apologize to my sister for abusing her so I was obviously confused. When I expressed my confusion to them they told me to stop acting dumb and innocent, later they realized I was being serious and genuinely did not know what they were talking about. That's when they sent me a bunch of screenshots between them and my sister. To sum things up my sister has fed her friends a very wild story about her life and how we treat her. She has told them the following things, our parents are extremely homophobic and are kicking her out at 18 because of her being bi. When she came out I quickly became the favorite child. I'm spoiled and get everything I want and because of this I treat her badly for fun? I hit her, steal slash break her things, verbally abuse her and call her homophobic slurs, not only do my parents allow it, they encourage it. She's forced to do all of the chores and cooking in the house including cleaning my room, this girl does not know how to cook. She lied about other stuff like having autism and me making fun of her for it which is crazy because I'm the one with autism. There's so much more the screenshots go back like two years so she's been telling them this for close to three years. I asked them why it's taken them this long to confront me. They said she begged them not to confront or talk to us about it because apparently it will make things worse for her and her plan was just to go no contact with us when she's 18, but they couldn't hold back this time because the most recent thing she told them was that apparently I found out about the guy she likes and immediately found his social media and started texting him to spread lies about her and now he won't talk to her. I debunked as much as I could, sent them pics from pride festivals we went to with her, sent them pics of us, sent them pics of my brother with his boyfriend. They were ticked but I asked them not to do anything. Until I figured out how to deal with it because apparently my sister is the abused black sheep of the family, they agreed. Update my sister has been lying about our family for years and has made us out to be abusive and extremely homophobic to her friends, and they just contacted me. I took screenshots of everything from last night's group chat. My dad gets home earlier than my mom and my sister has a part-time job so I spoke to my dad first. Obviously he was furious, shocked, hurt too. It was hard watching it happen since I love my dad. He also apologized a lot as I'm the one who had to find this out and sit him down. Anyway, mom got home and my dad wanted to talk to her alone so I went in my room. This was the unexpected part. I heard my parents arguing a lot and I later found out that mom knew about my sister Leah's lies. She found out five months ago and didn't tell my dad. Apparently she made my sister promise not to do it anymore and just trusted that she wouldn't. Safe to say my dad was heated. Leah got home and things got worse. Leah started punching and scratching her legs threatening to end herself, also screaming that she was going to unalive me. So I was kinda scared to leave my room, literally never heard my sister scream like that before. My dad was already mad that my mom went behind his back and kept him out of something that involves his child, my mom defended herself saying that she was just protecting Leah and that she's just a kid. But my dad is smart enough to realize that Leah is clearly not mentally well and said she needed to be put in a ward. From what I heard and what my dad told me my mom begged him not to but dad was already mad about what she did so he threatened to leave her if she didn't comply. There was more arguing but eventually they did drive her to the hospital and obviously I haven't seen her. Me and my dad are now at my grandparents and he is not currently speaking to my mom but he did tell her that if she tries to take Leah out then she is ending their marriage. I also spoke to my brother and obviously he was hurt but concerned for our sis so there's that. My dad and I have talked a lot, good talks, he apologized to me for everything going on but it's not his fault so there's nothing to forgive if anything I feel more bad about the situation but me and my dad are good. My psychopath mother-in-law just died in a car accident and my stalker coincidentally disappeared at the same time, plus update. My mother-in-law and I never had a good relationship, and this was down to the fact I was from a poorer family. 
She has tried to sabotage my relationship with my husband since the day she met me. I wasn't good enough for her handsome and successful boy who was a lawyer and I was a barista with a single mom. She always let me know this. I contemplated ending my relationship several times, especially when she yanked my engagement ring off my finger and tossed it into a lake when we were on a picnic. Thankfully my husband always showed that he is on my side. And I love him. A few years ago, I started getting very threatening and scary emails and texts from someone named Pax. This Pax knew everything about me. It didn't matter how many emails and phone numbers I changed, they always found me. I made several reports but nothing happened. My husband tried everything to trace the emails. Nothing came out of it. This past year I basically never left the apartment alone as when I did I was sent pictures of me walking. My mother-in-law died in a car accident while driving drunk one month ago. She took the life of a mother and a baby in another car too. Now, I haven't received a single threatening text or email from Pax in a month. After a few days I wasn't surprised. Felt like I always knew it was her deep down. My husband hasn't reacted yet. He's consumed with his grief and I don't want to bother him, especially when he bitterly told me you must be very pleased now when we heard the news and I tried to comfort him, he apologized later and said he was just feeling guilty that he loved and chose me more that he loved her. Now I'm waiting for him to connect the dots. Will he get it? Update, I started living like I never did before. With 10 minutes walks alone, then 15, then half an hour and so on. At first my husband didn't notice my freedom or. Maybe he did but was processing it himself. Last Friday I told him that I was going out with the girls alone. He kissed me and wished me a nice evening. When I came home around midnight, he was still up. He said that he wanted to talk to me. He asked me, was my mother your stalker? I said yes and he broke down crying. He said he has always suspected her and even talked to her a couple of times about it and she made him so guilty by accusing him of being a simp. He said he noticed how I, after so many years of fear and anxiety, stopped eventually crying in my sleep and he noticed that I haven't woken him up for a month now to cuddle me back to sleep. He apologized for never discussing it with me and never protected me from his family even though he had suspicions. Honestly I'm not even mad or disappointed. If the police couldn't help me I don't know how much my husband could have done and I just want to move on and leave this behind. We are going to start couples therapy and my husband is planning to tell his family that mother-in-law was my stalker. He is adamant about it and honestly I think it's a good idea. My husband has also decided not to attend the headstone setting on mother-in-law's grave. I discovered my husband's disturbing last letter to his deceased mother which he lost, so I showed it to him and made him cry. My mother-in-law was an angel of a woman, but sadly she passed away three years ago from terminal cancer. She welcomed me into her home when I was 17 and was kicked out by my abusive parents, and she was like a mother figure to me which I never had. Her death impacted our lives greatly, and we mourned for a very long time. I remember when she had a few months left to live, my husband started working on an enormous handwritten letter to her which he was going to give to her on her last days as his way of saying goodbye. I remember my husband showing me the letter and he was totally okay with me reading it as she and I were always super close. Unfortunately, this letter, which was about 30 pages long, went missing one day. My husband swears he left it in his drawer, but after turning the house upside down for days on end we were never able to find it. I grilled him about it, sometimes blaming him for being so careless for losing it. My husband has cried many times about it, and he says losing this letter is the biggest regret of his entire life. I cried a lot about it too as some of the things I read in it were so beautiful and it was something I know my late mother-in-law would have cherished deeply in her final moments. Well, we are moving house soon and yesterday I was clearing out the attic, something I have never done in the eight years we have lived in this house, and I stumbled upon a familiar notebook. I wasn't sure whether my eyes were deceiving me at first, but then I looked closer and realized it. It was the notebook which contained the letter. I cried, and even though I probably should have called my husband, I opened it up and started reading in tears. I flicked through the pages and each page had a subheading which related to the topic he wrote about. I had seen most of them, but one called, I forgive you for what you did that night. Mom, caught my eye. Curiosity got the better of me, and I started reading. What I read made me so sick to my stomach. I will copy an extract from the letter below. I'm sorry for never discussing this with you mom. I know this probably still haunts you to this day and what you did should be inexcusable. I found myself in therapy for many years and never told you about it. I knew it was a deep and dark memory of your life you wanted to forget. I don't blame you for what you did. It messed me up but just like everyone, you had your skeletons. The night you came into my room when I was 8 years old and you were very drunk and under the influence of what I now think was grass. I think you thought I was asleep. You were super mom to me, and no matter what influence you were under, you saved us from dad and I can never thank you enough. Nonetheless, what you did that night changed me. I'm sure you remember going into my room and starting to try to do things to me. Intimate things. Things you should never in a million years do to your own son. You carried on for a few minutes before stopping. I heard you crying in the bathroom a few minutes later and throwing up. I cried myself to sleep, but very silently. Thankfully you never came back in. You also never noticed how I was in the aftermath. I never held it against you though, not even the day after. You gave me everything. I know what you did was monstrous. But I forgive you mom. I forgive you. 
I threw up after I read this. My mother-in-law had roped my husband when he was just eight years old. I stopped packing and cleaning the house after that. I waited for my husband to come home, and when he did I gave him the letter. I didn't say anything, just showed him this. Without even reading it he broke down crying, saying he was sorry for never telling me, he could never bring himself to do so. He told me he means what he says. He forgives her. I held him for a long time. I can't blame him for not telling me, but it does feel like a very weird sense of betrayal. Update I discovered my husband's disturbing last letter to his deceased mother which he lost, so I showed it to him and made him cry. The day after I wrote my post I ended up confronting my husband about the reason he threw the letter away, and his answer was exactly as I suspected. He said that this memory was one that his mother tried so long and so hard to fight away, and reminding her of this incident on her very last day on earth would absolutely crush her. I proceeded to ask him why he didn't rip the page out and give the rest of the notebook to her, and he said that it would not feel genuine. He wanted to give her everything he possibly could. The deepest and darkest parts, and if he had to stick to only sunshine and rainbows he felt like he would be doing a disservice to himself as well as to his mother. There have also been things that came to light about his mother I was never aware of. I know his father was very abusive, but I didn't know just how bad it was. When in this extract my husband mentioned his mother saving them from dad, he meant it. Turns out his father was a cop and very abusive. He had the law behind him, and he was a diagnosed psychopath. I was never aware of this, but his mother had many marks on her back from cigarette butts and other sick things that resulted whenever his father would develop rampages. He only showed me a scar on the back of his head, which I have never seen before as my husband has long hair, and my husband said this was when his father got very drunk one night and decided to use a knife when my husband was just three. It feels like the world has come crushing down on me, and I don't know what to think. I have learned so many things in the past 48 hours that I don't even feel like I know my husband anymore. I got into a street fight over a burger, and ended up in the hospital. I'm typing this on my hospital bed right now because I know my story needs to be heard. I was hit with snow in New York City after leaving my comedy class. If you live in the city you know about the massive snowstorm that hit us. I've never seen bigger snowflakes in my life, each drop felt like a sucker punch to the face. As I walked in the snow back to my place I had to pee so badly, but my walk was 50 minutes away. I tried not to slip on the icy sidewalks and ultimately decided to stop into a Five Guys. I ordered a double cheeseburger just so I'd be able to technically use their bathroom. I tried opening the bathroom door but it only slightly opened. I told a worker and he said it opens you just gotta shimmy it a little bit more. I shimmied it more and I swung the door open. A broom inside fell down and I realized it was holding the door in place. A man was banging a girl on top of the sink, butt booty naked and all. He turned his head onto me and bro started seeing red. I told him I was sorry and tried closing the door but dude pulled his pants back up and started rushing me. I started backing and speed walking out of the five guys as he was rushing me. Once he zipped up his pants I tried running when I got out the door and I got an immediate punch to the back of my head. I put my hands around my head and admittedly took a couple body shots. I kept screaming at bro to get the hell off of me and swung a couple punches and kicks. I messed up when I realized my foot landed up his testes. Bro was the Hulk he didn't even flinch, he had balls of steel. He just kept going at me complaining about how I embarrassed him in front of his cousin and blah blah blah. Eventually he smartened up and sweeped me on icy concrete. I fell and broke something. I kept crying and wailing on the street. Eventually I was taken to a hospital in an ambulance and was told that I broke my coccyx. Have fun looking that up. Edit, many of you asked if I was the guy in that TikTok video, yeah the five guys burger ice flip video. I took my girlfriend out and made her pay, I don't know why she's upset. My girlfriend and I are not flat broke, but we are in a place where saving money is a priority. She budgets beautifully, and is wonderful with saving money, therefore it is fair to say she has more money than I do. My girlfriend makes it a point to make us go out to dinner once a week or every other week. Whenever the bill comes the waiter hands me the check and without missing a beat I always ask her, can you pay? She always agrees, I think this is such a nice perk in the relationship. I like when she takes me on dates, it makes me feel good about saving my money, and she has more than me anyway so she needs it less. I have good food, she spends the whole evening asking about me, complimenting me, enjoying my company, and planning our future. The problem came up last night when she had a huge craving for appetizers and margaritas. She complained about spending her day off cleaning the entire kitchen and she didn't want to dirty any other dishes. I suggested we go out, and she didn't see a problem with it. We had a great meal. Between the two of us we had a few margaritas and the bill was adding up. Before the bill came she asked if I would mind if we split the check, and began to explain how much these nights out are really eating away at her food budget. This is where I got confused. I would have never offered if I knew I would have to pay for my half. She also jabbed at me for always letting her pay, and never once offering. She feels she's being taken advantage of and if it wasn't for her, we would never go on dates because she's the one who pays. We had a small argument, she got really upset, paid the check, and we walked home without speaking. I said we just won't go out to dinner anymore, this suggestion or any other suggestions wasn't helpful. She's been distant and incredibly upset and is now mentioning the weirdest problems and making me feel like a bad boyfriend. She's even mentioned wanting to break up, over a $140 check. My portion of the bill was $95 by the way. Abandoned my family because they deserved it. I abandoned my wife and my 13-year-old daughter a week after I discovered my wife's affair. It's now almost six months since that day. Our marriage had plenty of intimacy and was in good shape. 
I came home late from work, and there was a safety training seminar I had to attend. My wife Eve was sleeping on the sofa and a message with some emojis popped up on her phone. Emojis like I would use when I message her. I snooped and I found out what had been going on for at least five months. I knew the affair partner, Adam, he was a work colleague of hers. He was married and had three children. While reading the messages something just snapped in my head. Over the course of reading their messages, I went from loving Eve more than anything, to hating her to just going blank. Not just about her, but everything. Totally numb, I took pictures of the messages and went to bed. Eve was mad the next day that I went to bed without waking her up. She complained about neck pain from sleeping on the couch all night. During breakfast I didn't say a single word, my wife and daughter chatted away. They didn't seem to notice anything different about me. Or even acknowledge me. But I definitely didn't feel like myself. I went through all the daily motions, I went to work, did all the normal stuff. The only difference is I sort of stopped talking. Sadly I realized that nobody seemed to even notice. It's like I wasn't even there. I started to understand that Eve and my daughter didn't really love me. I was in the house with them, but unless they wanted something from me they didn't really interact. I would get these pangs of pain, they would come and go. Sometimes they would overwhelm me completely. I walked around like this for five days before Eve asked me if something was wrong during dinner, I had maybe uttered three words in total to her and my daughter in that period. I didn't even answer her question, I just made a confused face, then continued eating. She seemed okay with that. The next day I didn't go to work. I didn't really have a plan. I put it in my car and walked around the neighborhood for a while. I ended up at the kitchen table waiting for the wife to come home. She came home with a few bags of groceries, she immediately started talking about her day while unpacking. I just sat at the kitchen table in pain. She didn't even look at me apart from one glance as she entered the kitchen. Daughter popped in and did the same. Their backs were turned to me and they talked about some trivial crap on sale. I have never felt so rejected, unappreciated, so alone. I was thinking back on our lives and all I could see was that they didn't care about me at all. They probably never did, I was an accessory to their life. I was hit with a wave of pain, I cried, still they didn't notice so I got angry, very angry. I had a glass of water in front of me, I stood up and threw it hard at the tiles over the sink. It just exploded, glass shards rained over everything. They froze, unsure what to do when they saw my contorted tear-soaked face. It was uncomfortably quiet for a long while before I spoke. Eve, I know all about your cheating with Adam. My daughter looked at Eve what? Is that true mom? Eve started to try to explain. She briefly glanced at me and said sorry, I can explain. Then she turned back to our daughter and they started arguing. Again it was like I was invisible or something. After a few minutes watching their increasingly heated argument I just walked out and got in my car, I looked at them again through the window, still arguing in the kitchen. They didn't even notice I had left. I sat there for a few more minutes before I gave up and just drove off. It took maybe 15 minutes before Eve tried to call me, then call after call after call, then a flood of texts from both of them. I just ignored it and eventually turned the phone off. The next day I took half of our money out and called my boss. I told him I didn't know when I would be back. He told me if I didn't show up I was fired. I just told him okay and hung up. I just didn't care. I went to Adam's house, his wife opened. I gave her a copy of the messages and told her what Adam and my wife had been up to. I left her crying on the stairs. At the end of the day I ended up in a cheap hotel at the edge of town. The next few days were kind of a blur. Eve's older brother is a cop named Bob. Bob showed up on the fourth day. I don't know how he found me. He tried to interrogate me, but I didn't say anything. When I didn't engage, he told me I was under arrest and put me in cuffs. However he didn't take me to the station like I expected. He took me home instead. Bob dragged me into the living room where my wife and daughter immediately started berating me. Still I said nothing. I just listened in amazement while they told me how terrible this was for them. When a terrible a-hole I was for making them worry. It went on for a while, in the end Eve screamed at me say something. I stared at her for a while before calmly saying I have nothing to say to you beach. Bob freaked out, and slammed me against the wall. Screaming at me to not talk to his sister that way. I got a lot of satisfaction out of Bob's violent reaction. I don't know why, it made me so happy I was laughing. Bob's wife left him four months earlier. I smiled at Bob, you're pathetic Bob. Did you hurt your wife Bob? Is that why she left you? Bob hurt me hard, I went down. Wife and daughter started screaming their heads off. As I started to get up I just laughed even harder. I just couldn't help myself. I am still in handcuffs, laughing. I said, F you Bob. He knocked me out cold this time. I woke up in the hospital. I puked all over the floor the second I opened my eyes so I knew I had a concussion. Eve, Bob and my daughter were there, they were talking to me, I was too confused to make it out. A nurse appeared and asked them to leave. She got me a pan to puke. In and called someone to clean. While she was taking my pulse, I told her that my family put me here and that they were not to come anywhere near me. If they came back into the room I would leave, I would just run away. She argued kind of sternly that running or even getting up was a really bad idea for me. But she would talk to security. I didn't see them again in the hospital, it was bliss. I decided to disappear, to turn into a ghost, I wanted nothing to do with these people ever again. I made a letter to each of them, I warned Bob that if he ever bothered me again I would report him. I told my daughter that Eve had betrayed me and that she would be without a father from now on. To Eve I made a longer letter. I tried to be as practical as possible. I told her to sell the house, that I won't be paying the mortgage or utilities anymore. 
I told her reconciliation, or even contact was impossible, especially after she had sent her brother to drag me back and hurt me senseless in front of them. I explained that I won't do anything for her ever again, so if she wants a divorce she will have to arrange it. I told her I will disappear and I don't want to be found. I ended it with if she interferes with my life again I will simply end myself. I really regret giving her that last sentence. It's like I let her steal a little bit more of me, like I let her give me a little more pain. In the hospital I made a plan on how I could disappear. Eve gave the hospital some fresh clothes that they forwarded to me. Then one evening I just went out the rear fire escape. I triggered some kind of alarm I was panicking a bit but, thankfully no one stopped me. I got back to the hotel to pick up my car. I traded it with a small RV and set off. I got a new phone. The only person I called was my father. I told him everything and told him if he gave my new number to anyone I would become totally unreachable, forever. He could call me if he needed to reach me if I needed to sign something. Other than that I wanted to be left alone. For the first few months I grieved the loss of my old life, but I came to realize that I grieved the loss of a fantasy. A memory that only existed in my head. The loving wife and daughter, the family, friends. It was all just an illusion in my head. These people never really cared for me. Over time I started to rebuild. Only this time I was a total ghost. I rent a safety deposit box to keep valuables and cash. I do odd jobs for money. I hunt and fish and scavenge. My money consumption is insignificant so my cash reserves are actually growing. I don't pay taxes, I don't have a bank account. When people ask my name I answer people call me Fred. I go out of my way to not contribute to society or anything else for that matter. All in all my life is getting better. At least now no one is using me for nothing but their own benefit while pretending they care about me. I don't know what happened to my wife and daughter, my old friends or the rest of the family. I don't know if I am divorced now or if I owe child support. I don't know what happened to the house. I don't really care. My father has tried to give me information a few times but I shut that down hard. He is the only one I speak to occasionally from my old life. Date I abandoned my family because they deserved it. As I was reflecting on everything yesterday I was starting to experience something similar to the day I tried to confront Eve. The world got muffled. I felt I needed to log off, I called a hunting friend and asked if he could come over. We talked on the phone until he arrived and the first thing he did was to confiscate all my ammunition. So he was pretty worried I guess. He called my dad and stayed with me until he arrived. I have moved to a different city so that took over 4 hours. Long story short. Dad arrived and he took me to see a doctor, as a result I have been committed to a psychiatric facility. The doctors suspect that I suffer from emotional and psychological trauma. Probably depression as well. Apparently, the numbness, extreme desire to self-isolate, strange reactive behaviors like laughing at being physically hurt, nobody loves me, feeling undeserving, reclusive, are pretty clear indicators according to the doc. I hope to talk to my daughter in the near future if the counselors say it's okay for me and her and if she wants to. My dad has talked to her a bit about the situation. He tells me that she loves me and asks for me. My dad is with me for now and I will be monitored 24 7 for the next few days. They tried some medication, but I had a very negative reaction, so they will try something else tomorrow. Also, Bob somehow found out about me and DM'd my account and apologized. Eve hadn't told him the real reason I left for the hotel. She had just told him about the glass in the wall, leaving the rest out. Bob told me he had informed his superiors what he had done when he found out. According to him, everyone that should be, has been informed. He was suspended in order to undergo anger management training. If I submit a complaint, he would be dismissed. He has prepared a full written confession and all the paperwork for me if I choose to do so. All I needed to do was read it and if I agreed to sign. It he would be dismissed. I decided to call Bob's employer and plead in Bob's case that he continues as a cop. Bob visited me on Thursday, he had prepared all the paperwork for me to file a complaint against him. He made no excuses, he admitted his behavior was completely out of line. He apologies for losing his cool, and that it was entirely his fault. He pushed me pretty hard to file against him actually. But I have been thinking about him. I have seen him throw himself in the path of a punch to protect an old woman being attacked. I know a lot of his colleagues, and they always talk about how he will always go that extra mile to help someone. I found out why his wife divorced him as well. Bob doesn't make much but he donates 10% of his salary and volunteers 3 days a week to help the homeless. Apparently his ex found this to be unbearable. Bob refused to stop helping so she divorced him. Bob is a good man, he lost control one time, I lost my way for over 6 months. Edit, I have been out of the psych ward since Friday morning, I have been getting a lot of therapy and I am doing much better. I have daily treatment but I no longer need to be committed. I suffer the after effect of emotional trauma and have mild PTSD. My behavior has naturally been off as a result of this, I have been in intensive therapy and I am getting some medication. I only take the meds now and again at this stage if I feel overwhelmed. Some of my behavior, especially the isolation, probably made things even worse for me. I have talked a lot to my daughter. She tells me she has forgiven me. She never meant to make me feel unappreciated. She loves me. The first few days I didn't actually believe her. But once I got some perspective I realized this doubt was all on me. I have apologized more times than I can count, she started telling me to stop apologizing actually. She has moved away from her mother and is living with my brother and his family at the moment. She gets along really well with. His kids and my brother has told us that she can stay for as long as she wants. I am in no condition to be a full-time parent at the moment, so for now, she will stay with them. My brother has arranged therapy for her and I will do my best to be the best father I can be from now on. My wife, Eve, has also moved out of the house, and is living with her parents. My father has been paying the mortgage for me, without me knowing. So the house isn't sold yet. 
I am not looking forward to going back there to all the memories. I have decided to sell the house and downsize to a tiny home and live a life closer to nature with less stress. I will try to rent or buy a plot of land and live as simply as possible, at least for a while. My daughter loves this idea and has been researching tiny homes like a pro. Adam, the affair partner is trying to reconcile with his wife and has cut Eve off completely. Eve has been to my dad's house almost weekly begging for him to contact me and let her talk to me. If what her mother tells me is correct, Eve lost her job and is in a terrible way. Barely leaving her room at her parents' house, she is shunned by pretty much everyone according to her mom. I have found a lawyer today and will start divorce proceedings ASAP. I bought a whole case of my hunting buddy's favorite whiskey and spent Saturday night there, thanking him. He is a true friend. He probably saved my life. My wife's affair completely broke me and my family. I was so broken I couldn't even see it myself. Up until then I was sort of holding myself together by convincing myself that I was doing better. But the truth is I was hanging on by the tiniest of threads. Day 2, I abandoned my family because they deserved it. I have gotten a lot of therapy and I am fairly stable. My daughter is doing well. I am however a different person now, I have a hard time trusting people. Apart from my daughter I prefer solitude and I have a very low public profile in general. I don't know if I would say something is broken inside me. I guess you could say I am broken compared to who I used to be, but I am not unhappy. I am perfectly okay as a partial loner, I am just different now I guess. The house is sold and I bought a tiny home where me and my daughter live. It's not a tiny, tiny home like you see on TV, it has two separate bedrooms and a combined living room kitchen. It's in a secluded location on a forested hillside and it has a porch outside as big as the house and a wonderful view. I absolutely love the tranquility and the close proximity to nature in our new home. I am divorced, or almost divorced, it's just waiting for the formalities now. Expected time frame is 3 months. Soon to be ex has been begging me a lot for a second chance, almost daily, but she has not demanded anything from me. She doesn't try to excuse herself, she owns her affair. We used mediation and she has given me everything basically, all our assets and full custody. The only thing she has asked for is to be allowed to visit often so she can try to repair her relationship with our daughter. She has offered to cook and clean as well. But I don't want to feel like I owe her anything, I will keep the household operational, it's tiny anyway. And I need some chores for my daughter, I don't want her to grow up to be a spoiled brat. My daughter and soon to be ex relationship is very, very strained. We will have to see how it goes. From my perspective I have told her I want closure but there is no way of repairing our relationship. We will be co-parents, that's it. I have insisted on split custody since it's cumbersome to undo full custody after the divorce is final. Now, that I can think straight, I want our daughter to have a relationship with her mother. I have forgiven her and moved on, I will live my life as I see fit from here on out. As for the assets I will give her half at the last minute, or directly after the divorce. We built up these resources during our marriage so it's only fair she gets half. But I really want to see if she will go through with it, actually giving me everything. She is very remorseful and I find it helps my healing. Soon to be ex is still struggling, some would say she is an absolute wreck. She is going to counseling, we all are, including family therapy for my daughter's benefit. I am determined to try to make up as much as possible for my daughter for my mistake. My daughter is very sharp, I believe she has forgiven me but she watches very carefully how I act towards her mother. I am determined to be a good role model, so I will act exemplary. It's been incredibly hard to deal with the aftermath but I am finally starting to stabilize. My narcissistic ex-boyfriend poisoned me over a LinkedIn bio, but he accidentally gave me a golden ticket to Harvard, basically my high school rival was a guy named Nathan, he and I were super similar, we were co-presidents of the same clubs, had similar academic portfolios, had done research papers together, and we spent a lot of time together, so despite being known as academic enemies, Nathan and I were actually in a relationship for two years of high school, now those were years that I really valued and enjoyed, Nathan took pretty much all my firsts, but, once the time for college applications rolled around, Nathan dumped me, saying that he needed to focus if he wanted to get into Harvard and he couldn't be distracted with me. This made me upset for a number of reasons, mainly because he called our two-year relationship a distraction but also because Harvard was also my dream school, and I didn't appreciate the way Nathan just assumed he would get in over me, even though he would be the final reason I hacked my brain and managed to get in. And so, just like that, our academic rivalry was back and we each had something to prove, but I never could have prepared myself for the lengths Nathan would go to, just to beat me. Everything went downhill at this debate competition, a four-day international conference in D.C. that we had been preparing for all year. This was the final big competition before college applications were due and our final chance to prove that we belonged at an Ivy League school. Everyone was tense, not just me and Nathan, and everyone wanted to win. But wanting to win will never excuse what Nathan did, even though I'm incredibly grateful for it, because his stupidity changed my life drastically for the better. It first started on the train to D.C. when Nathan changed seats so that we would be next to each other. It was a little awkward, but I thought that this was just Nathan's way of trying to apologize for all the unpleasant tension between us so I let my guard down and didn't think anything suspicious of it. For the remainder of the trip, Nathan tried acting like my friend. That train ride, he treated me like he used to. We spent time studying together, laughed over some inside jokes, and we even practiced our speeches in front of each other. I started to think this competition would be good for us, to make him realize that we shouldn't lose our friendship over just school, and dare I say give our relationship another shot. By the end of the train ride, things almost felt normal, and it felt natural when Nathan showed up to my hotel room the next morning with a cup of coffee for me. Him getting me breakfast while I was running late really felt like progress, 
especially since that was something we used to do for each other when we were still together. It even made me start daydreaming about even being in a relationship with him again. All felt right in the world, that was until I noticed something had changed in me. About halfway through the first day of the conference, I felt like I was in a hyper-focused mode, as if someone had filtered out the white noise in my brain and just left the sharpest, most productive parts behind. When I gave impromptu speeches, I found myself having extra time to think as if time was going by slower than usual. And when the time for questions came, I asked the most precise, detail-oriented questions that highlighted major flaws in my opponent's arguments. Unfortunately, Nathan fell into this category. Somehow, I was beating everyone in the debate room, including him. By the second night, it was obvious that I was going to win. I was just hoping this wouldn't cause a rift in our friendship because we were just starting to become close again. But all my concerns melted away because the next morning, Nathan came to my room and gave me a morning coffee to prep me for the day, even though he was somewhat agitated. So three days in a row, Nathan brought me coffee, competed against me during the day, and chilled at night. But on the fourth and final day of the competition, everything was even more tense than usual. My anxiety only grew when Nathan failed to deliver me a morning coffee. I tried not to think anything of it initially because it could have just been a coincidence, but then, Nathan didn't show up to the debate at all. He completely skipped the final day of the competition. That's when I knew something was seriously wrong. I ran to his hotel room the second the committee session ended. After banging on his door for five minutes straight, he finally let me in, but the moment I stepped inside, Nathan exploded at me, asking how it was possible for me to be performing so well. I was going to make some light-hearted joke because I genuinely had no idea how I managed to improve so much in just four days. Everything that happened during this conference put all my other work these past four years to shame, which was saying a lot since my senior year was the best I had ever performed. But I never got a word out, because Nathan immediately went on a chauvinistic, narcissistic tangent and revealed something truly insane, he had been trying to sabotage me from the very first day. Apparently he felt that this competition was the perfect thing to round out his application, and he really really wanted it on his LinkedIn biography so he could call himself an international debate champion, and so he had played dirty to try to win. What I thought was old friends catching up over a cup of coffee was actually Nathan giving me lace coffee to make me lose the competition. At least that's what he thought. Nathan told me that he had tried to intentionally buy me coffee with psychedelics and legal psilocybin alternatives in it, hoping that it would make me loopy, distracted, and confused. But I knew the coffee he had given me was the opposite of psychedelic, if anything, it was focus enhancing, and I felt ultra productive. I asked Nathan for the exact coffee brand he had bought and looked it up to confirm what I already knew, that the psychedelic coffee he bought had nothing to do with psychedelics. It was simply a mushroom coffee fusion blend. It was called Clarity Brew, and from the name I could sort of understand why Nathan might think that it was for a psychedelic type of clarity, but the actual product description made it clear that this coffee was a blessing, not a curse. The mushrooms Nathan had thought would hurt my chances of winning this competition were chaka mushrooms and lion's mane, which botanists will know are just cognitive power banks for the mind. I respected Nathan wholeheartedly until this point, but never in my life did I think that he would be capable of such a low-level Sigma IQ move. And even though Nathan had basically tried to poison me with his coffee, it worked so well on me that once I was done yelling at him, I took the clarity brew with me to confiscate it only to bring it all the way home so I could continue using the coffee until the end of senior year. That was when I discovered that the coffee didn't just make me more productive, it gave me long-lasting energy and naturally minimized the jittery effects of caffeine. Nathan had basically bought me super coffee in an attempt to drag me down. To no one's surprise, I won the competition and was later accepted to Harvard, Nathan was not. We still text sometimes, and he's apologized a lot for what he did. I've even started connecting him to a few people at Harvard to help him out with some research opportunities because I just want to be the bigger person here. Hopefully one day, he'll be the same way. Edit. Okay wait, thanks so much for all the comments, I think you guys are right about him just using me for networking. I've decided to block Nathan and cut contact with him permanently, because you're right, he lost the privilege of being my friend the day he tried to drug me. Though yes, I still do take clarity brew. Mun inviting my ungrateful stepdaughter from Christmas dinner after she cut contact with me despite me being by her side for 30 years. My wife Beth passed away three years ago and it hurt a lot, we had been together for 30 years. When I met my wife she was already a widow. Her first husband had died in a car accident. She had a daughter named Jane 43F who was six at the time her father passed. We married when Jane was about 10 years old. When I came into Jane's life, I had no idea how to be a parent to her. I expressed my fears to Beth and she said to just let her take the lead. I talked with Jane and told her that I knew I could never replace her dad and was not trying to. However, I would be willing to do all the dad stuff that her dad wasn't around to do if she wanted. I drove her to practices, attended every performance, stayed up late to help her study for math tests, taught her to drive. Shared my love of fantasy literature and Star Trek. Our relationship was always hot and cold though. While she seemed happy, I was never dad, or stepdad, or even Uncle Sam. I was always just Sam. Beth and I had a son, Tom 32M, and a daughter, Christy 29F. Jane has a reasonable relationship with her half-siblings considering their 14-year age difference. A year or so after Christy was born, Jane became sullen and despondent. After talking with Beth, I offered to adopt Jane. Beth and I had sat her down and made the offer. We thought that after the birth of Christy she was feeling left out. It backfired horribly. Jane said she didn't want my stupid effing name. I tried to explain that she wouldn't need to change her name, 
but she started screaming at me that she didn't want my stupid effing name, family or anything else. Both Beth and I told her that this response was completely unacceptable, but she kept saying nasty things to both me and Beth. I told her that her behavior was totally unacceptable and since her mom had lots of class and manners that this behavior must come from her stupid effing father's family. Beth told me that I wasn't helping and I left while she talked with Jane. A couple of days later, Jane asked to talk with Beth and I privately. She said wanted to move in with her uncle. I figured this was a hollow threat from a teenager since that uncle lived two states over and her life and friends were all where we lived. I said something like well if that's how you feel, you and your mom work it out and I will make it happen. I then left. I was the main disciplinarian parent in our household and while none of the kids were troublemakers, they all did things that got them grounded or their privileges with our cars taken away. I think Jane resented this as well. When Jane graduated high school, each student was able to purchase two tickets to the ceremony. Jane purchased two tickets and I thought I would be attending, but the week of the ceremony Beth told me that Jane wanted to use her second seat to memorialize her father. I was hurt, but I understood. She put a picture of him on the empty chair next to her mom. I think it also hurt Beth as well. Jane was an excellent student, and she got some good scholarships, and I paid the remainder of her cost to go to college, I did get to see that graduation. When Jane got married, Beth and I were not able to pay for the entirety of her wedding, we paid about half. She had her father's younger brother walk her down the aisle, she would spend a week or two during the summer with her father's family. At the reception my wife was again seated next to an empty chair to memorialize Jane's father. I was not given a seat with Beth at the family table, and honestly, I don't remember where I was supposed to be because I spent my time at the bar or standing behind Beth who was having a very hard time. However, it was a lovely wedding and once the dancing started and everybody was out of their seats I stopped worrying about where I was supposed to be. When Jane had her first kid, Beth and I were overjoyed. However, I soon learned that while my wife was going to be Gram Gram I was not going to be Grandpa but still just Sam. I am Sam to both her children. This was again something that hurt, and when Tom had his first child he asked if I wanted to be Granddad or Sam to his kids and I jumped at getting to be Grandpa. Jane ended up getting divorced about four years ago, shortly before Beth was diagnosed with cancer. She and her kids moved in with us and we helped her with her lawyer until everything was finalized. During my wife's last year, Jane was with us all the time. It was a huge help to both Beth and I after Beth passed, I was a wreck and mostly useless. It wasn't right, but Jane ended up doing most of the funeral preparation. I am very grateful for the help she provided. When Jane's father had died, his mother had helped with the funeral expenses and had purchased a double plot. When Jane prepared the funeral, she organized everything so that Beth would be buried next to Jane's father, her first husband. I was shocked and felt that this was done somewhat behind my back. My wife had never told me of this, but Jane assured me that this was what Beth would have wanted. I talked with Tom and Christy, and they know I intend to be cremated. Because of that, they thought that this was reasonable, and the plot was already paid for. At the memorial service, Jane was rightfully upset. She told many of the other mourners that she was now orphaned and that she and her two kids had no close family left. This upset Tom and Christy a lot, but I tried to explain that it was different for Jane. I talked with Jane during the memorial and told her that she does have a family that will welcome her if she wants it. She thanked me and was polite. I have not really talked with Jane since the memorial. The first year I invited Jane to all the family get-togethers just like before, even though Tom and Christy were angry with her. I left her. Voicemails asking how she was doing, how her kids are. However, the last couple of years I have stopped because I never get any response. I still send her and her kids gifts for their birthdays and Christmas. I just don't actively reach out. One of the last voicemails I left I told her that all she needed to do was call and I would help her. Now, my daughter Christy is getting married next year. She reached out to Jane in the past few months and has been working on reconciling with her. Additionally, Jane's ex lives in a different state and her kids will be gone for most of the holidays. Jane has told Christy about how alone she is feeling. Christy called me and asked me to invite Jane to my house for Christmas. Christy and her fiancé will be there along with Tom and his family. I told Christy that Jane knows she is always invited. Christy says that Jane won't come if I don't call and ask her to come. I told Christy that she could invite Jane, or she could tell Jane to call me. Christy says I'm being an a-hole for not calling Jane. I talked with my son Tom, and he says he is tired of the rest of us having to beg Jane to be part of our family. I love Jane, she is my daughter, but after so much, I just feel like the only way this will work is if she takes the first steps. Date I'm uninviting my ungrateful stepdaughter from Christmas dinner after she cut contact with me despite me being by her side for 30 years. I decided I wanted to invite Jane. I called and once again got sent to voicemail. I left a message saying that I didn't know what her plans were but that she should know that she is always welcome at our house. I figured that would be it, and I could tell Christy that I tried. On Saturday I got a call from Jane. She seemed very down. She told me the same things I had heard from Christy. Her kids would be out of state with her ex for Christmas and New Year's. She was feeling very alone. I told her that she is always welcome to come celebrate with her brother and sister and myself. She said that sounded really good and she would like that. Jane, Christy, and her fiancé John spent Christmas Eve with me. It was really nice. Jane was very sweet to everyone. Jane can be an incredibly caring person. Jane seemed a little on edge at first, but as the evening went on she became more at ease. We watched a Muppet Christmas Charl just like when my kids were younger. After my phone call with Jane, I had found Tom, Christy, and Jane's old stockings. There was not a lot of time but I got some candy, a book and a couple of gift cards for Jane, Christy, and John. 
On Christmas morning all three were a bit surprised to find that they had stockings filled with goodies and called me a jerk for not telling them beforehand so that they could make sure I had one too. I said I was not involved and you can't call Santa a jerk or you get nothing just like me. My son Tom and his family came over on Christmas Day. Jane practically knows more about what is going on with Tom's kids than I do because she is very active on Facebook. Jane's gifts to everyone were very thoughtful. Jane is great with kids and Tom's kids really enjoy their aunt. Jane and Christy made our Christmas dinner, and seeing giggling like schoolgirls in the kitchen together reminded me of Christmas long ago when Christy was seven or eight. Jane was home from college and Jane, Beth and Christy were all working in the kitchen. Christy was standing on a chair and Jane was teaching her all our secret family recipes. Christy adored Jane in the way that little kids adore adults who are not their parents. Jane was just so patient and kind to her little sister. I remember Beth, Jane and Christy telling Tom and I that stinky boys need to set the table. Seeing Jane and Christy together got me thinking about Beth and I had to go find a quiet spot to compose myself. Tom found me in my office. He said that Jane told him that I called her. He said that he was glad I did. That he was not sure he would have been willing or able to make the call. I told him I bet if it was his kid he would have. Tom and his family went home because his kids wanted to play with their new toys. Christy and John left to meet John's family for a late Christmas meal and get together. As Christy was leaving, she gave me a hug and told me Merry Christmas Daddy. When I turned around and saw Jane, I could see dread on her face. After everyone had left Jane asked to talk with me. We had a long conversation and I am going to hit the important parts. Jane said she was very thankful to be invited for Christmas. She told me that when she started dating after her divorce, because of her age she met a lot of guys who had older kids like her own. Many didn't think trying to blend families with older kids was a good idea. I guess they figured the kids would be out of the house soon, and they had co-parenting relationships that worked for them. However, Jane has her kids pretty much all the time. A large factor in her divorce had been that her husband had a view that his job was more important than their kids' lives. She wanted to be with somebody who would show her kids, especially her son, that family is not just a thing women care about. Apparently, as her longest relationship was spiraling, she had an argument with her boyfriend where she said something like, what's so hard about stepping up and being a good dad, my stepdad was able to do it and he didn't have any kids of his own when he married my mom. To which said boyfriend said something like you mean the guy you treat like poop and your kids treat him badly too. She says that after that fight, she kind of started thinking about our relationship, things I had done for her, and that she had done as well. She told me she feels embarrassed and ashamed. That she didn't know how to even start to fix anything, and she thought Tom and Christy and I were mad at her. Jane asked me if we could have a relationship like I have with Christy and Tom. I told her that I cannot give her a replica of my relationship with Christy, that none of us can change the past. I told her that for me, nothing has changed from when the afternoon at the park where I told her that I would be willing to do all the things her dad was not around to do. I will always be as much her dad as she wants. Jane was crying by this point, and I held her. She started sobbing harder and saying she was sorry. I told her that I know, and that everything is okay. In the middle of this, something happened that I have waited a very long time to hear. The sobs of I'm sorry became dad, I'm so sorry. I am so so sorry. Well, one apology and a good cry doesn't change a person. The next morning I was mostly back to being Sam, but there were a few dads and even one daddy sprinkled in. I walked in on my psychopath boyfriend abusing our dog, so I called my dad, an ex-Navy SEAL dog lover, to come help me out. My boyfriend and I have been together for two years, and even tough he can be really sweet at times, he has a serious problem with anger issues and being violent. Whilst he doesn't lay hands on me, he has punched the wall directly next to me and put in a hole in it when he was very mad. His anger is also always triggered by minuscule things. If his food isn't done exactly right, he gets angry, if he comes back from the barber and the barber has not done a perfect job, he will get angry, about a month ago I remember raging so hard at a video game he threw the controller at our TV and completely smashed it. Whenever he does get angry, I try to stay out of his way and give him space to unleash that anger. I learned that I should do this the hard way when six months or so ago when we first moved and I tried to get in his way when he was angry to get him to calm down. We were stuck in traffic for a while and he spent the majority of the time beeping at cars and flipping other drivers off, as if that would somehow make the traffic move. I told him to cut it out and to calm down, and he proceeded to backhand me. It wasn't a hard backhand, but the fact he did it left me in a great deal of shock for the rest of the day. He did apologize when he calmed down however. I would not say I'm scared of him, but I am worried for our safety when he gets angry. He gets angry on a small level daily, and has serious anger episodes once every few days. It was during one of these anger episodes that he showed me what kind of heartless monster he really was. So about three months ago we got a little Jack Russell puppy, and we have been raising it. Rather, I have been raising him because my boyfriend hates animals and has made this very clear numerous times in the past. The only reason we were able to get the dog is because I promised to take care of it and told me it could be my birthday present and he wouldn't have to go give me anything else. He finally gave in and told me he'll get the little mutt. So, this Jack Russell of ours is quite rowdy and unhinged. He is the most energetic ball of cuteness I have ever met, often licking your face, biting your sock, biting furniture, and he gets the zoomies multiple times per day. He really was a bundle of joy, but it was sadly very clear my boyfriend really did not like the dog. I never saw him abuse our dog before physically, but I did see him get angry at it, and whenever he did I tried to de-escalate the situation as calmly as possible. 
I remember the first time my boyfriend got angry at my dog. The puppy decided to wake my boyfriend up by licking him, and he did this about an hour earlier than my boyfriend usually wakes up. I remember hearing screaming from upstairs, and I went up to find my dog sitting in the corner looking scared as my boyfriend had just punched a hole in the wall. I stayed out of his way for the rest of the day. Well, yesterday I came home to thumping noises upstairs. Thinking my boyfriend was simply angry again, I went to investigate, and once I entered the bedroom I froze in horror. I saw my Jack Russell on the floor, laying there motionless, and my boyfriend booting the life out of it. I screamed stop and rushed to put myself between my boyfriend and the dog, and caught a kick to the stomach in the process. My boyfriend yelled that this is what the little poop gets for destroying his two favorite pairs of socks. I checked on my dog and thankfully he was still breathing, and I drove him to the vet to get him checked out immediately. He had four broken ribs and a concussion. It hurt my heart to hear it, and I knew I would be a terrible person if I brought my dog home to my boyfriend where he could hurt him again. That was the moment I decided to leave him, so I showed up unannounced to my father's house and explained the situation. My father is an ex-Navy SEAL who has served, and is a man my boyfriend is terrified of. He's not fond of my boyfriend and sees him as a wimp but always told me as long as I was happy he was okay with us dating. I had never disclosed the extent of my boyfriend's anger to him, and when I did, as well as telling him about the dog, my father flipped out. I asked him if he could drive me over to get my stuff, and my father agreed. I was back at my house 30 minutes later and when I walked in the first thing I told my boyfriend was I'm leaving. My boyfriend yelled no the f you're not, but then my dad, who was also 6 foot 6, calmly stated that I was. When my boyfriend saw my dad he lost his bravado instantly, and he now began apology backslash ing profusely for what he did. My dad asked for a word outside with my boyfriend, and I could tell my soon-to-be ex was scared. They talked outside in the backyard until I finished packing, and by the time I was done my soon-to-be ex came out and apologized for being so crappy to me in our relationship, promised to cover the vet bills, and looked like he was about to tear up I left to stay with my dad, and since he loves dogs, he took my Jack Russell and I in with no questions asked. However, my ex-boyfriend is a little psychotic, I'd be surprised if he doesn't try anything. Update I walked in on my psychopath boyfriend abusing our dog, so I called my dad, an ex-Navy SEAL dog lover, to come help me out. Well, turns out that my worries about my ex-boyfriend were not in vain. At first things were very much okay and he left me alone, but over time I think he gained some courage to try to reach out to me. The thing with my boyfriend is he a diagnosed narcissist, and I had already gone back to him three times, but I was determined that this time I was done for good. He had hurt my Jack Russell, and that was not something I was ever going to forgive or forget. The first time he called came about two weeks after I moved in with my dad. I didn't recognize the number, but I picked up anyway in case my friend was yet again stranded in Madagascar and calling me for help from a random phone. Sadly, that was not the case and it turned out to be my ex. He said he had been doing a lot of thinking, and he said he deserves an apology. I entertained him for a little bit, so I asked him what for. He told me he deserved an apology for ambushing in our home with my dad and emasculating him. I laughed and told him that my dad was ten times the man he ever was, and if he was a real man in the first place, he wouldn't have a thing to worry about in relation to my dad, they would really get along. I expected it to turn into an argument, but my boyfriend then started using manipulation tactics which have worked on me in the past. He started playing a woe is me card, telling me he really loves me, he will go to therapy, really work on his anger issues, all things I desperately wanted to hear from him in the past. I held strong though and I told my boyfriend blankly to f off, and told him if he ever wanted to reach me, he could contact my dad first. He then began to yell, and I ended the call very abruptly as he was yelling about me being a beach. He then proceeded to spend the next few weeks sending flowers and my favorite chocolates to my door all in an attempt to get me to forgive him. I threw the flowers out every time and gave the chocolate to my dad, who can never resist some good chocolate. After a few weeks of the flower method not working, my ex decided to show up at my door, but thankfully my dad answered. My dad was super short with him, but I watched from the window upstairs and was able to see my dad looming over my ex-boyfriend and telling him what appeared to be not so nice things. My ex-boyfriend ended up leaving, and has yet to return. I asked my dad what he said to my ex, but he said he would really rather not repeat it as maybe he took it a little too far. Now I'm extra curious as to what he said. What's the best smartass response you've ever given? When I was 14 years old I somehow managed to find a girlfriend, which was surprising considering I was short, had big goofy teeth and oversized glasses on top of a bowl cut. So it was Valentine's Day and I was getting ready to travel to my girlfriend's house. I remember in the early morning I woke up as early as possible and went to the shop to pick out the prettiest bunch of flowers I could find, and I was super excited to spend an amazing day with the girl that I loved. I texted her to let her know I was on her way and that I had a surprise for her. I ended up getting the bus considering I was not able to drive yet, and when I got on the bus I was greeted by the most cranky and miserable looking driver of all time. As I was paying for my ticket, this miserable old man looks at me and proceeds to laugh. I ask him what's so funny I'm just trying to pay for my ticket. The bus driver takes a look at the bouquet of flowers in my hand and instantly starts insulting me and the flowers. He says, oh you got your little girlfriend some flowers did you? Don't bother women just leave anyway. In a very condescending tone. 
I tried to calmly walk off, but he piped up again, making a joke about how they were probably for my mother as those teeth of mine could never attract a girl. I walked off trying my best not to say anything. When I was getting off the bus, the driver decided to say something again. This time he said, I've thought about it and I was wrong, they're definitely for your girlfriend, your imaginary girlfriend. He then laughed to himself. Without missing a beat I turned to him and responded, you were right earlier, these are for my mother, these were her favorite. Today is her three-year anniversary and I'm going to visit her grave and lay them there you effing a-hole. I hope you're happy you ruined my mother's death day. I'm the miracle golden child, and my sister hates me for it. I have competed with my sister since I can remember. I was a baby born after a miscarriage our mom had, so my parents were very happy and shifted their attention away from my sister and onto me. I took some joy in this by knowing that I was favored over my sister due to unfair circumstances. I did try to outdo her a lot, but I also tried to connect with her growing up because I considered her a really cool person. However, she always seemed uninterested, I would tell my parents this which only made them chew her out for hurting my feelings. That only caused her to hate me more. When I turned 15, I completely stopped engaging with her. My parents didn't push for us to be friends either and kept their attention on me. A few years later, I started going through my character development arc and started wanting to be independent. I also started really regretting competing with my sister and taking joy in being a miracle child when I was little. By this point, I got myself into a good college and my parents offered to pay for the tuition. Since I wanted to move out of their house, they offered to pay my new rent too. When my sister heard of my parents offering to pay for me if I moved out, she was understandably mad as they had refused to pay for anything and told her she needed to learn responsibility by paying for her own things. She blew up at my parents, but mostly at me, for stealing away the attention of our parents her entire life and making her miserable. I tried to explain that I agreed that they were bad parents and that she deserved better but she just told me to shut my mouth and that she didn't need my sympathy. My parents forced her to apologize and threatened to cut contact if she didn't. I agree that she was harsh but I understand how frustrated she must have felt her whole life so I don't hold it against her. Since she didn't have much of a support system other than my parents, she sent me a super long apology over text and tried to mend things. Though it was obvious she only did it just because she was forced to. During the first few months of college I ended up meeting a guy named John and we started dating shortly after. Everything just clicked and it seemed like he knew my every thought. At my 20th birthday party, I introduced him to my family and everything seemed to go well. I kept my family and John separate because my parents were always super nosy and my sister seemed extremely judgmental when I would bring company. This time around she was super friendly though. Looking back, my sister was definitely a little too touchy with him but I chalked it up to her just wanting to overcompensate to mend our relationship further. After I graduated, John ended up proposing and I said yes as I was head over heels in love. We decided on having a wedding once we had secured good paying jobs and things seemed to be perfect between us. Flash forward to three weeks ago and I got the most gut-wrenching message of my life. It was from my sister telling me that she was pregnant and it was John's. In addition to that, she sent screenshots of messages and explicit images between the two. They professed their love for each other multiple times and John said that my sister was the best he'd ever had in his life, directly telling her she was better in bed than me. It had been going on for the majority of the years we'd been together. To say I sobbed my eyes out would be an insulting understatement. I asked her how she could do this to me and she replied, now you know how it feels to get your whole life ripped away from you. He loves me more and I'll make sure he leaves your sorry butt for me and our baby. Go cry to our parents and see if I care. And then blocked me before I could respond. The man I used to call my fiancé came home hours later from work and saw me crying. He begged to know what was wrong and tried to comfort me but I blew up at him and kicked him out. He admitted to the affair over text and said he loved me but loved my sister too and had to be there for his child so the engagement is off. His brother came and took all his stuff and he hasn't even given me an apology for any of this. I've been crying for basically a month straight and all I want to do is hurt the living crap out of my sister but I know I would go to jail, especially since she's pregnant. I thought that things were finally looking up, but then she decided to betray me and for what? You'd think an almost 30-year-old woman would seek therapy or talk to me directly about her resentment but no, she had to sabotage my life for the sake of hers being crap. I can't even feel any sympathy for her anymore and I just want to go away forever. I've had extremely alarming thoughts but I've just resorted to locking myself in my room all day since I work remotely and it's calmed down in the last few days. My sister unblocks me occasionally to keep rubbing it in my face that he chose her over me, sending pictures of them together and her baby bump. I've already blocked her to make sure she leaves me alone. She's a grown woman gloating like a child. If he's willing to cheat on me for so long, I feel incredibly bad for their baby but definitely not for her. I haven't told my parents yet and I'm unsure how to even go about it. My husband's niece came onto him in our home. My husband and I have been together for six years. His niece Donna is 23. She's had issues with sleeping with family members in the past. Not long after hubby and I started dating, it came out that Donna had been having intimacy with her cousin on a regular basis. According to both the cousin and Donna, she was the instigator. She was also unapologetic. Donna moved in with her girlfriend this past spring and had been having difficulty holding down a job. She has mild Tourette syndrome and doesn't take medication for it. 
She texted hubby over the summer and asked if we wanted our house cleaned. We talked about it, we've both been uncomfortable around her in the past, but we did want to help her out. So we said okay, and she's been coming over twice a week to clean. Takes her a couple of hours each time, and we pay her $60 a week. She came over this past Saturday to clean. When she showed up, she was wearing a bra and short shorts. I thought it was odd because that's not close to anything she normally wears, but I thought maybe she was going to the lake after or something. We live in Texas and it's still quite warm here. I was in our office doing my weekly receipt checks when I heard hubby say what do you think you're doing? Then I heard Donna say in a sing-song voice but I'm tired. And my husband said there's a couch if you're tired. Knock it off. A few seconds later, I heard hubby yell I said stop. Then I heard a thud. I got up and ran to the living room. My husband was standing next to his recliner, and Donna was sprawled on the floor. I asked what happened and Donna told me she was just playing. My husband told her to get out. She got up, looked at us both, then said fine. Like a five-year-old and stomped out. After she left, hubby told me he had been sitting in his recliner with the foot up. Donna had come in and straddled the foot of the recliner, which is when he asked what she was doing. He said after he told her. To knock it off, she started smiling at him and was leaning towards him while rubbing his legs and wiggling her behind around. The sound I heard was her falling on the floor when he pushed the foot back into place and stood up. I was ticked off but I didn't want to get into it with Donna. She thrives on drama. I sent her pay for the week, then texted her and told her she would no longer be cleaning our house and she was no longer welcome here. She sent both hubby and I a couple of texts that she was sorry and just having some fun, but we ignored them. She showed up at the house Tuesday. That's her normal day to clean. When I answered the door, I just looked at her and said what the hell do you think you're doing here? She goes I'm here to clean, and I told her no you're not. Go home. And I shut the door in her face. She whined and yelled things through the door for a few minutes, but eventually left. All evening and into the night I've been fielding texts and calls from her parents and my mother-in-law. They're all asking why I fired Donna and don't I know she needs the money and she has problems and I need to be more helpful. I finally told them the truth, which got her parents off my back but not mother-in-law because family. Hubby has told her to leave me alone. She's been whining at me all night that I need to be more understanding and give Donna another chance. I really want to stand my ground about this, but I'm so tired of never doing anything right with his family. Hubby doesn't want her around either, but he's wavering because mother-in-law is throwing fits at him too. My dog attacked my stalker after he broke into my house. Now my sister-in-law says my dog is too dangerous to be around my niece plus update. A few years ago, I got into a relationship with a man who love-bombed me from the start. The relationship got very abusive and very controlling very quickly. When I finally broke it off a year ago, my ex started showing up to places I was at, trying to get me to take him back. Eventually, it developed into full-on stalking. He would show up at my work, and took to just waiting outside of it after he was banned, he would leave notes on my car when I was at the grocery store, leave all kinds of flowers outside my house and then stick angry notes on my door after he saw me throw them in the trash, he wrote me all kinds of weird, obsessive emails and letters. I've had to change my phone number three times. The behavior escalated over time, and got more threatening. In one instance, he started a small fire in my driveway but the police couldn't get enough evidence connecting him to it. It was after that instance that I put cameras in my yard. I was horrified to learn that the police couldn't do anything about any of this until my stalker actually was caught doing something illegal, like breaking into my house. At which point, I might already be dead. I decided I wasn't spending the rest of my life waiting for the other shoe to drop, so I got a firearm and a concealed carry permit, took some self-defense courses, and started doing strength training. I also looked into getting an attack dog, but after all the money I'd sunk into my other methods of protection, they were prohibitively expensive. So I went to my local animal shelter and got the scariest, meanest looking dog I could find. This is where Thor comes in. He's a 120-pound American bulldog, looks like he'd end you on sight, but is basically a gigantic teddy bear. He loves every person he's ever met, is incredibly sweet and gentle with my four-year-old niece, enjoys other animals, and even loves the mailman. I just kind of accepted that he probably wouldn't do anything to protect me from my stalker, but it didn't matter that much because having such a huge dog made me so much more confident. I brought Thor everywhere I could, and was working on getting him trained enough to be an emotional support animal, so I could bring him inside places with me. Last month, I woke up in the middle of the night to Thor whining. I was groggy and thought he had to go to the bathroom, so I got out of bed and opened the door. At that point, my house alarm went off and pretty soon after that, I was face to face with my stalker. I started screaming and went to run for my firearm. Before I could do anything though, Thor ran across the room in full attack mode. There was blood all over my living room and I remember my stalker was eventually able to escape, at which point Thor chased him outside and then came back to me. When the police showed up, they said Thor was a hero who'd probably saved my life. In my stalker's car, they found hardcore substances, a firearm of his own, a blowtorch and rope. It looks like he's going to prison for a long time though, so my nightmare is over. Pretty much everyone in my life thinks Thor is a hero, except my sister-in-law. She and my brother have a four-year-old daughter. 
She says since Thor has snapped in the past, he could do it again, so he's not safe to have around kids. The way she words this makes me really angry because Thor didn't snap. He saw a stranger break into his home, heard his owner scream in terror, and reacted to defend me, himself, and his house. Nothing about that screams dangerous around children to me, unless my four-year-old niece is also going to break into my house under the influence with firearms and blowtorches in her car. This is also a very emotional issue for me because Thor isn't just a dog to me. He's my safe place, my hero, the one who protected me and kept me safe when no one else could. I've also gotten increasingly anxious since this happened, and I can't go anywhere without Thor. I barely leave my house, pay to pick up my groceries from the store instead of going in because I know Thor isn't allowed inside, and all my friends know that if Thor isn't welcome in their house, I'm not coming either. I am really going through it, and am working with a therapist to overcome this. But I really really need my brother and sister-in-law's support. I think my sister-in-law thinks I'm just pouting and that's why I won't just leave the dog home and come over without him. I don't know how to explain to them that the fear hasn't stopped just because my stalker is in jail. What can I do to make her understand the situation better? Update the conclusion I came to in all of this is that while my sister-in-law is well within her rights to protect her daughter, she went about it in a way that disrespected me, both as a friend and as a victim of a very recent violent attack. We were extremely close before this happened, I was always there for them, and would literally drop plans to babysit my niece if my brother and sister-in-law needed a night to themselves. The very least they could have done for me, after I was almost kidnapped and unalived, is trying to find some compromise. We went from seeing each other three times a week to pretty much not seeing each other at all. I invited my brother and sister-in-law over, and tried to lay all this out without being confrontational or acting like a jerk. To my surprise, my brother and sister-in-law had no real understanding that I've been having a difficult time. They thought I was basically fine and everything in my life was more or less back to normal now that my stalker is in jail. They rationalized his by saying that during the year that I was stalked, I didn't show many signs of fear. I even made jokes about having a stalker, according to them. This is partially true, I knew people wouldn't want to hang out with someone who was constantly going on and on about some bad thing that was going on in their life, and I didn't want to be that person who was perpetually in crisis, so I was light-hearted about it sometimes. However, I'm not sure if I totally buy that they didn't know I was going through something traumatic and that it was taking a huge toll on my mental state. I mean, I got a firearm and paid for tactical training. I bought a home security system. I got active in self-defense classes and strength training, things that I previously had no interest in. Plus, who just brushes off having their house broken into in the middle of the night? It seems crazy and they don't seem so emotionally unintelligent that they'd think that. But both my brother and sister-in-law did apologize for being insensitive, and when I pressed my sister-in-law on why my suggestion of crating the dog isn't good enough, she eventually relented and said that it would be fine. It probably helped that the entire time they were over, Thor was asleep and loudly snoring in his crate. The paranoid part of me is convinced they just don't want to deal with me in a fragile state, made up an excuse about my dog, and are now just going to come up with some other excuse about why they can't see me. I invited them over for dinner in a few days and they're coming, so I guess I'll just have to see from there. In other news, Yesterday I left my dog at home and drove around my block alone. I was shaking the whole time but I did it. I keep trying to remind myself that I spent a whole year fighting back even though I was utterly terrified, I can't just lay down now that I'm so close to getting my life back. I think my wife did surgery on my son and never told me. My wife has been a plastic surgeon for six years. We married only six months after meeting. She joked that she only married me for my perfect features. No good plastic surgeon would ever touch your face she would say. That's why I married you. I couldn't resist fixing you up if you were anything other than perfect. Even in our early stages of dating my wife would bring up how beautiful our child would be. It was all she cared about. Our baby boy arrived several months after we married. I'll never forget the look on my wife's face when she held Jaden in her arms for the first time. I swore it was a look of disgust. You see, Jaden wasn't exactly the cutest baby. I thought she was being shallow, but I figured when she came to love him, she wouldn't care. Unfortunately, as Jaden aged, his features grew to be more interesting. His nose outgrew his face, his cheeks became so full he looked swollen, his lips were thin as paper, and even his forehead, on top of being Rihanna-sized, started to form premature wrinkles. Nonetheless, I loved him just the same. But, I could sense resentment grow in my wife. When Jaden turned seven, I started noticing some changes. He started waking up far too groggy in the mornings, practically falling asleep in his cereal. Then the real changes came. At first they were subtle. The wrinkles started smoothing out, his lips showed some fullness, his cheeks thinned out, his forehead lessened in size. I chalked it up to aging. But last month, he came downstairs in the morning, his nose bruised and swollen. My wife insisted that he must have fallen out of his bed overnight. Don't worry. He's going to be fine. I found him like this. I already stitched him up. You know he sleeps like a rock. After weeks of healing, it became obvious. His nose was completely different. Smaller, straighter, smoother. I finally confronted my wife. Are you messing with our son's face? 
How ridiculous! She yelled. How could you possibly think that? Plus, he's still ugly. We went to bed without speaking another word to each other. I woke up in a fog this morning, stumbling to the kitchen. It was 10 a.m. and Javen hadn't come down for breakfast yet, so I walked back upstairs to wake him. I cracked the door open, only to find my wife hovering over our son, tears streaming down her face as she desperately tried to resuscitate him. Javen lay still, a perimeter of stitches outlined the top of his face. His body showed no signs of life. It was supposed to be a routine facelift. She trembled. I. I didn't mean to. I cut off my mother because she allowed the guy who roped me to visit my daughter. Ten years later she wants to fix our relationship and get to know her grandkids. Thirteen years ago I was roped by my boyfriend's best friend Jay when I was sixteen. My mother never liked my boyfriend ever since we started dating back when we were thirteen, and certainly hated him when we got married. She always wanted me to be with Jay because Jay came from a good family, meaning Christian and white. So when Jay roped me, she didn't believe me despite all the evidence that he did. So while I was waiting for trial I moved in with my boyfriend and his parents. During this time I found out I was pregnant. I knew it wasn't my boyfriend's because we were never intimate and I still had my V-card. Jay ended up taking a plea deal and got no jail time in exchange for him never having any right to see my daughter. When my daughter was born my mother asked me to move back home and said sorry for everything. A year after my daughter was born I went to college a few hours away and my mom retired early to watch her. During the week I stayed on campus so I didn't have to drive back and forth. On the weekends I came home and I also called every night to make sure my daughter was okay. My second year of college, me and my boyfriend eloped and my mom did not like that one bit even though we've been together for six years at that point and he takes care of my daughter like she's his and still does to this day. So one day we had a big snowstorm and my Thursday and Friday classes were cancelled. So I went home early without telling my mom and in the kitchen when I walked in, Jay's mom, my mom and Jay. Jay was also holding my daughter when I walked in. They were surprised to say the least and I started flipping out naturally and grabbed my daughter and packed a bag with her stuff. My mother and Jay's mother were pleading with me to not leave while I was packing. When I went to leave my mom was crying, now begging me to forgive her. I said. I would never forgive her and went to walk out. On my way out Jay grabbed my arm and said I should be nicer to my mother. My mother called me hundreds of times but I never answered her. I left to get an apartment with my husband and daughter. I got a babysitter for when I was in class. A week after this incident my mother put over 100k in my bank account to buy me over. My younger sister just got married and my mother was at the wedding and I had to be civil to her. She asked about my daughter and son and current pregnancy. She told me how she wanted to fix things with me and see her grandkids before she eventually dies and how she's always believed me about the rope. She just didn't want to be fired, as Jay's mom was her boss. I asked her if she still hangs out with Jay's mother. She said sometimes but mostly at church I left the conversation of that. She's my mother. I love her. I miss her, she raised me and my sister all by herself but I don't know if I will ever be able to completely forgive her. I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. My nightmare cousin is demanding I use my mother's inheritance money to pay for her luxurious wedding, and my aunt is manipulating me about. My mother passed away a few years ago. Being an only child whose father had passed a decade earlier, everything got left to me. This should surprise nobody, but it surprised my nightmare aunt Ellen and her hellspawn cousin Courtney. In fact, they thought it was horrifically unfair. My mother was mentally ill, untreated and abusive. I was frequently in low contact with her over the course of my adult life, and she often tried to make me feel bad about this by fawning over cousin Courtney. Before she passed, she'd often take Cousin Courtney on trips with her. However, once she passed, Aunt Ellen got it in her head that Cousin Courtney should get a share of the estate so she could keep taking trips on my mother's money. This caused a good bit of fit-tossing and family strife. Cousin Courtney even tried to sue me in small claims for the cost of a trip my mother had been talking about taking her on before she passed. Cousin Courtney didn't show up to the court date and lost by default. Apparently she didn't think she needed to for some reason and was very upset about it. I wasn't really thrilled by the lost vacation day so my sympathy was beyond limited. Fast forward to last month. Aunt Ellen calls me to inform me that Cousin Courtney has gotten engaged. I make appropriate noises while thinking to myself the poor sod has made a terrible mistake. Aunt Ellen then makes this bizarre comment about sending her a check. I'm all, what? According to Aunt Ellen, my mother had promised Cousin Courtney money for her wedding should she ever get married. Now this seems ridiculous to me on multiple fronts. I am not my mother. My mother gave many a rant on how foolish it was to waste down payment of a house-level money on a wedding. She's a bit dead at this point, so whatever she promised died with her. I say no a lot and stop answering calls. And emails from this diseased branch of the family tree. Some backstory, Aunt Ellen and I already had bad blood about weddings. She uninvited me to a previous family wedding, then told everybody there I was a rude no-show. My level of interest in writing her a large check for Cousin Courtney's wedding is somewhere below my interest in poking a nest of yellow jackets while in CAD, and the chances of it happening after the lawsuit are somewhere around my cats not yowling at the fridge when dinner's late. Let's also pause to acknowledge that the wedding plans are intense. 
We're talking destination weddings at an expensive resort, multiple photographers, out-of-season flowers, designer everything and so forth. Her idea of what she needs for a wedding approximates something they'd cover on one of those cable channels that has convinced people 10k dresses are reasonable. My own wedding was extremely small because we prioritize paying off student loans. There's no reason anybody reasonable would think I'd buy into this level of Instagram dream wedding being necessary, but this community isn't about reasonable people. Cousin Courtney then lands on my doorstep. I foolishly let her in and hear her out. Mind you, this is an adult who is engaged to be married and a doctor in a particularly highly compensated specialty. She probably makes triple what I do unless she's being screwed by her employer. She doesn't know what to do. Aunt Ellen has cut her off. I can't fathom Aunt Ellen would ever do this, so I'm a bit gobsmacked. Cousin Courtney has gotten everything she's ever requested in life by tossing tantrums until Aunt Ellen or her husband hand it over. Well, for once Aunt Ellen has drawn the line. Apparently Cousin Courtney planned the entire wedding without consulting Aunt Ellen under the assumption she'd get as much money as her half-sister had for her wedding, the one I was uninvited from. Turns out, no. That money had come from the other side of the family, and Cousin Courtney has to pay up or she'll lose her deposits. Aunt Ellen has refused to help claiming she can't remortgage the house again. She's done it too many times already to buy things for Cousin Courtney, and the money just isn't there. My position is that this is not my problem, but Cousin Courtney has never budgeted in her life. Has no idea how. Aunt Ellen is still kicking in money to her rent monthly so she can live in a safe building with a doorman. So I make a terrible mistake. See, I advise college students professionally. One of the modules I have is on financial planning. So I whip that baby out and sit down with Cousin Courtney to talk about how to set up a budget and save for her dream wedding. There's no way she and hubby to be can't do this with their combined incomes if they buckle down and plan for it. This is where things get really nuts. Cousin Courtney's expenses are crazy. She lives on takeout and multiple caramel soy calorie bomb coffee drinks a day. She needs those because her work as a doctor is so stressful. She has a country club membership that costs a thousand a month. The real kicker is her cell phone plan. It's an absurd unlimited plan that's priced higher than current rates with her carrier. All she's gotta do to save herself some money each month is call them up and switch to the new plan. She won't do it. Why? Mommy always deals with her cell plan, she hates calling customer service people, she hates being on hold, it's just not that much money and she can't ask mommy to do it because she's not talking to mommy since she got cut off. This is around where I realized all she's done this entire time is whine about how expensive everything is and refuse to do anything constructive. Her reason for agreeing to go through this budgeting exercise was to show me how poor she is and how much she needs me to cough up the money for her wedding. My motive was to get her to finally do a bit of adulting. She was decidedly uninterested in that. You can't help somebody who won't help themselves. It's just not possible. When she realized I wasn't going to be writing a check, she dried up the crocodile tears and flounced. There was some very unfortunate name calling as well. The final coda to this absurd drama is that she made up with mommy. No, mommy didn't switch her to a cheaper cell phone plan and get her sorted out with a budget. Aunt Ellen called using an unfamiliar number to tell me how mean I was to her precious spoiled brat, and that my mother would have wanted her to have a perfect wedding. I hung up and blocked her mid-rant. Update my nightmare cousin is demanding I use my mother's inheritance money to pay for her luxurious wedding, and my aunt is manipulating me about. The wedding is off. The happy couple fought so much about the wedding plans they broke up. I talked to ex-fiancé last night. The story goes that they'd been fighting about the wedding costs for some time, and a big payment was due on the venue. They had to pay up or lose their initial deposit and booking. She wanted to pay without any idea where they were getting the rest. He wanted to cut their losses and lose the deposit. It all came to a big ugly head and he ended things entirely because she wouldn't back down. Hopefully, they stay broken up. I'm told they've broken up a few times before, so no guarantee this one sticks. Edit, I regret to inform you Courtney is back in my life and as absurd as ever. So it was a workday and I was waiting for a Zoom meeting with my intern. An unfamiliar account pops up in my personal room waiting room, so I assume it's my intern trying from some other account she has. Big mistake. Up pops the window and there is cousin Courtney with a big smile on her face acting like we're somehow speaking. Now you're probably going to tell me I should have instantly booted her, and you'd be right. I should have. Boredom and curiosity got the better of me, and I knew getting rid of her was only a click or two away. She flat out pretended we were on great terms and started making socially awkward small talk. I humored this for a bit before asking her why she'd contacted me. Well, her parents are having their 50th wedding anniversary coming up soon, and she wants to do something special for them. They've always wanted to go on a cruise, and she wants to send them on one. So she starts blathering on about the cruise she's picked out, how amazing it will be, dream come true and blah 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 rainbows. So what does this have to do with me? Well. She knows things have been tense between us and she. Thinks my donating to the cruise would be a great way to reconcile. There was a long sales pitch of nonsense short, she wanted $2,000 for me to fund this. Even worse, she mentioned others she'd been asking to donate and included her half-sister in the list. Her half-sister was laid off in March. 
Asking me is a pointless waste of time. Asking her half-sister is downright cruel. I told her this flat out. She whined a lot about how I just don't understand what it means to be married and how important celebrating that is. Around when she was working herself up into tears, my intern managed to send me a connection request. I was very firm that I wouldn't be donating, asked her not to contact me at work ever again, hung up on cousin Courtney, and had a lovely chat with my intern. I was admittedly a little baffled by cousin Courtney even wanting to give her parents an expensive gift. She's never been known for being generous. I decided to call my gossip monger uncle who always knows everything and ask what he knew about this. Turns out she was soliciting the whole family for donations, and she was planning on going on the cruise with them. Worse, since she lost so much money in deposits when she cancelled her wedding and something I didn't totally get involving an abandoned lease with the now ex since they're broken up, her gift was going to be planning everything. Everybody else donating was doing the paying for her dream cruise vacation with her parents. Suddenly the world makes perfect sense. Update, update 2, my nightmare cousin is demanding I use my mother's inheritance money to pay for her luxurious wedding, and my aunt is manipulating me about. Last we heard from cousin Courtney, she was trying to pull together a 50th wedding anniversary cruise for her parents, and her, and make me pay for a large chunk of it, despite the fact I had previously refused to help her with wedding donations. I wasn't down with that. She whined a lot about family and how important it is to celebrate a marriage that lasted this long. I blew her off. Well, hold on to your hats and glasses, Aunt Ellen and Uncle Dimwood aren't legally married. Uncle Dimwood is still legally married to the woman we all thought was his ex-wife and mother of cousin Courtney's half-sister, cousin Jessica. Yes, you read that right, they are having a 50th anniversary of having held a ceremony that was not a legal wedding and the groom is still to this day married to his ex-wife. This all came out because cousin Courtney apparently really was trying to send them, including her, on a cruise and found a cheaper option that was some kind of special deal for couples having a big anniversary. So she needed a copy of the marriage license. After a lot of awkwardness, they eventually had to admit they had none. The story goes that Uncle Dimwit's ex didn't want to go to the trouble of or pay for a divorce and he's too much of a dimwit to think to get one in absentia, so they just ignored that he was still married. He figured the ex would want to remarry one day and be willing to do the paperwork then. Aunt Ellen was in her we live in a commune and don't want the government in our lives flower child days, so had no objection to the wedding not being legal. Time passed and it never got handled. Nobody in the family ever knew. They thought they went to a real wedding. Pretty much everybody is really angry about being lied to for all these years. Cousin Courtney is completely thrown out of whack by this and fairly inconsolable, for once in my life I have some genuine sympathy for her. They've been lying to her for her whole life and it does actually have to be totally bewildering for her. I'm apparently still the black sheep because I should have somehow known and told Cousin Courtney. How the hell was I supposed to know this? Why would I have ever checked on their marital status? My entire life I was told they were married. I saw wedding pictures. There's also a weird side of Aunt Ellen blaming me for her finding out because it never would have happened if I'd just donated to the more expensive cruise in the first place. Luckily I've successfully ducked cousin Courtney and the rest having drama about all this. I only know they're mad from emails I'm not replying to and chats with gossip monger uncle. This is the plan going forward. Do not engage with crazy. My religious parents are forcing me to keep my baby even though it was the result of gang rope, so I'm contacting my aunt for help. My parents are religious nuts, and have forced this lifestyle onto me, their only child. I attend a private Catholic school, am forced to attend Mass every single Sunday, am forced to do Bible study and study scriptures, and it has pushed me very far away from religion. I am 14 years old, yet am given the responsibilities of an adult while given the freedoms of a three-year-old. I clean the house and do the dishes daily, all dishes, I do majority of the cooking, and the majority of the laundry too. Yet I am now allowed to do anything myself. I desperately want to join a gymnastics club, but my mother says seeing me in a gymnastic outfit would present his daughter as a SLT to the entire world, and my father also says no as he fears the outfit would tempt him. I have tried asking him to elaborate on what he means by this but he refuses to do so. I suppose you could say I have started a rebellious phase, which isn't even rebellion it's just me trying to do regular 14-year-old things like see my school friends outside of school. Well, my parents did not allow this, so I decided to sneak out, and I got caught. As my punishment, I was grounded for a month and forced to cook every meal and do all of the cleaning as well as the laundry. To be honest, I'm not even sure that my parents even love me at this point. Now on to the main problem. I have one friend who is not in my school, and about two months ago she told me she was going to have a get-together at her house with quite a few friends since her parents were not home for the day. I decided to risk it again and sneak out, and so I went out. I was successful and managed to get out, and when I got to the get-together I was ready to have a fun time. What I was not ready for, was to get ambushed by three guys in a bathroom alone and be roped for almost an hour straight. It was easily the most traumatic point of my life, and I went home without saying goodbye. I blocked my friend too. Five weeks later I threw up in the morning, and I threw up the next morning. I took a pregnancy test and I found out I was pregnant. This, on top of the trauma I was already facing from the rope was enough to sink me into a serious depression. 
my parents being rather abusive on a day-to-day -day basis did not help either. I thought about my pregnancy the night I found out there was a baby inside me, and I realized that there was no way I was ready to be a mother of rope baby at 14 and raise the baby in this cruel environment. I broached the subject with my parents the next day, and just as I expected, I was told no. My parents were actually more mad at the fact that I snuck out than they were horrified at what happened to their daughter. I ended up crying when my mother said I deserved what happened to me after I told them what outfit I wore, which was a sleeveless top and jeans. My parents told me there was no way they were going to let me have a termination, and so I hung my head low. Thankfully I found a solution. And that solution came in the form of my aunt. My aunt and I have never been very close due to the fact that she is not religious and my parents do not want to associate themselves with her for this reason. However, on the occasions I have messaged with her she seems very understanding, very supportive and wants to help me as soon as I turn 18 as I have expressed great interest in getting away from my parents as soon as I turn of legal age. Well now was the time I needed help, and so I contacted my aunt a week ago. I kept my conversations with her private and deleted WhatsApp which is how I talked to her afterwards each time, as my parents snooped my phone and I didn't want them to find out. My aunt and I have arranged a termination to happen in two days, and we have arranged that she is going to come pick me up in the middle of the night. I'm going to use any chance I have when I'm alone over the next two days to pack so I can get out as quickly and quietly as I can on the night. I'm really hoping I stay safe and my parents don't find me. Update my religious parents are forcing me to keep my baby even though it was the result of gang rope, so I'm contacting my aunt for help. So my aunt came and picked me up and I was very very glad that it went exactly as planned. The only hitch in the road came at the clinic when I was asked to give my parents' signature to consent to the procedure, but my aunt came through. She took the nurse who gave me the form to the side and talked with her for a few minutes, and the nurse came back looking very empathetic and borderline in tears, then proceeded to tell me that the form was a requirement. The procedure went fine and I'm very happy to say that I am no longer pregnant. My aunt ended up driving me five hours with all my stuff to come live with her which is where I am staying. My parents ended up contacting her to ask her if she had seen me, as they had reported me a missing person to the police the next day, and were going to try to make this a very serious issue if I did not return. My aunt told them she had not seen me, but then she talked to me. She asked me what I wanted to do, and maybe it was the wrong decision, but I told my aunt to tell my parents and asked her to please try to fight to adopt me legally. And my aunt did just that. To say my parents were angry would be an understatement. My aunt wasn't even on speaker, but being in a different room away from my aunt I was still able to hear my father yelling very unholy words. I was quite amused, hearing my mother and father both breaking down and yelling incoherently about how terrible my auntie and I are and about how we're going to hell. They even proceeded to call me a little ungrateful beach. My aunt was recording this conversation too, and I know this will not bode them well in court. My aunt has contacted lawyers and has begun the very first steps of trying to legally adopt me despite my parents doing everything they can to fight back, mostly just threats. They still don't know that each time they call to scream, yell and insult us, they are being recorded. It's something my aunt plans to dump on them last minute, and in my untrained not lawyer eyes, this could be a slam dunk victory when the time for the judge to make the decision comes. The police took my 11-year-old son and interrogated him for 16 hours straight without any food or water and didn't let us see or even speak to him. Last week at around 8.30 a.m. my son was taken out of class by the school's resource officer and led to the main office where four police officers carrying firearms and tasers were waiting for him. They then patted him down and took him handcuffed to the police station and began looking through his phone, emails, messages, everything. The biggest issue was that no one called us. Not the school, not the police, no one. We got a text from a friend of his who had our number asking us if he was still coming over after school since he left class early and had not come back yet, this was at 1 p.m. we called the school who only told us to call the police department as this wasn't a school issue anymore, and refused to even say where he was or what he was doing to get himself in trouble with the police. We start freaking out wondering where our son is or what happened to him, but my husband who's more level-headed, just tracked his phone and saw where he was and we headed there. We got there at maybe 1.30 and were completely stonewalled by everyone. No one told us anything at all, except that he's being investigated for conspiring to run into the school with a firearm and put this firearm to use. This is just insane, he doesn't do anything crazy and talks to us pretty openly about everything. He spends his time at school, with friends building forts or playing Nerf guns. We continued to demand to see our son, and called a friend of ours who works for the state as a social worker. She wasn't able to get down there or figure anything out until about 8 p.m. when she finally did, they tried to stonewall her too, and it took a lot of effort from her end to spin whatever she did in such a way that they finally released him. They only did this at 1 a.m. for the almost 12 hours we were there, they did not let us speak to our son or see him this entire time. We got him home and he told us everything. Apparently he and his friend were talking about the guns that they were gonna use later. These were in reference to his Nerf guns. They never spoke about running into schools and using firearms or anything. They were going to hunt creepers from their Minecraft game using a mod which allows for guns. When they finally let him go some effing imbecile in a fancy suit says, sorry, we received a credible report about a planned usage of firearms in school from a teacher and had to act. We've concluded he was talking about a video game with his friend and he's free to go, that's verbatim what he said. Throughout the interrogation, 
They kept offering him McDonald's, offering to give him soda and candy if he just told them where the firearms were or to draw out the plans and who was involved. They asked him if we drink, if we have any meds do weird things after smoking. They kept going through his phone and asking him where is this picture taken, or who was there. They questioned him for 16 hours without food or water even when he cried about how hungry and thirsty he was, and spent the whole time entirely invading his and our privacy on the phone and didn't let us see or talk to him. The school is refusing to talk to us at all other than they graciously said he is okay to come back to school once they finish speaking to the police, maybe. We can't get answers if he is suspended or if he can even go to school and the police department keeps telling us the issue is closed and hangs up on us. What the hell do we do? Ilian Murphy stole my girlfriend. It all started when we watched Batman Begins. I was interested for the plot and Christian Bale but she found Scarecrow to be so much better than Bruce Wayne. Yes, the deformed villain was hotter to her than billionaire playboy Bruce Wayne. She said girls always found villains hotter than heroes and I was making a huge fuss over it. Okay, true but it's Christian Bale for God's sake. Days later, I catch her watching Batman Begins again and says she wasn't really paying attention to the plot and wanted to understand it better. The plot to her was Killian Murphy in a seductive voice. I didn't get the big appeal when Bale was right there, but whatever, you do you. We usually watch movies when she comes over and she insists on picking the movie one day. I say, fine, as long as it's not Batman Begins, thinking her obsession was only caused because of that movie. She puts on this thriller movie called Red Lights. Cool, I love thriller movies and then Killian Murphy shows up. I'm sensing a pattern but I quietly observe her reactions when he's on screen. She's giggling, blushing, kicking her feet, the whole shebang whenever he appears. And she absolutely loses it during that classroom scene with Murphy and Elizabeth Olsen where he gets caught staring at her and she repeats over and over I would have folded with no shame. Like, hello? Your boyfriend is right here. It takes me a minute to realize she's repeating the scene and squealing like a schoolgirl. Her whole face is red by this point and she's just rolling on the bed giggling excitedly. It doesn't end there though. She starts watching Peaky Blinders just for Killian Murphy. It's one thing to watch a movie for an actor but a six-season show is downright insane. She soon forgets I exist and replaces the photo widget she had of me with Killian Murphy. That's when she crossed a line. Simping over Murphy I understand but he doesn't get to replace me on her phone like that. Then, Oppenheimer comes out and I never hear the end of it. My girlfriend is a math slash science person and she's never had any interest in history but now that her man, as she's been referring to him for the past week, is starring in this three-hour movie about an atomic bomb, she just has to see it. She says it's a good way to catch up on her history but we all know the real reason. But fine, we go see it in theaters and she's so excited the entire time. Seriously, I've never seen her so happy before. So now I'm an idiot who's indulged his girlfriend's obsession with Killian Murphy for too long and now I'm second to him. But it doesn't end there, because why would it end there? Why did nobody warn me about the nudity in this movie? Her jaw drops seeing him naked and going to pound town and the words are on the tip of her tongue, I can practically hear her say, that should have been me, so I lean over and whisper in the pettiest tone I could muster and tell her, just F him. She gets embarrassed and starts giggling nervously while hitting my arm softly saying, babe, no. What? No, but by her tone it was so obvious she was saying I would if I could. Anyway, we all know Christian Bale is better so count your days Killian Murphy. Called off my wedding after sister-in-law shaved my beard in my sleep. My fiancé Lexi and I are a happy couple of six years and engaged for one or so I thought. My fiancé's sister Sally, has always been hostile towards me and would rarely speak to me and when she did it would be because her parents were around. Sally is Lexi's rock because she got her through a tough time during college and since then Lexi has told Sally everything about everything. We've had problems with this in the past due to her telling Sally personal things about my childhood I'd only told a few people. Which led to us not speaking for three months during the virus when she'd only leave our room for food and to go to the toilet, and recently we hadn't had an argument in a year plus until three nights ago she mentioned that she'd like me to shave my beard. I have a very thick beard that I've been growing for eight years and I'm very proud. So of course I told Lexi I wouldn't be shaving my beard to which she stormed off to the kitchen and slammed her wine glass into the sink smashing it and a plate in the process. It was a very clear overreaction on her part. I immediately stood up and asked what the f she was doing, she then spun around and screamed that I'm a selfish a-hole because I won't shave my beard and ran to our bedroom and slammed the door. I ended up sleeping on the couch and woke up at around 4am to Sally with a razor trying to shave my beard so I pushed her off me. Lexi then ran to check on Sally whilst I was looking at the big patch Sally had taken out of my beard, then I went upstairs and packed a bag whilst Lexi shouted at me for hurting Sally. I told her to f off and that the wedding was off and drove an hour to my parents' house where I've been staying since the incident. Earlier today I got a text from Sally saying I was selfish for not shaving my beard because when I go down on Lexi it feels weird I haven't replied to her. My family thinks I should break off the relationship but her family said I should just shave it all and move on. So what should I do and am I wrong? Edit, I've now got as of typing 99 plus text slash calls from Lexi saying things like don't leave, let's have intimacy one more time and I'm pregnant she's trying to baby trap me. Lexi messaged me more weird things miss me and I'll take the baby too which I didn't understand until Sally messaged me saying Lexi is in hospital being treated after a SU side attempt. I don't believe it at all, I've blocked Sally's number now. I called the police and showed evidence of her suicidal messages so she hopefully will be getting checked into an institution. Lexi's aunt, who is the only person on her side that agrees with me, just called me to tell me Lexi has been checked into a psychiatric unit for two weeks. I've filed a police report on Sally for salt, and I'm in the process of cancelling the wedding venue. I'm back at the house. 
I've had a locksmith change the locks just in case. The wedding venue can't be refunded but it was going to be paid by her parents anyway so I don't care. I've also contacted my lawyers. Good riddance. After 30 years of frustration, I discovered this insane hack and slept with a man 20 years younger than me and had the best intimacy of my life. I could have never imagined that just a couple drops of something as simple as oil could transform me from a shy housewife into a ravenous cougar capable of sleeping with men built like Greek gods. I had been married to my husband for almost 40 years, and after four kids and two grandkids, my life completely changed. I had never been very happy in my marriage. My husband and I met when we were very young, and our parents forced us to get married after he got me pregnant. We had an extremely traditional marriage. I stayed home and took care of the kids, and he went to work. Our intimacy life was just as traditional, in all the years that we were together. We only really had intimacy to be able to have children, not for pleasure, at least not for mine. The intimacy had been so unfulfilling for so long that eventually, I just gave up on ever experiencing a full orc small I wish I could go back in time and tell my younger self about this hack, it would have transformed my life to be able to actually experience arousal and feel effortlessly desired. There were many times when I felt myself halfway there, but my husband would just stop. That's how I ended up nearly 58 years old without ever having known what it felt like to climax fully. You might think of me as some awful, selfish person, but after my husband died, I remember thinking about how he had never given me a full org SM as they lowered his coffin into the grave. He had been a mediocre man, and I thought about how he had gone a lifetime without giving me the simplest thing. My children had always been closer to me than my husband, so after he died, they focused more on supporting me rather than their own grief. A couple of months after my husband passed away, my closest friend, Marsha, took me on a vacation to Cancun. It was an incredibly healing trip and Marsha was very emotionally supportive and attentive. She basically spent the entire trip letting me vent to her, and I unloaded all my feelings about how I had been a housewife my entire life, and now that that wasn't my identity anymore, I felt like I didn't know who I was. When we got to our gorgeous Airbnb, Marsha cracked open a bottle of wine, and we sat on the balcony, just staring at the view as I kept talking about my insecurities. We spoke about my marriage and my life up until that point for the entire flight to Mexico. I vented to Marsha about how I felt like I had zero relationship with my own sexuality, and I ended up admitting to her that I had never had an orc small Marsha seemed shocked, she knew that my marriage had been unfulfilling, but I guess that a woman my age never experiencing climax was unbelievable. We were tipsy at that point, and as soon as I revealed my secret, Marsha stood straight up and told me to go put my hottest outfit on. She said she didn't want to hear another word and that we were going out and getting me laid. At first, I burst out laughing, thinking that my friend was joking, but when I finished laughing, it was obvious that Marsha was dead serious. I decided to follow her directions and put on my favorite black bodycon dress. We finished off the bottle of wine and decided to walk to the downtown area where we were staying. I watched groups of young travelers slurring, stumbling, and kissing in the streets and thought of my own youth, and how I wasted it. Before we got to the first bar, I knew tonight was my night to make up for a lifetime of being an obedient housewife. That night I decided I was just another, intoxicated, horny tourist. Marika and I sat at the bar, and to my surprise, she immediately ordered two rounds of tequila shots. I had never been much of a party girl, but I knew that night was different, and I took the shots with glee. The next thing you know, Marsha and I were plastered, just sitting at the bar giggling and ogling all of the hot young guys around us. Since I had been married basically my entire life, I never really got in the habit of checking men out. But that night, I felt like an animal, there were so many delicious men in that same bar, and I felt myself starting to get excited. Marsha noticed me checking out this one guy and started telling me to go over and talk to him. Yet I immediately shut her down. I was intoxicated but not that intoxicated, there was no way that a young guy like that would be attracted to an old lady like me. Therefore, you can imagine how floored I was when someone tapped my shoulder, and I turned around to see an even hotter young guy smiling at me. He introduced himself as Matthias and said that he was visiting Cancun from his home country, Greece. He had thick dark hair and olive skin, he was much taller than me, and it was obvious that he worked out. As gorgeous as he was, the first thing I noticed about him was that he looked like he was in his early 20s. He told me that I was by far the most beautiful woman he had seen since landing in Mexico and that it would be his honor to buy me a drink. I glanced over to Marsha, who had this mischievous smile on her face, and she nodded her head eagerly. I decided to take up his offer, and he bought me and Marsha two more rounds of drinks. We hung out with him for a little while, and I could tell he was flirting with me. He kept putting his hand on my thigh and around my shoulder. At one point, he even gave me a kiss on the cheek and tucked a piece of my hair behind my ear. The man was driving me wild, but I was old enough to be his mother. I figured I had no chance with him, no matter how flirty he was acting. A couple of other guys with thick hair like Matthias called to him across the bar, and he signaled back at them. He told me that it looked like his friends were moving on to the next bar, but he didn't want his night to end without me. At first, I just thought he was leaning in, to give me a goodbye hug, but when he didn't turn his head, I realized he was coming in for a kiss. He leaned down and gave me a deep, sensual kiss, and I went weak in the knees. My husband had never touched me like that. When he pulled away, he put a little piece of paper in my hand and reminded me again that he didn't want his night to end without me. I had stars in my eyes, I didn't tell him yes or no, just maybe, after all, I was still nervous. Part of me felt like an old lady out of her depth. Marsha and I were both wasted at that point, and when I turned back to her, 
she immediately said go. I just laughed. I told her that the attention was nice, but there was no way I could feel comfortable enough to actually have intimacy with a stranger, let alone such a young guy. Marsha literally grabbed me by the shoulder and shook me, asking me if I was really going to let this opportunity go to waste. I told her that I was just too nervous. I asked her how I was supposed to enjoy intimacy while feeling nervous, but all she said was, I'm glad you asked. That's when she reached into her bag and pulled out this little dropper bottle, it was even labeled awaken arousal on it. I had never seen anything like it before. Through slurred words, Marsha explained to me that she used it when she was getting back into the dating scene herself. She said that after she divorced her husband, she couldn't get comfortable with another man without a little help and had been using this, but tonight it was all mine. I tried rejecting it but she practically threw the bottle into my hand. I figured it must be some type of arousal supplement, and in my Dr. Nken state, all I could do was finally giggle and put the bottle into my own purse. We got another round and then headed back to our Airbnb. Marsha was more of a doctor Nker than me, and as I put her to bed, she literally grabbed me by the face and pulled me close just to say, call him. Afterward, I poured myself one more glass of wine and sat on the balcony all on my own. As I stared at the gorgeous view, I pulled out the piece of paper with Matthias's number as well as the awaken arousal oil. I stared at the number on the paper and said F it and placed the bottle on the bed. The next half hour felt like a blur, and before I knew it, I was watching Matthias walk up to my Airbnb. I hadn't had romantic butterflies in my stomach since I was a little girl, and my heart pounded as I let him in. The second I let Matthias into my room, he grabbed my face with two hands. He was so much stronger and seductive than my husband ever had been, and I melted into his arms. I showed the bottle to him and he immediately understood what to do. He put the oil on his fingers, and I felt the oil working away the last of my anxiety as he explored my body with his hands. His touches felt just right, with just the right balance of gentleness and control. He laid me down on the bed, and slowly pulled my dress off as he complimented me in both English and Greek. I had goosebumps as he slipped my panties off, my body ached for him. I had never wanted a man so badly. Matthias started giving me head, and only about a minute in, I felt a brand new sensation creeping up on me. At first, I thought I needed to pee, but before I could determine the feeling, I was hit with overwhelming waves of pleasure, one after another. I knew this was it. I was finally having a full-on ORGSM. My legs went numb, and I shook with every wave of euphoria that came on. Matthias talked me through the entire thing, egging me on and calling me a good girl afterward. Even though we had met that same night, it was like our bodies had known each other for years. As soon as we got down to it, I knew I had made the right choice, not only to call him but to trust the awaken arousal oil. I never would have had the confidence to go ahead without it, and I certainly wouldn't have been so physically relaxed through the whole thing, if not for that. Matthias made love to me all night, and I ended up losing count of how many times I climaxed. It felt like losing a second virginity, and I couldn't believe an old woman like me could have such a wild, uninhibited night with a younger man. I invited him over every night before Marsha and I flew home, and each time, I took a couple of drops of the oil before he arrived, and the intimacy only got better and better. I don't think I would have ever discovered this wild part of myself without the help of Marsha and Matthias and how they truly reawakened the arousal within me. Bridesmaid tried on wedding gowns during bride's dress appointment. My best friend Gina got married in November 2022. I was her mo, and she had four bridesmaids. One of them was Kelly, her future sister-in-law. Gina started dating her now husband Greg in high school, and they'd been together for eight years by the time he proposed. Kelly, on the other hand, had been with Greg's older brother Paul for 10 years, with no sign of getting married anytime soon. Gina had her first, and only, wedding dress appointment only four months before the wedding. Those present were me, Kelly, another bridesmaid and her younger sister. Before we got started, Gina asked me if I wanted to try on dresses with her, since I was also engaged. To anyone else this might have seemed like a fun offer for her best friend and fellow bride-to-be. But it was actually because I was pregnant. I was less than two months along, and only told Gina to let her know I'd be close to my third trimester during her wedding. I significantly postponed my own wedding due to my pregnancy, still not married, and she knew I wouldn't start looking for a gown until long after my baby was born, so she wanted me to try on dresses before I started showing. I was extremely thankful, but declined. Gina's appointment was only 90 minutes long and she had her own dress to find. We all figured that was the end of it, and went to help Gina pick some dresses to try on. While we were near the racks, I noticed that the dresses Kelly was picking up and showing us were a lot different than the ones we were looking for. Gina was interested in simple, sheathed dresses with spaghetti straps or short sleeves, but most of the ones Kelly was going for were strapless A-line dresses and ball gowns. We tried to remind her that wasn't what we were supposed to be looking for, but she insisted on adding some of those dresses to the rack with the ones we were picking up anyway. Gina started trying on the dresses we'd found. We took pictures, gave our opinions, and discussed each of them with our consultant. At some point, Kelly excused herself and didn't come back for almost 15 minutes. We were so focused on Gina that we didn't even notice how long she was gone. And we really didn't notice that she'd taken one of the dresses she picked up with her. And then, 40 minutes into the appointment, in walks Kelly. And I think you all know where this is going. To her credit, she looked great. It really was a pretty wedding dress. Strapless, had a corset bodice, a tulle skirt, a beaded sweetheart neckline and a sweet train. 
and as we later found out, the reason she had taken so long was because she had to find another consultant to help her get into not only the dress itself, but also two petticoats to get the ball gown look. Kelly paraded in front of us with a huge smile on her face, spinning around, going on about how much she loved that white, sorry, ivory, dress and how she felt like such a princess, before smugly asking, do you guys like it? We sat there for a moment in absolute shock. Gina's sister looked like she was about to blow up on Kelly. I could tell Gina was upset, but she has both a BA in public relations and the consequential skill of not embarrassing herself or other people in public. Fortunately, I have neither, so I was the first to open my mouth. I started by asking why she was trying on a wedding dress, and Kelly had the nerve to chuckle and say, uh, what do you mean? Gina said you could try on dresses with her, it's not my fault you said no. Why can't I do it too? So said, as annoyingly and condescendingly as I could, oh, so you're engaged too? My bad, I had no idea. At that, Kelly looked nervous. Everyone was staring at her. After a moment, she sheepishly confessed she wasn't actually engaged. The consultant that had helped her turned to her shocked, saying, you said you were getting married in three months. She tried to give us excuses, she was almost engaged, it was just one. Dress, it wasn't fair that I could try on dresses and not her, but it was done. Everyone at the boutique, bridal party and staff alike, was already pissed. After almost five minutes of that, Kelly finally asked someone to help her out of the dress. Once that was done, she took a seat as distant from the other bridesmaids as possible and didn't say a word for the rest of the appointment. The consultant must have apologized to Gina a dozen times. Kelly never did. Gina did end up finding her dress that day, so we considered the appointment a success. Kelly wasn't dropped as a bridesmaid, mostly because neither Gina or Greg wanted to upset Paul, but remained aloof and unpleasantly snarky up until the wedding. Even though I was the mo, Kelly decided to avoid me as much as possible for embarrassing her the way I did. She didn't find out I was pregnant until the rehearsal dinner. It was at that dinner that she told the bridal party that she was going to give Paul an ultimatum, if he didn't propose to her that month, she'd dump him. A week after the wedding, he dumped her. No one was surprised. Gina and Greg are still happily married, and she is now very open about how angry she got that day. That being said, we both love telling this story. My family is pressuring me to give my good-for-nothing sister my wedding venue because she needs it more and is pregnant. My fiancé and I have been together for eight years and engaged for three. I was doing my PhD program and was juggling planning the wedding. My fiancé took much of that work, but it was perfect because our dream venue was booked till after my graduation. So what we did is book our dream venue three years in advance. It is really a beautiful venue. The only slot we got was September of this year. My sister got engaged a few months ago. They were planning on having a spring wedding next year. They had no venue lined up, but had a few vendors lined up as well as a set date. Yesterday our parents invited us and our so backslashes to a family barbecue, where my sister announced to our extended family that she is expecting. Everyone was so happy for her and my brother-in-law. My nan asked my sister if the wedding was still on the set date or if they were going to wait, because of the baby. She said no, that she hoped to move it to September. We don't have many out-of-town guests so they could attend both weddings no problem. Nan was happy and asked sister if she needed help planning such a short-notice wedding. My sister then turned around and said that's what I wanted to talk to you about. I was really really hoping we could kinda like take your venue? I really cannot stress myself too much with planning a wedding while going to maternity classes. And I think it is so beautiful. It would really mean a lot to me. It went silent. But everyone was looking at me expecting me to say yes of course everything for my little sister. My brother-in-law looked very uncomfortable and told her that they had talked about this and that it was not okay to put me on the spot. But my sister just said don't be like that. My sister wants to do what's best for me so it's no big deal right? Definitely trying to guilt trip me into saying yes. I just said well it kind of is. I don't know. I have my heart. Really set on the venue cue the crying. She stormed off. Nan told me that I was being selfish because she needed the venue more than I did. I tried to defend myself and my mother said you waited three years. Would it have killed you to wait a few more months? When has your sister ever asked you for something? A few comments later my fiancé got really mad and we left. My sister called me crying and said that it was unfair that I always get what I want and that I could have done this one thing for her. Dad said it is just a venue and what matters is the person who you are marrying. He is kind of right but we have been planning for so long. My fiancé is furious with my family and doesn't even want my sister to come. Now my family is threatening not to come because I am being selfish and my sister needs it more than me because having a baby is too stressful. My brother-in-law called me and apologized for the inconvenience. He told me he had discussed it with my sister and she had told him she would not ask. He is properly mad at her now and warned me that my sister is blaming me for potentially ruining her marriage. My father has sent me about five texts along the lines of I hope you are happy your sister hasn't stopped crying since yesterday. What's really unfair is how quick they all took her side. My fiancé and I have decided to boot my sister from the bridal party and replace her with my aunt who is the only family member that took my side. We have not decided whether or not we will invite my family as a whole. Furthermore my mom took it upon herself to tell on us. 
she called Fiancé's parents and told them that it would be best if my sister gets it because she is pregnant and preeclampsia runs in the family. Whatever that means. My future father-in-law told them to F off and basically ripped my mom a new one for expecting something so ridiculous and that they were going to lose me if they kept playing favorite. So my mom is now crying too and saying that my father-in-law is an SS. Playing the victim sure runs in my family. This is just getting so pathetic. It seems straight out of a bad soap opera. My in-laws are driving to us currently with some supper and wine and basically told me to not worry and that no matter what happens that they will be my safety net. I cried of happiness. My sister saw this post and she lost her mind. She accused me of painting her like a loony and misinterpreting facts. But let's be honest, she was acting like a loony. She said that I was being unfair. That she is family and that she asked nicely because she loves me. She also underlines the fact that the opinion of internet strangers doesn't count because family is more important and I should focus on making my family happy. The only text I sent back was this. I'm sorry that you perceived it that way. I did not in any way distort what happened. As you might notice I didn't describe your tone nor exaggerated anything. Perhaps you had that night differently in your mind than I do, but I digress. I am sick and tired of bending to your will. My whole life I have been your servant and your doormat. Remember all the birthdays I had to share with you because you would throw a tantrum because you didn't get presents? Or when you cried so that I would fill out job applications for you? But the thing that has hurt me most till now is when you ruined my graduation. I am done. I admit that I also spoiled you but I will not any longer. If you want to marry so badly before your baby is born then you could look at, Hotel X, that offers last minute weddings. I have spent too much time planning my wedding to give it to you. And if you want to ruin our relationship over this then go ahead. I will sleep safe and sound knowing that it wasn't my fault. She only sent me wow. You must love me so very much and blocked me. She unblocked me this morning to send me a screenshot of her talking to my wedding planner, hello dear, I got the message from. Your mother and will proceed with the rebooking of the venue on the spot. However this will have extra costs as we have to change the names on the contract. Please come by my office tomorrow so we can sign a new contract. Sister, that's great. I'll be there at 9. My parents haven't actually written to me since the thing with my father-in-law. My older brother contacted me and wanted to know what happened because he got a weird story from mom and dad. Mom had told him that I had offered previous to the barbecue to give up the venue to my sister and that I humiliated her. I told him what really happened and he had no problem believing me. We talked a lot about our parents' behavior and he confessed that him moving was partly due to our parents being poop heads to us. He told me that mom had gotten wind from the post and was mad at me for betraying my family. I haven't written to my parents because I have to come to terms with the fact that they love my sister more than me, if they love me at all. At the wedding, we sat together and put passwords with the majority of our vendors and also with the venue directly. We haven't talked to our planner yet which is why the text message exchange with my sister worries me so much, also we cancelled the catering that my parents paid for. With such short notice, we won't be able to get a full catering like we wanted to. But all our friends and my fiancé's family will help us prepare a buffet, and everyone is going to chip in. That will be our bachelor party. As we will have to spend more on our food now we cancelled our bachelor parties and we'll have a family and friends cooking session. Thank you again for helping me see how toxic my family is. I will try to sort it out. If they apologize from the bottom of their heart they will be allowed into my wedding but if not I still have my brother, who will be walking me down the aisle, and my aunt. We eventually got to calling my planner and she was actually really horrified. She told me she had never talked to my mother since the day we went to book the venue. She assured me that even if they were to call and say that I wanted it, I had to be present to make any changes. So we informed everyone that will work for us on our wedding and they offered to hire security for that day at a reduced price. A nine-year-old sister was sent to boarding school but never came back. Plus update. Up until about seven months ago, I lived with my mom, dad, and my little sister. My sister is no longer here, she's in boarding school. We are not bad kids, we're half white, half Asian, when my grandpa got sick four years ago we moved here so my dad can take care of him. Me and my sister worked hard to learn the language, despite her age, she actually caught on better than me and I was so impressed with her. The issue began with grandma, she would really look down on my sister and I love my sister and didn't like it one bit. My mom said it's cultural and I shouldn't make a fuss but it was hard when grandma really started making it obvious, she got me clothes, games, etc., but my sis got no attention. Four years ago, we lived with grandpa and grandma. In that time of me getting spoiled, my sister got reprimanded for everything she did, I swear, it was super unfair you wouldn't believe. Just under a year ago grandpa passed and my parents decided we'd stay here since I already speak and read pretty fluently. Grandma spoke to everyone about how rude and unladylike my sister is and my parents went along with it when I completely think that's wrong. Seven months ago her and grandma went out and my parents said she'd be at boarding school for the summer just the summer. After three months I got anxious and asked when she'd be back and my dad ended up crying at the question, I was talked to by my dad and he said she loved boarding school so much she didn't want to come back yet. Like? Is that how boarding school works? I don't think so, maybe I've been watching too much TV or reading too much Reddit, but we're in another country and I swear what they were doing was emotional abuse. Still, it got worse, after five months, I still hadn't gotten any contact, no message, no letters, nothing, 
and that's when my dad started making her room into his office space. We actually got into a big fight over it and I ended up with more chores, but he never answered why he was doing it if she'd be back soon. It's now been seven months since that car trip that took my sister away and the final nail in the coffin hit. I was looking through the attic for my mom and found a box with some of her old stuff, including her phone. Why wouldn't she have her phone? I really just want to know if there's anything I can do, no one will tell me which boarding school she's at, I'm told not to worry about it because I'm a child. I know I'm too young to do much but if there's anything I can do, please help. When I think about it I can't stop remembering the way my mom cried that day. It makes me shiver, I've been imagining the worst and I'd hate it if it ended up being something horrible I imagined. Update I was able to get in touch with a few different sources, the least favorite of which was a phone call towards those that help find traffic children. I knew my family would be investigated and actually went to meet up with another family at that time, so basically, a Redditor close to my age met with me and she had already shown my story to her family. They ended up letting me stay with them for a bit and made the proper calls to make sure it wasn't illegal, I actually even specified that I wasn't running from home, and I'd come back after the investigation. It didn't sit so well with authorities and I was actually forced to go back home, but it only got stranger from there. I went back home to a completely empty house, even grandma was gone, so I was allowed to stay with the other family for the time being. They were extremely kind, for a week I didn't get any news and, bless her mother's heart but I was told I had a home here no matter the results. So, a few days after a week had passed, I got a call and it turns out they found my sister. My family had been taken in for questioning and were placed in holding for quite a while, I'm not sure why they didn't tell me this immediately though. I don't actually know the full story, but my sister was living close to 700 kilometers away. Nearly a whole day's drive, it wasn't summer school, or boarding school, or anything like that my dad sold her to get married. At 9. She was effing 9 years old and he sold her to some effing stranger. My mom was off the hook because I still needed a parent and she wasn't in on it until it was a decent way in. My dad and grandma have been arrested though and I'm back living with my mom and sister now. I'm still in contact with the Redditor that let me stay with her and I'll forever be grateful, I have no idea what would have happened if I was around when authorities came knocking. She's my angel. On a more depressing note, my sister doesn't speak much, but she seemed to cheer up after I let her read my post. She said she felt abandoned and alone, among other things, but seeing how I and plenty of strangers gave their hearts for her made her very happy so thank you all. This isn't over by a long shot, there's still things that are going to happen, but I have my sister, and that's all thanks to Reddit. Thank you. My mother's best friend has been hitting on me a lot recently and she is super hot. But I have a girlfriend. So I am 19 years old and I met my mother's best friend for the first time a few months ago when she came over to our house, and one of the very first things she said to me is, I would go for you in an instant if I was 20 years younger, I laughed it off thinking it was some sort of joke and told her I'm flattered, but I hate to break her heart and let her know that I have a girlfriend. She laughed it off too and I thought that was that. We exchanged more small talk and she then commented about how good my forearms look. I thanked her for the compliment and my mother came back from the toilet at that moment so I left the sitting room and let them do whatever. However, I'm now certain that despite me being 20 years younger than she is, she is very much interested in getting into bed with me. She has been visiting my house a lot recently, and in a weird way it's almost as if my mother knows she wants to sleep with me and is trying to help her out. My mother always finds a way to leave us alone, and without fail every time her best friend says something with some intimate undertone. One of the times this happened she made a remark about being able to see my abs throughout the compression shirt I was wearing and that my girlfriend is a lucky woman. She then followed that statement up by showing off how long her tongue is by touching her nose with it. I don't know if this woman knows but touching your nose with your tongue isn't exactly riz. Either way, she has done the following things which make me suspect she is into me, she has brushed by me in a way where my manhood ends up pressing against her behind, she has tried to take my hands into hers while talking to me, she has taken many photos of us and has kissed my cheek in one of them as well as wrapped her arm around my chest in another. One of the times we were alone she decided to eat a banana in a very slow manner in front of me, and the last time she came over she decided to throw all her subtleness out the window. I went downstairs to get a drink and conveniently my mother decided she needed to go toilet for a few minutes there and then. My mother's best friend was wearing very tight jeans, and she asked me if I thought her butt has been growing as she has been hitting the gym recently, and she proceeded to stand up and turn around and hit a pose, placing her behind a few feet away from me. I told her sure, and she blushed and giggled like a little girl. That happened a week ago, and just today my mother surprised me by booking me and her a two-day getaway in Paris, her favorite city, so me and her could celebrate her birthday. I was overjoyed with this, and then my mother broke the news that her best friend was also going because in her words, she wanted to celebrate her birthday in her favorite place with her two favorite people. Here's the thing, my mother's best friend is unbelievably attractive, and in amazing shape. Despite being a mother and almost 40, she is somehow very toned and lean, and I have seen her in a bikini once as we have a swimming pool and she came over for a swim once. I know she wants to do something with me during this getaway to Paris, but I have a girlfriend and I don't think I have an interest in doing anything, despite how attractive she may be. However, I have talked to my friends and they say I would be an idiot to pass up the opportunity. Update my mother's best friend has been hitting on me a lot recently and she is super hot. But I have a girlfriend. So the trip to Paris came and went and I think I have come out of the trip more traumatized than I have ever been. So technically I ended up hooking up with my mother's best friend. But it wasn't exactly like that. So our first night there went well. We went out to get some food and get some drinks, and of course the best friend tried to make some hints, even going as far as offering to come into her room while she was changing so I could help her pick her outfit. She also shamelessly asked me to come into her room so I could see for myself how comfortable her mattress is. I think she had completely given up on being subtle by this point. 
As for my mother, she was either completely oblivious to her best friend hitting on me, or she was not doing anything at all to stop it. I never talked to her about it though as that is a conversation that is way too weird to have with my mother. The canon event of this holiday happened on the second day we were there, which was my mother's birthday. My mother has been to Paris a lot and she has a distinct restaurant there which she loves more than any other restaurant in the world, so we went to get dinner there. Afterwards, we proceeded to go out for the night. Despite being near 40, my mother still has an animal party side to her and she loves to go out and dance, she is a free spirit I suppose. So we went out, and things were going well. I was dancing with my mother when my mother's best friend interrupted and took my hand away from my mother's and started to dance a bit. I was under the influence by this point and so I didn't care much for it. I danced away. She then tried to turn around and get me to hold her hips but I stopped her, and told her I was going to sit down on the other end of the club for a minute as the loud music was hurting my ears. A few minutes later my mother's friend came up to me with a drink saying she bought one for me and asked me how my ears were. I thanked her and drank it and I remember nothing else. All I do remember however, is waking up still very drowsy and disoriented to what happened and feeling my mother's best friend's hands everywhere. Before I could even say anything I felt her mouth going there. I could barely feel anything, and I wasn't even sure if this was actually happening as I was so out of it. I stayed silent most of the time and eventually she ended up getting on me, and she did it until I nut which took around 15 minutes. Could have been more or less, I do not know. What I do know is that I never resisted and never put up a fight, but I felt very weak and could barely even move my body at all, so even if I wanted to have I would have struggled to get her off. I asked my mother and best friend what happened last night and they said I was dancing and then went limp and passed out on my mother, so they called a cab, went back to the hotel and put me to sleep. They said nothing else, and I didn't ask any further questions. I'm now back home and I texted my girlfriend saying the trip was good, and she asked me as a joke if my mother's best friend had tried anything. I said no. I suppose this makes me a victim however, and I'm not sure how comfortable I feel around my mother's best friend now, but I suppose I can just put it out of my mind and get on with it. Date 2, my mother's best friend has been hitting on me a lot recently and she is super hot. But I have a girlfriend. So I have talked to my friends about the situation and told them no matter how much I try to laugh the whole thing off and go on with life without saying anything to anyone, I'm finding it hard to do so. Their advice was less than helpful, and the general consensus of them all was that I should be thankful a goddess like my mother's friend decided to do that to me. In their words, I got to just lie there, get a nut off by a super hot woman, not tell my girlfriend and basically obtain a get out of jail free card because my mother's friend decided to substance me. This hurt a lot and I told my friends I needed some time to think. I did not broach the subject with my mother, and I figured that my girlfriend deserved to know what happened first. The next time I came over to hers I asked her if we could sit down and talk then I told her my account of what happened. I did not cry or show much emotion, I just told her that I never wanted any of that happen and I had zero intention of doing anything with her and what happened really has traumatized me. My girlfriend's response was to tell me to leave because she needed to think about it. She ended up giving me a call a few hours later to ask me why I thought it was okay for me to dance with her in the first place, and I asked her if that was seriously her takeaway from what happened here. She asked it again and I told her I was just dancing with my mother's friend, there was nothing inappropriate and when she turned around to seduce me I excused myself, but my girlfriend refused to take this. Furthermore, she stated that the fact while my mother's friend was on me during the night I never tried to push her off makes her see it as cheating. I told her she literally doctor get me and borderline roped me, but according to my girlfriend because I was conscious I should have pushed her off, and even though I explained to her I literally did not have the strength to do so and was still disoriented, she still said she saw this as cheating and could not continue the relationship. This hurt, especially because I have been with her for 4 years and we have survived much bigger storms in the relationship, and I have in the past forgiven her for doing more than this too. Seeing as I was now out of the relationship, I figured that when life gives me lemons I should make lemonade, and so I sent my mother's best friend a text asking her to meet up and talk about something. There was a part of me that thought about actually just sleeping with her, but I decided against it. When we met up, I confronted her on what she did. I said I knew all about it and detailed to her that what she did not only traumatized me, but it also cost me my relationship as my girlfriend believed that what happened was consensual and it was cheating. I also told her I am no feel, this was without a doubt a case of me getting Dr. Ged and roped. However, despite all this I mentioned I was not going to accuse her publicly or spread rumors about it or anything. I'm not a malicious person who will do things in revenge. I told her that what she did was disgusting, and she was lucky I was as cool-headed and calm as I was, because if she tried that with the wrong person it could have very well ended up with her in the ER. We left this meetup on terms that she would never try anything with me again and she is not to make any attempts to reconcile nor say anything to my mother as I will do so myself if I ever feel like it. I discovered that my fiancé has been contacting my arpist father and plans to secretly invite him to our wedding. My father started roping me when I was 12 years and did it on a monthly or so basis until I was 14. The only reason he stopped is because CPS was called, but unfortunately they were not able to take me away as my father never left marks or bruises on me, and there was genuinely no evidence of rope. He also threatened me to say nothing was going on and do my best to sound convincing, and so out of fear I did. When they let me stay with him he stopped roping me, but he resorted to other forms of abuse, and continued this until I moved out at 18. I found a cheap apartment in another state, and I left for this state the day I became legal and enrolled in the cheapest college I could find. I also had found a job in this state just a week before leaving, so thankfully I was kind of set. I cut all contact with my father too. It was a community college that I met my fiancé. He was charming, tall and handsome, 
and something about his calm and accepting aura made me confide in him during one of our study sessions. He was appalled and held me for a long time after I got all that off my chest. He was the only person I have ever told besides my best friend, and we are now engaged. We dated until we finished college and were together for three years by that point, and he engaged a few months after. The wedding is now four months away and I cannot wait. I thought my fiancé truly has no flaws, his three-incher could be regarded as a problem but he knows how to use it so it's not as bad as it sounds. As far as my abusive father goes, my fiancé has been nothing but supportive, has never chimed in with an unwanted opinion or even hinted at the fact I should forgive my father or resume any form of contact. That's what made my discovery even more shocking, because I truly never saw it coming. This was something I feared when I first told him, but over the years he was so supportive I never in my wildest dreams considered this a possibility. My fiancé was asleep and so I took his phone to look up a clothing item because mine had died. The temptation of Instagram reels got the better of me and I scrolled for a few minutes indulging in relationship cat memes, getting totally lost in the cat's dancing and forgetting all about what I was using his phone for. Just as I was about to exit the app, I saw a familiar name send him a message. I could only see the first name at first, and it happened to be my dad's. I was thinking there was no way, and so I got off the app and went onto the website to browse for clothes. But I couldn't shake the fact I saw my father's first name pop up in the message, and curiosity got the better of me. I went back onto Instagram and went into the messages. The account name was my father's name with his second and last name's initials after it. They all matched my father's, and now I was begging God that this was some messed up coincidence. But it was not. I clicked into the messages and scrolled through. What I found was so much more effed up than I could ever imagine. They had been speaking before we were even engaged, and my husband has plans to secretly invite him to the wedding. In my husband's words, he reached out to my father because he thinks I'm not mature enough to let go of the past and reach out even though it's good for me to do so. He said he thinks having my father back in my life, even indirectly through my husband would work and make me more domesticated, like a good woman should be. I put the phone down and for the last week I have been making arrangements with my best friend in another state to come pick me up. I'm going to call the wedding off as soon as I am safe. I spend every day packing while my soon-to-be ex-fiancé is working, and my best friend will come to pick me up in two days' time. I'm not saying anything for the time being as I'm trying to escape as safely as possible. Discover that my fiancé has been cheating on me by owning a remote control vibrating toy and letting her co-worker use it on her. So a few days ago I was looking through my fiancé Lila's drawer for my wallet, and I discovered a mysterious little device. I didn't know what it was, but with the help of Google it turned out that it's a small and discreet egg-shaped remotely controlled vibrating toy. The thing is, I didn't buy it, and neither did she. This was very suspicious to me. So once the opportunity came, I decided to snoop on her phone. And I probably shouldn't have done that. Lila had a workmate that had to relocate quite far away a couple of months ago. Let's call him Jacob. He is in his late 30s while she is 23. After a long scrolling session it turned out that Lila had a crush on him and they started texting outside of work. It was very innocent, they were oversharing, but nothing too bad. But the real stuff started around two weeks before he was relocating. I don't know how they got intimate that fast, but Jacob gave Lila this vibrating toy and the app to control it was on his phone. And here's the worst part. For at least three months, he was controlling this vibrating thing. While we were in a super serious relationship. And that's not even the worst part. The thing that keeps me from sleeping at night is that he controlled this thing while me and Lila were physically together. And they were texting about how exciting and hot this is. I have been able to corroborate it with my calendar. There were occasions where we watched the movies, and she secretly was being emsturbated by him. Or when we went out for a date, he knew and played with that app on purpose. She was all in on it. She effing enjoyed it. There's also the most disturbing and awful part. I actually met him a couple of days prior to his departure. Lila's workplace had a farewell party for Jacob, and I was picking her up. While I was picking her up, we talked briefly, it was nice honestly. But, then according to their text messages, he used the toy on her a few times while we were driving back home. She even sent him something like, stop it or I am gonna finish and he will discover. Athletes, what are your pregame hacks to always perform well for a big game? I'm the starting senior quarterback for my high school football team, and my coach says I have a huge shot at getting recruited for college football. I've been playing since I was four and my entire life has consisted of multiple workouts and training sessions. I would push myself physically for hours on end every day, and with all of this vigorous training, you'd think I'd be tired and able to sleep easily, but it was actually the hardest part of my day. Basically, at the start of preseason, I was at the gym religiously, obsessing over my workouts and practicing with my team. However, something changed one night after an intense workout. My body forgot how to shut down properly and it took me hours to fall asleep. At first, I thought nothing of it because a little less sleep never hurt anybody. Little did I know that this sleep issue would make my life a living hell. And since I was so stressed out about ruining my entire life, my skin completely broke out. I looked like a walking pepperoni pizza and everything felt like it was falling apart, until my coach stepped in himself to fix everything for me with his secret sauce. After a week of getting only a few hours of sleep per night, 
I was so out of it that I kept dropping the snap, and playing much worse overall. I thought the reason for this was nerves about the upcoming season, and the pressure to be the best, but whatever it was, I needed to fix it immediately. So, I tried various methods to get me back to my peak performance, like meditating and cutting caffeine, but nothing seemed to work. I was searching to find that one thing that would cure my lack of sleep, and a single conversation was all it would take to change the trajectory of my football career. It was the first practice that my coach put the second string quarterback in over me. He was really disappointed and asked why I was suddenly wasting my potential. I didn't want him to think poorly of me, so I fessed up about my sleep problems and how nothing I had tried worked. He said that this wasn't worth making a fuss over, and took me into his office after practice to give me something called Portal that would solve all my sleeping problems if I just took it before bed every night. I told him I didn't buy any of that, especially since I had already tried melatonin gummies, but he revealed something shocking that I still can't believe to this day. Coach has had a ton of other players struggle to play because they couldn't sleep, but he couldn't have his players lose their football career before it even started. So, he did plenty of research to get them back on track and ended up on Andrew Huberman's page, this neuroscientist with 5 million followers, and followed this guy's advice religiously. That's how he learned the exact formulation of a good sleep aid. Since Portal was the only thing that matched that formula, Coach ran with it. He even said athletes who made the switch had no problem playing games on Friday, then heading to practice on Saturday. I was a lot more than willing to use it after hearing all this. I took the portal that night and after drinking it, it only took half an hour before I was knocked out, which might seem like a lot of time but I'd take that any day over staring at my ceiling for hours before nodding off. The next morning, I felt rested for the first time in a while. Even when I was woken up at 6am for morning practice, I completely balled out and even coach noticed the difference. This was the turning point for me. I used to be a B student, but those quickly became A's since I could finally focus in school instead of sleeping through class. And because I was getting my full 8 hours in, my skin cleared up and people in school started noticing me more. I had a few girls ask me out, but football is life so I had to shut that down immediately. I did spend time with my family now that I wasn't booked and busy, with tossing around in my bed for hours, and I've been showing my younger sister some football tricks. It's been a great bonding experience for us. I'm thinking of giving some portal to her too, she's not an athlete or anything but she could really use the help in class, especially with her SATs coming up. As for football, I secured my starting spot back for the upcoming season, and we started it off with a 3-1 to winning record. I was told by my coach that college scouts were going to be at our next game, so I knew I had to lock in. I stocked up on carbs, got some extra conditioning in, and took Portal Dream literally at 8 p.m. The next day, we ended up getting the W after a blowout win, and I had four passing touchdowns. Coach talked to me after and said the scout was thinking of recruiting me to play college football on a scholarship. I just need to keep a winning record for the rest of the season, which isn't going to be hard to do now that I can actually sleep. My wife's stretch marks after giving birth gave me the ICK so I'm getting a divorce. My wife and I are both children of very wealthy families, we have been together for around 3 years and we got married last year. Our relationship used to be perfect, we would go to the nicest restaurant, always go shopping, and engage in whatever activities were popular. But best of all we would always go partying. Neither me nor my wife ever had to work because our families were super rich, and neither of us ever wanted to either. It was really easy and fun living our lives, but then slowly I saw my wife start to change. My wife started taking up hobbies like eating healthier and going to the gym. I was really mad at her because it interfered so much with our social life, like I wouldn't see her for an hour in my day, and then most of the time she refused to eat certain foods, and always ate healthier. It made me feel so alone when she would even refuse alcohol at parties. During this period my wife said that she wanted to start doing some volunteering, I said that I think she should highly reconsider and should just stay at home with me and binge some TV shows. She said that she wanted to be doing more with her life, and I was shocked that she thought we weren't already doing enough. But I was way too hungover to get into a full argument so I just agreed to let her do whatever she wanted and went back to sleep. A couple of months went by like this and it wasn't the same as it used to be. That's until my wife gave me the most terrible news of my life. She said that she had stopped taking her birth control and that she was now pregnant. I didn't know why she was so excited about that, I started just bawling my eyes out. I didn't want a child or to have to take care of one, it was way too much responsibility, time, and effort. I asked her what she wanted to do about it and whether she wants to abort it, but she seemed extremely offended by that and said I'm a selfish PP for even suggesting such a thing. I responded by telling her that it was selfish from her to go off the birth control without telling me and then to take it even further get pregnant. We didn't talk for a couple days after that, and I made her sleep on the couch. I talked about it with my parents and they had the same reaction as my wife, they said that I should be excited, and that having a child and creating a family is the most essential thing in life. My parents told me that I was probably just acting out because I was afraid of being a dad. So I hired many professionals and authors of parenting books, to come and educate me about being a dad. The more I learned the worse it got, I hated the current situation but there was nothing I could do about it, so I hired many caretakers to help my wife while I went out and enjoyed the last fun moments of my life. We didn't really communicate much because she was acting very distant to me. Finally one late night I received spam calls at 2am from all my family and my wife's caretakers. They told me to get to a certain hospital because my wife was in labor, and although I was extremely tired I got a taxi to the hospital. I waited another hour or so by my wife's side before my baby girl was born, I felt like it was an alien, and that I had no connection to it. My wife looked exhausted, so I let her sleep for a bit and gave the baby to the nurses to take care of. I went home and just thought about the countless memories I had with my wife from a year ago. When my wife got home she said she wanted to have a very serious talk. She told me how she wanted for us to stop being so materialistic and for us to move past the base level of attractiveness as the main driver of this relationship. She said that she wanted us to buy a nice smaller house and for us to be more in touch with our roots. 
I was totally against this, and I felt like I was talking to a completely different person than the party girl and model that I once knew. I used. To know. I just agreed with her because I didn't want to get in a fight, and I knew that somehow I would find a way to make this all work out. But I was so wrong about that. Because I was just complying with everything she said, we decided to have intimacy again. But that's when I saw the stretch marks she had on her stomach from pregnancy, and she also had some extra fat surrounding her midsection that she used to never have. As things were getting spicy, I immediately got the ICK, and I wasn't in the mood anymore. I felt disgusted, and my wife said that this was exactly the behavior she expected, despite her talking to me about not having a purely attraction-based relationship, but rather an emotional connection. That's when I decided that I would be getting a divorce. I contacted my divorce lawyer and by the next day the papers were in my wife's hands. She seemed a lot more calm about it than I expected, and she just shrugged it off and agreed, on the condition that she would get full custody of the child. I was honestly baffled that she was so calm and nonchalant about the situation. Did I really mean that little to her? I broke out and started screaming about all my anger that I had kept inside, and then I just started crying, I lost my perfect wife that would always want to have fun with me. She just left the mansion with our daughter. That was last week and I'm still not over it, I don't know what to do but I have so much sadness in me, and I am missing her so much. I just wish things could go back to how they used to be. My wife's stretch marks after giving birth gave me the ICK so I'm getting a divorce, wife's perspective. My husband and I have been together for around 4 years now. Looking back, our relationship was terrible, but at the time I thought it was great. We would literally go to parties every day of the week and get wildly drunk every time that we could, and neither of us had any responsibilities in life because our families were rich so for the times that we weren't partying we were just hungover on the couch having fast food and ice cream while binging a show from Netflix. This is how our lives were and I was fine with it, until my ex-best friend posted on Instagram about how much her life had changed ever since she stopped her party life. She talked about how she achieved true happiness when she stopped pursuing quick dopamine and rather tried to pursue happiness and content. That really for some reason just clicked in my head. This was also around the time that my mother had passed away, because she like me was very much a party girl. I decided that I would start to try and take up just one healthy hobby, which was the gym. But then from there that led me into eating healthily, and being more conscious of my screen time. All of this self-improvement just kept on adding on to each other, and eventually after taking up meditation I realized that the most important thing that I would do in my life, would be to start a family. So without telling my husband I stopped my birth control. I knew he wouldn't support this decision, and he was starting to try and change me back to my old ways, but I was convinced to change my life for the better, and I also wanted to change my husband's life for the better. Soon after stopping the birth control I got pregnant, and I was overjoyed with happiness, but my husband didn't feel the same. Instead of taking care of me, he just hired caretakers while he would go out partying. Obviously this hurt me a lot mentally, but I was determined to get through this. Finally when it was the day to give birth, for the first four hours I had to do it alone until they finally got my husband to come. It seemed like everything was turning out fine, especially when I had a deep conversation with my husband about changing our values, but deep down I knew that he hadn't changed. So when he gave the divorce papers I wasn't angry or sad, I was really just disappointed. I let him express all of his anger before I just took my daughter and left. Honestly I deserve a better man, and my daughter deserves a better father. Am I the a-hole for telling my parents that if they give my brother money I will stop giving them money? My brother is trash. He has multiple baby mamas and is a deadbeat. He also is the apple of my mom's eye. He can do no wrong and is just misunderstood. My parents are retired and on a fixed budget. I do well for myself and I help them out. I give them maybe $500 a month to help with groceries and bills. Every once in a while I will give them extra for an unexpected expense. No questions asked. My mom asked me for $2,000. I sent it to her. Strangely enough I ran into my brother at a family wedding I had been told he could not afford to attend because it was a destination wedding. Weird. Funny story he actually missed the wedding because he hooked up with some rando on an excursion and went to their resort. It was our cousin's wedding and my aunt was pissed. She had to make special arrangements to get him included on the trip since he only got the money last minute. She said my mom shouldn't have given him the money if he wasn't even going to show up. Then she shut up after she saw the look on my face. I enjoyed the wedding and had a great time. When I got home I went to see my parents. I asked my mom why she had asked for the $2,000. She lied and said something for the house. I asked what? She couldn't say. I told her what my aunt said. I told her and my father that from now on I wanted receipts for any money I gave them. I said I have no problem helping them but I will be damned if I work my SS off for her to give my money to my piece of shit brother. She started crying and my dad said that they weren't children and didn't answer to me. I agreed and walked out. I didn't talk to them for two months. My aunt called me yesterday and told me that my parents were thinking of going to the food bank since they didn't have any money. I said I had given them $2,000 a couple of months ago and that was more than my family of three spent on food on that time. She said I knew damn. Well they had given my money to my brother. I told her that he should probably pay them back then. She said I was being a beach. Today I effed up by accidentally complimenting a patient's PP. Plus update. This happened yesterday and I'm still horrified and laughing about it. I'm an ultrasound tech. 
I had a patient come in for an ultrasound because he has some swelling in one of his nuts. The normal procedure is I leave the room, he takes off his pants and underwear and lays on the exam table and covers up with a sheet. I come back in the room and place a towel over his groin while pulling down the sheet. He remains covered. I place another towel over his legs below the nuts. This keeps only the nuts exposed during the procedure. Everything is good so far. The scan involves checking each nut as well as the surrounding area. For the most part this is just a place and, get image, repeat. As I'm working, I can see he is slightly uncomfortable and keeps moving. It's not uncommon for men to get a heart on. Typically I ignore it but this guy is shifting enough that I'm not able to get images. I say, don't worry about it. It's normal but I need you to hold still. He settles down and I continue. The towel is bulging enough that I can tell he still has the stiffy. I need images so I keep checking. Yep, it's still hard. Okay so this guy is hot. I have an attractive man laying on the table with a heart on covered by nothing more than a towel while my hand is rubbing a wand along the length of it. No big deal, I'm a professional. I finish and start to put the machine away but between his moving and my nervousness I don't realize that the cord is under the edge of the towel. The towel starts to slide off as I pull so I reach down to stop it. I'm reaching between the bed and the ultrasound machine and lose my balance. I have a hold of the towel as I start to fall and rip it off. A blob from the ultrasound catapults up and hits me in the face as I'm bent over. Not thinking, I use the towel that is already in my hand to wipe myself off. As I'm wiping my face on this guy's loincloth I get a good view of him. After a moment I realize that I'm just staring at his manhood. He is completely exposed but afraid to cover himself because I already got onto him for moving earlier. I start to apologize. I meant to say something along the lines of, oh my god I'm so sorry. Instead what comes out is, wow impressive. I lay the towel back over him, fumble to put the machine away and tell him to get dressed and open the door when he is done. He tried to tell me it's no big deal when he was leaving but I was so embarrassed that I couldn't even make eye contact. Go to doubt update I hope I didn't make him uncomfortable with my comment. I reported it to my supervisor though and was willing to accept the consequences. I thought I was going to get fired for making inappropriate comments, perhaps suspension. I admit it was a mistake on my part. Yes I'm female. No, I wasn't trying to brag that women get away with such things. Yes I'm human and make mistakes. Yes, I apologized to the man several times for both my comment and for my clumsiness. He wasn't upset when he left the office but if he files a complaint then I will understand and I will live with it. No, I did not ask him out. No. I will not call him from his file. I wasn't trying to create unwanted attention for this man or make light of the situation. My supervisor pulled me off one of my appointments earlier and called me into his office where other hospital personnel were waiting. I knew what was coming next, after I reported the incident my supervisor filed a report. This kicked off a whole process which included someone reaching out to the patient proactively for damage control. The good news is that the guy isn't upset. He had no clue why they were calling him and they said he started laughing when they explained. He was apparently apologizing to them and thought it was a waste of their time. He said and this is the best part, that if he has to come back he hopes I'll be there. The bad part is I had to sign some forms for the hospital and was reminded that I need to be more careful. I feel I got lucky because this could have been much worse. Like my boss could have found out that I did end up calling him after that. I found out he has a girlfriend but that is not stopping us from renting a hotel room once a weekend. My perfect boyfriend's brother changed him into a toxic alpha male. Me and my boyfriend have been dating for four years, we started dating in seventh grade and now we are both in our junior year of high school, and we are still madly in love. Ever since I knew him, he has always been the same funny, kind and morally obligated person. He would always do volunteer work, and was the president of our class every single year since the start of high school. We have plans to go to the same college together and we've already talked about marriage, and how many kids we want. He always scored the top of our class in grades, when he's not studying he's at church, and one of the most upstanding qualities he has is that he is waiting till marriage. Because of that, we usually have sleepovers at his place and I always feel very comfortable and safe with him. One thing to note is that my boyfriend doesn't have a father. He would usually look up to other people to get his influence and to build his character. Recently, his scumbag older brother just got out of juvie. Now, he is asking my boyfriend if he can stay with him. He told me about the situation and I was highly against it because I knew that his older brother was not a good influence. He was especially vulnerable to influence from older guys, due to his lack of a father figure. But my boyfriend was too kind and decided he wanted to help his brother. However, neither of us knew that this would be one of the biggest mistakes of our life. The changes happened very slowly. I barely noticed them until one day in class he made a really peculiar joke about women. Usually he makes the whole class laugh but this time only his buddies from the sports teams laughed. He said in a really condescending tone, women, and he chuckled a bit. I wasn't sure whether or not to confront him about this, but in the end I decided to just let it slide. But that's when the second incident happened. I caught him through one of his house windows smoking and drinking alcohol with his older brother when I wanted to surprise him at his house. This was getting scary, 
I knew my boyfriend would originally never do things like that, and yet as clear as day he was smoking and drinking. I went and knocked on the door and asked my boyfriend, who was very clearly intoxicated if he wanted to go on a walk like we usually do. His brother responded for him and said walks are for PCs. My boyfriend said with a slurred speech yeah walks are faux putties. I never heard him use any profanity ever before, so I tried grabbing his hand to talk to him outside, but he slapped my hand off and said, don't touch me beach. His brother just started laughing, while I on the other hand ran out crying. I didn't know who this was. I started avoiding him for two days, despite the fact that he was blowing up my phone with apologies, and even at school he tried desperately to talk to me. Finally, I gave in and decided to listen to his part of the story. He was saying how it was all his brother's fault and that he deserved a second chance. I agreed, and over the next week his act started to pick up. I started to wonder whether his brother was finally gone, or arrested again. He wanted to make it up to me by having one of our traditional sleepovers together. I wasn't opposed as we would do this very regularly, but something about this time felt different. I saw that his brother's car wasn't in the garage, which was a good sign, towards late at night when we were both lying in bed just chatting, he said he had to go to the bathroom. And I knew it was wrong but I decided to go through his phone. I clicked on the chat between him and his brother, and I was horrified at what I saw. His brother's most recent message was, have you effed her yet? To which he replied not yet but when she falls asleep it's game over. I heard his footsteps and just threw his phone down. I laid there completely frozen, looking at his fake smile. That's when I decided I had enough. I confronted him about everything that's happened, and he told me that he was just trying out new things and living his life. He then confessed to me that he didn't want to wait till marriage anymore and that he and were going to do it now. I obviously refused but then he pulled down his pants and said you know you want this. That's when I kicked him in the nuts and ran off. He didn't even bother chasing after me. The following days at school were awful. My ex kept on saying those sexist jokes in class, and it was really awkward because a lot of the people, especially the girls that used to like him, just resented him. I decided to get my revenge. This all started with his delinquent brother, so I knew he had to go. I created a plan and it worked out. His older brother was busted for his underage alcohol usage, and they found some coke as well, bonus. So now my ex was all alone and he had no one, not me nor his pathetic brother. Bonus 2, I started dating a really nice guy, although I don't like him as much as I did my ex, it's certainly a step up. He saw me with my new boyfriend and I instantly saw the jealousy in his eyes. I certainly wasn't expecting to see him on his knees sobbing for my forgiveness. But what happened next was crazy. My narcissistic girlfriend made my autistic brother cry by insulting his marble drawing, so I made her the butt of the joke to make him laugh. My girlfriend has always been very insensitive to people and their feelings, but in her words she is just brutally honest. She has told my best friend before that he should give up trying to be an engineer because he is too dumb for it, has told her best friend that maybe she shouldn't have walked down a dark alley at 2am when her best friend told her about being roped, and insults things that she thinks are wrong or stupid without a second thought. This is a trait that can sometimes come in handy, but most times not so much, like when she met my parents for the first dinner and called the meal my mother made for her trash. My mother was deeply offended and proceeded not to speak to my girlfriend a whole lot after this. I tried to get my girlfriend to apologize, but she asked me why should she apologize for telling the truth. I told her it's not about that, it's about the fact that my mother spent a full day preparing this meal and you insulted her alongside all of the hard work she put into making the food, specifically because she made another portion specifically for her because my girlfriend is vegan. My girlfriend responded saying that if that took her all day she should spend her time doing something else. This was a huge red flag in hindsight, but I was still in the honeymoon phase and did not want to admit that my girlfriend was not perfect. My girlfriend and I never discussed the topic about her visit at my mother's, as I gave up after a few failed attempts of trying to get her to see why she was in the wrong for doing what she did. Well, I was unsuccessful until one day the stars aligned and my girlfriend decided to smoke some grass. I don't know what happened, but the grass must have mellowed her out and made her more compassionate. While baked off her head, she confided in me that she had been feeling bad about what she said to my mother and her whole attitude towards the situation, and wanted to make amends for it if it was not too late. I told her it certainly wasn't and asked her if I could call my mother and ask if my girlfriend and I could come over so my girlfriend could apologize for her actions. I did exactly that the next day, and my mother being a very forgiving person accepted. Well, a few days later it was time to go and I could tell that my girlfriend was nervous and even said she had made a mistake at one point by wanting to apologize, but I told her that my mother is already expecting us and we should go. I thought heard my girlfriend call my mother a beach under her breath, but I let it go and didn't make a deal out of it. So, we get to my mother's place and my 8-year-old brother was there. I let my girlfriend talk with my mother in a room alone and went over to my brother's room where I saw him drawing his favorite Marvel character, Spider-Man. Whilst the drawing wasn't objectively amazing, it was a lot better than my girlfriend or I could do and I was very impressed with how good it was for an 8-year-old. That's what made what happened next so much worse in my eyes. A few minutes later my girlfriend came in and told me they had talked and my mother forgave her. My mother was preparing another meal at the time and told us it would be ready in 30 minutes. My girlfriend and I were about to leave the room and let my brother get back to his drawing when my girlfriend piped up. My girlfriend knew my brother was autistic and that's why her comment was so much crueler. She said, are you drawing yourself as Spider-Man, and when my brother said no it was just Spider-Man, my girlfriend responded, then why does your Spider-Man look so autistic? 
I instantly told her to knock it off and my brother started crying and ran into the bathroom. I took my girlfriend outside and asked her what that was all about, and she said it was just a joke. In that moment a light bulb popped into my head and when we went back inside, I caught my brother before he could tell mom what happened. I asked him not to say what happened to mom and asked him to trust me because I had a secret plan, and this got him to agree. Dinner came around and my mother was serving everybody food, and when she served my girlfriend food, I took that plate away and replaced it with a block of cheese. Before my girlfriend could even ask what that was all about I asked her if she wanted a block of cheese. Everyone looked at me confused and my girlfriend asked me why, and without missing a beat I asked her, then why do you look like such a rat? My girlfriend was extremely offended but I kept going. I then pointed to some grass outside and asked her if perhaps she'd like to eat grass because she looks like such a cow, and when I asked her if she'd like me to catch some plankton for her to eat because she looks like such a whale, she teared up and began to cry. My brother was laughing his butt off while my mother kept trying to get me to stop. My girlfriend ended up leaving in tears and we have not spoken since and neither of us have reached out. Date my narcissistic girlfriend made my autistic brother cry by insulting his marble drawing, so I made her the butt of the joke to make him laugh. So ultimately my girlfriend was the first of us to reach out to the other, and the first thing she did was ask me how could I be such a vengeful and spiteful a-hole. How could I humiliate her like this over a harmless joke? I told her that it was not harmless, it literally made my autistic 8-year-old brother cry by completely crapping on his hard efforts towards the drawing, and made him feel very bad about himself and his autism. I told her that I talked to my brother later that night and he told me that it made him feel very about his autism and reinforced his belief that he is not normal. I told her that what she said deeply hurt him, and if she wanted to be brutally honest to adults, it was a mean thing to do but they are adults and have thicker skin. But this is my autistic brother we are talking about who was having fun drawing and she felt the need to be a piece of crap. I think I got through to her because she did something she has never done in our relationship, and that's say sorry. But I told her that was not enough. I told her that the reason I did what I did was so she could see how it feels to be humiliated in front of everyone and be called out. I told her I was just being brutally honest the way she was and if she did not like it then maybe she should stop doing it to other people. She still did not understand how that was the same and she tried to claim that what she did was not nearly as bad as what I did, but I disagreed. I told her that either she accepted responsibility, understands why doing what I did was necessary and apologized to my brother personally in the most honey and heartfelt way she can, I cannot see myself continuing the relationship. My girlfriend chose the latter option and opted to end the relationship, and has now spread the story around the friend group. Of course she has. Left out all the context and only left in what I did, and I'm now getting many texts from many different people about how much of an a-hole I am. My son has become a degenerate after finding a goth girlfriend and slapped me in front of her to try assert dominance over me, so I called the police on him. A few months ago my son Roger started failing classes, which is something he has never done before as he was a straight A student. Around this same time, he started hanging out with a girl from school. She wears a lot of baggy clothing, pale makeup and wears ICP shirts every time I've seen her. I think my son is in love with her, because he now always paints his face before he goes out, with the exception of when he is going to school. He had about $500 saved up and I guess he went out and bought all these ICP shirts and hats. At first, I didn't know what ICP was, so I googled it. I found that there is a culture around this band and they call themselves Juggalos. I found a lot of negative stuff about Juggalos, so naturally I was concerned. Some even consider it a gang. I brought this up with my son and asked him if he was on substances. This was about two weeks after he started dressing this way. He told me to mind my own business and slammed his bedroom door in my face. I waited a few days and tried to talk to him about it again. This time, he told me that I was being dumb and that he wasn't doing substances. I asked him why he was wearing face paint. He told me that it was no different than me wearing kiss makeup when I went to one of their concerts years ago. I told him that I was going to a concert, not spending an hour doing makeup to walk 5 minutes to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk. The argument really didn't get anywhere and I decided to let it go. This was until we went out for our yearly Mother's Day dinner. We usually go to a decent restaurant and this year we decided to go to Macaroni Grill. Well my son decided he was going to wear his face paint and ICP clothes to this dinner. I was ticked off and told him to go change. I told him that this wasn't a circus and we were celebrating his mother. He got very upset and yelled some profanity at me about how I am a horrible father. Because of this argument, we didn't go to dinner. I feel horrible about it for my wife's sake, and I did make it up to her the next day. Either way, up until last week my son and I had little contact and when I would try to talk to him, he gave me the silent treatment. This last weekend I found something no father wishes they would ever find. Call me a bad father for snooping, but I did. He was out doing his thing with this girl and I wanted to see if he had any substances in his room. I thought maybe I would find some grass. If I did, I would confiscate it and talk to him about it. But what I found was a white powdery substance in a small Ziploc bag. Being a former addict, I knew what it was. I went and talked with my wife about it and she was shocked. We didn't know what to do. Hours later, my son showed up at our home with this girl. I called him out about what I found and he completely lost it and told me I had no right to go through his things. After his yelling was finished, I asked the girl to leave and that this was a family matter. My son told me to F off, proceeded to literally slap me and took her to his room. My wife was crying and I was fuming. It took a lot not to slap him across the head but I maintained myself and didn't resort to that. What I did next is what I feel was the best thing I could do. I called the police on them. My wife is still very upset with me for this, but I didn't see another way to help him out short of physically forcing his girlfriend out and him to stay. Before the cops came I flushed the blow down the toilet, but they found that he had some grass. 
the girl was asked to leave and my son was told if he tried to leave, they would take him to a youth detention center for a few days. Well since all of this, my son has been grounded and is not allowed to see this girl. It's easy for me to blame it all on the girl, but I am sure I failed. Somewhere for my son to act this way. Apparently he is talking to my wife and asked her about going to some physical juggalos and ICP has. I looked it up and it sounds like bad news. My wife said he could go without talking to me. I am at a loss at this point. While I want my son to experience life, he seems to be headed down a dangerous road and my wife is enabling it. I did talk to my wife about it, and all she can say is that this is our way of making up for calling the cops on him. Date my son has become a degenerate after finding a goth girlfriend and slapped me in front of her to try assert dominance over me, so I called the police on him. I thought about how I could make my wife see what my son has gotten himself into when it comes to this lifestyle, so I figured I could show my wife a couple of the videos about the festival she just gave him permission to attend and she was horrified by the substance bridge the most. We agreed that my son would not be able to go without adult supervision. So, there's a guy I know who at some point has actually gone on tour with ICP and I reached out to him to talk about it. He had some interesting and good insight on them and made me realize that the problem here has little to do with the music my son is listening to. It is more about something he is going through and we need to figure it out along with him and help him. Now for our son. After my wife and I talked about the situation, we decided it would be best if we had a friendly conversation with our son. One that would not include yelling from my wife or myself, even if our son raised his voice. We were going to tell him our decision on the concert and see if we could find common ground on a few of the other issues. So last night, we sat him down when he had gotten back from hanging with his girlfriend. She came with him as she needed to grab something that was in his room. She stayed for 30 minutes before leaving. When she left, my wife and I asked our son if we could have a chat. He resisted at first and tried to walk away, but I said please son, I just want to talk. I'm not going to yell. I just want to know what I can do to be a better father. It worked, even if he looked annoyed. Before I got into the substance use or ICP and face paint stuff, I asked him if he was alright. I asked him if he needed to talk to someone. He kind of just sat there. My wife asked him the same thing, with different phrasing so to see if she could get him to open up. At this point he started to tear up and I could tell he wanted to say something. I shut my mouth though, and continued to let my wife work on him opening up. Since we have been clashing, I didn't want to ruin this opportunity. After a few minutes, he basically stated he was still having a hard time about his best friend's S aside. All this time, my wife and I thought he had moved forward with that, yet he was still trying to work through it. We all cried and after several months of him not allowing me not to hug him, he let me. It was a hug that lasted for a few minutes. I felt like I had my son back and that he had me back as well. So after this part of our conversation, we got onto the other serious issues such as the substance use. I asked him why he had blow in his room. He then said I shouldn't have gone through his stuff and that I needed to respect his privacy. I told him I was concerned for him and that was the only reason I did it. I told him that blow is a dangerous substance and that I know from personal experience. He seemed taken back by this and gave me a confused look. I told him that I had a substance problem, specifically blow, and explained how messed up I was before I got help and before I met his mother. He looked shocked that I could relate a bit to him in regards to substance use. I told him we just wanted to make sure he was safe. I asked him how long he was doing it and to my surprise he said he has never done it. He told us that it wasn't his. He said that a friend of his gave it to him and was pressuring him into trying it but he hadn't had the desire to try it. I calmly asked him if this friend was a substance dealer. Of course the answer was yes. At this point, I didn't have a reason not to believe him because he was being very open about everything. I did however ask him if he would do a random substance test if I asked him. He said yes, but that it would show that he has been smoking grass. It is a relief knowing that he wasn't doing blow. I can deal with the grass. A lot easier than having to get him off of blow. After discussing this, my wife and I were both still pretty calm so we moved to the final part of our conversations. The ICP issue. My wife started this part off by apologizing to me for giving the okay to let him go to the festival. She then pulled up one of the videos on her iPad and handed it over to him. She told him to watch it. I think he knew where this was headed because he looked kind of upset. After the video, she then told him that we both decided it was not a good idea for him to go to this festival without an adult. He was upset at first but I had one last idea to maybe get him to understand why. I pulled up a message from my friend from the band that toured with ICP and let him read it. Apparently, he knew of the band and the guy and this got through to him better than my wife or I could. My wife and I agreed that depending on his reaction, we could try to work it out to maybe my son and I would go for a day. There were a few factors that we needed to work out for this to happen. When we told him this, he took it better than we thought. He did ask if he could take his girlfriend. We said that we would have to speak with this girl's parents and get to know her better. He agreed to that. We are also compromising with him a bit on the face paint and music part of it. We asked if he would consider not wearing the face paint all the time when we go out. We explained that while it doesn't embarrass us, it does cause a distraction. He agreed that when we go out to family functions or family dinners, that he would not wear it, but would still most likely wear the t-shirts. We thought it was a good compromise. Things are headed in a positive direction and my relationship with my son has gotten better over the last 24 hours. Date 2, my son has become a degenerate after finding a goth girlfriend and slapped me in front of her to try assert dominance over me, so I called the police on him. We decided in order for my son Roger to go to the ICP concert, we needed to get him in therapy and also give family therapy a try. The biggest thing we all learned from family therapy is that we lack communication. While the talk we had was a good stepping stone, we still have a ways to go but we are headed in the right direction. With time, I think we will be back to a healthy and trusting relationship. Now for Roger and his girlfriend. 
I mentioned that he wanted her to go to the concert with him if I took him. I also mentioned that I needed to meet with this girl's parents. It took some convincing, but I was able to go over to her house and have a conversation with her father about a week or so before the concert. Unbeknownst to me, her mother was out of the picture and had been since she was about seven or eight. Her house is kind of run down and her father invites me inside. Immediately, I could smell a combination of cigarette smoke and stale beer, which was extremely strong. It was a mess. It looked like someone threw a party and forgot to clean up. I suddenly felt bad for the girl and felt even worse for judging her. She was obviously a victim of a broken home. Despite the conditions, the conversation was productive and we talked about her going to the concert if he was okay with it. He agreed it would be fine but said he didn't have the money to help out with any of the costs. I said we would take care of it. I was there for less than 10 minutes. Maybe I am being judgmental of her father, but I felt bad and we have had her over for dinner several times a week now. We have learned a lot about her and she is just a damaged youth trying to get by with the head she was dealt. She hasn't indicated any abuse and she does appear to love her father a lot. She just hasn't really opened up much about anything. And short of being suspicious of abuse, I don't know if it is really our business so we haven't pushed it. Now for the concert. The three of us headed to the concert and were planning on being there for two days. We got there Friday evening and there were people all over the place. All kinds of people. My son and his girlfriend wore face paint but so did about half the people I saw. I felt out of place but at the same time I was glad I didn't let them come alone. The smell of skunk grass was strong right as we walked in the entrance. I saw some people trying to sell substances and some offered me meth to try for free, but we pretty much just ignored them. We didn't really have any issues and the two of them enjoyed themselves. I gave them their space and didn't hover but I did keep an eye on them from a distance. I didn't think being within a few feet of them would have been very encouraging of the progress we have made through therapy. I had to trust them a little bit and know they would make the right choices. Overall, it was a good experience for my son and his girlfriend. It wasn't my type of atmosphere but I wasn't there for me, I was there to support my son and just try to be a good father. My ex reached out to me about our secret pact and I don't know what to do. Part 1. I, Anthony, have been with my current girlfriend, Michelle, for 4 years, no plans of marriage and one time she cheated on me, intoxicated, mistake, blah blah blah, whatever I forgave her. We are pretty much best friends that do everything together and live together, other than the one instance of cheating we have had no major issues and live a pretty good life. She does not want marriage or kids, I do though. It's a hard no for her. Recently my ex, Nicole, contacted me over a promise we made back when we broke up, when and if we were both not married by 32, we would find a way to be together. Some backstory on her and I, childhood friends, started dating in middle school, dated through high school, she was accepted to her dream college and so was I, on opposite ends of the country, Virginia Tech for her and Stanford for me. We did long term for two years until deciding to let each other live their life and be more connected to maybe someone closer if it was going to happen, this was a mutual decision and we broke up contact at that point so that we could move on. Her parents still talk to me on occasion, live 4 hours away, same with her sister, 20 minutes away, and her grandparents 2 hours away, but never about her per my request. So flash forward I have been getting calls from a weird number once every month since September and just didn't answer because I don't answer numbers I don't know, figure if important they would leave a message. X's sister comes by and says hey, this is from Nicole. She said you can read it and respond if you want, and if not then she will understand soon enough. For the life of me I had forgotten our weird promise but the letter goes as this, hey, Anthony, I know neither of us have been in contact in the last 10 years, but I'm asking if you still remember the promise we made. I have no right to ask for it, and if you have moved on then it's okay, as. I want you to be happy. First and foremost I want you to know this isn't a desperation attempt because I'm lonely. My sister was quite keen on giving that as the probable reason as to why I've been feeling this way and why I'm bringing up that old promise. This is more along the lines of I just can't imagine my life with anyone else. I yes, have been on many dates and had one relationship that lasted over a year, but there was always this lack feeling in me that well in all honesty, they weren't you. You're the guy I knew instantly when I was young that I would want to be with forever, the guy who made me smile, that I could wake up next to and was genuinely happy knowing that we were together. In my mind you, Anthony, have been my only one and desire, that day we decided to try and move on because of the distance. I won't lie, it took me about a year to realize how stupid that was. It was mutual but my feelings are that I pushed you towards it. I honestly feel like the first suggestion of giving time to each other to finish school and not have to try and coordinate our lives, was the stupidest mistake I could ever have made. Anthony, you are my soulmate, my love, my life, and that is why what comes next I say with all fear aside. I am ready to leave everything and find a new job, to move back to, Candyland, and be with you. I'm fully prepared to do this if you even think there can be a chance for us again, I love you. I love you and nobody else will ever take the place you have in my heart. I talked to my parents and friends, they are in full support of this, also, thank you so much for being there for my parents when they needed help moving and working on dad's bike and truck, I had no idea until a few days ago. I will be fully committed to being yours, I want to be part of your life and want you to be in mine forever, growing old, seeing the world change the lives we live together is one, and most importantly I just want us to be happy. I've wasted enough time holding back what I have wanted to say for the last few years, Anthony, I love you so much, I want to live my life with you. I'm prepared to leave it all for you, and lastly my love, my childhood friend, my soulmate. I'm more than prepared to be your wife and be the mother to our children. If I don't hear back by the end of the month, I will assume you have moved on for the better and will do my best not to reach out again. If you decide otherwise I have left my number and email. Love, insert nickname from childhood, Nicole. 
My ex reached out to me about our secret pact and I don't know what to do. Part 2. To be honest I don't know if I should respond or what I should do. She left her number, one that has been calling me, and her email. I'm conflicted a lot really. I literally cried when I read the letter and it brought back a lot of emotions that I didn't think were still there. Since, Michelle, Nicole, and I all went to the same high school they both know each other and I'm honestly afraid, Michelle, will tell me to go be with her without a second thought if I told her about, Nicole, reaching out only just knowing how she is as a person. I've been debating it since getting the letter yesterday and since I always see good advice here I thought to ask the Reddit family. Tomorrow Michelle and I are going on a hike so I'm going to bring up what I want and need out of a relationship to be happy. Edit, I talked to my current girlfriend first. We had a big talk that was the last six hours we were hiking about what we both wanted in the future. She made it clear that kids and adoption are out of her plan and suggested that we should just be friends if that's what I truly want in the future. I told her that I would still be friends with her no matter what since all the things we do together and she laughed and said no kids, and I keep my best friend who loves to do the same things I do? Cha-ching. It's all good, rather we both be happy in the long run, don't feel too bad or think this is a mistake. We then talked about the letter from my ex and she pretty much said Nicole sounds crazy, but if it's something I want to pursue because of the history we had, then she has no ill feelings towards me going that route. Also said if it doesn't work out then I can always go back to plan, no kids and freedom, thank me for bringing it up then in her typical fashion joked about me going to be blue bald for a while. Rest of the hike was pretty much us talking like we normally do then debating. Lunch. When we got to the trailhead I asked if she wanted any alone time or not, she said no, and that she eventually thought this would happen as we got older. Asked me if we can still do the friend stuff until something else happens in our lives and I told her yes of course, she said no harm in that then and that was that. We're at the mall for her girl's lunch and I'm sitting at the table like a weirdo. My ex reached out to me about our secret pact and I don't know what to do. Update. After Michelle and I ended our relationship, kinda, nothing changed aside from living together in intimacy, Nicole and I started to make plans for when she came out here for her grandma's birthday. Talking on the phone a lot, emails back and forth, we decided on waiting to video chat or send pics to another since it wasn't too far off when she would be visiting and we thought it would be a good surprise. The initial hello was awkward as hell. When she got out of the terminal, I recognized her right off the bat and was amazed that she pretty much looked exactly the same as when I last remembered. I had seen pictures of her sisters and parents but I was floored on how much she hadn't changed in the last 10 years. Getting into the car we kind of just stared at one another for a minute and she started off with well. If you don't drive anywhere, people are going to start honking smart guy. That started our week-long catching up journey. We first went to get some food and decided on pizza, oh yeah, and it was pretty easy going from that moment on. We shared stories of what life has been like, showed off scars, looked at each other's trips and vacations, shared each other's hobbies, she asked about our old group of friends and who's still around. That small first meeting changed everything in life for us both. I won't go into specifics or minor details on the following dates and days, but to say that week went by in a heartbeat is an understatement. When it was time for grandma's birthday it was like old times again, the family was easy to be around, we all joked and laughed and didn't have much of any problems throughout the week, our music taste was the only problem, lots of fighting over that radio dial. The goodbye felt painful, our week of vacation was over and it was time to get back to our lives half a country apart. Flash forward a few weeks, and we decided that I go visit her. This time around. Phone conversations were going great and airfare was cheap enough. Texted before I got on the plane and told her my arrival time, landed and felt like I was ghosted. Not there to pick me up, wasn't answering the phone, didn't respond to any texts, Facebook said last online 4 hours ago, I started to feel like maybe this was some joke on my behalf and was worried, about 45 minutes go by and I'm walking towards a hotel when the phone rings and I find out she was so antsy about me coming that she spent the night awake and upon hearing I was on the way, promptly passed out hard. By the time she got to me I was a sweaty mess but was apologetic all the way to her place, and the following 2 days. We hung out the entire time pretty much doing what we couldn't do where I live, days at the beach, swimming, me getting in a small amount of rock hounding while she looked for critters, and eating all the Cajun food I could ever hope for. In a nutshell it went great and other than the constant bald jokes, I had shaved my head, it was all fun. Meeting her friends, her dog, hanging out and doing things we each love was just tranquil in every way possible. When it came time to say goodbye she asked if I had any vacation time left and if I did if she could come back up for longer and I of course said yes. Four months go by of back and forth traveling on weekends, always on the phone, and by that point I feel like it's time, I asked her if she wants to move in with me, immediately said yes and we made our last vacation week into a road trip to bring her up to where I live. Our dogs got along and she was able to transfer to a new department based pretty close to where we lived. It was a dream coming true and it too went by so fast that honestly it feels like it was yesterday. She actually asked me to marry her a few months later and I of course said yes. She had glowed in the dark rock setup to ask me in our yard when we went up to the deck to watch the stars. I feel like I'm going on a rant here. So much for not every detail, right? Well, it's been close to a couple years now since everything started. We have a beautiful daughter together Ariana, adopted, we had issues, she wouldn't be able to give birth, our dogs are jerks and doofuses, Michelle and Nicole have met and we are all friends again, they actually hang out a lot together, she has moved on and we still do a lot of our favorite hobbies together as a group or separately. With the virus and us being at home non-stop together, it's been just fine. Were things perfect? No. But nothing ever is, we had our issues in the beginning and still squabble over stupid things at times. This was the best decision and my only regret is that we didn't reconcile our relationship earlier. 
This has gone by in a flash and honestly I can't wait to see what the future holds for us. Each day is refreshing and a smile rarely leaves my face. I get to spend my life with not only my first love and childhood friend, but also with great friends and family that are always there for us both. My mother-in-law is asking for a DNA test so now I am asking for a divorce. I've been with my husband for five years now. Married for three. Well long story short, his mom was always overwhelmingly bold with her input on everything, to put it nicely. I genuinely think it's not fair to be mad at your partner for something he didn't do himself. He can't control what his mom does or says. But what's also not fair is him not addressing it when I am clearly uncomfortable or upset and instead just talking me into brushing it off or going with it. I never would ever have a back and forth with my mother-in-law, because I think it's very rude, so I just accept her snarky comments. It's just not worth barking at each other. I always kinda brush it if it's a snarky comment or if it's a better way to do something in her opinion, I'll just tell her thanks for the suggestion but we are fine. It's actually true, the saying when you marry someone, you marry their family. I think the way to handle it is each spouse should keep his side of the family in line for lack of a better way to say it. I deal with my parents and their shenanigans and I expected him to do the same. He never did. He always asks me to give her some grace. Well it's hard when that person is insulting you. For a while now she has been making comments about how my son doesn't look like my husband when he was a toddler. Basically he accused me of sleeping around. This, rightfully so upset me. Sorry, my genes are strong what do I tell you? I was short with my husband because he didn't address how out of pocket and disrespectful this whole thing is. It has been a week since my husband, well, soon to be ex-husband told me that he would be doing a paternity DNA test, not because he thinks that it's not his son but to shut his mom up. I don't know which one is worse, him accusing me of cheating or this poop. But all I know is this is audacious. I didn't cheat and I am not concerned one bit about the test results. I wasn't going to stop him from taking a DNA test or whatever but I just know I don't want to deal with this any longer. I am looking for an apartment and I talked to a lawyer the day after he brought this DNA test thing up. And I've been acting more than normal since. We'll be getting the results in two days. I can't wait. He would be also getting divorce papers with that too. I know for fact he won't see it coming. I tried my best to make this whole thing work and manage my relationship with my mother-in-law as gracefully as possible. But thinking about it, it's not just my mother-in-law that's the problem but how he is handling things is also a problem. And side note, I never been more glad that I didn't leave my job when I got married. He makes more than enough to take care of the financial side of things. I thought I would get bored, I only have to be on site two days per week also I really love my job and the company so I didn't leave. Best decision I ever made. He is unreliable, to say the least. I know that divorce can be hard on kids, but I experienced the other side. Living with two parents that hated each other and violently fought almost all the time is as hard maybe even harder. They thought that staying together would be good for me and my siblings. Newsflash, it wasn't. It was traumatizing to say the least. I don't remember, I either read somewhere or maybe my therapist told me that when you fight with your spouse you shouldn't see it as me versus you. But more like, me and you versus the particular situation or problem on hand and try to figure it out. But it's really hard to do so when you start hating that person. I don't want my son to live like that because I tell one thing I just can't stand my husband anymore. I don't know if this is a weird way of saying it but I just don't respect him anymore if that makes sense. I just see an unreliable man and I know for fact that our fights won't be the same as before. I would have said what a waste of five years but I have a sweet and smart gremlin now and having a child really pushes you to be better, but I don't think I can continue this exhausting relationship. My mother-in-law is asking for a DNA test so now I am asking for a divorce. Part 2. The day he was supposed to receive the results, I called my father-in-law and invited them to come over that evening. He was working when he got the results. He sent them to me and told me he would talk to his mother to finally put this to rest. I informed him that I had already invited them for this evening and I am just waiting for my apology before I leave. I asked that he come home so we can talk before they come over. He called, and I basically told him that this is not working for me anymore. I've already talked to an attorney, filed for divorce, and it might be more expensive than a paternity test, but it would be more effective making his mother happy. And no, I don't care that he was working when I told him. I don't think he would have either, he left work and came home. Long story short, we had a spectacular fight. He said that I am not thinking about my son and I am overreacting because it's not like he went behind my back. And if he knew that I was this upset, he wouldn't have done it. But he knew. We fought about it when he brought it up. He just didn't care. When I gave him the divorce papers, he said he's not signing anything and he'll ask his mother to apologize when his parents arrive and get done with this. Listen, I don't need him to sign it to get a divorce. It would only make things complicated, that's it. His mother said, she has nothing to apologize for. She wouldn't apologize for having suspicions. She didn't accuse me of anything and I can leave if I want to. So that's that. I did leave that night because I wasn't going to get an apology, and he didn't seem to understand that him reinforcing that it's okay for her to meddle is why I want a divorce in the first place. He eventually told his parents he'll be coming over from time to time to check up on them, he is their only child, 
and not to bother coming over any more until she apologizes. She wasn't amused. She told me I am taking her son away and some wh underscore re would take my son too. She is not someone that you can talk to, I'll tell you that much. It's like talking to a wall. All she knows is insulting or being passive-aggressive on a good day. We're not getting a divorce. We talked the day after. He said I can always file for a divorce, but we should at least try couples counseling because he doesn't want to co-parent. My naive co-worker is in an abusive relationship and I'm doing everything I can to save her, but she says she am acting creepy. I work for a non-profit where I'm the supervisor of 10 people that work under me. Last fall a young woman named Jennifer started to work with us through an outside fellowship. She's the kind of person that just commands attention as soon as she walks into the room, and it's seriously hot. She is very pretty but just has one of those personalities that everyone likes. I had to train her when she first started but was very surprised by how quickly she picked everything up. I immediately took a liking to her because of her work but also how easy she was to talk to. During our training, I would say we became pretty close. So much so that I would text her outside of work about non-work related stuff and she would even sometimes respond. We even go to happy hour alone sometimes and I think I'm the closest to her at work. One time I even got her to go out and have lunch with my mom and I when my mom was visiting town. She is someone I consider a very good friend and want the best for her. Now here's the problem. About two months into her working with us, I found out she has a boyfriend. I really don't care that she has a boyfriend but felt a little manipulated that she never mentioned him before. I am her supervisor, I have been training her for a few months, we have been talking about a lot of stuff so it just comes off as hiding something. It was a little hard for me to trust her after that but I kept it to myself. She was still a great employee and her having a boyfriend did not change anything because apparently she has been with this guy for five years now. He doesn't live in the same city and they barely see each other from what I understand. So months go by and everything is going really well. So much so that I was even thinking about recommending her for a promotion. We became even closer during this time. About two weeks ago our parent group hosted a fundraising gala. I asked Jennifer if she would like to go with me and she said yes. I always have a great time with her so I was really looking forward to it. The night of the gala I called to see when I should pick her up and she said her boyfriend was in town and he would drop her off so she would just meet me there. This is the first red flag I noticed. Is this guy really that insecure that he can't even let her date take her to this gala? Five years and this insecure? That's a problem. But I just agreed and said okay. She eventually gets there but I don't approach her. Honestly, I'm still pretty bothered by what happened earlier so I wanted her to come to me and apologize. She came up to me and we talked but she never apologized for what she did but I ignored it. Soon we were talking just like before and honestly really enjoying each other's company. Here's when I noticed the second red flag. Jennifer and I were talking to another couple when she excused herself because she had to take a call from her boyfriend. I thought it was pretty rude and she has never done something like this before. A little later she comes back and says that her boyfriend is picking her up and she will leave early. Third red flag. She was very much looking forward to this night and suddenly she wants to leave early? You know when you can just tell someone isn't happy in their situation? Yeah I definitely felt it right away. A little while later he gets there and I kid you not, this idiot walked into the gala wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I almost wanted to laugh but I didn't want to embarrass him. Jennifer introduces me to him and I make pleasantries but I do make a joke about how he must feel a little out of place. He says something like nah, not really sticking around so not a big deal. I followed up with, well there are some really important people here and his response was something like, I've met senators while wearing flip-flops, I think I'll be okay. Holy crap, I'm getting angry writing this. He completely rubbed me the wrong way. So anyways, as she is leaving, I tell her to let me know if she gets home okay. It gets around midnight and she hasn't sent me a single message. So I sent her a text and no reply. I sent her another around 1am saying I am worried and just to let me know if she is okay. No reply. I have a hard time sleeping that night because I'm genuinely concerned. It's just the kind of person I am. I need to know my friends are okay or it bothers me. I woke up the next morning after getting really bad sleep and she still hasn't responded even after another few messages. This makes me upset because I can see she has uploaded pictures on Facebook but yet won't respond to my text. The only explanation is that her boyfriend is the reason. She always responds to me and at most a few hours later. So Sunday night I finally sent another message really detailing how upset I was with how she was treating me. Also how I think how much control I feel her boyfriend was exerting over her was really making me lose respect for her. I always thought she is this strong independent woman and suddenly this guy is controlling who she can or can't talk to. Of course I get no reply. Monday, inevitably we see each other at work and she confronts me the first thing in the morning. Before I even get a chance to speak, she says I made her uncomfortable and she wants to just finish her last two months of fellowship without any contact that is not necessary for work. This was about two weeks ago. I was really upset at first but honestly I've done a lot of reading. When you are in an abusive relationship, you stop seeing the world the way it is and only the way the abuser wants you to see. It makes me really sad that I am losing a good friend because her boyfriend has insecurity issues. My question is this, what is the best approach to let her know of these concerns I have? Date my naive co-worker is in an abusive relationship and I'm doing everything I can to save her, but she says she am acting creepy. I'm starting to think that I need to try to get a restraining order on her boyfriend from her behalf. I saw her come in yesterday with a bruise on her wrist, and I rushed over to ask what happened, but she told me she just fell and that I'm creeping her out. She's delusional, how doesn't she see that her boyfriend is abusive and I am trying to save her from his evil hands? Edit, I tried to help you and you gave me a giant middle finger. Hope you enjoy the hell you got waiting for you in the future with your abusive boyfriend. 
but you probably think you're better off. This cracks me up. Just wait when you come running back me and asking for forgiveness and I will just laugh at you as I am doing now. Good luck you terrible excuse for a human being. Oh and F you. Edit 2, you care about refugees so much right? You want to help immigrants? You like social justice and want to keep working at non-profits? Yeah looks great in a resume doesn't it? How about you tell everyone that you're also effing a lobbyist who raises money for the very people creating those problems to begin with. You're a liar and you may have tricked a lot of other people but I see right through you, you dumb beach. Karma is going to hit you like a beach and don't come running back then. I'm only going to leave this door open for a little while longer. I hope you see the light soon because you're only effing up your own future. Edit 3, effing beach. I've been in this profession a decade longer than you. I could have helped you move forward in your career. Now you're talking crap about me and trying to paint me as creepy for sending you books about abusive relationships when you're in one? You're really going to try to ruin my reputation when all I did was try to help? Do you know the connections I have? You think when you leave in a month you'll just slide in. Easily in some new job? I will ruin you and make sure everyone knows how terrible of an employee you were. Let the games begin you dumb wh re. Try to keep your legs closed for a few minutes while I fix the damage you caused. You really have no idea how nonprofits work do you? This is such a small world and you attack the one person who has helped you from the beginning. Oh and thanks for not showing up at my boxing match. Even though we talked about it months ago and you said you would come. This just confirms that you were never a friend and just using me. We don't need users like you in the business. I have helped hundreds of people and will have hundreds more. Can't wait for you to go back into your cushy life where you don't know what real pain is. Leave the real work to the nice people like me who genuinely care about helping. Date 2, my naive co-worker is in an abusive relationship and I'm doing everything I can to save her, but she says she am acting creepy. Dear friend, where do I even start? This Friday will mark a month since you left, apparently because you were scared of me. Three weeks ago marks a year since we met. I wonder if you even think about any of that. Honestly, you probably do but I know he wouldn't ever let you show it. Do you know that I haven't even had the strength to go on social media for a while now? It reminds me too much of the memes we shared on Snapchat. But I'm tired of holding back my happiness because you choose to be dense. I remember like yesterday when you first walked in, nervous, unsure, a little bit of a bimbo, but beautiful nonetheless. I immediately introduced myself, this is something I never do as I have to maintain a role of authority but something about you was different, well I thought so anyways. I could see that just speaking to me changed your demeanor. I had a dazzling effect on you. You never really worked in an office before and didn't realize how cold it would be. I offered you my blazer and you were so thankful. It put a smile on my face but it was also when I first noticed that we would become good friends. Man, how things changed, huh? To be honest, I probably never should have become such a good friend to you. Therein lies my biggest mistake. People always tell me I'm too trusting and friendly and until now, I really didn't want to believe it. But I took you under my wing like the damsel in distress that you were. With my help you picked things up so quickly, faster than anyone I saw in a decade of this business. You had a future in this, you were promising. I still get a smile when I think about that meeting we had to present to Roger. You were so nervous, visibly shaking. Do you remember who gave you the encouraging words so you could go out there? Do you remember how delighted he was and all the compliments he gave you? You were ecstatic. You were made for this and I was the one to show you that you could do it. On our way back from the presentation I took you to the halal food truck. I still can't believe you never tried it. Ha ha, but you loved it. You would snapchat me every time you went. But you threw it all away because you were weak. It really isn't your fault I know but I can't help but be angry that you were so weak. You let him gaslight you, abuse you, control you. He decided who your friends were, he decides who you text, he decides how long you stay out. But at the end of the day, you accepted it. You let him in for that I don't think I can ever forgive you. I tried so hard to get through to you but instead you turned on me. You ruined everything I worked for and painted me out as someone who would actually assault you. I'd be lying if I said the thought never crossed my mind, but you were too beautiful for me to do that too. I could do that to others, I have, but never you. It's just really sad. There was a position open that you would have been perfect for. I told you it was going to open up very early on when we met. I was preparing you for it. If you didn't leave, you would be starting Monday. But no, another more qualified person will. Someone who actually wants to help people and not just themselves. What truly hurt is when you didn't show up to my football match. I told you about how hard I have been working and you pretended to be so supportive. I know I sat on the bench, you promised you wouldn't miss it, but where were you? I know you had nothing to do that night, I saw your status about how you started binging True Blood, something I introduced you to, so what was your excuse? Gross. Your behavior is just gross. When you come back to me looking for help and I will no longer be the guy who bends over backwards for you. I hope you remember that you made this decision. You chose him over your future. You chose him over your career. You chose him over your friends that really cared for you. It's sad, pathetic really. I feel bad but also amused and angry. Today has been just hard because I found out the person we interviewed will start Monday. It just brought back a lot of memories and I just had to vent. Good luck kid, you're going to need it. Sincerely, the nicest guy you'll ever meet. My boyfriend caught me watching homemade adult films videos of my deceased husband and I, and is now accusing me of cheating. My boyfriend and I have been seriously dating for three years, and eventually want to settle down and marry. My late husband and I were together since college and had a very loving and passionate relationship until he was torn away from me in a freak accident eight years ago. I have mostly moved on, but still miss him terribly some days. 
I do not compare my now boyfriend with him, because both have a really special place in my heart. My boyfriend is sensitive to this loss of mine and I have been in therapy and he accepts my late husband as one of the greatest loves I have ever experienced. My late husband and I used to always have an intimate night together on New Year's and last night I was terribly missing him again. He had gifted me a pillowcase he customized for me made of satin and I lie down with it whenever I want to feel close to him, it's just how I cope. So last night when my boyfriend was watching TV I went to my room, hugged the pillow and opened my hard drive that had our photos. I had not opened that file in so long, I forgot I also had NSFW stuff in there, and when I saw it I wanted to relive it, so I started browsing. I did not want to delete our intimate photos of us in the bathtub, our honeymoon and wedding nights, some NKED cuddling, because those are special to me. My boyfriend came upstairs and asked what I was looking at. I showed it to him thinking it was no big deal, but in his response I sensed alarm in his voice. He started questioning what the heck I was doing browsing through those photos and why do I see a use in keeping such intimate media with a former partner? I tried to laugh it off, I smiled sheepishly because at first I thought he was going to tease me about it. However when I realized how hurt he was, he simply didn't let me say anything. He genuinely felt hurt and betrayed and accused me of cheating on him and told me that I can sleep with him in his grave. I felt that was crossing the line and wanted to scream my head off but kept calm. My boyfriend never had such a reaction to me missing him before and I can see why my actions hurt him but to accuse me of cheating on him feels super wrong. He told me that he is breaking up with me and warned me not to contact him. He left my place and I have no idea how to talk to him. Update, my boyfriend finally called me back asking to meet. I thought we could have a conversation about it and make up. He however didn't intend that. When we met, I asked if we could get back together, offering to remove those files from my laptop and transferring them into a USB drive, all photos, even non-intimate ones so I don't have easy access to them. He told me, he would ideally be in a relationship with someone who only had him in her heart and he'd rather I get rid of my husband altogether, but it's unfair to me. He said he realized what he wants and that is number one in someone's heart. He put up with a lot of stuff just because I am a widow and doesn't think he would date one again. It really hurt me when he told me that my action has damaged any trust in our relationship and even if he wanted, he couldn't pretend, and what hurt me the most, he says he has lost feelings for me. He initially had finally decided he would propose to me by the end of the year but now it's not in his plans. I was incredibly hurt and started bawling but he wouldn't comfort me. He simply wished me the best and told me he hopes the memories of my husband keep me warm at night. Which I found petty and disrespectful but was too stunned to say anything. My best friend's 11-year-old brother decided to fire a BB gun at my cat, so I smacked the F out of him. A couple weeks ago I was babysitting my best friend's brother. I usually can't stand kids but my friend was on the verge of a breakdown so I offered to take the kid off his hands for a bit so he could finish his art school project and relax. I took the kid back to my house because there isn't much to do around here and I'm a broke student and on the trip back he was already acting like a obnoxious piece of crap, asking me if I ate my dog because I'm Asian and referring to me as a female every single time we talked. My mum was out running errands and meeting with some of her friends so it was up to me to watch him. I asked him if he wanted to play a board game, he said no, I asked if he wanted to play some video games, he said no, I asked if he wanted to go kick a football around since I live in the countryside and there's plenty of space to dick around, he said no. By this point I had no idea what the kid wanted so I just kinda let him explore the house a bit to which he stumbled across my BB gun. Now, I'm from Europe which is pretty self-explanatory, you don't come across BB guns, airsoft rifles and such often so naturally he was fascinated with it. I explained that I don't use it to shoot despite the fact that I do have pellets and that I only keep it around for cosplay reasons. I told him he couldn't shoot it because it's still a semi-dangerous piece of equipment. The PP head threw a full-on tantrum at the ripe age of 11, screaming and crying, yelling and hitting stuff to which after five whole minutes of this I relented, I told him that he could shoot a few as long as he aimed at a big tree in the garden and only under my supervision. He agrees, I set up the gun etc etc now, I have five cats, one of them is a 12-year-old senior cat who spends his days lying around the garden under patches of sun. He's not slow per se but he definitely isn't what he used to. B. I take the kid out and direct him to the tree, he fires and all's good, my senior cat is lounging close by behind the kid, sleeping away and not bothering anyone. Kid turns to me and asks for some water to which I say sure, don't fire, I'll be back, as I'm filling up the glass for Mr. Numbskull I hear a loud yowl, like a really really loud pained yowl. I immediately dash outside and see the little PP head pointing the BB gun at my senior cat who's lying there essentially screeching in agony. He fired at my cat and the absolute smug crap eating smirk on his face made me absolutely lose it, I stormed up to him and slapped him right across the face while simultaneously screaming at him, and then I slapped him again. He fell and I started stomping him. I scooped my cat up and cradled him shushing and patting him as I called my mom, explained the situation to which she came rushing back home, probably broke a couple of red lights and took the cat to the vet whilst it landed on me to take the crying cunt back home. Am I the a-hole for telling my stepdaughter to go ask her real dad when she asked me to pay for her plane tickets? I married my wife Elise 12 years ago. She has a 16-year-old daughter, Anna, from her previous relationship and we have a 7-year-old son as well. From pretty much the beginning of our relationship, Anna and I have never gotten along. 
I don't know how to emphasize that it is not because of a lack of trying. She just does not like me. When she was young she was just scared of me and afraid I'd tear their family apart. Nowadays it's more of a neutral dislike rather than strong antipathy so I suppose that's progress Elise is a stay-at-home mother, so she relies on me for income. As a result, I pay for everything for Anna. Food. Clothes. Volleyball fees. Field trips. I take an interest in her hobbies. I go to her games. I'm not saying I'm perfect but I try my damn hardest to be the stepfather I can. But it's so. Hard. Always giving me curt one-word responses. Always having to have an attitude. She does things to get a rise out of me. Staying out late reeking of booze. Always trying to sneak boys in. Typical rebellious stuff. But I always let her know I love her and I'm there for her in hopes of her shithead teenager phase pasts. The opposite is true for her biological father. She adores him. Can't tell you why. He never goes to her games, always makes excuses for why he doesn't want to see her. He forgot her birthday last month and she cried herself to sleep. Well anyways, Friday, I came to her room to check her phone and read her messages, not a permanent thing, but she's been caught sneaking out twice in the last month so this is her punishment. I ask for the phone, she says no, I'm tired of you checking my shit, leave me alone. I tell her I'm not asking again and she goes just f off already. You're not my real dad. You never have been. Stop acting like you can tell me what to do before getting up and slamming the door. Like I said guys. I'm tired. Tired. Of the Blanton disrespect. Of being the verbal punching bag while still providing more for her than anyone else in her family. We haven't really talked since until this morning during breakfast. She asked if I could pay for her plane ticket so she could see her boyfriend. Cross state. Like I said, her mom doesn't work and her dad is a paw so I normally would be the one to cough up the money. Not this time. I respond to go ask your real dad. I could tell she was hurt. Tears swelled up from her face and she excused herself from the table. My wife took me aside later and said my comment was extremely disrespectful. I said if anything's disrespectful, it's her treating me like a doormat and a credit card, and I will no longer tolerate this treatment in my house. I told her we don't have to be friends, am I the a-hole? Bride's mother attempted murder the groom at the wedding. Me and my friend worked for a catering company, and this is how we met our bartender and bouncer. This client we had that day was some rich old money. We started with the catering consultation, the wedding planner had changed three times already before they even came to visit us and the appointment kept getting rescheduled. The day of the consultation came and they actually showed up, both the mothers with the bride and groom in tow. The wedding planner didn't show, but we kept the consultation going and would email all relevant paperwork later. The mothers of the bride and groom were the best of friends, and they were so excited they got to plan their kids' wedding together, and the future of family names was preserved. It was during this rant that my friend cut them off and spoke directly to the bride and groom. Friend, I want to know what you two want, what cuisine do you like? What style of service would you like? Bride's mother, BM, they want a full-service buffet with carving stations, hors d'oeuvres and cocktail hour and the cake will be from this bakery. Friend, I'm sorry ma'am, I thought this consultation was for the bride and groom. If you want a consultation for your own wedding you will have to book one with my assistant. BM, excuse me, but I know more than these two kids do, I plan my wedding myself you know. Friend, how about this, you two ladies can sit with my assistant and give him all the details of what you are thinking, and I will give the bride and groom a private tasting. BM, fine, but I better see every piece of paper before it's signed. I take the ladies to another part of the office and listen to BM overtake everything, occasionally pointing out that a handsome young man such as myself shouldn't disappoint my mother when it's her time to plan my wedding. I just nod and smile and do my best to keep them busy while my friend gets the real story from the bride and groom. Back at the main consult, friend, so I can already tell there's some tension so let me assure you that my company has nothing but the best intentions to make your wedding day as grand as you envision. You, the bride and groom are our first priority, groom said to the bride, I told you they shouldn't have come, my mom caves to your mom's every whim, and we will get railroaded. Bride to groom, I know, but I couldn't say no, she says it's her God-given right to plan this and I don't know what else to do. Friend, let me assure you that my assistant is merely hearing their suggestions, this is the real consult. But before we go further, if we cater your wedding, who will be signing and paying for our services? Groom, us, I won't have a dime of their money be involved with our day. Friend smiles, perfect. They proceed with the rest of the consultation, going over menu options, service styles, table setups, timetables and coordinating with the bakery. The last thing they went over was allergies, the groom has a very severe allergy to peanuts, which has apparently been a problem with BM, she believes he should just keep eating them and you'll get over it eventually. Except the groom's allergy is basically, touch nut, full anaphylactic shock. We jot down a huge note that peanuts will not be anywhere near this wedding. Before the consult wraps up, my friend suggests putting passwords on the account, you never know who might try to change something, and the bride says no, but before they leave, the groom pulls my friend aside and says absolutely, but please don't give it to the bride. After their appointment ended, and the bride and groom left, and the mothers left, I went straight to the liquor room and my friend and I compared notes. As we suspected, the bride and groom wanted something almost entirely different than the mothers wanted, but since the bride and groom were paying and signing the contract, we shredded the mom's plans. The bride and groom opted for a plated dinner for 80, with an hour of or d'oeuvres and cocktail. The cake would be delivered by the bakery and their staff would handle it. All was relatively quiet with this contract, until three weeks before the wedding when a 6 foot 7, 260 pounds African American man came into our office. He said he was here about his cousin's wedding and gave the proper password. My friend and I sat down with him and he introduced himself as the bride's cousin and he's worried about the wedding. 
Earlier that week, the groom was admitted to the hospital after going into anaphylactic shock. BM lied to the bride and groom and fed him a meal where everything was cooked with peanut oil. He witnessed the whole thing and when he confronted his aunt, BM, she said it's a mind over matter thing. He wanted us to be aware that bride mother and bride father were uninvited and banned from the wedding, it was the bride's orders. There was a lot of drama with the other vendors and general wedding planning, and this was the final straw. Cousin also wanted us to know that he is a cop, and he'll be providing security at the wedding. He brought three of his cop friends with him and left one in the kitchen to keep BM from sneaking in and poisoning any more food. The day of the wedding was mostly drama-free until the reception started when BM and boyfriend showed up with a gaggle of their friends and tried to force their way into the wedding. Cousin took no shit, my friend and I backed him up as best we could. And they were ejected from the reception. BM tried one final time as the reception ended and the wedding party filtered out, she sat in her car until the bride and groom were visible then gunned her car at them. Cousin rushed them out of the way and BM smashed her car into the reception hall's front door. My friend and I witnessed the whole thing from the parking lot and rushed over to make sure the bride and groom were safe. We gave our statements to the police, and BM was. Arrested. The couple were shaken but not harmed. A few weeks after the wedding cousin showed up to our office again, he thanked us for everything we did to help his cousin enjoy her day. He told us that the groom told him everything we did was distracting BM and setting up passwords. He was grateful for everything we did and gave us his card, anytime we needed security he'd be sure to have our backs. Not long after this, he was shot in the line of duty and took a leave of absence from the police force for a bit to clear his head. Having previous experience as a bartender, we hired him on and he has been with us ever since. He still works as a cop but only at a desk in the precinct, and eventually he'd like to open his own bar. Bouncer has a heart of gold and the brawn of an ox, and we are glad to call him part of our team. BM went to jail and was cut out of the bride and groom's life, boyfriend divorced her. The happy couple just had a little bundle of joy a year ago, and are asking us to cater the baptism. GM was very apologetic for just going along with BM and was able to salvage the relationship with the couple. Oh and my friend and I were sued for damages, slander and breaking contract, by BM. The case was laughed out of court. Today I effed up by banging my girlfriend while my parents were home. So I had my girlfriend over in high school for the first time. She had met my family and parents, and everything was good. My parents liked her. She liked my parents. I had never even had a girlfriend or anything before, so my parents weren't completely used to their son having a lady over. Anyway, so we're upstairs in my bedroom, and we start getting a little freaky. Things escalate, and we eventually start making love. We were super quiet about it so that nobody would know. This is where things get hilariously terrifying. We're both stupid teenagers, and neither of us did this before, so we didn't lock the door, it wasn't even closed all the way since we weren't expecting to be doing things initially. So, I'm balls deep in my girlfriend as she's riding me, we're talking full on adult content. And my dad just casually walks into my room without knocking, and essentially gets a full ass view of my girlfriend's butt and my willy halfway up Main Street. He's so startled he made this really loud dough. Sounds like Homer Simpson, you know? He quickly turns away, pretending like he hadn't seen anything. This all happened in less than two seconds. I pulled the sheets over us so fast that I didn't even have time to pull out. My girlfriend is turning bright red. I can hear my mom downstairs say, honey? What was that? Because of how loud my dad yelped. My dad, God bless his soul, replies, I, uh, stubbed my toe. Don't worry about it. In the most defeated way possible. My girlfriend couldn't look at my dad the same way again, and neither could I. I haven't talked about it with my dad ever, it's been three years. However, now when I think of it, it is more funny than embarrassing. I am also still with said girlfriend and we bring it up with each other periodically, even though she doesn't find it as funny as I do, and gets super embarrassed. My friends all excluded me from their wedding and claimed I was ruining it. I, 28, used to have a friend group of about 10 people back when we were in middle and high school then college happened and we all drifted apart. Nothing happened to make us drift apart, just growing up and losing contact. Still friends but not talk all the time. Hang out regularly friends if that makes sense. But of course, some of us stayed close friends with each other. One person from this friend group Kayla, fake name, 28, is getting married in a few weeks. I didn't get an invitation but I wasn't hurt. I understood. We didn't stay close friends. But then I was hanging out with my best friend Bob, 28, who was also in that friend group, a few days ago and he mentioned that he was going to the wedding. I was a little surprised but I just told him I hoped he had a good time. He asked if I was going and I told him no, I didn't get an invite. He said that was strange because everyone else from the group was going. Two of them were plus ones as they were dating or married to other ones who got an invite. But they were all going and Kayla knew it and even told Bob she was really happy that the gang was getting back together on her special day. I told Bob I was kinda hurt by that, but I didn't want to make a big deal of it. Two days pass. Kayla calls me fuming mad that I was whining that I didn't get an invite to anyone who would listen. I told her that I wasn't. I explained to her what happened. She said that she's been getting texts and calls from other members of the group saying that she should have included me and wanted me to put a stop to it. I said I would do my best and that I was sorry that I caused her this trouble. She thanked me for the apology and hung up. I called Bob and asked him why he spread this around and he said that he didn't mean to. He felt bad that I was hurt and he wanted to ask someone else from the group if they knew why I wasn't invited and she spread it. Around I guess and everyone wanted to know why Kayla cut me out specifically so they started asking her. So I made a Facebook group chat with all of them and politely asked them to leave Kayla alone. That I was just hurt in the moment and vented about it to my best friend and that's where it should have stayed. They all said okay and apologized to Kayla. 
Yesterday Kayla made a Facebook post ranting about me without saying my name and said she had to hire security and give them a photo of me to make sure I didn't try to crash the wedding. Something I would never do. The comments under the post were calling her out. She called me again and screamed at me that I was ruining her wedding and told me that some of the friends are considering not going to the wedding now. And now I'm just wondering if I should have just kept my mouth shut or stood up for myself or what. My amazing coach told me I was wasted potential because I became a bench warmer after being the starting quarterback. Now I'm being recruited to a D1 school because of his little secret. I'm the starting senior quarterback for my high school football team, and I recently got recruited to play D1 football. I've been playing football since I was four and for years. My free time consisted of doing shuttle runs, three-cone drills, bench pressing, etc. My end goal being to go D1 for college football. I would push myself physically for hours on end every day, and with all of this vigorous training, you'd think I'd be tired and able to sleep easily, but it was actually the hardest part of my day. At the start of preseason, I was at the gym religiously, obsessing over my workouts and practicing with my team. However, something changed one night after a particularly hard day, my body forgot how to shut down properly and it took me hours to fall asleep. At first, I thought nothing of it because a little less sleep never hurt anybody, except that after only a few hours of sleep every single day, I was so out of it that I kept dropping the snap, and playing much worse overall. I thought the reason for this was nerves about the upcoming season, and the pressure to be the best, but whatever it was, I needed to fix it immediately. So, I tried various methods to get me back to my peak performance, like meditating, taking hot baths, and cutting caffeine, but nothing seemed to work. I was searching to find that one thing that would cure my lack of sleep. Little did I know, a single conversation was all it would take to change the trajectory of my football career. It was the first practice that my coach put the second string quarterback in over me. I could tell he was really disappointed and he asked why I was suddenly wasting my potential. I really didn't want him to think that, so I finally fessed up about my sleep problems and how nothing I had tried worked. He said that this wasn't worth making a fuss over, and took me into his office after practice. He handed me Portal Dream, and told me that taking it before bed would solve all my sleeping problems. I confessed I was skeptical about it, especially because I had already tried melatonin gummies, but he revealed something shocking that I still can't believe to this day. Coach has had a ton of other players struggle to play because they couldn't sleep, but he couldn't have his players lose their football career before it even started, so he did plenty of research to get them back on track. He ended up on Andrew Huberman's page, this neuroscientist with 5 million followers, and followed this guy's advice religiously. That's how he learned the exact formulation of a good sleep aid. Since Portal was the only thing that matched that formula, Coach ran with it. He even said athletes who made the switch had no problem playing games on Sunday, then heading to practice on Monday mornings. I was a lot more than willing to use it after hearing all this. I took the portal that night and after drinking it, it only took half an hour before I was knocked out, which might seem like a lot of time but I'd take that any day over staring at my ceiling for hours before nodding off. The next morning, I felt rested for the first time in a while after getting that sleep in. Even when I was woken up at 6am for morning practice, I completely balled out that practice and even coach noticed the difference. This was the turning point for me, I secured my starting spot back for the upcoming season, and we started it off with a 3-1 winning record. At the next game, I was informed by my coach that there were D1 college scouts there, so I knew I had to lock in. I stocked up on carbs, got some extra conditioning in, and took portal literally at 8pm. The next day, we ended up getting the W after a blowout win and I had four passing touchdowns. Then, the scout who I had been in contact with came up to me and offered me a spot. On their team next year, I officially signed the document to commit there a few days ago. This teenager accidentally set the world's most horrifying record after the police locked him up and forgot about him. In 1979 an 18-year-old Austrian teenage named Andreas Mihevex was mistakenly arrested for being a passenger in a car crash and was thrown into an ordinary holding cell. However, since out of the three cops that arrested him, each one of them mistakenly assumed that one of the other two cops was supposed to be the one to go and free him, nobody ended up freeing him at all. And since Andreas was locked in a cell in the isolated and deep basement of a police station, none of the police officers had any idea that he was still down there. Over the course of the first few days, Andreas desperately tried screaming at the top of his lungs to try notify somebody that he was still down there, but nobody came to get him. Even when Andreas' mother herself, very concerned for the well-being as well as the whereabouts of her son, came to the police station to ask where her son was being kept, the cops just kind of brushed her side and told her to mind her business. It wasn't until day 17 of Andreas being locked that the cops agreed to file a missing persons report. Just a day after that they finally found Andreas still in his cell after a janitor smelled something bad coming from the basement. The three officers did not get away scot-free however, and they were each fined a whopping $2,000 for negligence. Despite losing over 53 pounds, Andreas somehow ended up surviving. He also ended up being awarded $60,000, and to this day holds the world record for the longest time surviving without food and water at 18 days. Stalk me then break into my house in the middle of the night and propose? Enjoy your life crumbling. So I have this co-worker who has been really creeping me out for the last several months, and the worst part is the management have done nothing about it. This co-worker Alex introduced himself to me on the very first day of the job, and at first I thought it was sweet that he was willing to help, but I didn't realize how sinister his intentions actually were. On just my third day at the job he asked me out by bringing me a handwritten love letter where he mentioned the fact he loved me a few times and in it stated he cannot wait to raise our children. I told him sorry I was not interested as I just had a very bad and traumatic breakup and was not looking for a relationship, but he did not take this very well. His immediate response was, I see I'm not good enough for you, and he stormed off looking very angry. I was unsure of whether or not to report him, but I decided not to. That was a mistake in Hidnight, 
as over the next few weeks I started receiving anonymous love letters left at my desk in the mornings as well as flowers being delivered. I knew it was Alex as I recognized his handwriting and I went to confront him about it, but he ended up denying it of course. He asked me if I thought he was actually such a loser to try to pursue a woman who thought she was too good for him. I reported this to management and ended up getting told that by my boss and the letters or the flowers are not threats and there is no proof that this is indeed Alex and therefore there was nothing they could do about it. Life at work became very stressful thanks to Alex, as he moved on from love letters and flowers to sending me chocolates too, but specifically my favorite kind of chocolate. I have no clue how he found out what my favorite chocolate is, but I was now sure that he was somehow stalking me. My suspicions, unfortunately, were confirmed another few weeks later when there was a knock at my door. I was expecting a delivery driver and I opened up, only to see him standing there with a photo album. Before he even spoke I shut the door and I heard him yell that he was just going to leave the photo album at the door and that I could get it whenever I felt like it. I waited a few minutes before I saw him leave, and curiosity got the better of me. I ended up looking at the album and what I saw shook me to my core. The photo album consisted of pictures of me, taken from my IG page, with him photoshopped beside me, with one photo even making it look like we were making out. I felt sick to my stomach and called in sick the next day. The next time I went in I made sure it was on a day that Alex was off and I went straight to my boss's office and told him about everything Alex has been doing to harass me. I showed him the album too. The boss looked at it for a second saying he was not willing to pursue this as he saw this as nothing more than a romantic suggestion and that I shouldn't be so hard on people who are looking to date me. This comment was like a dagger to the heart as I realized my boss was never going to do anything to Alex. I had no idea why though, but then I found out. I asked nonchalantly around the office, and got word that Alex is my boss's nephew. It was then that I realized there was no way for me to be safe in this workplace, and so I put in my two weeks notice the very next day. Well, Alex got word of this immediately of course and started badgering me at work to please stay in the workplace as I was his only friend there. I told him I was not his friend and asked him to please leave me alone. You see, Alex was not liked by anyone in the workplace, as on top of being creepy, he was very incompetent and maintained a high position purely thanks to nepotism. The next two weeks before I left were the most horrible of my life. I had to deal with Alex showing up at my door four times unannounced begging to talk each time, as well as having to deal with letters stuck to the car windshield and flowers showing up at work. It all culminated just three days before I was due to leave work. It was nighttime and I was sleeping. I woke up to the sound of my alarm going off and someone clearly inside the house. I froze in a panic and my blood ran cold. I had absolutely no idea what to do, and I was 100% sure that this was indeed Alex. I feared for my life, thinking he was going to unalive or rope me, and then I heard him head up the stairs and call my name, telling me that he has a surprise for me. My fear made me freeze in place and my body physically could not move. I heard Alex checking the rooms, and then I saw him opening my door. I was still in the dark, too scared to even do anything, but despite it being the dark he noticed me. He turned the light on and looked at me, telling me I look so pretty when I'm scared. He proceeded to pull out a letter and read it to me. The letter was all about how much he loved me, and how he knew he needed to let me know how he really felt about me. He then got down on one knee and pulled out a diamond ring asking me to marry him. I still wasn't speaking, I was genuinely terrified. He came over to me and put the ring on and told me he can't wait for our wedding day. Something then clicked and I regained strength. I managed to sock him as hard as I could, connecting the ring with his cheek and cutting it, and I ran out of the room and locked myself in the bathroom where I called the cops. For the first time since I had reported him to the authorities, they were of some help. They came immediately and looked through the cameras inside my house to see Alex indeed breaking in. He had a car outside which he came with, and they were able to track him down and in the car they found a plethora of substances and pictures of me taken without my knowledge. Pictures through the window of my changing and things of that nature. To say I was traumatized would be an understatement, and I pressed charges in an instant. Not only did I press charges, I exposed what he did online by mentioning his name, I exposed my boss for allowing Alex to keep doing what he was doing, I leaked a lot of stuff about Alex online and found a way to reach his family and also let them know about Alex's doing. The trial is now underway and Alex has become deeply hated in our small town community and is an outcast. Update stalk me then break into my house in the middle of the night and propose? Enjoy your life crumbling. The trial is now officially over and Alex has been sentenced to three years in prison and my old boss has been thankfully fired. He did not face any legal consequences unfortunately as there were no grounds under which I could press charges on him too, but just like Alex he has also become deeply despised in this small town. What makes this glorious too is that, and are you ready for this, Alex had a wife and kids. I was never aware of this, and his wife has reached out to me apologizing profusely for her husband's actions. She told me that since Alex is in jail and the two twins are very young, they are going to be moving state far away from Alex and he will never see them again. She will also file for divorce and go through with that process while he is in jail. Alex has never been good at saving money and due to this their house was under her name, and she plans to stop renting it. This means that Alex will come back to being homeless. This, on top of the fact that this parents have disowned him, means that he will be very likely living on the streets, 
which makes me very happy to hear. Due to his criminal record it is unlikely he will find another job very easily, meaning overall he will be left dirt poor, homeless, without a wife and kids, disowned, and hated by everyone. As for me I will be moving states very soon and will start looking for a new job once I'm over there. I have also started online therapy to try heal from this situation, and I'm very hopeful for the future. My small PP boyfriend found out about my previous adult films career and is now insecure because I starred in BBC films. He packed his things and left. As much as I love my boyfriend and share everything with him, there is something that I've kept hidden from everyone I know including him, which is that 12 years ago I had a career in the adult films industry. It was during a dark period in my life, however, it was very brief career of only 9 months in the industry. I've made some scenes of different niches, but after 9 months inside I didn't like how the industry treated me, forcing me to do things I wasn't comfortable with, and I started to lose my identity. After a lot of therapy, I decided to get my life back and got out. A couple of years later after my exit from the industry I had some money saved and bought almost all of my work from the companies I filmed for and we signed a contract but they can't use the videos that I've bought from them. However, I didn't have any power over the people they sold these videos to previously. But since I had a brief career and almost no one recognizes me anywhere I go I thought no one probably had bought them. Since my retirement from the industry I had no contact with anyone from the industry at all, and even when I searched my name nothing appeared so I put everything behind me and moved on with my studies, got my degree, and launched my business. I never told anyone about my past or that I ever did adult films, none of my friends knew, neither my parents. To me it was a period that never existed. So, about three weeks ago, my boyfriend's architectural company had a gathering for its employees to celebrate their annual achievements. We were having fun there, my boyfriend talked to some of his friends, and disappeared for some time. He then came back with a look on his face, spent some time talking to some of his friends with me then said we need to get home. I was worried, as I thought there's something happened with his work or something. When we got back home he pulled out his phone and asked me is that you? And it was me in one of my adult film scenes I've shot. It was a BBC niche scene with more than one performer having turns on me. I was mortified, and asked him how he got that and told me one of his friends has an adult films library he's been creating since his teenage years and he recognized me downloaded the video from his cloud storage and shared it with my boyfriend asking him if it was me in the video, and how lucky he is to date an adult film star. I started crying, and told him these days were 12 years ago and since then I've done none of these scenes again, and told him the whole story. He said it's okay, and that he has no right to judge me for my past, and let's move forward. The problem is, he didn't. Now my boyfriend's member is a little below average around 3.5 inches. But he knows how to use his extremely well. And he never seemed insecure about his size at any time during our dating time. But since he discovered this video he became distant and somehow uncomfortable around me, and even lost desire in me, like when I try to touch him he says he's not in the mood and goes to watch TV outside. Two nights ago, I asked him to talk and asked him what's happening? We started talking and then he said, that he always struggled with his insecurity regarding his size, and he knows that a big portion of guys are bigger than him, so he compensates for that by his performing well and enhancing his craft, but how could he compete with what he saw me having in the video? I told him there's nothing for him to worry, in the video, all he's seen is just an act, and it wasn't pleasant as it seems, it's all for the camera. He then said that if it's all an act how come I had more than one instance of crossing the finish line in the scene? I was again mortified as I didn't expect him to watch the whole scene, but I kept telling him that he's the one I love, and his size is the perfect size for me. And me having. Those finishes was just a body reaction. I had no emotional connection, and now that I'm with him I'd never trade him for anyone he answered by saying even if he believed me, it's in his head now, whenever he touches me he would see the image of me having intimacy with 11 inches and that is something huge for him, and to please leave him alone for some time. No matter what I say to him, it's like I'm talking to a wall, he's just not listening. I don't know what to do now? Yesterday he told me he'd go to the cabin to clear his head for some time and when I asked when will you return he said he doesn't know when, he packed some clothes and left in the morning. I'm at lost as he never seemed the insecure type to me at all. I tried to reach out to him via text and phone calls but apparently he closed his phone as all I get is his voicemail. Update my small PP boyfriend found out about my previous adult films career and is now insecure because I starred in BBC films. He packed his things and left. Today morning I received a call from my boyfriend. When I answered he said to please don't speak and just listen to him and he said the following, I have nothing to apologize for, doing adult films is not a shameful thing and it's been more than a decade ago, it's not like I was doing it while I was with him. He'd like to know more about my brief adult films career which is the 9 months I spent in it if I'm willing to talk about it, if not then that's okay. He'd like to apologize to me for any hardship or heartache he's caused. The reason why he went away to clear his head is not cause I've done adult films, but cause this specific scene was what he saw during his teenager years and his nightmares. Seeing his partner being railed by more than one person with bigger PP than his. Watching this made him relive this period of his life, which is why he needed space away from everyone not only me to clear his head, and focus on everything that can counter his feeling of insecurities. 
During his day in the cabin he replayed our four years relationship in his mind from every aspect even the intimate one, and it appears that we've had healthy and satisfying intimate life. He called his old therapist and told him about his insecurities, the therapist asked him if I doesn't have an opinion of her own, or that if she would continue in a relationship where she's not both emotionally and actually satisfied? And when he said to him no, she's not that person if she's not satisfied she'd go. That's when he got his answer. The last thing, he really loves me and wants to be back with me, however, whether we like it or not something in his subconscious has been triggered, so our intimacy life will be a little bit awkward for some time, and we would need some couples therapy as well. So if I'm okay with that he would like to be back with me as soon as possible. When? He finished his words I was on top of the world. I told him to get back please at once, and an hour later he was with me at our apartment. We kissed we hugged and we cried a lot. Then we sat down and I told him about everything, why I did adult films and why I couldn't continue in the industry, how I was humiliated, used and possibly roped at some point when I was inside. The reason why I bought the rights to my scenes after I quit so no one can see me in that aspect anymore. We also talked about his co-worker, we've both known him for a little over a year. He told me that this person called him while he was away telling him he recognized me after about four months of knowing us while he was browsing his adult films collection, but was afraid to talk to my boyfriend for the fear of his reaction. My boyfriend now tells me it's all bullcrap as he chose this moment to tell him that because the company is approaching a big deal and he wanted my boyfriend out of the picture and the only way he could do that was to mentally cripple him. I asked him about if this co-worker told other people about this scene if it would cause him any embarrassment, he said it won't be easy for him given how society views intimacy performers, however, it won't be embarrassing, if anyone who should be embarrassed are them not us. I also asked what would it be if his parents knew, and he said that he told his mom about it but not his dad, and that she has no problem with it as long as he's happy and that she loves me anyway so it won't change how she feels about me. I asked him why he told her, and he told me because I envision a very long relationship together in the future. Our first therapy session would be next Monday. We both know it's nowhere near this simple, and it would be extremely hard with a lot of hardships. But we both love each other and are willing to take the trip together. Am I wrong for calling my mom an out-of-line attention-seeking entitled B-word? I, 17, came out as transgender when I was 14, I have always liked more masculine clothing and shorter hair, but also because of sensory issues as I am autistic. My mother, 62, does not approve and never has. I do not care if she accepts me or not, I just want her to understand that this is too far. My cousin Rose, 23, is getting married in 3 days. I am very excited for the wedding and am so happy she found someone she can spend the rest of her life with. We have always been very close and she is like a sister to me, even accepting me when I came out and taking me to go shopping for clothes that made me comfortable. That being said, my mother has demanded I wear a dress for this, at first I argued but I reluctantly agreed not wanting the drama. A few hours ago she showed me the dress she wants me to wear. I asked her for a simple purple dress, but she said that wasn't good enough and I need to wear something to bring her little girl back, to which she pulled out the most Disney princess ball gown I have ever seen. To describe the dress it is literally way fancier than the dress my cousin, the bride, chose to wear. I told her there is no way in hell I'm wearing that, and I agreed to wear a simple dress or I'm going in a suit. She screamed at me that she just wanted one picture of her daughter looking nice. I told her that she doesn't have a daughter and even though I agreed to wear a dress she needs to get over herself because my cousin's wedding is not the time and place for it. She said that the only son she has is my brother and if I do not wear the dress she won't drive me to the wedding, and will wear the dress herself. I started sobbing and said that I'm her son too, and I just want her to love me and treat me like she does my brother. She said I was not her son, I was an abomination to humanity and that she wasn't going to take me to the wedding if I kept this up. I got angry. And screamed at her, saying that if anyone wore that dress it would completely ruin the wedding for Rose and that I refuse to wear that dress because it will make her absolutely lose it. She yelled back that she would wear the dress, but she'll give me a change to change my mind. I screamed again and said you are going to ruin the wedding, she has been looking forward to this for a year. She's never going to want to talk to us again because you're an out of line attention seeking entitled B word. And I stormed up to my room, where I've been for the past few hours crying. My mom came to my room and said if I want to be such a jerk, I can just stay in there and not to come out until I agree to wear the dress because everything will be fine and I'm overreacting like all teen girls do. I love my cousin and don't want to miss her wedding, but if I wear that dress she will absolutely hate me. Was I wrong for what I said? I feel like I said what was needed but I'm unsure. I got in the car with the itchy heavy princess dress on and my mom said I look like the prettiest young girl she's ever seen, that only made me more pissed and happy about destroying the dress. The whole ride to the venue my mom had a crap eating grin on her face and kept saying she knew I'd come around to it eventually and I look so much better this way. When we got to the venue I was the last one out of the car, and holy crap was that dress heavy, it actually weighed about 5 pounds and my shoulders were unaliving me, I was so eager to run in the venue and destroy it myself, but I knew I had to wait. We started walking to the entrance and the second we got to the front gate and I stepped inside, the sound of a cowbell rang out in the direction of the maid of honor and she yelled no white aloud and I was met with the sound of a splat, then heard open fire. And then I was met with a glorious surprise of objects being thrown at my torso and legs, what was being thrown at me you ask? Water balloons filled with ice many different fun things, dark blue fabric dye, green fabric dye, Mod Podge and rainbow glitter, beetroot juice and red wine. All of them hit with a glorious rainbow splatter of stuff that was never going to come out. My mom let out a blood-curdling scream and my uncle said she nearly fainted. 
She was absolutely livid and started screaming about how my dress what ruined and what was I going to wear now? The maid of honor explained that she was supposed to do that to all the white dresses that weren't the brides, my mom explained the dress wasn't white. The maid of honor looked absolutely shocked, she's an amazing actor, and started crying, she can cry on command, and apologized profusely. She put on a show of trying to clean it all off, but it only spread it around more. She said she'd take me to one of the rooms to get cleaned up. As she lead me away to be cleaned up I expected to be taken to the room the bridesmaids were getting ready, but what I didn't expect was that she handed me off to the best man and when I asked her where we were going she said you're one of the fellas, so you shouldn't be with the bridesmaids. I was lead to the area with the groomsmen. I walked inside and immediately saw all the groomsmen getting ready and a few of them helping the groom. The best man went up and talked to the groom and that was when the groom came in and asked me to sit down for a minute, there's been a small change of plans. I sat nervously in one of the chairs and he said he appreciated everything I've done for my cousin, and how he appreciated that I've been a reason for her to live for so long, she attempted suicide back in 2010 and 2018, and how if I'm that important to her, I'm that important to him. He then said he was sorry it was so last minute but asked me if I would accept the role as one of his groomsmen as he found an extra suit last minute and it might not fit properly but I'd still look amazing. This made me sob. Uncontrollably and I immediately accepted and he pulled me into a hug, one of those awkward side hugs. He told me that he had some extra tape for my chest in the bathroom if I wanted, but my cousin also got me a binder that he put in the bathroom and I went to get changed into my suit, this took a while, I came out and he helped me fix my collar. He patted me on the shoulder and I couldn't help but start crying. He hugged me again and said if I'm worried about my mom, not too, there are precautions if she tries anything. I said it wasn't about my mom, that I have never felt so loved and cared for by anyone and how I was so happy to see my cousin found a good man who makes her happy. He smiled and tried to hide he was tearing up, he quickly wiped his eyes, and the best man said it was time for all of us to go outside. We all piled outside and I was lead to an area where we lined up with the bridesmaids, I was paired up with my cousin's friend Daisy 16F, who was a very nice girl. The music started and we all started walking down the aisle, and then it was my turn, I heard the dreaded what the hell did you do to my baby, shouted from the middle row of the chairs as I was halfway there, but I didn't turn back, I just kept walking with my head held high. I got in line behind the other's groomsmen and saw that my mother was red in the face, visibly shaking, and she was crying a little. I made eye contact and smiled wide at her then looked away, only for her to scream you ungrateful brat. You absolute freak. You've ruined everything I worked for. Do you know how hard it was to raise a freak like you? While trying to charge at me, but she ended up being stopped by some of the other groomsmen, and she ended up being dragged out by security while screaming you're out of my house, do you effing hear me? I want you out of my effing house. Once she was gone, the rest of the wedding went really well. My cousin looked absolutely stunning walking down the aisle. I started crying a little because I realized that these people are my true family. The ceremony was beautiful, and the reception was amazing too. My cousin ended up giving a speech talking about how she was thankful for everyone who came, and then she said I am especially proud of Astorin, my little brother, we have always been there for each other and I am so proud of the boy he is and young man he's becoming. Yes I absolutely started sobbing. So that's basically how it went. When we got back to the hotel, I grabbed my bags from my old room I shared with the wicked witch, my, not anymore, mom, and brought them to my aunt and uncle's room. My parents want me to give my PS5 to my crap-eating brothers. Am I the a-hole for selling my PS5 rather than sharing it with my stepbrothers? My, 15, mom and dad met and briefly dated while they were both studying at uni. My mom gave birth to me after they had broken up and had to sue my dad for child support. I was raised by my mom and had virtually nothing to do with my dad throughout my childhood. My mom was an international student and her family cut ties with her due to the circumstances of my birth. Tragically, two years ago, I lost my mom to cancer and thus I was placed under the care of my dad. My dad has remarried and has two sons, five and seven, with his wife. It wasn't a bad arrangement at first, but we were all essentially strangers. I was given a bedroom to myself and we shared some meals but other than keeping to myself. After a while, they started to act up. They would constantly pull pranks on me and I swear to you, I think they ate crap before. I saw them rummaging through the toilet one day after I forgot to flush. Anyway, about 10 months ago, I was lucky enough to score a casual job at an aged care facility as its support. It was stupid easy money as it involved installing and maintaining a dozen or so common PCs used by the residents plus running basic computing workshops. I ended up accruing a whole lot of disposable income in a short time. Stupidly, instead of just keeping quiet about it, I decked out my room with a new TV, headphones and a PS5. Obviously, this setup was of great interest to my two stepbrothers. Initially, my rule was that they could play the PS5 anytime I wasn't using it but I would get first dibs if I wanted to play or use my TV. I was also super accommodating by buying an extra controller, which I didn't need, and several kid-friendly games that they wanted to play. I eventually had to change the rule to only play when I was there because the 5 years o destroyed one of my controllers through spilling juice on it. This is where the drama started. They whined to my parents who then ordered me to place the PS5 in the living room. I refused stating that I had purchased it with my own money. This led to their argument that I have too much money and should contribute rent, utilities and food money. I called their bluff and said sure, draw up a contract and I'll get a lawyer to review it to ensure it complies with the Family Law Act. My dad then told the boys that he was going to buy a separate PS5 for the boys for Christmas but the dude is clueless about the global shortage. Finally last night, after realizing that he had zero chance of buying one for close to RRP, my dad threatened me to either voluntarily give my PS5 to the boys for Christmas or he would toss it in the bin while I was at school. I was so pissed that I went on Facebook Marketplace and sold the PS5. 
The boys found out today and were devastated. I feel really bad because they shouldn't be punished for this crap show. My parents are in their room talking about me and I'm sitting here in my room. Am I the a-hole? How could I have handled this better? My huge husband attacked my innocent son. I, 34, married my husband, 40, 10 years ago. He had twin boys from a previous relationship that are now 19 and almost 20. I love these boys so much. Although they are not my bio sons, they are mine and no one can tell me otherwise. I legally adopted them a few years ago as well. So they are mine. I came home from a shopping spree and dropped off my older son at the airport. When I walked in, I heard my husband yelling and cursing. I got closer where he was in his office, hitting our younger son while he was on the ground. I begged him to stop and eventually he did. I rushed to comfort our son and he aggressively grabbed my arm and demanded I don't lay a hand on him. I stressed that he was hurt and he was our son, my husband retaliated he's not our son, he's a pathetic man that needs get the heck out of my house by the morning kicked him and walked away dragging me with him and not minding my paste. We got to our room and he locked the door and went to the bathroom to shower. I went brought him new clothes and went back to sit on the bed. After some time, the water turned off and then I went to see if he was calm. I found him sitting on the floor crying. He cried all night while holding me and only just fell asleep less than an hour ago. My husband is the personification of a gentle giant. He's 7 feet 2 inches, over 400 pounds, buff and used to box. But this man would never hurt anything. I mean if I asked him to take care of a bug for me, he will slowly pick it up while talking to it and then take it outside. He has never had a loud voice or shown any aggression. So I've never seen him that way before. Our son is 6 feet 6 inches and almost 300 pounds and does football himself meanwhile I'm 5 feet 8 inches and 127 pounds after seeing the damage he did to our son, I'm very frightened to think of what he could do to me. Turns out my son isn't so innocent. I was able to get some details on the cause of the fight. My husband didn't sleep for long, after some hours, he woke. Up again really upset and wouldn't say anything to me. He went to the bathroom and cried for a few minutes. I texted my son threatening him and he finally called back. He wouldn't tell me what happened either, he just told me he was fine and kept apologizing to me and I didn't know why. After my husband's shower, he got out and went outside. He didn't take his phone, wallet, keys or even shoes. While he was gone I went to go see my son and he locked himself in the room and kept apologizing to me. I had picked up food on my way and forced him to open door so I can feed him since I know he hadn't eaten. He did open door and I got to feed and hold him. I know people said I should have left but I just felt off so I went home to bring my husband some food and in hopes he would be in a better state to tell me. I waited some hours when he finally came back. I stood my ground and demanded he tell me, I told him how I felt about the whole situation and how upset I was with him, and threatened to call the cops and even divorce. He fell down and cried again. I comforted him for some time and then he went upstairs and came back down with a his suitcase packed. He didn't say anything to me, and took my arm and brought me to his office. He made me sit on his chair readying me to look at something on the screen. He started crying and apologized profusely. On his desk my son's iPad was there. He opened the computer and there was a flood of pictures and videos of me in very inappropriate situations. And these were things from my son's tablet. Whenever I'm on my period and have bad cramps, I like to lay on the tub and let the hot shower run on me and oftentimes I fall asleep. There were so many pictures of me in that positions. There were pictures of me getting dressed, picking up things, in intimate positions with my husband when we obviously thought they couldn't see, and even from our bedroom, there were pictures. There were even some where he touched me while I was sleeping. There was just so much. I'm a very curvy woman and get looked at intimately a lot outside but I have never expected that from my son. Especially because at their schools their classmates talk about my body and he is always defensive and protective of me. I don't have a habit of dressing immodestly around the house when the kids are home but there have been instances where I'll wear some leggings or really fitted top or dress. My husband told me he'd be staying at his friend's house to give me space and I couldn't bring myself to say anything asking him to stay because I didn't want to be alone at that moment. He left and left me sitting there looking at myself in very vulnerable positions that my son captured. I don't know what he does with these photos. I feel so vulnerable and dirty right now. Crashed my homewrecker sister's wedding with my ex. I, 24, was with my ex fiance N, 27, since I was 13 and he was 15. He was my first love, my first everything. We got engaged when I was 20 and about 6 months after we found out we were expecting. Unfortunately I miscarried a couple days later. That was the worst moment of our lives. We always dreamed about starting a family early so this was a major blow to us individually and to our relationship. I fell into deep depression and I admit I was wrong for only caring for the lost I felt and not my partners. We argued a lot, he partially blamed me and I accused him of not knowing how it felt to lose a life you were growing inside you. We were hurting each other and decided to separate for a while, that while turned into a year. We still kept in contact, I went to therapy and worked on healing myself, he even came to a few sessions with me. We decided to get back together shortly after my 23rd birthday. However the relationship wasn't the same. He was somewhat withdrawn from me and I thought it was because he still blamed me. I was sick overthinking and worrying. It got to the point where I was going backwards in my process so I decided to snoop through his phone. I found out during the year we separated he had been confiding in my sister, 27, and it turned to something intimate. He cut it off when we got back together but the damage was done. She was pregnant. Turns out my parents knew about this and some of our friends. I kicked him out and cut off everybody who knew. Well a couple weeks ago I got an invite to the wedding. Something snapped inside of me, I got drunk and I took a cab to my parents' house where they were throwing a party for them. Most of my family was there, I basically showed up and gave a whole F you speech to everybody. 
my sister ran upstairs in tears and my parents called me in a hole for ruining the prospect of their wedding. I said good because nobody apologized to me, everybody just kept. Saying we were separated, things happen people fall in love, I should be happy for them, the heart wants what I wants. The worst part is my sister told me maybe my baby died for a reason so she could get her happy ending. I entitled good for nothing niece thinks she deserves more than my son. I told her I'd never love her like I love him. When I, 43, was 18 and when my sister, 47, was 22 at the time I had my nephew, let's call him Luke, with her then boyfriend, now husband. My sister and her husband didn't have any interest in Luke when he was born so I took the role of taking care of him. I got my grandmother, she's an angel, to watch him while I was in my last year of high school in exchange for me cleaning and cooking for her on the weekends. My parents weren't much help either, they would give me about $100 a month for Luke, and if you have a kid then you know it's not much. Me and my grandmother were the only ones to take care of him. A year after I graduated from high school I was kicked out with my nephew because my parents, sister, and her husband didn't want to deal with us anymore. My sister said she wished she never gave birth to him. I immediately went to my grandmother and we went to a family law attorney and I got custody of him and my sister and her husband signed their rights to me. I lived with my grandmother and when I went to community college and my part-time job she watched my son, Luke. It was a lot of work especially when my grandmother passed away when my son was six. My grandmother left 90% of her things to me in her will, which caused my parents and sister to reach out to me under false intentions to meet my son and I to reconnect. That didn't last long and I told them they could either act right or never see us again. My dad decided to actually reconnect with my son and I and now we're close, while my mom and I don't really talk much but she treats Luke nice. When Luke was 8 both me and my sister became pregnant and that's when my sister decided she wanted my son back and started to tell him that me and my husband wouldn't love him anymore once my actual son came along. My husband met my son when he was 5 and we were already together for a year before he met my son. My husband treats Luke like his and we got married when my son was 7 and adopted him when he was 9, with my son's permission. We found out that my sister was saying this when one day he broke down crying asking us not to leave him after we told him that would never happen. He explained what my sister and her husband were saying. Luke knows that he's not my biological son but he is my son. After that I cut contact with my sister and her husband again and did family therapy and individual therapy for my son. When I had my son, one pregnancy, two children, I made it clear that our love for him, Luke, didn't change. When my sister reached out about two years later I decided to go low contact with her with the okay with my son and husband. My husband and I live comfortably while my sister and her husband struggle sometimes financially. My kids did extracurricular activities, got the presents they wanted, and went on one big family trip in the summer. While my sister and her husband couldn't afford much, so when my niece was around 9 my sister started making comments about how I needed to pay for this or that for my niece but I told her it wasn't my job. I gave my niece the gifts she wanted, took her out from time to time but nowhere near how I would treat my own kids. Now my son, second, is turning 17 and my husband and I were talking about getting him a cheap starter car. We did the same for Luke when he was 17. My niece is also turning 17 and apparently my sister told her she was going to get a car too. The thing is my sister can't afford to buy her a car so she asked me to but I told her I wasn't going to buy her a car. That I didn't promise her one and that it's not my job to get her one. My sister then got mad and didn't talk to me for a while. When my son's 17th birthday came around we surprised him with a car. My niece then called me a couple of days later screaming and crying asking me why I hate her and why I can't treat her the same as her brother. I calmly told her things were different, her brother is my son while she is my niece. I'm her aunt and nothing more, that as an aunt my job was birthday presents, Christmas presents, and showing up when it mattered, that was it. That her brother will always be more to me than she'll ever be. Then my niece started yelling at me again telling me that I'm being unfair and hung up. My sister then called me to berate me about how I need to do more, I told her if she wouldn't have promised a car to her or my money to my niece no of this wouldn't have happened. It's been a couple of days and I'm getting calls from some family and some of my sister's friends calling me a bitch and some other things. I do feel bad because my kids did grow up with more and I guess I could have helped more. My nightmare mother-in-law decided to throw herself a baby shower so I told her she'll never see my child after she's born. My husband and I are expecting our first child and have recently moved closer to his family as I've gone no contact with mine due to them covering my father being a child lover. Anyway, my mother-in-law is a nightmare, she has never liked me and never thought I was good enough for her baby boy. She has told me so directly on many occasions. She also pressured us heavily into giving her grandkids, and now that I am pregnant, she has been referring to the baby as her baby this entire time. She will say things like I can't wait for my baby to be born. My baby is going to be so loved. This rubs me the wrong way of course and I often feel like lashing out, but my husband tells me to ignore her. So, my mother-in-law recently wanted to throw me a baby shower and invite her friends. She said they made an agreement a long time ago that they would celebrate each other's kids' weddings and births. My husband and I eloped and declined a reception for her friends since we don't know them. My mother-in-law told me that I owed it to her to let her throw the baby shower since I hurt her friend's feelings by not having a wedding reception. I asked if I could invite my friends, and she said no, that this was for her friends and that if my friends wanted to throw me a shower they could. I reluctantly agreed. My husband and I spent hours on our registry, and my mother-in-law asked for it so she could share with her friends. She said she forwarded the registry on. She asked me what design I wanted on my cake and cookies. I told her flowers because I am decorating the nursery in a garden theme. Throughout the whole planning process, my mother-in-law and I conversed about the shower. 
She kept telling me, this is going to be so wonderful, you're going to love it. My friends are so excited for you. I can't wait to see what everyone gets you. Well, the shower came and edit they provided. Me with a mother to be sash and my mother-in-law a granny to be sash to wear. I noticed that the theme of the shower was circus animals. The cake had an elephant and balloons on it, and the cookies were animals. At first I thought that maybe the floral theme was just too difficult, so I rolled with it until it was time to open presents. Thing is, every present was some sort of circus animal. Onesies, blankets, toys, nothing on my registry. I was a little confused and even went so far to check my registry to make sure I hadn't goofed up and changed everything. I thanked everyone for their gifts and tried to sound as gracious as possible, but I was so confused. My husband, who is a little less tactful than I am, showed up at the end of the shower and noticed the theme right away. He goes what's up with all the circus animals? He looks at the presents and says, this isn't what we asked for. Then he looked at his mom and goes, mom. What did you do? She smiled and said, I didn't like the theme you chose for my baby. I'm going to decorate my baby's nursery at my house with circus animals, so I created a registry for myself. My husband said, you did what? She says, my baby is going to need a room at my house so I threw a shower for myself. I lost my composure and told her that she would not see my baby and to stop calling the baby hers, and my husband told his mom that she's delusional if she thinks we're going to allow this. My husband then told her that because she had the audacity to do this, she will never be seeing our child as long as she keeps displaying this type of psychopathic behavior. She started crying and said we are just withholding her baby from her. We've been getting texts from his family since the shower, calling us selfish and ungrateful and saying we ruined her joy of being a grandma. Update my nightmare mother-in-law decided to throw herself a baby shower so I told her she'll never see my child after she's born. I spoke with my husband last night before we went to bed and told him that I feel like we need to say something to the extended family sooner rather than later. I said I understand he wants to respond logically and not emotionally, but that I also feel like us not saying anything looks like we have something to hide. He agreed and said that he will send a well-worded response later today. He just wants to think of how to word it before sending anything. I can respect that, he wants to make the situation better, not worse. He wants to make sure he keeps what he says neutral and to the point. He's also not sure what to say to his mom at this point. He said once he sees how the family reacts to the whole story then he'll be able to make a better judgment of how to approach her. There had been zero discussion with her about setting up a room at her house for the baby. I asked my husband last night if she had mentioned anything to him about it, and he said no, other than she suggested we add a pack and play to our registry so we can have a portable crib. He said he was as shocked as I was to find out that she had intended on setting up a full-fledged nursery at her house and that he had no idea she was throwing a shower for herself. I asked him why he didn't take me seriously when I said that her calling the baby her baby made me uncomfortable, and he said that he thought it was just a generational thing as his grandmother did the same thing. I asked why he didn't ask her to stop, and he said he wishes he had and feels bad for not taking me more seriously. He said he knows I have trauma from the years of abuse at my parents' hands and thought maybe I was reacting due to that, but now he sees that it goes beyond that. He also knows that. Due to my past experiences, I tend to blame myself for things and don't stand up for myself even. Though I should. He repeated that his mom is notorious for making things about herself, but that he had no clue she would go to this extent. We agreed that if she had just been honest with her intent, then we would have been okay with it, maybe a little weirded out if we're being honest here, but we would have allowed it. What bothers both of us the most is the extent she went to deceive us rather than just having a conversation with us. We had no clue grandparent showers were a thing, either. We're not certain we want to go 100% no contact with mother-in-law at this time, but we want to keep our distance from her for now. We did agree that she will not be allowed to be alone with the baby for the foreseeable future. The hospital that I'm giving birth in allows infants to stay in the room with the mother, so my husband and I have agreed that the baby will stay with us as much as possible. We're still up in the air as to whether we're going to allow visitors at the hospital, some of that will determine how I feel after the birth, if I end up needing a C-section, etc. Mother-in-law definitely will not be allowed in the room while I'm delivering, no one but the husband and our medical staff. The big thing we agreed on is that we want our baby to be loved and safe and secure. He knows that I don't have a family to fall back on, other than my brother and my friends. We want our baby to have a sense of family that I did not have growing up. Husband's dad and stepmom have been absolutely amazing from the second we announced our pregnancy to them, and I have no doubt the two of them will be loving, doting grandparents. Honestly I suspect mother-in-law will be a good grandma, but she's going to have to earn my and my husband's trust again. Update 2 My nightmare mother-in-law decided to throw herself a baby shower so I told her she'll never see my child after she's born. My husband talked to his brother yesterday and what he found out was something which I suspected but greatly feared. Turns out that my mother-in-law is plotting to take my child, but it's not because she wants the baby to be hers. You see, it's because she thinks I'm going to end up like my own parents and be very abusive. My own mother was physically and emotionally abusive to me and my brother and my mother-in-law seriously thought I would turn out this way. My mother-in-law told basically everyone that I'm mentally unstable so she's preparing a room for when, not if, my husband leaves with the baby when I have a psychotic breakdown and attempt to unalive them both. 
The baby shower was a ruse to try to get a rise out of me and show her friends how unstable I am, but my husband ruined it by showing up and being the one to really say something. I mouthed off a bit, but my mother-in-law was hoping to really push me over the edge. I assumed that my baby comments were testing the waters as well. I've been in therapy for years, and I've been working on my own fears of being like my parents with my therapist. We have a weekly standing appointment on Zoom. I've also talked with my OB and psychiatrist about staying on my medication and watching closely for signs of postpartum depression. My husband has been a part of all these conversations and has sat in therapy with me multiple times. I'm not violent or known to have violent outbursts. I tend to withdraw and be non-confrontational when I'm upset. I can't say I fault my mother-in-law for having concerns, but I wish she'd gone about showing it in a completely different manner, such as talking with me and my husband. He has half a mind to go to her house and just rip her a new one, but I told him no. We're not going to fight fire with fire. If she talked with me about her concerns, I feel we wouldn't have reached this point. She's seen my arms and legs, which have marks from abuse. I would have told her I shared those concerns and then told her what steps I'm taking to prevent them. I haven't told her about having those worries because, ironically enough, I didn't want her to worry. I don't want to keep my daughter from a grandparent who loves her. I just wish things had been handled a little differently. I overheard my in-laws talking about framing me for cheating on my wife so she can get back with her ex-husband. I have been with my wife Abby for six years now, and every day that goes by I love her more and more and we're even expecting our first baby. Whenever the holidays come around, we always spend a few months visiting my wife's family. They have been very two-faced to me. Their words are nice but there is a very obvious undertone of them disliking me whenever they speak. Especially when I speak about my upbringing or childhood. They see me as a hooligan and criminal due to the fact I grew up in an orphanage. So, when my wife and I came this year, the whole family was really excited, saying that Alan is coming. In all the years in the family I never heard of Alan. My wife didn't even care about this Alan so I thought it was just some cousin. However, the famous Alan, literally described as tall, handsome, rich and easygoing with a perfect smile and chiseled abs by my mother-in-law, was my wife's ex-husband and first love. When he arrived I tried to get along with Alan, but the man just ignored me and took every chance to get closer with my wife by making jokes about the intimacy they used to have or talking about the past. I didn't take it personally because I didn't want to look jealous, but when he was joking about him railing my wife, it was very hard to keep my mouth shut. Lately he has been coming every day to visit the family and Abby's family has started comparing his accomplishments to mine aloud. They're all big fans of Alan and I honestly feel jealous of that because they're treating him better than me. So, two days ago I heard my mother-in-law and brother-in-law talking about how how nice it would have been for Abby to stay with Alan because he's a smart man and a much better man than me. What hurt me the most was hearing my brother-in-law say that he can try to get Alan and Abby back together and my mother-in-law just laughed saying that it would be good. To go on a trip to Europe every year and not to the countryside with the peasant, talking about me. I then heard my mother-in-law continue speaking and suggest framing me for cheating. She said they should make a fake online dating profile, and my brother-in-law laughed along saying that might be something worth considering. Hearing this really opened my eyes and with this knowledge, I'm starting to notice how my brother-in-law makes many comments to my wife about how great Alan is. Abby entertains this sometimes, but most of the time shuts my brother or mother-in-law down. Update I overheard my in-laws talking about framing me for cheating on my wife so she can get back with her ex-husband. I decided to talk with my wife Abby about what I heard my mother and brother-in-law saying. The moment I finished speaking, Abby just kissed my forehead and ran with her pregnant belly out of the bedroom to literally yell at everyone in the living room to tell them how disgusting they are and how Alan is half the man I am. No one spoke besides an aunt who tried to justify them by saying that they were just making jokes. At some point Abby told her mother, whether you like it or not, I'm married to this man. I'm going to have this baby with him, so shut up and bear with it. Then my wife yelled at her brothers and went with them to talk in private. My brother-in-laws talked with me and admitted that they were only doing that because they believed I was forcing Abby to marry and live in a farm far away from the family, even though she herself has told them it was actually her idea to get married in private and live in the farm. The three brothers apologized to me and were really embarrassed about their behavior saying they only invited Alan to mess with me. After that most of the family members apologized to us, Abby told everyone that she doesn't want to see Alan in the house anymore while we're here. She's not going to forbid them to talk with him, but doesn't want to see him near her because it's uncomfortable, and the fact that everyone allowed him to make jokes about them having intimacy was deeply disgusting. My mother-in-law tried to complain but Abby just said shut up mom and left the room with me. In the bedroom Abby confessed to me that she also felt uncomfortable but since Alan is a friend of the family she preferred not to say anything other than throw passive-aggressive comments at him. For example, after New Year's we were all eating and Alan stroked her belly without asking, to which my wife said, do that again and I'll bite you, so he never did that again. Abby even said that she actually talked with Alan and told him that she dislikes being touched by other people. Alan responded saying she was overreacting and left her talking alone. I feel really stupid for not noticing how uncomfortable my wife also was feeling. Just out of curiosity, I asked her why she broke up with Alan. I'll admit it, he's really charismatic and seems very successful. Abby told me that he always treated her as if he knew everything and explained things that she already knew every time they talked. He would literally explain to her how to use the toaster as if she was a three-year-old. Abby never felt the need to talk about that relationship because it wasn't relevant and she sees me as her first love and not Alan. I apologize to Abby for not noticing how uncomfortable she was and only looking at my own feelings without talking about it as a couple. Abby also apologized for the same, we promise to communicate this kind of thing to each other no matter what. 
Yesterday we went on a date together and when we came back my mother-in-law looked very unfriendly but she apologized to my wife. Abby said she should apologize to me. My mother-in-law and I talked for a while alone and although I'm still upset we promised to at least be civil with each other for Abby and the baby. For now Alan is not longer in the picture because yesterday I got his number to send a message clarifying why he can't come back and why I don't want him near my wife, the man just blocked me without answering, I guess he understood but if he didn't I don't have any problem in going to talk about it face to face. My sister's boyfriend was tweaking because I took a shower. Turns out it's sinful for me to take a shower in my own home. I, 17, live at home with my two sisters and parents. My older sister, 22, has been dating her boyfriend, 21, for three months now. He's been sleeping over at our apartment ever since they started dating, but the frequency of the sleepovers have been increasing over the past few weeks. Our apartment isn't tiny, but it's small enough that we all share a bathroom. The room doesn't have air conditioning and only has one window that doesn't really let a draft through. When you shower, the room steams up a ton, so my whole life we've just either left the door ajar or opened the door fully as soon as we stepped out of the shower and did the rest of our bathroom stuff. The very first time my sister's boyfriend slept over, I was getting ready to go to bed in the bathroom and had the door closed, but unlocked. I was taking off my boxer shorts when he walked into the bathroom. He immediately apologized, closed the door and we never spoke about it again. Well, last week I thought I was home alone and was taking a shower in the afternoon with the door ajar, as always. After I was done, I opened the bathroom door and continued with my routine, lotion, face cream, stuff like that, and noticed that my sister had come home during my shower. When I was done, I walked into the kitchen to find my sister and her boyfriend having an argument. I didn't want to intrude, so I left and soon heard the front door fall closed. In the evening I made dinner for our family and while I was cooking my other sister, 20, came and talked to me. Apparently, our oldest sister and her boyfriend argument was about me and my showering habits. He thinks it's disgusting that I shower with the door ajar and feels uncomfortable with me using the bathroom in my own house. This shocked me, because from the way our bathroom is set up, you can't even see the shower from outside of the door. I went to my other sister and asked her if this was true, and she refused to talk to me. It's not as if I was the only one that showered like this. We all do. I'm just the only one taking showers in the afternoon slash evening when her boyfriend is usually there, because that's when I come home from hockey practice. My bully is effing my wife. So I made her choose, him or me. My, 26, wife, Becca, 26, her best friend, Daria, 26, and I all went to high school together but I ran in a very different social circle. They played sports and were decently well-known slash popular. I was really into art and computers, chubby with an awkward haircut. We all went to a really large high school so it was more that I knew of them rather than actually knowing them. Becca and Daria have been best friends since they were really young. They both moved into the same neighborhood in preschool and their parents are very close. In high school, there was a guy, Chris, 26, who would regularly bully me. There was a name that Chris and his friends called me based on a thing that happened during my sophomore year. It was essentially a trap that Chris and friends had set up so that I would be embarrassed and they could pretend I had done it to myself. I feel like I'm already doing a bad job hiding my identity so let's just say that the name was Stinky. I hated it. They called me this all the time and made me the butt of many of their jokes. Chris was very popular and was friends with Becca and Daria in high school. Chris was good looking, wealthy and he knew it. He walked around like he was untouchable. Insert all of the wealthy, athletic, good looking stereotypes that you want here, they pretty much all rang true for him. I hated him and hated any time that I had to be around him. I know that a lot of people face some really violent bullying so I don't want it to make it sound like I was physically tortured but I did feel like I was relentlessly harassed. I was very thankful and excited to get out of my hometown and away from those people when I went to college. I don't know if it was growing up and growing into myself, the ability to reset my identity, or just getting away from bullies but I really found myself in college. I'm still a bit nerdy and artistic but I grew into my body. I started making friends and realized that I had something to offer the world. I rapidly became a lot more confident and comfortable socially. Becca and I ended up going to the same college a few hours away but she didn't have a car. I offered her a ride home for Thanksgiving break and it became a habit of riding together for breaks and chatting about life and school. We started to become friends and our friend groups started to combine. In sophomore year, our talks became deeper and more personal. I realized I was into her on the way home for Christmas and asked her on a date over break. We've now been together almost seven years, engaged for the last year. We have a strong relationship, communicate well, go on regular dates and trips, and have supported each other through numerous ups and downs. We have had our fights over the years and even did some counseling together for about a year, I was bringing my parents' passive-aggressive style of fighting into our relationship and she was assuming I was criticizing her all the time because of her mom's crappy behavior. We've found those times to be challenging but helpful in the long run. I love this woman and I'm excited to get married and spend our lives together. Becca and Daria reconnected after college and now own a business together that plans events and helps connect people and businesses to local food, drinks, and experiences. Their business really took off in the year before the virus and they've been slowly but steadily growing back as things have been opening up. They have started to enter into a number of exclusive contracts with event spaces and restaurants slash breweries. In a market where things can turn quickly, these deals are super important to them as they provide a lot of security for their company. Becca came home about two months ago really excited about a new brewery exploring an exclusive deal. About a week later, the brewery signed and there was a dinner to celebrate, Becca asked if I want to come and meet the team from the brewery. She told me that I might have met the owner before but I guess I didn't think to ask who it was because I didn't know who it was going into the dinner. 
If you're still with me, you can probably guess who the brewery owner is. I was sitting at the table with Becca waiting for the rest of the group to arrive when Chris came through the door walked up to the table, greeted Becca and then turned to me and said hi Stinky. I was immediately confused and angry. She knew that I knew Chris and she knew that he had harassed me throughout high school. She didn't mention at any point prior that he was the owner of the brewery and that she was working closely with him. I got through dinner but on the way home, when I asked why she didn't tell me, she blew it off as though it was water under the bridge, that I had changed and I should understand that Chris had changed too. I was still upset but tried to let bygones be bygones. Over the next couple of weeks, it was clear that Daria and Chris were becoming romantically involved with each other. Becca and I usually spend two-thirds nights a week with Daria whether going out or simply watching TV at our house or hers. We often joke that we're a throuple but to be clear, that is not the case and what we have is strictly platonic. Over the last month or so, Chris started showing up to nights out and even came over one night to Daria's house when we were hanging it and watching TV. I've tried to be open to a new Chris but he seems like he's the same overly macho, trying to hard to be alpha jerk he was all those years ago. I tried to bring up to Becca that the casual relationship between Daria and Chris is probably not good for their business, while Becca agreed, she felt like she couldn't tell her friend to not date or sleep with someone. Last week, Becca invited me along to an industry event, I got there to unfortunately find Chris is there as well. I try to be friendly and nice, we get a table for the four of us and have some drinks and food. At one point, the girls leave to network with a couple of potential clients. Out of nowhere, Chris starts talking about how this event might be a good place for him and Daria to find a woman to have a threesome with. Caught completely off guard, I ask him what he's talking about and he says that him and Daria want to have another threesome and that I should know all about that. I was super confused and asked what he was talking about and he proceeds to tell me that him, Daria and Becca had a couple of threesomes in high school and that he figured that I was having threesomes with the two girls as well. I felt blindsided and didn't know what to say. When we got home, Becca already knew I was upset about something and asked me what was wrong. I told her about what Chris had said and she tried to deny it at first but then told me that it was partially true. What Becca told me was that Daria and Chris were FWBs for a bit at the end of senior year slash right before college. Chris and Daria spent a few weeks talking with her about having a threesome with them but she was on the fence. At a party when everyone was tipsy it was brought up again and she went to a bedroom with them. Note for mods, they were all 18 at the time, they all stripped down and did a lot of kissing slash touching but Becca backed out of having sex and instead watched them. On Thanksgiving break of freshman year, the three talked about going all the way with it but ended up not being able to find a free time for all of them. Daria then got a boyfriend and it was never brought up again. All of this was news to me. In addition to not really coming into myself until college, I was a late bloomer in terms of relationships. Becca was my first everything. I knew and wasn't upset that she had had sex before us but we had never really gone into the when or who of that. Becca keeps saying that I never asked and she never lied about all this but, especially with doing business with Chris, it feels like lying by omission to me. I'm struggling with all this. Chris did his best to make my life awful in high school and now is back. Almost every time I spent time with him, he seems to be belittling me, making fun of me, he even told Becca in front of me that she could do better than me and was dating down, she told me later that it was just a joke and stopped being so sensitive. It seems like this threesome slash intimacy thing is just one more thing he can hold over me. He's a snake and always seems to say the worst stuff to me when Becca and Daria are just out of earshot. We've been arguing about this situation for about a week now. I asked Becca to cut all contact with him last night. She told me I was bring unreasonable. He's with her best friend and they all do business together. I asked if it was that Daria and her Nita's brewery's contract. She keeps asking me why I can't move on and accept that Chris is a different person. I told my kids I don't love them and I don't care if their mom dies. They're on their own. I, 56, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer back when I was 37. They caught it relatively early but I was not expected to survive. About a month after my diagnosis, my ex-wife Sarah divorced me, took the kids, house and most of our savings. She even turned the kids against me and I was alone, I was an only child and my parents died, to deal with my seemingly inevitable death. Well except one person, my co-worker Jane. She was the only person in the world who seemed to care about me. Before you ask, there was no infidelity, Sarah divorced me because she couldn't be my nurse as she watched me die. Anyways, the doctors wanted to try to remove the tumor after a few courses of chemo, and I went into remission after the surgery and some more chemo. I tried to be there for my kids, but Sarah remarried and my spot was taken by her new husband. After a while I stopped calling them on birthdays and holidays, stopped giving gifts, stopped trying to be involved in their lives. It hurt almost as much as the cancer when I realized I didn't mean anything to them. I ended up marrying Jane and now we have two kids. It still hurts but I love my new family and they actually give a damn about me. Recently, Sarah got diagnosed with terminal heart disease and they are struggling financially. My kids called me for the first time in over a decade to ask me out for lunch. I didn't want to og but Jane said they're extending an olive branch and to at least hear what they want to say. At lunch they didn't even bother with pleasantries, they jumped straight into asking me to help out their mom with medical bills. I said no and got up to leave, but my son said that even if I didn't love their mom, they did and if I loved them, I needed to help. I asked them what their half-siblings names were, when was the last time they called, who they spent the last two decades worth of Father's Days with. Why the hell? Should I give a crap about a woman who took everything from me and left me alone while facing my death? Why should I give a crap about the kids who wouldn't even see me before my surgery or at any point when I was dying? They were silent. So I said, I don't care about your mom, nor do I give a single damn if she dies. And I don't care how bad her dying hurts you guys because I care about you guys about the same amount you guys care about me. Not the slightest. I won't help because I don't love her or you guys. 
I then paid for their food and left them at the restaurant. I have been getting calls from my ex's family telling me how awful I am for saying that to my own flesh and blood. Usually, I wouldn't care but my wife told me that even though I'm right, I was too harsh on them. Was I in the wrong? My wife cheated on me with my best friend but their stories are different. I don't know who to believe. My wife Lisa and my best friend Tom used to hang out in a group for years. We were kind of known to be the three musketeers of sorts. Even when Tom eventually found someone of his own to marry, Lisa was best friends with her as well. Lisa and Tom had an extremely close relationship, though, and would often call each other platonic soulmates. One day, Lisa came up to me and told me she didn't feel comfortable being alone with Tom anymore. I asked her why and she didn't tell me at first. For weeks, whenever we had a social gathering with Tom, they'd stare at each other for a while, but would never talk. I thought they just had an argument until one day, Lisa came to sobbing. I listened to her side of the story and then asked Tom his side. There's an issue though, they both have different sides of the story. Lisa says that last weekend, she and Tom were alone listening to music together after his wife went to bed. Lisa said Tom was standing next to her and unexpectedly kissed her on the lips. Lisa said she recoiled and said no she was with me and he was married to her best friend. Lisa says Tom then took out his schlong and said that they were both free spirits and it was not cheating unless he put it in her kitty. Lisa says she told Tom she was in love with me, laughed it off, he put it away and ended the night with Tom driving her home a while later. Lisa says this was not consensual and she and Tom decided that it would not be a good idea to be alone together in the future. Lisa revealed this to me after Tom was upset with Lisa after not hanging out again a few nights later. Lisa said she was afraid of what Tom might say to me, and me leaving her as a result, and afraid of losing her friendship with Tom's wife. I asked Tom what happened. Tom says they were S.I. dancing together. They were close and he kissed her open mouth and felt her breasts. Tom. Said this went on for a few minutes and nothing more happened. Tom said they stopped because Lisa said it was cheating on both me and his wife. Tom said since he was a free spirit and did not consider what was happening cheating, he wanted to jokingly prove a point that he could even take his schlong out and it still wasn't cheating unless he put it in her kitty. Tom said that the dancing, kissing, honker grabbing was consensual, and they mutually decided to not be alone together again. Tom is afraid of his wife finding out. Tom said he did not tell me because he did not consider anything that happened cheating, but admitted his wife would consider it cheating and would divorce him. Both Lisa and Tom have incentive to minimize or not fully disclose what actually happened for fear of my reaction and said they were fearful of me telling Tom's wife. Lisa is adamant in her version. Tom is adamant in his version. Both do not want me saying anything to Tom's wife. Did something more happen? Who is telling the truth? Am I the jerk for telling my mom I don't give a damn about my autistic brother? My parents were very loving when I was kid but when I was 7 years old, my mom gave birth to my younger brother. I tried to love him but I noticed that as soon as he came, my parents stopped paying that much attention to me. It got even worse when he was diagnosed with autism when he was 3 years old. Now, my dad is never home and my mom talks to me about once a day because she's so busy dealing with my brother's meltdowns. I've known my best friend Rachel since we were in kindergarten. Her mom is the nicest person I've ever met. Rachel and I played soccer but my mom was rarely able to take me to practices and games so Rachel's mom would always take me. I used to be in the school choir and my parents went to like one performance during the six years I did it. Rachel's mom was at every performance for me even though Rachel wasn't in choir. Those are just a few examples, but Rachel's mom has always been there for me when my parents weren't available. My mom never really cares what I'm doing unless she needs me to watch my brother so I spend a lot of time at Rachel's house. Once I spent a whole weekend there and my mom didn't even call to ask where I am. Rachel's family go on a lot of vacations and they often take me. They're going to Disney World during Thanksgiving break and invited me to come with them. I asked my dad and he said I could go. They've already planned and booked everything and I'm really excited. I've been to Disneyland once with my family and it was horrible. My brother threw a huge tantrum on the first day because he wanted to go on the rides alone and sit between mom and dad so I had to stay in the hotel most of the time. My brother found out that I'm going to Disney and he had a really big meltdown. He loves Disney and he was mad that I was going without him. My mom told me that she was planning to go to Washington to visit my grandparents. My dad didn't say. Anything about that so I'm pretty sure she just made that up to stop me from going. And even if they are going, I don't want to. I don't want to go on a 14-hour car ride with my brother and I'm pretty sure when we get there they're either going to make me stay with him while they go out or take him out and leave me alone in the hotel, I also wouldn't be allowed to go out on my own. She told me that I need to think about my brother and his feelings are more important because he's younger and autistic. I told her that I honestly don't give a f about my brother's feelings and I wish he was never born. He was there when I said all this and he's been crying and screaming for the last 3 hours and it's giving me a headache. My mom has been trying to calm him down and my dad said that he'll still let me go because he understands I'm frustrated, he also grew up with neurodivergent siblings so he knows what it's like. My mom said that I'm a rude, ungrateful brat and I need to be kinder to my brother. Am I the jerk? This dentist is being sued for the most terrifying and bone-chilling appointment in the history of dentistry. His name is Dr. Kevin Maldram, and he is a professional dentist and a professional moron. For some unknown reason, he decided it would be a good idea to perform a total of 32 different procedures on a single patient in just one appointment. This genius decided he would put this patient through four root canal procedures, eight dental crowns and 20 goddamn fillings all in one go. The procedure itself lasted over six hours, and he demanded that the patient, who was a woman named Kathleen Wilson, be injected with more than double the safe dosage of anesthesia. He demanded this be done just so she could withstand the pain he was putting her through. But he does have his reasoning. When Dr. Maldram first examined the mouth of Kathleen, 
he was shocked to realize that basically every single tooth in her mouth was completely decaying. Worried that she was at serious risk of suffering permanent damage to her teeth, he decided that he needed to fix this himself ASAP. Figuring that all the teeth needed to be fixed ASAP, he took it upon himself to fix them all in one go. Whilst on the surface his actions may seem reasonable or even virtuous, other dentist and oral professionals, like your mom, have come out and stated that the doctor should have known better, and that it's simply impossible to treat so many teeth in one single appointment. The thing is, she is now suing him for $50,000 for injuries which left her disfigured, but also for the fact that he falsified her medical records to cover up the fact that he gave her double the safe dose of anesthesia. How did your parents blame you for that turned out to be their own fault? One day when I was in high school, I arrived home to discover several mostly empty bottles of alcohol from my mother's liquor cabinet, sitting out on the kitchen counter. Upon hearing me enter the house, my mother angrily stomped into the kitchen to demand an explanation about why her booze was missing. I had absolutely no clue, but she wouldn't believe that my brother had denied drinking her booze. So therefore it must have been me. My mother threw a tantrum trying to get me to confess, which included yelling, screaming, hitting, punching and throwing things at me. Then she started hurling the other punishments. I was grounded. Any of my personal possessions that she didn't like, such as music she hated, was confiscated and many of them were smashed, destroyed and thrown into the garbage in front of my face. Then there were chores. I could expect to do nothing but clean from the moment I entered the house until I had to go to bed, until she felt I had learned my lesson. As it turned out, neither my brother nor I had anything to do with the paranormal disappearing alcoholic spirits. About three weeks later, one of her friends popped in for a visit. Let's call her January I was mopping the kitchen at the time. Jan chuckled at seeing me mop and made a comment about how her kid never cleans. She asked my mother what her secret was. My mother told her about the missing alcohol and that I was being punished. Jan's face nearly hit the floor. Mouth agape. She reminded my mother that they had drunk the booze together during her last visit, about a month prior to this new revelation that I was, in fact, telling the truth. My mommy dearest very calmly stated. Oh, that's right, I forgot. Then turned to me and said, as soon as you're done with the floor, you can stop with the cheers for now. You're not grounded anymore. And that was that. Of course, my mother never apologized to me. What things did you do as a kid that you now realize is extremely weird? When I was in fourth grade, so around nine or ten at a private school, we used pinto beans as counters during math. Well, one day someone realized if you put a bean in water, it would sprout. And it became incredibly fashionable to keep a couple living bean sprouts hidden in your desk at all times. This turned into a whole industry, sneaking to the cabinet in the back and stealing the beans was risky. So people took on those roles. The beans were old, so getting them to actually sprout was valuable. Others would sneak the sprouts in and out of class to get sun. A boy's grandparents had bought him a science experiment kit that came with hundreds of these little plastic vials that stood up on their own. They were the perfect size for keeping a sprouted pinto bean. So he started trading them. Another two kids had water bottles with a straw that fit neatly into the vials and made it easy to water the sprouts. They turned it into a service. One pretty talented group of girls started making houses out of paper and cardboard for the sprouts to live in. This allowed bean families to become a thing. Another girl realized that the houses meant there was a market for bean sprouts, furniture. Kids starting pulling textbooks out of their desks and stashing them around the classroom to make space for larger and larger houses. The houses were a turning point because they ran anywhere from $5 to $10, which was the first time anyone had charged real money for something instead of bartering. In addition, demand for sprouts went through the roof. Since you could fit four or five in a house. The kid who had been successfully sprouting the beans is under immense pressure to produce, and we've crossed a threshold so people are willing to pay real money now. Into this high-pressure situation, walks my classmate, Julia. Julia brings a tiny bottle of purple liquid one day and tells Bean Sprouts her kid that it's the diluted slime of an extremely rare snail from the forests up north that she collected herself while camping with her family. It's such a strong fertilizer even diluted that one drop in each vial will guarantee that a bean will sprout. In addition, a drop to which already sprouted bean will ensure a nice green plant. There's enough for around 50 sprouts in there, but it's going to cost them $20 for the whole bottle. Well, if you're selling the sprouts at $1 each, $20 is a steal. So the kid comes back the next day with the cash. Julia gives him the fertilizer and he puts a drop in each vial just before we leave to go home. The next day, all his bin sprouts are dead, and he's pissed. Turns out the fertilizer was just Julia's mom's perfume, and it killed all the plants. Well, bean sprout, her kid is not the kind of person to take this lying down. So he goes to the teacher to tell her that he got conned. And the whole thing unravels. The teacher is upset that her students have been devoting hours of in-class time to beans. Parents are upset that money they thought was for snacks or field trips was for beans. The principal has to announce to the whole school that growing plants in your desk is now banned, which just confuses everyone else. And my class is angry at poor bean sprouting kid for snitching and ruining everything. All their hard work is now in the trash. The bean sprout industry never recovered. What is a dead giveaway someone is not to be effed with? Spent a large chunk of my teenage years in juvenile correctional facilities and getting into stupid shit. Between age 14 to 20 I've been in more fist fights than some UFC fighters, quantity not quality. I have nerve damage in my hands and they get stiffer and clumsier as I get older, had to pick up painting miniatures to keep fine motor control. I have tattoos to cover the scars at work, a job with that I have learned colon one, loud guys are soft guys. They want to be loved and accepted, but start shit out of fear they'll be rejected or as a reaction to rejection.2, cauliflower ear. They probably know what they're doing. 
avoid unless you're a seasoned fighter or also know what you're doing. Dot three, smart guys. They might not be the fastest or strongest, but they've learned the kinetics of fighting, momentum, balance, and gravity. One kid kept a hand towel near him at all times and used it in a fight and almost ended another kid once, caught his arm when he swung, wrapped, twisted, and flung him into a toilet and gave him a concussion. 4. Guys that walk slow and never broke eye contact. They weren't afraid of anything and more often than not had a high pain tolerance. Usually pretty quiet. 5. Bulky slash muscular guys aren't always good fighters. But if they caught you lacking, it was lights out. Most importantly though, I learned you don't F with anybody. The wiry funny guy always cracking jokes could be the one take you out of your shoes. And. Some people can just snap. The guy that gets effed with can be the one that pops and that adrenaline rush gave the burst of strength to suplex you into a concrete bench. Be kind to everyone until you're forced to not be so kind. What story do you never tell because nobody will believe you? I took revenge on a rapist by stabbing him in the ear with a q-tip. He assaulted a friend of mine who repeatedly told him to stop. He touched her, then he pinned her, then he actually assaulted her. She hasn't recovered since, and even came to distrust her closest friends. She told me his name, and I hunted him. I learned where he worked, where he lived, his schedule. In between my work shifts, I would catch up to him and keep tabs. I did this for two weeks. When he got out of work one night, I was waiting. He didn't hear me slip up behind him, and I put the q-tip into his right ear and slammed it in with my palm. You wouldn't believe the blood. The shrieking. I couldn't move. I just watched him writhing. We were alone, no one was around to help him or catch me. I finally gathered my wits and ran like hell. I burned the clothes, gloves, and ski mask I had been wearing. I never made a sound so he couldn't identify my voice, and as much as I thought I was going to drop the one line or learn to listen, I held back so he couldn't tell the police any sort of motive. The girl was never questioned and neither was I, and as best I know, his hearing is totally destroyed in his right ear. I'm so happy that my ex-wife is miserable. Found out my wife, was having an affair. She met a guy at work and came home one day telling me she was in love with him, no longer loved me, and wanted a divorce. This was a guy she'd only known for three months. At the time, she and I had been together since we were in our twenties. We have three kids, well, I tried to fight for my marriage and didn't want a divorce, but she simply would not stop seeing this guy. After one weekend where she disappeared from Friday afternoon to Sunday night, I ended up throwing her out of the house. She immediately moved in with this guy. The only excuse she ever gave me was, I never wanted to hurt you, but there's just something about this guy, and I deserve to be happy. That was it. That was the depth of her reasoning for throwing everything we built together away. We ended up finalizing our divorce in early 2022. Although I had very hard feelings toward her, I faked it enough to get pretty favorable divorce terms from her. It seemed she was so eager to be with her dream man that she didn't have time for a long divorce. So in the end, I got to keep my pension in the house, which I had bought from my grandmother. I did have to give her half of my 401k however, the effect on our kids was pretty devastating. All three of them took it very hard. My oldest son told her that if she chose this man, he'd never have a relationship with her again. As of right now, neither of our sons has a relationship with their mother. Our daughter does talk to her from time to time, but their relationship is very strained to say the least. My daughter is a very kind person and she tries, but she usually ends her conversations with her mother even more upset than when they started. About four months after the divorce, my ex contacted me out of the blue. She told me she had made a terrible mistake and asked if she could come home. He dream man turned out to be an alcoholic who she says is verbally abusive and wasted all of her money. I used this opportunity to tell her. Exactly what I thought of her as a person, a wife and a mother. I told her this was her life now and to deal with it. I told her she no longer had a home at this house and to never contact me again. Then a few things happened over the last year that have driven her to start trying to contact me again. First off, I met someone. My sister introduced me to a friend of hers who is also divorced, and she and I hit it off. We've been seeing each other since last summer, and while we've agreed that neither of us wants to get married again, we are together. Once my ex heard about this, she once again tried to contact me, but I ignored her. My son also got married and didn't invite his mother. She again contacted me to try to get me to intervene on her behalf. I told her I would talk to him, but I never did. Secretly, I feel like she deserves all the pain she's feeling when it comes to our kids. She destroyed our family without so much as an afterthought. Too bad. So sad. Now, she recently told our daughter that she finally broke it off with a dream man because she could take his drinking and total lack of responsibility. He wasted her half of the 401k that I had to give her. He also totaled her car driving drunk. This from a man in his 40s. Again, she knew this guy for three months and torpedoed our whole family for him. On the face of it, I act like I feel sorry for her, but inside, I really delight in the fact that she's so unhappy. Call me evil or whatever, I don't care. She brought this on herself, and it serves her right. I actually had to sit there one Saturday night while she got ready for a date with this guy and laughed on the phone with her friend about how awkward our living situation was. I lived in hell for over a year because of her. Wait until she finds out our son and his wife are going to have a baby later this year. Maybe if she had been able to keep her legs closed, she'd get to meet her grandchild. Enjoy your shitty one-bedroom apartment and your broken down used car. Me and my new partner will think of you when we're on vacation in Hawaii this summer. Hawaii was the trip my ex and I always planned to take once our daughter finished college. Maybe I'll send her pictures. As a psychologist, who is the most disturbing individual you have ever met? While in college, I did an internship at the State Penara College. 
In addition to being a mental health technician at the state psych hospital, I was also a resident assistant for the college. I assisted students with housing issues, enforced code of conduct, etc. One evening, I was pulling duty in the male dormitory when one of my friends showed up at the office door wearing nothing but a towel. We will call him Robert. Robert asked if I would come get a girl out of his room as she was refusing to leave. I advised Robert that I was not his personal bouncer and he would need to handle his romantic dalliances himself. He explained that was not the case. He did not know the person. In his room, he had left to go take a shower down the hall. Communal showers in the men's dorms, and instead of having to carry the room key with him, he left a roll of toilet paper wedged in the door to keep it from closing. They locked automatically whenever shut. Safety measures. When he returned, there was a girl laying on his bed with her books strewn about as if she was studying. Upon seeing him enter the room, she began screaming and throwing books and pens at him and demanding he get out of her room. I knew Robert, and he was not one prone to lie or exaggerate, so I went to check. Sure enough, there she was. I told her she needed to leave. She protested, stating that she was in her room. I advised that considering it was a male dormitory, I doubted her claim. I helped her pack up her stuff, walked her up to the second floor, which had the main entrance to the door, walked her outside, and sent her on her way. I advised Robert that I needed him to sign an incident report. He followed me back to the office, still wearing his towel, waited while I filled out the report, signed it, and left. He was not gone ten minutes before returning, still in the towel. Apparently, when we walked the girl out, we forgot to close the door completely behind us, and she double-backed on us. Came. Through the back door and resumed her study position. This time, I meant I was going to be prepared. I locked every door leading in or out of the dormitory and left a sticky note on the door advising there was a security risk and not to let any unknown or unaccompanied females into the dormitory. Next, I called campus security and advised them to be waiting at the front door to escort this individual away from the building. Then Robert and I went back to his room. Once again, I helped her pack her things and escorted her out the front door. Campus security had not yet arrived, so this girl tried every door like before, but all of them were locked. She then went window to window on the ground floor, knocking to see if anyone would open the door for her. Finally, campus security arrived and captured her. The girl had a valid college ID, so we looked up her residential dorm. It just so happened that she had been assigned as a roommate to a friend of mine. I called my friend to inquire about the girl. My friend said that she had only met the girl one time, and that was the first day of fall semester. The girl mumbled something, grabbed her enormous book bag, left the room, and had not been back. We were currently in November. Not knowing what else to do, campus security delivered her back to her assigned dormitory. Walked her to her assigned room and emphasized over and over how this was her room and she had better not be found in the men's dormitory again. The girl would argue, then become silent, argue, then become silent. I thought that would be the end of the story. Uh, no. The next morning, I was awakened by the phone. It was the dean of students asking me if I was there on duty last night. I was advised that I was. He asked if I could come to the dormitory where this girl supposedly lived right now. It was 7.30 a.m. I was scared to death. What the hell had happened? You're a burglar, but instead of stealing things you do things to confuse or annoy your victims. What do you do? If the homeowner had a Christmas tree they store somewhere when it's not being used throughout the year, the fake ones, not legit trees, I'd get it out, put their decorations on and wrap it in lights. They'll then wake up in the middle of the night or the next morning to a Christmas tree, fully set up. It's June, why is the Christmas tree up? That will confuse them. They pack it away, still confused, and don't think about it again. That is until the next night. The next night, you get that damn tree out again, decorate it and put it somewhere else, but this time you place a single present under it. The present is to the homeowner with no name saying who it was from. Inside the box is, absolutely nothing. This will continue for a few nights, adding a couple more empty presents each time, further confusing and frustrating them. Until the final night. The final night, there is but one present under the tree. The box is heavier than usual, so they don't throw it out. Aside from a brick used to give the box some weight, there is only a letter inside. The letter reads come outside, your present is waiting. The homeowner walks outside and before their eyes is, all their fucking Halloween decorations covering their house. What are your worst college roommate horror stories? 53 seconds, I had a roommate during my junior year who was a year younger than me. He developed addictions to multiple prescription substances over the course of the year and it really affected his personality. He would be irritable and lethargic one minute, and then a few minutes later after popping some pills he would be incredibly happy and tell me how much he loved and appreciated me. He would bring girls into the room and sleep with them literally right next to me. He would leave food all over the room and blame me for it. It was pretty bad. The absolute worst of it was when one night he literally crawled into our room one night after heavy intoxication and woke me up. He was sobbing and begged me to throw away his pills for him, which he kept in an old McDonald's french fry box. I told him that I would in the morning. This ended up being a mistake because the next morning he heard the pills rattling around in the box as I picked it up and immediately leapt out of bed asking me what I was doing. He threatened to fight me if I didn't put them down and I decided it wasn't worth it. The story has a happy ending though because he took a year off from school, admitted himself to rehab, got better and is now a semester away from finishing his degree. He ruined my sister's only birth experience so I made sure he'd never forget her. When I was 14 and my oldest sister, Sarah, was 22 we found out that she was pregnant with Paul, her boyfriend of 4 years. They immediately got engaged and they were really happy. For a time. Sarah had a horrible pregnancy, about 16 to 18 weeks and the wonder of creating a human life evaporated within her. 
she developed hyperemesis, which if you don't know is really bad morning sickness, she was constantly in pain, she developed gestational diabetes, and just all around hated the experience. Around this time Paul, the then fiancé, started getting sick of the complaining. I believe the argument was your body is built to do this, it can't be that bad. Sarah was due around Valentine's Day and Paul's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Doe, were very excited, both about the grandkid and the fact that he could be born on a holiday. She was very against that and really really hoped that her son wouldn't be born on a holiday, even one as small as Valentine's Day, her birthday sometimes falls on Easter and she hates it, because it might make him feel that his day isn't very much about him. Well, Mrs. Doe says something like well if you name him Valentine or Valentino then that'll make the day even more special to him. Again, my sister hated the idea. She thought it was tacky, he'd be bullied for it, and just really didn't like the name Valentino. Paul loved it, but agreed to go with a more average name like Daniel or Jared. Fast forward to February and she was ready to get this over with. Sarah had officially been put on bed rest because while standing or walking her blood pressure took unexpected spikes and dips. I look back now and goodness do I feel bad for her. She was doing her best to avoid giving birth on Valentine's Day because, again, she didn't want him born on a holiday. Unfortunately, births happen when they happen and that baby was going to come on Valentine's Day whether she wanted him to or not. I remember waiting out in the waiting room with my dad, brothers, and Paul who couldn't stand to be in the delivery room because it was gross. I was so mad that he could have gone in but wouldn't because he thought my sister was gross while giving birth, whereas I had to stay outside because I was too young to go in with my mom and other sister. Dad went home with the youngest two brothers while the oldest, Zeke, stayed to watch me because I refused to leave. Sixteen hours after Sarah went into labor my little nephew was officially part of the family on the evening of Valentine's Day. Unfortunately, Sarah was not okay. She had to have an emergency cesarean section and while doing the operation discovered that the back of her uterus, facing her spinal cord, had a very large and very severe, thankfully non-cancerous, tumor. When I say large I mean it was twice the size of a standard uterus. The doctors were shocked and didn't understand why nobody had noticed it on an ultrasound. It accounted for her severe back pain and blood pressure issues. The doctors immediately went in for more surgery to remove the tumor, but sadly ended up having to perform a full hysterectomy. This meant that my nephew would be Sarah's only child. Now, while Sarah was in for surgery Paul was taking care of everything baby related to make sure his son was okay. In my 14-year-old self's memory I remember him being suitably distraught, but I didn't really pay him much mind and spent my time in the waiting room with my mother and other sister. Zeke, however, wanted to be a good future brother-in-law and make sure that Paul was okay. He found Paul filling out the baby paperwork on his own looking, in my brother's words, like he had not a single worry in his mind. Zeke asked why Paul didn't wait for Sarah to fill out the paperwork as she should have been out of surgery within the hour, and Paul said that he just wanted her to get her rest and heal. That checked out with Zeke, as he was 16 and didn't know any better at the time. Now I know what you're probably thinking. No, he. Wouldn't. He knows how much she hates that name. And still, she'd need to sign the paperwork too. My fellow peoples of Reddit, I regret to inform you that Paul forged Sarah's signature on the paperwork and waited until she was out of surgery to hand said paperwork over. My sweet nephew, who was born on Valentine's Day, was named Valentino on his first official birth certificate. I still to this day don't know why Paul and his family were so insistent about the name. He had even picked out a different one with my sister. And before you ask, no he was never brought up on forgery charges because his parents were witnesses to her signing the papers, even though they only got there at the last minute. So Sarah dumped him and got her son's name changed a month later. She was willing to do split custody with him because that's her son's father and she wants the kid to know him, but Paul vanished and she never heard anything back, which seemed weirdly out of character to us. Until a mutual friend on Facebook was tagged in his wedding pictures six months later. Paul had apparently started cheating on her not long after she got pregnant. Sarah was livid but there wasn't much she could do so she filed for child support and continued to live her best life. Until six years later. This is where the revenge starts, my friends. So Sarah has been a single mother for the past six years and has been amazing at it. At this point in my career I've been a hairdresser for about eight months at our local Great Clips. I'm working one day and who is seated before me but Jane, Paul's wife, herself. I take her back for a trim and she clearly has no idea who I am. That adds up because a mutual friend that still keeps in contact with Paul said that Jane doesn't know a thing. She has no idea about Sarah, that she was the other woman, or that Paul actually has a kid that he's been, infrequently, paying child support for. She's in the dark on it all. I told myself not to be an ass and treat her like a normal customer, which I did. Now at this point, Jane was heavily pregnant, so a lot of our conversation was about that. She loved being pregnant but it was hard. Her husband was so unsympathetic, big shocker, and she was due in 10 weeks and they still hadn't picked out a name for their baby girl. Ladies and gentle people, this was my chance. My neglectful parents who abandoned Emmy 30 years ago are suing me for $100,000 for not buying my bio brother an apartment, and I think I'm going to lose the case. I was born into a dysfunctional family, and when I was just two years old, my alcoholic parents signed away their parental rights over to my aunt who became my caretaker. My aunt and her family were amazing to me and treated me so well, however, I still desperately reached out to my parents on an almost weekly basis begging for them to make some sort of contact with me. But they never did. I did not get a single happy birthday text, a single Merry Christmas, surprise visit, nothing at all. I cried a lot about it to my aunt, especially when kids at school teased me for my parents not wanting me in their life. And yet still, like a loyal puppy I kept hope that my parents would reach out to me and make amends for what they did. If they just reached out I would forgive them in an instant, but they never did. 
I fully gave up hope when I was 16. It was my 16th birthday party, and my aunt woke me up to tell me that my mother had called. According to my aunt, my mother wanted to meet up with me at a restaurant in her hometown and take me to dinner. I had plans on my birthday, but I canceled them all just to go. I ended up spending three hours on a bus going just up to the hometown, with my mother's number saved, ready to call her. When I got to the restaurant at the designated time, I entered, sat down and started waiting. I gave my mom a call after 15 minutes, then after 30, then 45, and finally after 90 minutes of sitting there, by this point crying, I decided to block her number and return home. To this day my 16th birthday remains the most traumatic day of my life, as it was the day I truly realized I meant nothing to my parents. I started seeing my aunt and her family as my real family, and even destroyed the pictures of me as a baby with my bio parents which I had in my room at the time. I ended up putting my head down and getting to work in school, and after a lot of hard work, support for my aunt's family, both financial and mental support, I ended up graduating law school and becoming a lawyer. I'm now 29 years old and work as a lawyer in a high-end firm, and I make a very good living. This is exactly where the problem starts. Due to my high income, I was able to pay back my aunt's family the money they lent me to pay for law school, and I was able to rent out a very nice apartment for myself. Last year, end-of-year bonuses came in, and my bonus was enough for me to afford to lease out a small one-bedroom apartment for an entire year for my cousin, who I was very close with, as the apartment is beside his college which happens to be far from home. My cousin has a long commute to college every day, and this apartment would allow him to focus on his studies better. He was overjoyed. But just recently my parents got in touch with me. When my mother called I instantly recognized her voice, I wanted to cry as I thought she was actually trying to reconnect, but I was very wrong. Instead of saying hi, asking how I've been or anything along those lines, she told me she heard I bought my cousin an apartment. I asked her why she was asking this, and she said that I have a little brother who is 22 years old and wants to move out of the house but has no money, and she told me I should rent an apartment for my brother to live in too. She did not ask, she told me too. The first question I asked was, I have a brother? My mother said yes, but instead of saying anything else about him she said, so you'll do it. I of course told her no and hung up. Not even a week later I was served at work, ironically enough, with papers telling me my parents are suing me for $100,000 for parental maintenance. The case has started and although in my opinion any sane person could see I'm in the right, I may lose this case and here's why. One thing I haven't mentioned is I am Chinese, and in China maintaining a respectful relationship with your parents as their son or daughter, despite how they treated you, is looked at as crucial, and this seems to be the angle my mother and father are taking. Update my neglectful parents who abandoned Emmy 30 years ago are suing me for $100,000 for not buying my bio brother an apartment, and I think I'm going to lose the case. So the case is over and I am very much devastated to say that I ended up being forced to settle. As much as I wanted to be hopeful and pray that the judge would see right through the utter bullcrap that my parents and their lawyer were spouting, the judge was not. My parents ended up claiming that they tried to reach out to me when I was little, and that I hated them for leaving me with my aunt, which is something I wanted as a two-year-old. They actually played this card, and the judge believed it. I stood there in shock and as my parents lied and manipulated the entire situation to make me appear as if I was some sort of monster who hated her hard-working parents who dictated their entire life to getting her daughter back. There was honestly a time in the case where I was convinced I was going to have to give up the $100,000, which would have been a huge dent to my bank account, but thankfully my lawyer managed to pull through. We managed to prove that my parents showed little interest in connecting with me as a teenager, a move which was countered by my parents by saying that they lost all hope by that point as they tried to reach out so much when they were young. I ended up having to settle for just over half the original sum my parents wanted, and my parents accepted the settlement offer immediately. As far as I know they have not used the money to buy my brother an apartment, and instead are currently using it to travel around the world and stay in high-end hotels. All of this is told to me by my bio brother, who I have connected with a little, as it turns out our parents have been neglectful towards him too. My entitled brother smashed my Xbox because I wouldn't buy him a new game, so I took his money and bought a new one. My 16-year-old brother is a super entitled child and has been like this his whole life, thanks to our parents spoiling him his entire life. Whilst they never played favorites, they were able to give us whatever we asked for whenever we did due to us being a very financially stable family. I was never a materialistic person and therefore I never asked for much, but my brother was very different. He was wearing designer clothes at age 9, had a shoe collection as 12, and owned a Rolex at 14 years old. Our parents may have given him a lot, but they failed to teach him manners and decency, as my brother has been suspended for bullying kids in class who are not as rich as he is, and one thing my parents certainly did not teach my brother is the ability to take no for an answer. My parents have tried telling him no, and my brother usually throws a tantrum and causes a scene while yelling about how the world hates him. He used to do that when he was 9 anyway. Nowadays when someone tells him no he resorts to anger and threats. If our parents ever say no to something, he threatens to move out into his best friend's place, and this is enough for my parents to jump to his needs, it's very annoying. My brother and I have a solid relationship, he is my brother after all, but dealing with his entitlement is very hard some days. As an example, just last year when he was 15, he asked me if he could borrow my jacket to go to a party at his friend's house. I told him no, but he snuck out taking my jacket without telling me, then proceeded to lose it. 
This was a jacket gifted to me by my friend for my birthday the year before, and that friend has since died. Needless to say that jacket had a lot of sentimental value to me and it hurt a lot when he lost it. He never even apologized, saying if I just let him use it he wouldn't have to sneak out with it, as somehow sneaking. Out with it was the thing that made him lose it. Well, last week I had the displeasure of dealing with my brother's entitlement once again, and I was reminded just what a nightmare he is to deal with. I had not dealt with his entitlement firsthand in a while, so I had honestly forgotten how bad it was sometimes. My parents were out of the house for the night and I was playing my Xbox. My brother is a not a gamer so he doesn't have one, but he barged into my room claiming he wants to play my Xbox and ordering me to get off it. I told him no, and he huffed and puffed, then took my Xbox out the socket. I angrily kicked him out of the room and turned my Xbox on again, and a few minutes later my brother came into the room. He said he wanted to ask me something, and I responded by telling him I'm playing now and he can in one hour. He then said it was not that, and that he wanted to get into gaming and was looking at a specific game in particular. He showed it to me and it cost $120. I told him there was no way I would buy it and to call our parents if he wants it, but he said they won't answer his phone. He asked me to buy it for him again, and when I said no he told me to ask my parents to pay me back later. I explained to him I don't like asking parents for money when I have my own job, but I told him I would look at the game in a week for the Xbox countdown sale and if it was discounted I would buy it. But no, my brother wanted the game now. I asked him why doesn't he spend his allowance money on it and he said he doesn't want to spend his own money on it. I told him to get out of my room after that. That night while I slept I heard a few loud thuds from beside me, and I jumped out of bed to see a shadow pounding away at my Xbox. I turned on my nightstand lamp and looked to find my brother hammer punching my Xbox over and over. I physically forced him out of the room and tried to turn on my Xbox, but it wasn't working. As someone who is a petty person by nature, I wasted no time the next day. Without much thought I crept into his room while he wasn't home and went through his stuff, then located his wad of cash, which was his birthday money and I proceeded to take out just enough for a new Xbox, as well as $50 for emotional damage. I bought an Xbox of the same color, and my brother seems very confused as to how the Xbox is working, he seems to think it's the same one he smashed. My parents also have no clue about any of this. My best friend's manipulative wife lied to him about me and her sleeping together, so he believed her and punched me in the face. I met my best friend Josh during my freshman year of college and we have been buddies ever since. We have always shared our love for tech and he is always my go-to guy when I need someone to talk to. Josh started dating Mary five years ago. Mary has a very different set of morals than my wife or me. She is very loud, manipulative and just craves attention, so much so she begged Josh to propose to her at my wedding. He of course did not. This led to their first of many breakups. You see, Josh and Mary had been dating on and off for four years. They broke up often, but somehow always ended up together after a few months. Mary is always the one who breaks up with Josh and then takes him back. I also know that Mary cheated on Josh with at least two guys when they were dating, but she somehow convinced him that he was not putting enough effort into the relationship. Josh always blames himself for Mary not being happy. My wife also knows about all of this and has always kept her distance from Mary. However, we do meet her often during parties with friends. The crazy thing is, Josh and Mary got married last year. Sadly for Josh, last month he found out that Mary was cheating on him again and had an affair with one of her co-workers, who just happened to be 17. Josh was completely broken and stayed at our place for a week, before growing a pair, going back and confronting Mary then kicking her out of the house. Josh bought the house before marriage, and hence he had to get the cops involved to kick her out. From what we know, Mary moved back to her parents' house. I have been helping Josh through the process and he filed for divorce last week. But last Saturday things got heated, Mary came to Josh's house to collect her stuff along with her dad. I had advised Josh to get out of the house when they came, but he wanted to make sure she did not take anything that did not belong to her. During her visit, Josh got into a fight with Mary and Mary told Josh that she had an affair with me while they were married and we used to do it in their bedroom. This is all 100% false. I have always known that Mary was trouble and kept my distance from her. I feel she is just trying to hurt Josh by saying that. After that incident, Josh got extremely agitated and came to our house. I saw he was distressed and knew something was wrong. As I opened the door, he started cursing at me and accusing me of sleeping with Mary. Luckily, the kids were not at home, but my wife and I were there and we were both shocked by what he was saying. He tried to punch me, but luckily he hit my shoulder and I was able to wrestle him on the ground and calm him down. I kept on telling him that what Mary told him was completely false and that I had never spent a single minute with her alone in my life. My wife threatened to call the cops and he left. After he left, my wife was completely inconsolable. It took me hours to calm her down and convince her that Mary was manipulating Josh. I work from home and rarely leave my house without my wife or kids. I think she believes me, but she has been different for the last four days. Josh told a lot of my close friends that I was having an affair with Mary. He is not taking my calls or my wife's calls. My wife tried to call Mary, but she was also not taking our calls. All my friends, including Josh, think that I am the biggest a-hole for getting involved with his wife. Date my best friend's manipulative wife lied to him about me and her sleeping together, so he believed her and punched me in the face. My wife and I decided to explore whether we could sue my best friend's wife Mary for defamation. I asked my wife if she wanted me to take a polygraph test to prove I never did and she smiled. She said she does not doubt me one bit, but we can't let other people have any doubt that I had an affair with that Satan spawn Mary. Our kids are friends with their kids, and we can't live with them thinking I had an affair with Mary. She just wanted us to be strong and solve the issue as soon as possible. In the morning, we messaged my wife's mother's friend, who is a very experienced attorney. 
We called her based on the time she gave us in the morning and explained the issue. She said that we should pursue the legal route, but she does not handle such cases and gave us the contact of another attorney in her firm and set up a meeting with her at noon. We went to visit her and discuss the issue. The lawyer told us that we could sue Mary as she has made false accusations and there is a precedent of considering what she said as slander, as it attacked my character and we can prove emotional distress. However, she told us that a defamation lawsuit is a very long and expensive process and may take several years. She told us that Mary has a weak hand and she will not want to go to court. Hence, we should give her a way out by telling her to give in writing that what she said was false. Moreover, as she said the false statement to Josh, we would need Josh to state what she said. We came up with a plan for sending her a letter of intent to sue for defamation. The attorney worked on this and we got notified that Mary received the letter on Friday morning at her parents' place. The letter told her that we would sue her by the end of the month if she did not provide an official statement in writing that the statements she had made were false. The letter also told Mary to only communicate via the law firm regarding this matter. As planned, I messaged Josh and told him we had decided to sue Mary for defamation due to the false statements she made about the affair. We would leave no stone unturned to prove that the allegations are false. Our lawyers will contact you next week and we hope you cooperate with them and tell them exactly what she said to you. On Saturday morning, as I was cooking breakfast and my wife was sitting with our kids, the doorbell rang. I saw the ring camera that Josh and Mary standing outside the door. Before I could tell my wife to stay back and not open the door, she bolted towards the door. She opened it and started yelling at Joshua she is five foot nothing tall, but she is scary when she is angry. She just started calling him names and how can he destroy our lives when we supported him at his lowest? Josh just kept saying, he just wanted to talk to me and kept repeating that. He looked down. My wife just kept on yelling at him and telling him to get lost. Mary started talking then, saying that she was sorry for what she said. Josh was abusing her as she was packing, and she just said that to hurt him. She just kept on saying that Josh is such an idiot and has created such a big mess. My wife turned to her and told her that she better find a good lawyer to reply to our lawyers. At last, she told Josh that if he wanted to meet me, go and first make things right for me and then slam the door. I was watching all this from the breakfast table through the ring camera literally smiling watching my badass wife rip them a new one. Then I smiled even more, realizing that we recorded the whole conversation including Mary confessing her lies. I felt so relieved in the moment knowing that I had proof of her telling the truth. We forwarded the video to our lawyer, and she sent a thumbs up and called us briefly to say that we should meet on Monday to discuss the next steps. After an hour or so, Josh messaged our friends group that he did a terrible thing and spread false statements about me. He is ashamed of it and wants to apologize for it. Moments later, Mary messaged saying that some statements she made were misconstrued by Josh and that what he told everyone was false. Their relationship is going through rocking times and would thank everyone for giving them privacy and to pray for them. About Josh, we still plan to file for TRO against him and Mary next week. The lawyer said we should be able to get it for Josh as there is clear evidence of danger, but Mary might be a long shot. We will see what to do from there. As for our friendship, it's done. It ended the minute he decided to punch me, instead of at least asking me if it was true. I can't have people like him around my wife and kids. He was a great friend, but my family and their safety have a way higher priority than him. For Mary, I guess she wins. My wife still wants to push to get her to pay our legal fees. We will see what to do on Monday. However, she was able to destroy Josh's support system with one lie. I was helping Josh through the whole divorce process. But, he is on his own now. I also do not think many of my friends would be kind to him after the stuff he tried to do at my house. I feel bad for him and I know he needs support and professional help. However, I did my part and I hope he understands what's right for him in the future. What is your silent, unseen act of personal defiance? When a kid is being a brat in a noisy and public area, I casually get close to them and fart on their head slash face. I'm really tall so it's usually a direct hit dot if I decide to stare it's usually with a, yeah, what the f are you gonna do about it? Look dot I'm about 6 feet 7 inches so even when I'm just trying to be friendly, i.e. not farting on a stander kid's head, and meeting a family member's or friend's kid for the first time, I've noticed they get very high between their mother's legs intimidated on sight if I'm not sitting down. So it's not hard for me to silence slash intimidate a child, especially when I'm trying to dot however, a few times I've been called out. One time I was pretty drunk with a friend at a target buying risk, and no, we never finished playing the whole game. This little Mexican 5-7 to seven year old with a mohawk, was being an insufferable little shit in the action figure section. I heard him from like 5 aisles over and it was like nails on a chalkboard. I tell my friend, I'm gonna fart on this kid's head. Watch and learn. I saunter on over to the aisle in question and see the vile little prick calling his mom an idiot for not buying him a huge effing G.I. Joe the movie vehicle, which pissed me off even more considering how awful that movie was. Buy some good toys, I already bought that one for you and you broke it by throwing it down the stairs shut up. I need it. It's the only one I don't have now. The mother was younger than me, I'm mid-twenties, and gave a defeated look, I don't have enough money right now. You are an idiot, and continued to just berate and publicly shame this woman. At the time, I was on a strict Chipotle carnitas burrito diet. And while I was watching all this, my stomach gave me an initial warning gurgle, very courteous stomach, telling me I was about an hour away from punishing the toilet. Serendipity. Destiny. I inch a bit closer to my prey, inspecting some wrestling toys and pondering the weird homoeroticness of the whole sport in general. The kid shouts F you, I hate you. The mom rolls her eyes and turns her back to the kid to ignore him. And could you believe it, the kid gets on his hands and knees and starts taking the toy out of the box. It's go time, 
mother f apostrophe er dot I position my back towards him and at this point I'm like two feet away from him. His head is down, getting frustrated with those goddamn twisty tie things, and I go for the kill. I bend down to reach for the one of the toys on the lower shelf. At this point, my ass is inches away from this kid's head. Now, generally speaking, the best way to go about this is to act casual, drop your belly bomb, then walk away after a few seconds like nothing is out of the ordinary. I usually go one all over and listen to the kid's reaction and delight. However, today I couldn't help myself. I have my head tilted back looking at this kid out of the corner of my eye, to ensure accuracy. I'm so close that from a distance it looks like I'm about to sit on him. My friend sees this happening and can no longer contain himself. He's covering his mouth, but his he haw hyperventilating donkey chortle is fairly audible over the late 90s pop music playing on the loudspeakers. The kid immediately looks up towards the laughter, but can't help but notice there is an ass now directly in his face. Now, I'm trying not to laugh but also panicking as I just made eye contact with him. He furls his brow and I look over in the mother's direction, still back towards us. I relish in the moment and the look on this child's confused and naive face. The initial blast was mighty and boisterous. I swear I saw his hair blowing in the wind, so to speak. If I wasn't wearing jeans, I think it could have probably blown over an empty soda can. I would call it a very fun fart, A++ would buy again. However, what immediately followed that out the chamber was truly horrifying. The fart's implication changed. Without notice and swiftly. It went from a joyous, dry air horn squeal to a nefarious, hissing mephitis. I think the little moppet noticed the hateful metamorphosis before even I did because he wretched his neck violently trying to get away from the personified evil being fumigated into his soul. Because of his positioning, hovering over the toy, hands and knee, it was all in vain as the only way out was forward, and forward would mean certain death. I had positioned myself well on the higher ground, free to escape or relent at any time in him, poor and immobilized, biding his time until the cruel attack was over. Obviously, this child needed to reread Sun Tzu. In total, it lasted about four seconds but for that kid, it must have seemed like time was frozen. The long-term severe brain damage which he no doubt suffered, only added to that effect. When I finished with my business, i.e. forcing a little boy to huff my farts, there was a silent, pregnant pause. The kid was clearly shocked and stunned. No one had ever stood up to this dwarf sociopath in his whole life. I had taken the words out of his mouth and filled it with fart. I make my move first, picking up the toy I was reaching for off the low shelf, take a few steps forward and stare at it for a few seconds. On two alligator, the only thing the kid could manage to do was burst into tears. My friend senses danger the jig is up and his head darts for cover. The mom turns around to see her kid with an open toy, crying on the floor and me minding my own business. She walks up to him and asks what's wrong but the kid can't speak. All he gets out is, bawa wawa fart bawa wawa. It took every fiber in my body not to laugh. I put the toy back on a middle shelf, turn around, give a final nonchalant looksy and then begin to take my exit. Sensing that his assailant was getting away scot-free, he somehow managed to compose himself for a moment. He shouts, he farted on me. I could feel him pointing at me but I continued to act like I was just browsing. I was almost around the corner when the mom goes, excuse me, sir, sir. I turn around nonplussed, uh, who? Me? While pointing to myself. Yes. Did you just fart on my son? Weighing my options, I played dumb. What? I mean, I did fart. On my son? Well, I mean, technically speaking, I mean, what is on? Why did you fart on my son? At this point the little kid has the look of schadenfreude on his face, happy to see me in trouble. F you, I'm a man. I will fart on you if I please. I turn my attention to the little kid and stare at him, because the whole store could hear him being a little, rotten asshole to his mother so I thought I'd come over here and treat him like one. The mom looks at me, her son and the scattered G.I. Joe slash rapper slash box on the floor. The mom is puzzled as to what to do and says, just, just go. That's my cue. I turn around, walk away with little extra step. I look up to see the black orb of security cameras and all the stories on Reddit about unjustly having to register as ASX offender flash before my eyes. As soon as I turn the corner, I book it outside as fast as I can while dialing my friend. Like a true friend, he is right out front with the engine running and risk in the trunk. We laugh on the car ride back about the whole scene. With a slight hint of seriousness in his tone, my friend asks me, do you do that a lot? Ah, not that much. Like once every six months or so. We both knew I was lying. We got to our other friend's house, played risk until four in the morning while drinking scotch. Overall, I would say it was a pretty pretty good day. It's a fascinating historical fact that barely anyone knows. League of Legends, a computer game, ruined the life of a friend. When we finished school, he was winning at life, good grades, got into architecture at uni, had a great girlfriend, and had a decent part-time job that he liked and paid well. Then he found League. For the non-PC gamers, this is a 5 vs 5 game, whereby you control a unique character and work with the other 4x random gamers to meet objectives. It can be fun, but some players take it rather seriously as the game ranks you based on your performance, and the performance of your team. My friend was one such person who took the game seriously, and aggressively. It consumed him. Like, day and night, downward spiral consumption. He became obsessed with the game and trying to improve his ranking. The relationship was the first to go. Understandably, no girl wants to be second to a computer game. Next was the job, as the late nights playing led to poor performance and sick days. Finally, the academics suffered and became permanently deferred. His demeanor took the biggest hit. At school he was everyone's stupidly optimistic and upbeat friend. 
After his spiral, he became a short-tempered and angry man who often took that aggression out at the failures of his other four ex-teammates. What was the worst way you saw someone ruin their life? League of Legends, a computer game, ruined the life of a friend. When we finished school, he was winning at life, good grades, got into architecture at uni, had a great girlfriend, and had a decent part-time job that he liked and paid well. Then he found League. For the non-PC gamers, this is a 5 vs 5 game, whereby you control a unique character and work with the other 4x random gamers to meet objectives. It can be fun, but some players take it rather seriously as the game ranks you based on your performance, and the performance of your team. My friend was one such person who took the game seriously, and aggressively. It consumed him. Like, day and night, downward spiral consumption. He became obsessed with the game and trying to improve his ranking. The relationship was the first to go. Understandably, no girl wants to be second to a computer game. Next was the job, as the late nights playing led to poor performance and sick days. Finally, the academics suffered and became permanently deferred. His demeanor took the biggest hit. At school he was everyone's stupidly optimistic and upbeat friend. After his spiral, he became a short-tempered and angry man who often took that aggression out at the failures of his other four ex-teammates. What is the worst wedding you've ever been to? While in high school, a recently graduated friend got pregnant and had to get married. Both sets of parents were incensed that their good religious children had sx before marriage and both sets of parents were convinced that the other parent's child was to blame. His parents thought the bride was no better than a street-walking whore, her parents thought the groom was opportunistic child-toucher, she was 18, he was 20. Then there were the cultural slurs thrown around, mostly by his family since they were white and the bride's family was Hispanic. When the father of the groom asked if the bride's family planned on serving dirty rice, hey hey at the reception, I thought the grandmother of the bride was going body slam the idiot out the door dot so we get to the day of the wedding and bride's six brothers spend of the day skulking around like they've got weapons hidden in their suits. The groom's family continued to try to convince him that he should at least wait until the bastard is born so you can find out if it's yours or not right up until he went to stand at the altar dot after a very quick ceremony, the whole crowd heads off to the reception being held in the rec room of an apartment complex. The bride and groom try to make the best of it, there was no dancing or even music, because of their religion, and the food was just snack type stuff. It was a whole room of unhappy family members sucking down red punch and bad attitudes. Then comes the coup de asshole, the groom's sister, who was a good 15 years older than the groom, had volunteered to provide the wedding cake as she'd been making really fancy cakes for family birthdays for years. Bride was kind of excited about this since it was really the only gesture of welcome she got from the groom's family. Sister took off right after the ceremony to go and pick up the cake and after an hour, had still not shown up. After another 30 minutes, the bride was ready to just break a chocolate cookie with the groom and be done with it when sister arrived, carrying three store-bought coconut cakes. Correction, three of the smallest stores bought cakes ever in existence and they were obviously not fresh cakes, they had discount stickers on the boxes. Each cake said it served six people and there were over 70 people at the reception plus they were coconut, which the bride was allergic to. The groom's sister had obviously spent an hour or so driving around to different stores looking for the worst of all cakes for this wedding. And she never even tried to explain why she did not make the cake herself as she had offered to do. I don't think the bride stopped crying for days and the groom just looked like he wanted to shoot his whole family. What is the cruelest thing a parent has ever done to you? This one is easy, sadly. My mother called Child Protective Services on me last year. Just because I wasn't talking to her. My world was turned upside down with one phone call. One day a sheriff came to my house. I was surprised because I'm not one to get into trouble or piss anyone off. He said he was there to check on mine and my children's welfare. I was confused. He said my mother had called and said I hadn't talked to her in over a year, my husband was abusive and holding me captive, and I was doing heroin and meth. I looked at him and said, you've got to be kidding me. He assured me it was for real. I told him I spoke to her about two months ago, there's no ball and chain behind me, and I damn sure ain't doing heroin or meth. He actually laughed. I told him she's got issues and I don't want nothing to do with her. He said, well you look healthy, you're not locked in a cellar, and your kids are at school where they should be so I'll be on my way. I thanked him for his time and off he went. I was steaming pissed that day. I wondered what is wrong with that woman. Now I really won't talk to her. The next day, during the afternoon before the kids got home from school, there was a knock on the door. I opened the door and there is a sheriff and social worker. Dumbfounded, I ask if I can help them. They tell me someone has made a report to CPS and they're there to investigate. I was floored to say the least. So we sit down and the social worker begins to interrogate me. She then begins to list the allegations. She tells me I'm supposedly mentally ill, doing heroin and meth, being manipulated and abused by my husband, my children run around unsupervised, the kids aren't adequately cared for, etc. I broke down and sobbed in disbelief. I asked who made this report and was told it was anonymous. I knew by the heroin and meth and husband abusing me bit exactly who it was. The show had just begun. Another sheriff arrived shortly after. They ask if they can search my home. I said for what, and was told if I didn't consent they would take my kids away. Reluctantly, I said fine I have nothing to hide. As the sheriffs are upstairs searching I'm still being interrogated downstairs by the social worker. My husband arrived and was very upset about the situation, naturally. He's even more angry seeing me a mess in tears having to be asked appalling questions. Next thing you know, there's a knock at the door. Lo and behold it's another sheriff. He waltzes in and I ask what the hell he's here for. The sheriffs come downstairs with an empty box that my husband had under our bed from a gun he purchased. They asked where the gun was and he replied it was in the car. They asked to see it and he refused. He's not a felon and it's registered and completely legal. 
That seemed to piss them off but they had no grounds to take it or see it. So here we are. Sitting in the living room with the social worker and sheriff while another one is in the kitchen and one in the dining room. Why, I couldn't even tell you. The sheriff had a brown paper bag and said there was some evidence in it. He pulled out some pill bottles. He asked me what they were for. I told him I suffer from depression and anxiety. I also take something for an opiate addiction. I'm in recovery and take a preventable medicine. Well, they thought they got me there. Mentally unstable and a drug addict. Perfect ammunition to use against me. They looked at me as though I was despicable. Scum. I could feel the judgment through my bones. The social worker asked my husband and I to accompany her to the kitchen. That's when she pulls out the drug tests. She asked if we were willing to take a voluntary drug test. We said absolutely. He went first, then I went. There we were in our home with three sheriffs and a CPS worker peeing in a cup to prove ourselves not to be drug addicts. I felt completely violated. The test took a few minutes to come out but they were negative. Almost disappointed, she let us see them and told us they were clean. I felt validated, but still so angry. My kids come home from school and ask what's going on. I didn't even know what to say. I just told them to get a snack and go to their room and I'd be with them shortly. The social worker said we could wrap up for now, but she'd be in touch. I kindly led them out. My husband and I just looked at each other and didn't even say a word. We were both too upset to even talk. Every aspect of our privacy and humanity had been stripped of us. Then we had to explain to the kids what was going on. After that we had to clean our home because when the sheriffs went through our belongings they had just thrown things about and had no respect for our things. The next day the kids informed me after school that a social worker had come to visit them to ask them questions about mom and dad. They were scared and upset. I told them it would be okay. As long as they told the truth everything would be fine. We've got nothing to hide. The social worker paid me a few more visits. Each time I was cooperative and willing to do whatever was needed. Anything to get them to go away and stay away. Turns out my mother had called the principal at school asking him questions about my kids. Were they stinky, dirty, did they look well-fed, things like that. Then someone who claimed to be an uncle called and did the same. The principal got so uncomfortable he called the social worker and told her he was being harassed and didn't want to deal with it. She finally said without saying in certain words it was my mother who filed the report. She admitted that the situation was very unusual. She paid me a last visit to let me know that not one claim could be substantiated. She apologized for the intrusion. She told me the case was closed and she would report back to my mother that all is well. Only after having our house ripped apart, taking drug tests, having my children interrogated at school, calling my psychiatrist, pharmacy, family and friends where we deemed fit enough parents. I can't begin to tell you what this situation has done to me. You're probably wondering if I confronted my mother. I sent her a text message after all was said and done and asked her if she had any idea what she had done. I asked what she was thinking. I know what she did. To not only me, but her grandkids. Well, she had nothing to say about it. So I left it there. If she ever comes to her senses and wants to explain herself and apologize profusely I will give her a chance. But never will I go out of my way to have any kind of relations with her. As far as the kids, they want nothing to do with her. That is their choice. I told them they are free to talk to her and see her if they wish they should not suffer anymore. They said they would rather not. So be it. My gold digger stepmother threw a temper tantrum at the reading of my grandmother's will, and immediately after got embarrassed in front of everyone. My stepmother is a very entitled person to say the least and she has never seen eye to eye with any members of the family. She was my father's rebound just two months after the passing of my bio mother, and the whole family was very surprised to see him move on so quickly. My stepmother, in her three years of being with my father has gone on too, tried to ban the mention of my bio mother in the house, gotten herself banned from my uncle's place for getting drunk and picking a fight with my aunt over religion, and become widely accepted as the black sheep of the family. Her and I certainly do not get along and we are always kind of staying away from each other, only interacting when absolutely necessary. I mean how can you be on good terms with a woman who will yell at you for saying the name of your dead mother? It's also become very apparent to us that she is a gold digger of a high level and for some reason it only appears to be my father who is unable to see this. I have tried proving this to him many times only for him to call me rude and disrespectful. You see, my stepmother loves gold, and diamond rings, hell the first time my father proposed to her she said no because the ring didn't cost five figures. Another thing which is a huge point of contempt was the relationship between my stepmother and grandmother. They never got along and that was no secret. They both openly talked about how much they disliked each other throughout the years, with my stepmother even calling my grandmother a beach during Christmas once. However about six months ago my grandmother was diagnosed with terminal cancer and told she is maybe half a year to live and will be lucky to see the holidays. And just like that, almost overnight my stepmother's behavior changed drastically. She went to calling and texting grandmother daily, making sure she was. Okay, showing up for surprise visits with medicine and chocolates, and even offering herself to be a free caretaker. My grandmother, being no fool, saw right through my stepmother's act. You see, my grandmother was a very rich woman and this was no secret in the family. Everyone knew that her nest was fat, and my stepmother wanted as much as she could get. The six months throughout which my grandmother's health kept deteriorating I saw my stepmother acting so concerned for her. Even going as far as breaking down and crying at a family gathering because she was so sad that grandmother was going to die. What she didn't know however, was that granny was planning to ruin her. She has already suspected my stepmother for doing this for her own interest, but what I sent her previously only confirmed to her that my stepmother was up to some shady tactics. 
You see, a few months ago I managed to eavesdrop on a phone conversation between my stepmother and her best friend, and my mother was quietly complaining about how she has to take care of the old hag, but that the will will all be worth it in the end. I ended up audio recording it and showing it to my granny. So when granny ended up ultimately passing away just a few days after Christmas, the entire family gathered around for the reading of the will done by grandma's lawyer. The will was immaculate, we all knew that granny had some money, but we had no idea it was this much. Essentially, most of us got enough money to get through college, and some of us got very expensive and timeless jewelry too. The thing is, as the will kept being read one thing became obvious, and that my stepmother was nowhere to be found. The entire time my stepmother's face was seething with anger, and with each name that was called she got more and more angry. The will ended without a single mention of my stepmother, other than one dollar that was given to her as my grandmother's way of saying, thanks for acting like a part-time caretaker. My stepmother. Threw a tantrum when the will was done, she was literally crying about how she spent so much time caring for granny and got nothing in return. She then, in a fit of rage, proceeded to call us all ungrateful PP heads and blame us because we ended with a lot and apparently never did anything for her. She went to leave when the lawyer spoke up again, and this time what he said got her attention. Turns out my granny had left a letter to my stepmother, a letter which was read aloud. My stepmother hoped that the letter would leave her with fortunes or something along those lines, but all she got instead was a long explanation of how she knew that the caretaker role was all an act to get money out of her. That granny knows without a doubt that my stepmother has already thrown a tantrum over the will, and if that wasn't enough to show everyone how much of a gold digger my stepmother was, my granny also put a CD into the envelope. We played the CD and it was my recording which I gave to her, the recording exposing my stepmother's true intentions. We all sat there, eyeballs directly at my stepmother, who proceeded to dart out of the room as soon as she realized what she was listening to. However, the way the room was positioned made it impossible for her to leave without walking by everyone, so her leave, which took about 30 seconds, was extremely awkward and even funny to watch. Date my gold digger stepmother through a temper tantrum at the reading of my grandmother's will, and immediately after got embarrassed in front of everyone. So in the aftermath of my grandmother's absolute badassery, it became clear to my stepmother that she was not very much wanted in the family. The only person who stuck by her, unsurprisingly, was my father. He went out of way to send a personalized text message to every single member of the family who attended the will, 13 people, defending my wife's actions, simultaneously berating my late grandmother for pulling something so sly and backhanded, and telling everyone that if they wish to say something to his wife then they're gonna have to go through him first. This was the first ever huge fight I had with him. Even when my stepmonster tried to ban the mention of my mother's name, I never turned to him for help as I just defied my stepmother, but this time it was different. He was going out of his way to defend a person who has been cruel and hedonistic, even two-faced, and at the same time he stands against his late mother-in-law, who was the mother to his first love. We ended up getting into a huge screaming match about his text to the family and he ended up telling me that if I don't like my mom I can pack my stuff and get out. He referred to that woman as my mom, and I asked him not to say that. He shrugged at me and said that he's technically not wrong, and I exploded at him, asking him how can a man be so spineless? I told him I'm 16 but I'm still more of a man than he will ever be. He may be bigger and older than me, but at least I have the nerds not to let a gold digging witch disrespect my dead wife, my son and my mother-in-law. Maybe that was too far, but in the heat of the moment I meant it, and I still do. Needless to say I was kicked out and I'm now staying with my cousins, who have all cut contact with both my stepmother and my dad. My idiot parents bought my psychopath sister a dog for her birthday knowing she would abuse him, so I gave him away to my best friend to save him. Although my sister is not diagnosed as a psychopath, I'm convinced she is one. She is 13 years old and in her own words, loves to hurt things. And these are not just words from her, she really means it. I have scars on my back from the time she decided to wake me up with hot water a few years ago, my mother has a wound on her leg from my sister thinking it was a funny prank to stick a poker at my mother's leg, and my sister has been expelled from three different school, each time for hurting fellow students, even going as far as to cut a girl's hair off with scissors. The biggest thing is, my parents somehow fail to recognize that my sister is dangerous, and refuse to take her to therapy or anger management class or anything that could help her in any way. I truly think my parents are idiots or have some form of mental impairment because there is no way you can look at my sister and deem her not to be dangerous. The girl literally keeps a to hurt list in her notes app on her phone which consists of people she is going to hurt. Every single day, my sister shows some sort of psychopathic behavior, with the latest incident being yesterday when she decided to ambush our mother to play five-finger fillet with my mother's fingers which were resting on the table. Our mother took it as a joke. A huge thing with my sister is that she also has a tendency to hurt animals, and I have caught her hurting rabbits, frogs, snails, even cats, she got clawed in the arm once by a cat she tried to hurt and now has a fear of cats. What makes me unbelievably frustrated is that two months ago she asked my parents for a pet dog for her birthday. She promised to take good care of it. When I found out, I told my parents not to do that because the dog will get seriously hurt, but I was brushed aside and told that my sister would never go out of her way to hurt a puppy who was hers. Their logic being that my sister could not look into the eyes of her new puppy and hurt it. They must have missed the time she looked into the eyes of a kitten and set his tail on fire. Anyway, this led to us having an argument which ended with me being told that this isn't my decision, and they will talk to my sister about it and deem if she is fit to take good care of a dog. So they ended up talking to her and of course getting manipulated. I heard the entire conversation as they had it right next to me, and each time I tried to chime in I was told to be quiet. My sister kept promising to take good care of the dog, and even started lying by listing fake examples of times she has brought animals into the garden to play fetch with and let go after a while. Obviously she has never done this, but my parents bought it. 
So her birthday came around one week ago and I woke up praying that my parents didn't end up falling for her prank. So I came downstairs to find my sister who was too busy opening her presents to say hello to me. And in one of her huge present boxes was a puppy. When she opened it she was very excited and my parents were too, but I was just disappointed. I grit my teeth shut however and went about the day, celebrating it like nothing was wrong. At night, I was sitting downstairs with my sister's new dog feeding him, as he hadn't been fed all day. I ended up getting a guttural feeling that my sister was planning to hurt this puppy, and I decided to snoop through her phone to see if she had any plans. If you recall her notes to hurt list, this was the first thing I went into to see if she had any plans for this puppy. Lo and behold I found the plans for the puppy. She planned to starve and hurt the dog in a vicious manner, by doing things similar to what she did to the kitten. I started fearing for the dog and tried figuring out what to do. It was at that moment I got the genius idea. I contacted my best friend. And asked him if he would still like a puppy as he has been going on about getting one. He said yes and I explained the situation to him. That same night I dropped the puppy off, and in the morning I played it off like the puppy had escaped through the unlocked door. Not my parents or my sister even thought to question it, proving to me I did the right thing. I still sometimes visit the puppy too. My obese son ended up sitting on his bully and squishing him. The school called me to give out and I tore them a new one. So my son is obese, he is a freshman in high school and 15 years old and 240 pounds at 5 foot 10. He is trying to lose weight and has so far dropped 20 pounds and I am extremely proud of him, however he struggles a lot socially. School is very hard for him and at his size he gets bullied a lot. There is this one kid in his class named Aaron who is a total piece of crap and bullies my son for his weight relentlessly. He has gone on to knock my son's food out of his hand, drawn pigs on my son's books and insults my son daily, calling him names such as Beluga, Butterball Grease Dog Discord Mod and the worst one I have heard is him telling my son he is built like a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. My son has come complaining to me many times about the bullying and I have called the school up numerous times, but it almost seemed like no matter what I did the bullying persisted. I am a pacifist at heart so I tried telling my son to avoid physical confrontation and embarrass the kid verbally, but there was little my son could do. When my son tried verbally lashing back, according to him, Aaron just responded with shut up fatty, and whoever heard the conversation ended up laughing at my son who became a laughing stock just like that. So last week my son came to me again telling me about Aaron asking me if he should just fight back physically. I ended up telling my son that although I am usually against this, he has my permission to whip this bully's butt. Just a few days later while Aaron was at school I ended up getting a call from the principal telling me to come into the school as soon as possible. I had a day off on that day so I came immediately where I was greeted with my son in the office alone with the principal. The principal told me that my son had seriously injured Aaron and he was going to be suspended. I asked the principal what happened, and the principal proceeded to tell me that my son can explain himself. And explain himself my son did. According to my son, Aaron started picking on him again, calling him a cheeseburger, and my son told him that if he says something else he's gonna regret it. Aaron went on to sarcastically remark, what you gonna do, sit on me. So when the next break came around my son walked up to Aaron with no hesitation, pushed him to the ground and sat on his chest, staying there until Aaron was wheezing. Aaron ended up going home as he was having difficulties breathing. The principal told me that something like this is serious and was very dangerous to do, and they would have no choice but to discipline my son. I interrupted the principal however and went on a rant about how for months the school has been allowing Aaron to bully my son for his weight despite my son's amazing effort at losing weight. That this type of BS is the exact reason nobody tackles the school system seriously and why bullies have free reign, because the school offers no pushback. And when the person on the receiving end of the bullying ends up fighting back, you punish him for not sitting there and taking it without complaints. I asked the principal of my son looks like a WH re to sit back and take it all with a smile on his face. Date my obese son ended up sitting on his bully and squishing him. The school called me to give out and I tore them a new one. So my son did end up being suspended for three days despite my absolute best efforts to ensure he receives no punishment for his actions. The three days were spent by me and him going out and enjoying ourselves as well as exercising. It has now been two months since that incident however and my son has gone on to lose another 15 pounds, putting him down to 225. That's a two-plate bench press folks, I'm extremely proud of him. As far as my son's bully Aaron goes, he doesn't pick on my son anymore and actually steers clear of him. I figured this was going to happen however, as Aaron didn't seem like a hoodlum who would get rocked in the mouth and come back for more. He's a spoiled only child who isn't used to being told no and certainly doesn't know how to stand back up after getting hit, so I did indeed expect him to back off. Also, an unexpected outcome of this whole situation is my son has become a little bit of a meme in his school for sitting on his bully. I asked my son if he minds this and he says not at all, he says it's quite funny and whenever people say it to him they say it with humor and applause. Turns out nobody really likes bullies huh? However, we are looking for new schools for his sophomore year of high school as we have both agreed that even though things are going pretty good right now, there are a lot of traumatic memories that can develop by staying in this school for my son, and that is not something either of us want. My son wants to start school with a Cleason slate and that's what we're looking to do. My son has also been more motivated than ever to lop's weight, and he has asked me to shame him into doing so. I oblige as this is what he wants, but it still feels weird to wake my son up by calling him a fat F each morning. He tells me this is what he wants though, and in the past month, which is how long I've been shaming him per his request, he has lost 10 pounds. Who's the most entitled person you've ever met? The neighborhood mom who told me that I should let her son actually assault me. This happened when I was 15. A boy in my neighborhood would often catcall me and try to grab me. He was around my age. I had told him to leave me alone, I had complained to his parents, but to no avail. 
when I told my parents about it, they just told me to ignore him. One day, when I was walking home from school, he caught up with me. As usual he made some filthy comments about my body and the things he would do to me. I walked faster in an attempt to lose him. I just wanted to get home. But he grabbed my arm and lifted up my skirt, exposing my underwear. I effing lost it. I began punching and kicking him with all my strength and with all the rage that had been building up inside me. I didn't stop until someone pulled me off of him. It was his mother. She screamed at me for hurting her little boy and told me she would be speaking to my parents. I said fine and walked home. I knew it would get ugly that evening, but his blood on my knuckles made me feel a little better. That evening when my parents got home, Karen was already waiting beside our front door. Apparently, she had been messaging my parents all day, telling them about the beating. She berated them again in person. The boys will be boys defense was used. Here's the fun part. My parents actually apologized to her and promised her they would discipline me. When she left I told them my side of the story but my dad just repeated what he had said earlier, that I should have ignored him. And, icing on the cake, he told me if I didn't want to draw the attention of boys, I should lengthen my skirts. Never mind the fact that I had pretty much been assaulted. My mom told me to grow up and be more ladylike, instead of getting into fights with boys. My two brothers who were younger than me were much more sympathetic. My 13-year-old brother said he'd get his friends to gang up on him. If he ever came near me. Thankfully, it never came to that. The coward never harassed me again. I guess getting beaten up by a girl can really kill a misogynist's confidence. Made my disabled coworker cry for making fun of me. My coworker Z is disabled from the waist down, and we've been working in the same office for three years. She is the most obnoxious loud mouth to ever breathe on this planet, because of which I never hang around her, but she has these two friends who keep poking fun at people and think they are the funniest people around. My father died a few months ago, and it was bad for my family and my coping mechanism has been binge eating which led me to gain weight. Some coworkers told me that she has been calling me Snorlax behind my back but I didn't care because she didn't say it to my face. A few days ago, we had a team building exercise and had to give each other endearing names, and she named me Snorlax and everybody started to laugh. I said that I didn't find that funny and decided to not participate any further. HR called me in and told me that it wasn't meant in a mean spirit, but she said that she was going to talk to Z and ask her to not call me that again. Our team has a WhatsApp group and the next evening Z shared a video of a fat man dancing without a shirt and wrote that I was a happy Pokemon. This was extremely petty so I confronted her about it the next day, and she told me that she was only joking and I shouldn't take it to heart. I said that I was going to complain to the HR and she asked me to go ahead. When I moved a few steps away I heard people laughing, and when I turned I saw that she was imitating the guy from the video. I yelled at her that it would have been actually funny if she could actually stand up on her own two feet and then dance, to make fun of her for being in a wheelchair. She started to cry, like she absolutely lost it. I thought that she was only faking it for sympathy but they had to take her to see a doctor because she wouldn't stop crying. I kind of regret it, but I also don't feel too bad since she started it in the first place. Am I the a-hole for getting my toddlers high? I'm 32 and a huge pothead. When I was 25, I met my current girlfriend in line for the bathroom at a Nickelback concert and we hooked up that night. I guess she wasn't on birth control because she got pregnant and told me about it a month later. Well, I'm pro-420 but I'm also pro-life and very religious, so we decided to make our relationship official for the sake of the baby. Ever since my twins were born, I have loved them so much and I work two jobs to make ends meet for my family. Unfortunately, working these long hours tires me out beyond belief, so when I get home I usually blaze up on the couch and watch something relaxing like Judge Judy. My girlfriend sometimes gets mad at me for smoking in the house while the kids are there, but they're in a different room so I don't think it really matters all that much. Anyway, we had their birthday pretty recently at our house, and it was awful because there were like 15 kids running around screaming at the top of their lungs. It was a super stressful situation for me, but I had an idea. I had just made a bunch of edible brownies, and I decided to put them out for the kids. I was hoping that they would eat them and mellow out for a bit and it actually worked perfectly. We sent them home, and some of their parents even thanked us because it seemed like their kids were really relaxed afterwards. I told my girlfriend about my awesome plan and she completely flipped out at me. She claims I was endangering all of these kids' lives, but I think I was just making everyone's lives so much easier. Try to take advantage of my sister's disability? Enjoy being disowned and arrested? My little sister, henceforth known as Holly, is mute. She can whisper a little but it takes a lot of effort on her part. She's been mute ever since she was five, when she lost her ability to speak in an accident. She's very smart and she's a good-looking kid. At the time of these events, she was 16 and I was 21. Me and my sister live together in an apartment because my mother is a roamer who isn't well suited to take care of a teenager. She has our twin siblings, but not my sister and I. My dad is distant from the family, so helping my sister through high school falls on me. I work at a car parts shipping company so I get paid just enough to get by. Because of our relatively poor living situation and my sister's inability to speak, she gets bullied at school. Generally it isn't much of a problem, but in the few months leading up to these events she was having increased problems with it. At the time, Holly was 16, but she was a sophomore in high school due to failing a year in middle school. Because she's good looking and is older than most of her class, she gets attention from juniors and seniors. It's mostly negative attention, but there was one guy who I will refer to as Dio from now on who treats her really nicely. He's a senior and at this time is 18. He repels bullies from her because he's a tall, handsome, tough guy and bullies don't want to mess with him. I don't interfere with them because my sister is visibly happy when she comes home from school and whenever she's around him. I didn't let them hang out alone together, but supervised them hanging out a few times. Anyway, 
After a few months she stopped coming home happy. She isn't hanging out with him anymore either, and although I ask her multiple times she won't tell me anything about it. I confront him about it and he evades the topic. At this point I'm suspicious, but I don't know what to be suspicious of. I'm getting more and more worried about Holly, so I go to her counselor and assistant principal to ask about her activities at school. From what I learn, she still spends all her free time near Dio at school. I find this strange, since she doesn't seem happy anymore. A few days later, I invited Holly and Dio on a dinner night to Olive Garden. While we're there I do two things that are completely illegal. First, I steal his phone, which I've seen the password to, and second, I read his texts and emails. I do anything I can to find out what's happened between them. I don't find what I'm looking for, but I do find out that he drinks and smokes 420 with his friends on weekends. A few days later I find his phone in the laundry, and say it must have ended up in one of our coats by accident. I know for a fact he got it back, because he called me to thank me for having Holly return it. I still didn't have what I was looking for, so I went back to the school and used his previous texts as grounds to check CCTV for any suspicious activity. There wasn't anything suspicious by school standards, but there was something that caught my eye. It was my sister, going to the central bathroom in the school and him going to the boys' room of the same bathroom about a minute later. The bathrooms are separated by a wall, but there's a janitorial closet that opens into both bathrooms and is completely in the blind zone of anyone walking into the bathrooms, let alone the CCTV cameras. At this point, I began to suspect that something was happening between them in that bathroom. It was the only one with a closet like that, and if my memory served me correctly, the closet didn't have a proper lock. It just locked from the outside on both sides. Now that I suspected something, I confronted Holly about it. She broke down crying, and after 15 minutes of consoling, she shakily signed to me something that made my blood boil. Apparently, it was far worse than I expected. I had thought they were going in. They're in doing substances or something, since Dio was the kind of guy who would pull that kind of thing. As it turns out, according to Holly, he brought her in there one day, closed the doors, held her down, and assaulted her. He told her that he would know if she told anyone and he would hurt her if she did. Because she physically could not scream for help or make any kind of loud noise for that matter, he got away with it. The worst part is, he was threatening her into meeting him there every couple of days and doing that to her. I was livid. My first instinct was to call the police, but I realized that there was no evidence except the testimony of a mute girl. I wouldn't be satisfied with police intervention anyway. The first thing I did was call Holly and for a week off from school. The next thing I did was find out where he lived. After that, I planned the most brutal revenge I could think of. My first step was to break into his house. It turns out his parents go out a lot, and he leaves to smoke and drink with his friends. I knew from reading his text that there was a spare key on top of the porch light in the backyard. That Saturday, I scoped out the place, and waited for everyone to leave. I then began phase one of my revenge. I went into his house through the back door and found his room. I smashed his PC, stole his wallet, and pissed on his bed. Then I poorly hid two small bags of weed in his house. Finally, to hide the fact that it was targeted, I tossed up the rest of the house, but didn't take anything. I then went to a Starbucks and used the Wi-Fi and Dio's debit card to purchase a bunch of sex toys in his name and send them to his house. I then left his wallet sitting near a homeless man sleeping on a park bench. Next, I contacted his parents and told them I had seen their son drinking and smoking with a group of teenagers. They were furious, which leads me to believe that wasn't the first time something like that had happened. Finally, I went to the back road he walked on his way home from his drinking parties, which I had found out in a text from one of his friends. I waited for two hours in some bushes for him to walk by, and then jumped him. I demanded his money and phone although I knew he didn't have his wallet. I kept one hand in my hoodie pocket, pointing it like I had a gun, which he believed. He handed over his phone and ran away. I then finished up my plan by using his phone, which I still had the password to, to send an email to the school from his school email, confessing to roping my sister in the janitorial closet multiple times, as well as possessing substances on school grounds and drinking when he was underage. Then I snapped his phone on my knee and went home. My sister went back to school the following Monday, armed with a can of mace I bought her. Dio wasn't at school, and she was called in by her counselor. She told them the whole story, and he was charged with rope, underage drinking, and illegal substance possession. On top of that, his parents completely disowned him, and he was expelled from the school. What single human has done the most damage to the progression of humanity in the history of mankind? Emperor Gaozong of China. It was the 12th century. When people talk about how China used to be the most technologically advanced part of the world, this is the period they're talking about. Some historians say that they were on the brink of industrializing. Then Manchuria invaded and conquered northern China. The imperial court retreated to the south and declared Gaozong, the emperor's brother, as the new emperor. China's top general Yue Fei rallied the army and defeated the Manchurians, and he was raring to chase them out, but he got orders from Gaozong to back down because he'd rather negotiate. These negotiations end up signing away the north half of China. A few years later, the Manchus invaded again. Yue Fei beats them again and pushes all the way back to the old capital. Then he gets the order to retreat. He responds with a letter saying that he's got the Manchus on the ropes, and he can reconquer northern China in like a month. No, says the emperor, retreat immediately. Eventually, Yue Fei does retreat, but he delays long enough to evacuate the city first, making up some logistical issues as an excuse. At this point, you may be wondering why Gao Zong was so reluctant to push an advantage. The answer is that his brother was still alive, the king of Manchuria liked to bring him out once in a while and make fun of him. If Yue Fei reconquered China, he might liberate the rightful emperor, and Gao Zong would be out of a job. As such, 
Gao Zong was actively trying to throw the war. He interpreted Yue Fei's delay at the end of this war as meaning that he had reached the point of at least considering going rogue, so as soon as Yue Fei got back, he was arrested and promptly executed on treason on the ground of a ver, he might have done something. Presumably because the optics on the actual charge were too bad. People realize that this is bull quickly enough, and there are protests, but Gao Zong manages to pin everything on one of his advisors and placate the mob by executing him. So how does this affect the long-term progression of humanity? Well, as I said, China might have been on the brink of industrializing at the time, but didn't have access to enough coal. There are coal deposits in China, but they're all in the north. Second, the Manchus never really got their internal issues sorted out, and 70 years later they were easily conquered by the Mongols, who then recruited a bunch of disaffected Chinese siege engineers. This essentially removed the one weakness of horse archer hordes, they're not good at taking fortresses, and allowed them to wreck half the world. Had China been united at the time they probably could not have done this. So had it not been for the malice of this one man, the Mongols would probably never have become the juggernaut they eventually did and the Industrial Revolution might have happened about 500 years ahead of schedule. My golden child brother destroyed the heirloom ring which my grandmother left me, so I destroyed his relationship. My brother is a golden child and he has been this way since he was born. He was a miracle baby and a planned pregnancy whereas I followed after and was unplanned. Growing up my brother took great pleasure in being treated as the favorite by my parents, he routinely let me know he was the favorite and flaunted his expensive presents. My parents did not totally neglect me, but it was clear they favored my brother. I remember my birthdays being celebrated in a minuscule fashion, with maybe a family dinner at home. My brother's birthdays however were always extravagant, with expensive presents such as the newest toys and clothes, with trips to water parks and movies he wanted to watch, as well as outings to restaurants we couldn't really afford. I remember asking for a present on my birthday which was about as expensive as the dinner at the restaurant we went to last year for my brother's birthday, and was told not to be stupid as my parents did not have the money for it. My brother also grew entitled over the years as he realized he could simply take my things without permission and get away with it. I remember him stealing my favorite jacket and refusing to give it back. I was 14 at the time and already working and had bought it with my own money. I told my parents about it, and they said I should stop being petty over a few dollars. I ended up getting into an argument over the jacket with my brother, and he ended up socking me over it when I tried to take it back by force. I am now 18 and my brother is 21, I am looking to move out soon and what happened recently has me speedrunning getting out of this house. So my grandmother had recently passed away and she was someone who I was very close with. Definitely closer than my brother was. I remember during the will reading my brother looked more excited than anything about the possibility of inheriting. Money or something valuable. I know what he wanted exactly, and it was a family heirloom ring. Well, unfortunately for my brother, it was I who ended up inheriting the ring, and once my brother heard this chaos erupted. At first it wasn't too tumultuous, with some seething and visibly frustration from my brother at the reading of the will. However, I knew that once I got home things were going to hit the fan. And I was very much correct. As soon as my parents, brother and I came home, I was instantly ganged up on by the three of them. My brother spoke first, asking nicely if he could have the ring so he could propose to his girlfriend. I asked him why he wanted to propose to her as he's only been with her for two months, but he claimed he just knew. I told him no however, this was my ring and it was something I wanted to remember my grandma by. As soon as I finished my sentence my parents jumped in, trying their absolute best to persuade me. They started off trying to bargain with me, offering to buy me things and even pay me the ring's worth in cash. I told them no however, and then things turned hostile. My brother claimed he deserved the ring more because he was the oldest and tried to state grandma would want him to have it, so I asked him why she left it to me then? He then insulted her, claiming that because of her dementia she probably forgot who was who and put the wrong name down. I got in his face about this comment and our parents separated us. The argument ended there, but I should have known my brother, being the entitled poop he is, would not let up. The next morning I woke up and looked in my brother to find the ring and place it in a safer box, one that my brother would not find. But the ring was not there. I ended up going downstairs and searching for it, only for my brother to ask me what I was looking for. The ring I responded, and my brother went on to tell me that he destroyed the ring because he figured if he couldn't have it, I couldn't. Either, his reasoning was we are family and we are equal. It's not fair for you to have things I don't. I saw red when he said that, but I managed to catch myself before making a stupid decision and so I left the house to compose myself. After doing a little bit of thinking, I figured I would reach out to my brother's girlfriend. Call me petty, but he has manipulated her into believing that he is a selfless and loving brother, he is not an honest boyfriend. I told her all about the ring situation and how despite only being together for two months and not even having said I love you, he plans on proposing to her. We exchanged for a long amount of time where I essentially exposed him and proved to her just how selfish and self-centered he is. I don't know how they broke up, but all I know is they did. As when I came home I found my brother crying over his girlfriend leaving him. Date my golden child brother destroyed the heirloom ring which my grandmother left me, so I destroyed his relationship. So a lot of things have happened since my last post, not the least of which being my brother finding out that I was behind his girlfriend breaking up with him. The reason he found out was because the girlfriend herself ended up telling him. He tried to text her relentlessly after they broke up asking for another chance, and one of the times she snapped and told him everything I told her. My brother snapped at me and we ended up actually getting into a fist fight over this, but it did not escalate too much and neither of us ended up getting seriously hurt. I have also been successful in finding an apartment in which to live and I will be moving there very soon. Likely the biggest thing that happened however, was that my brother actually lied about destroying the ring. He never destroyed it at all, nor did he sell it, he stashed it away in his room deep in his closet. 
I ended up finding it while I was going through his closet to look for a leather jacket he borrowed from me but never gave back. I took the ring and sealed it away safely and have not informed my brother of my discovery. If he ends up finding out I found it I'm sure I'll have a lot of problems to deal with. My parents aren't talking to me either right now because of my brother's girlfriend breaking up with him. My brother is still inconsolable about his girlfriend breaking up with him too, as he has moved on to harassing her friend group into getting her to forgive him, and by doing so is speedrunning getting blocked by the whole friend group. My sick girlfriend purposely coughed on my immunocompromised baby brother as a prank, so my mother slapped her. My girlfriend is notoriously known for pulling pranks, pranks which really aren't pranks. She has pranked me by inserting the tip of the massage gun into my back door without warning, put extra hot hot sauce onto my food despite knowing I don't like spicy food and once put a thumbtack into my shoe causing my foot to bleed. She has never taken her pranks outside of our relationship though as she is pretty good at respecting boundaries of others and does generally understand that the only reason I put up with these pranks of hers is because I am her boyfriend. Well, something came over my girlfriend last week when I asked her if she would like to visit my mother and see my baby brother for the first time. She seemed very excited and said yes, then asked me if she could prank my brother. I told her no however, he is immunocompromised and she is not to do anything to him. She seemed to take this on board and we agreed to visit my mother over the weekend. Unfortunately, my girlfriend ended up getting sick on Thursday evening and we thought about cancelling the visit altogether, but my girlfriend persisted that she was going to be fine come Sunday. When Sunday came around my girlfriend was still a little sick but not nearly as bad as she had been the last three days, and we asked my mother if she was okay with my girlfriend coming over. My mother said yes but as long as my girlfriend wears a mask. My girlfriend agreed and we headed over. As soon as we got there, my girlfriend started gushing about how cute the baby was and tried to hold him. When my mother told her no, she seemed very upset and pouted, but my mother informed her she would be allowed to hold him when she's not sick. My girlfriend then got the brilliant idea to try show off that she's not sick. I should have known my girlfriend was going to try something stupid but nothing could have prepared me for. What she did. She proceeded to take her mask off, announce I'm not even that sick look. And she let out a few exaggerated cause right into the babies. I pulled her back immediately and my girlfriend started laughing saying it was all a prank. My mother got in her face and asked what this was all about, and my girlfriend laughed before saying she was not actually sick anymore and this was a prank. I didn't even know she was not sick, she told me she was 90% okay this morning but not 100. Anyway, my mother, not finding this prank funny at all, decided to show my girlfriend what happens when you mess with an Eastern European woman's child. My mother cocked her hand back and delivered a thunderous slap to my girlfriend's face, and I stood back in absolute shock. As soon as this happened I got in the middle of them and separated them. My girlfriend began crying and my mother asked her to leave. On our way out I apologized to my mother and told her I was going to have a serious talk with my girlfriend once we got home. My manipulative husband lied about vaccinating our daughter and she is now sick with polio, so I'm divorcing him. My husband is a huge conspiracy theorist and this has been our only point of contempt within the marriage. Everything else is fine, but his obsession with QAnon, Fox, the globalists and other things can be infuriating at times. He cannot go a single conversation without turning it political. The other day we were talking about how nice of a day it is, and he commented that we better enjoy it while we can before they round us up and put us all in labor camps. He also makes sure that his political stance is known whenever we go out to meet up with other friends and desperately tries dragging them into political conversations. The thing is, he is a very loving husband and has always treated me amazingly, however when we had our child six months ago things changed for the worse. We suddenly found ourselves having heated arguments about how to raise our daughter. I wanted our daughter to be vaccinated, but my husband was insistent on us not vaccinating our child. I remember him waking me up every day with articles he found of parents complaining about how vaccines ruined their baby's health, as well as shared stories with me which he found through Facebook. He would tell me daily that if we vaccinated our child she would die and that it would be our fault. If we did it we would be murderers. This argument of ours happened every single day until I put my foot down and told him that we're either vaccinating our daughter or I'm divorcing and vaccinating her myself. My husband seemed to reluctantly give in after I said this. And thus we began vaccinating our daughter. I was there for most of the vaccines which were administered to her, but I coincidentally happened not to be there for any of the polio vaccines due to work. I texted my husband every time and he would send me a picture of himself and our daughter at the hospital each time. I had no reason to believe he was not actually vaccinating her. Well, about three weeks ago we noticed our baby started getting sick. She developed a very high fever, looked to be more tired than she ever was, started having pains in her limbs and would cry out whenever we touched her arms or legs, and her movements especially in her neck area started becoming stiff. We made a trip to the hospital where we had the doctors examine her. My husband and I waited patiently and did research and all the signs pointed to polio. I was super confused however as my husband had her vaccinated for polio. But my suspicions grew as each time I mentioned polio he deflected it and reassured me he had her vaccinated. Well, the doctor came back and delivered the news that it was indeed polio and asked if she had been vaccinated. I said yes, but that's when my husband asked me to speak privately with him. It was then that he revealed he did not vaccinate her because he thought it would all be okay if he just said he did without actually doing it. I cried and called him an idiot, but then told him now was not the time for me to be mad and we will discuss this later. Over the next few weeks we focused on helping my daughter recover, and although it was heartbreaking and most of my nights were sleepless, it seems like my daughter is now doing okay. I also plan to divorce my husband. 
I told him this a few nights ago and he begged me not to. We had a very short talk about it where I explained to him that I could not live with a liar. He seemed pretty defeated after I made my stance clear to him. Update my manipulative husband lied about vaccinating our daughter and she is now sick with polio, so I'm divorcing him. I am currently in the process of divorcing my husband and no matter how many times he texts me begging me to reconsider I am refusing to do so. I am currently staying with my mother and I am the one taking care of my daughter. Speaking of her I sadly have some absolutely devastating news. At the time she seemed like she was going to make a full recovery and come out of the other side unscathed by polio, but this was far from the case. My baby has sadly shown signs that it will be likely that in the future she will be getting post-polio syndrome. The doctors told us that this condition is one that affects many who contract polio and it's not abnormal, but it is a very serious condition. He says that it is unlikely that my child will ever outgrow this. It is a condition which ends up affecting the person's energy levels, making them very tired and fatigued constantly, puts their joints and muscles in extreme pain at times, makes the person extremely prone to loss of muscle mass, can inhibit regular breathing patterns and overall damages quality of life. The doctors say that although they are not yet 100% certain my baby will develop this in the future, she is showing signs which others did before developing post-polio syndrome. My heart broke when I heard this and I texted my husband about it, informing him of what his negligence did. He seemed to regret his actions severely, and he says he wishes he could go back in time and make the correct choice. I don't know why but hearing him say that seriously ticked me off. Like yes, if you could go back and not ruin your child's life you would, check out Super Dad over here. But one item, if removed overnight completely, would cause the most chaos among society. Screws. I cannot believe this isn't higher up. Literally everything would fall apart. Homes, both standard wooden suburban models and fancy high-rise condos, would collapse. Your appliances are no more. Power lines drop, probably electrocuting a shitload of people in the process, or starting fires. You can't drive to work because your car is held together with this shit. So you walk. Except you can't wear your glasses because they have teeny screws too. As a result, you can't see, so you get lost on your walk. You try to get close to a street sign so you can read it, but instead you trip over it because the sign is now on the ground. You eventually get to your shitty restaurant job, but can't clock in because computers are held together with screws, the cash register is held together with screws, and even the menu that hangs above the counter is held together with motherfucking screws. In addition to basic order taking needs not being met, the fryer has also completely come apart, dumping gallons and gallons of dirty oil on the floor. Cool. You're not cleaning that up, so you quit your job. You pull out your phone. But it doesn't work, because the cell towers are all on the ground. So you get a newspaper, find a job listing, and go there. The elevator doesn't work. No one can interview you because there are no lights, there's no power. The secretaries are running around with candles desperately trying to hold things together with duct tape and pins. You leave. You try to take the bus home, think again. You pass a grocery store, collapsed, and think you'll grab some spaghetti to cook at home. Can't be that bad, right? Cook it over a fire, you'll learn to exist in this new screw-free world. Fuck, you may even thrive. You take it home, but all of your pots have no handles because, wait for it screws. So you give up. You're tired, unemployed, hungry, with sore feet from all. The walking. You don't even have a roof over your head because your home collapsed. You're desolate. You won't survive this screwpocalypse. You decide to take your own life. The easy way out. The only easy thing you've done this far. You grab your pocket knife to slit your wrists, you're about to whip it out when goddammit the blade fucking fell out because it was held together with a motherfucking screw. What is something you did as a child that turned out to be an indicator of your future personal sexual preferences? Lots of tying up playmates. Like, lots of it. I always played the bad guy that captured the princess slash school teacher slash missionary slash nun slash whatever and tortured them until they told me everything. What's amazing to me is that my victims always wanted to play games like that. It wasn't like I was the only one ever to suggest it. And it may relieve you to know that the absolute worst torture I ever devised, back then anyway, was tickling and using imaginary whips. Mind you, once the play group got old enough, that tickling was less tickly and more about seeing where the boundaries were. There was this other boy that insisted on being the hero, which lasted a few weeks until he decided to lose while trying to rescue whoever the victim of the day was. One of my imaginary swords disarmed his imaginary sword, and he decided that he should take the place of the victim. Which was fun too because after the first time he complained he couldn't see me hitting him with the whip and said I should go cut down a vine and whip him for reals, but like, not hard. A few weeks after that, it was a fairly common thing that the victim would refuse to leave the side of her hero. So noble. So, I go to ask my dad for more rope. He asked what the hell I needed rope for. Well, the princess got rescued, but I got the knife this time and couldn't tie them both up. He cut me off six feet of rope. Damn. The 80s were a different time lol. Basically, sticks and stones may break my bones, but whips and chains excite me. What is the best revenge to a cheating partner? An ex girlfriend about 10 years ago emailed me to say it wasn't working out and that she had met the unconditional love of her life, something she told me I was. So, needless to say, I was a bit hurt, but not much I could do about it. I chewed on it for a while and got really pissed off the more I thought about it. I eventually moved on with life and basically forgot about her entirely, like pushed so far out of my mind and memories that I legit never thought about her at all. I ended up running into her several years afterwards working at a hotel reception desk and straight up didn't even notice her. 
she was acting a little bitchy and I didn't know why and chalked it up to her having a rough day or something. Got my key and got settled in my room. The next morning I was coming out to get ready to head to work and was in the lounge area where they have the waffles and stuff and she taps me on the shoulder, I assume she worked all night, and proceeds to challenge me. And I'm like whoa, whoa, whoa. If I did something to offend you, I'm so sorry, but who the fuck are you? And then she said I'm so glad I married and not you, you're such a piece of doo-doo. And then I was like oh. As the light finally came on. She looked like she was very miserable, and that made me very, very, very happy. She was a real tool. Looking back on it, I am kind of proud of myself that I managed to completely move on with my life that I didn't even remember what she looked like. I am amazed that she expected me to dwell on her as if she was the greatest thing that ever happened to me and that I lost her, like it seems she almost expected me to dwell on it for years and be depressed about it. As if that wasn't enough, I met a woman in Germany who is like the female version of me. It's pretty awesome. Funny how life works out when you just go with the flow. Men of TikTok, what are the struggles of dating a very rich girl? I was never sure how rich she was. I just knew her family had property in a couple places in the US and China. And this is also how I found out property in China is dumb expensive. When she went for the holidays, if she wanted to say, stay in Shanghai and then go to Beijing later, she didn't have to look at hotels or Airbnb, she just had to make sure she grabbed the right set of keys. It was weird. She wasn't dripping with designer clothes and drove a fuel-efficient compact but just looking at where her family had apartment slash houses, I can only imagine dot she was a super sweet, down-to-earth girl. Biggest heart in the world, very hard-working, and acted like a child in a candy shop everywhere she went. I think the biggest strain came when we would eat together. For me, money was tight and the best way to stretch my college scholarship money was to cook meals in bulk. Before she met me, she ate out literally every single meal. At first, it took some adjusting and rebudgeting. Bless her heart, she understood and found compromises. She loved my cooking and would surprise me with groceries and then say I have to pay her back by cooking whatever she wanted. Every once in a while she'd pick up the entirety of a bill that we were supposed to split but she always found a way to make sure I didn't feel down about it. I don't think she ever once bought me an expensive gift. Most things were either handmade or were very thoughtful for example shoes I've been eyeing for months but couldn't afford and she noticed them my computer browser. I was in a car accident that left me paralyzed forever so I ate my feelings because I was depressed. Two years later I had another life-threatening accident because of my weight so I decided to finally change. I went from being a tri-sport athlete to a cripple when I got paralyzed from the waist down in a car crash with a drunk driver. In those first years when I was wheelchair bound, my entire life centered around adapting to my disability. I had to give up on my degree and ended up becoming severely depressed because I didn't know how to live my life anymore. This period lasted two years, and it was enough for me to gain over 100 pounds because food became my source of comfort. My weight kept increasing and by the time I was 30, I weighed almost 300 pounds, but weight wasn't the only thing I gained throughout the years. I was able to find an extremely loving husband who became the light of my life, and didn't see my weight as a deal breaker, even though I felt ashamed to just look at myself in the mirror. I became good at avoiding family photos by being the one to take the pictures because I never wanted to immortalize my shame in a photo album. And it got so bad that I bought a matte screen protector for my phone so that I would never catch my own fat face staring back at me. Ignoring my weight was the only way I could live, but I would soon come to regret this decision because being this big was quite literally killing me. In just a week or so, I would experience the worst scare of my life that would change everything, more than the car crash ever did. It all started when me and my husband decided we were ready to have kids. My doctor said that paralyzed women can still get pregnant, and I was happy for two seconds until he revealed the worst news possible. I needed to lose weight to avoid all the extra risks that would come with being obese and pregnant. I felt awful in my skin already, and knowing that my husband would never become a father if I didn't lose. All this weight nearly destroyed me. I cried to him about this, and he reassured me that we were going to face this problem together. He knew working out would be really difficult for me due to my paralysis, and I didn't even know where to start. So he came up with a plan to go on a health journey together and we were going to hold each other accountable. We threw out all the junk food and started meal prepping together constantly. Even though this was working slowly for me, it was great for our relationship because it was really wonderful to spend quality time with the love of my life in such a consistent way. Unfortunately, it was still too much for me. I cracked one day and ordered a massive Oreo cake from Walmart. I planned to devour the whole thing that very night, but my husband caught me as I was secretly eating it in the depths of our house like a criminal. We had the biggest fight of our lives that night, and I'll always be grateful we did because just hours after having the screaming match with my husband, telling him he didn't care about me, shouting that he couldn't understand what it felt like to be stuck in a wheelchair, I had a stroke. It was terrifying, but it made me value my life more than I ever had before. I realized I never wanted my husband to be broken over my death, and I couldn't die without experiencing motherhood first. I had an epiphany when I woke up in the hospital, I needed to lose weight, no matter what, because if I was able to survive that car crash, there had to be a way to survive the aftermath. My husband and I had another serious conversation after that because even though he had the most disappointed and concerned look on his face, I knew he didn't want to give up on me. He brought up a conversation we had before, about trying other alternatives, and said I should reconsider more options if I really thought working out would be impossible. I always wanted to lose weight authentically, but he bluntly told me that my life was pushed off its authentic path the day that drunk driver crashed into me. He said he had talked to his mom recently and she had lost a tremendous amount of weight. When he asked what her secret was, she said she was taking Avi Collagenic Elite. I had no clue these pills would work on me, 
since I was almost double his mom's size, but after years of fighting a losing battle against my weight, I figured that the worst thing the pills could do was nothing. We asked my doctor if I could use this, and he gave me the green light. And my husband told me that if the pills helped me lose weight, then maybe we would have a shot at getting pregnant. That instantly sold me, since being a mother was really important to me. You could take up to four per day, so that's what I did. By the end of the first month I had lost, eight pounds. It might sound small, but it was the most I had lost in years, so it was a huge improvement. The best part? I had lost all of that while still adjusting to a healthier diet without fully restricting my favorite snacks. In the second month, the pills adapted better to my system and I lost 11 pounds, which was crazy. Being consistent definitely helped too. Seeing my weight finally have a 2 in front of it motivated me even more to continue this weight loss journey. This didn't feel as impossible as I thought it would be, and suddenly, it became easier to resist the urge to eat anything unhealthy. I replaced soda with diet soda and drank that until I had finally transitioned to 8 glasses of water every day. Between my healthier diet and the obby collagenic elite, I continued to lose an average of 10 pounds per month. And finally, I started to feel young again. Since my life was finally improving, I decided to take things one step further and started to train my arms and upper body to keep my torso active. It took over a year, but I'm finally at 180 pounds now. It's heavier than back when I was an athlete, but lighter than what I've been for the past several years, so I'm satisfied with the result either way. I even got to a point where I stopped taking the obby pills because I didn't need them anymore. I just wanted to be healthy and happy, and they accomplished that. My husband and both our families were incredibly proud of me too my mother-in-law especially, because she knew all I needed was a little push. I even confided in her that there are still things I dislike about my body, from the way my skin sometimes sags to how I'll always have stretch marks from being so big. She told me that my body serves as a reminder of what I had gone through, and I was lucky to have her son by my side. I finally feel safe, secure, and ready to start my own family, because, as of last week, I am officially pregnant and I'm the happiest I've ever been. Edit, guys please stop telling me to name my child Abby. Yes I love them for their help, but I think I'd name my baby girl after a dish soap before naming her after a weight loss supplement. Thanks for platinum though. What is the worst case of overprotective parenting that you've ever seen? My sister turned from a rebellious substance using teenager to a cult-like religious mother. My sister was by far the worst I've ever met. She was a typical bad teenager in high school, doing the whole I'm 17, I'm grown, you can't tell me what to do thing including alcohol, substances, and intimacy, none of which I have any problem with, but probably aren't a good idea if you don't possess the responsibility to deal with them. She got knocked up at 17 by a dude who bailed on her and she took about a ton and a half of reality to the face and decided to turn her life around. Problem is, she swung too far back in the other direction and became a super fundamentalist Christian and chalked her getting knocked up by a transient Mexican farm worker, and literally everything else, to God's plan. After my nephew was born things didn't start to get bad until he was around 7 or 8 and developed his own personality. She started forcing him to go to church and catechism against his wishes. She also severely restricted the information and media he was allowed access to. Books were restricted solely to the Bible and other religious texts, and educational books so long as they didn't contradict scripture in any way. She refused to allow him to have friends unless she'd vetted them and ensured they came from a good Christian family. Until he was 16, the only television he was allowed to watch was Disney Channel and CNN, she put parental block on everything else. He wasn't allowed to see movies rated above PG or get his driver's license until he was 18 and she couldn't really stop him anymore. Video games were right out of the question. The end result of his sheltered upbringing was that, as soon as he was a legal adult, he began to rebel against everything she'd ever imposed on him in whatever way he could find. He started intoxicating himself, stopped going to church or any of the religious studies groups she made him go to, and fell in with a group of guys who got him. In a fair amount of trouble. Thankfully he's calmed down recently, in his early 20s. He's in college now, still smokes, but not nearly as much as he used to and, to my knowledge, hasn't committed a crime in a few years. My depressed sister faked her own death and moved to Sweden to live in a cabin in the woods that she built herself, I desperately want to get her back. My sister spent the majority of her life depressed. Neither my parents nor I know what it stemmed from, but we do have suspicions that it was from the bullying she went through in school, and the fact that our uncle was convicted for roping her probably didn't help either. I remember she started hurting herself as early as 12 years old, and I desperately tried to get her help. I felt like I had failed at the time as an older brother, as no amount of talking to her one-on-one -on -one or therapy or counseling seemed to do anything to help her. One thing about my sister is that she loved nature and absolutely despised the prospect of growing up in a busy city while working a regular job. I remember the only time she seemed to be happy is when she would sometimes go on tangents about living in the wild, surrounded by animals and bird chirps in the mornings. I remember I suggested to my parents that perhaps we could move out of downtown New York, which is where we were living at the time, and maybe go to a more natural area in order to help my sister. They shut me down, saying they both had great jobs here and there was no way they were willing to give that up. They were convinced that my sister would grow out of her depression, but she never did. She actually only got worse. By the time she was 16 she was very depressed, routinely talking about not seeing a point in life and hating the monotony of day-to-day -day life in the city. I asked her if she wanted to travel with me. I was 19 at the time and was saving up money for an apartment of my own, but I figured I could set some money aside to make my sister happy. We ended up vacationing in Sweden and for the one week that her and I were there, I had never seen her so happy. She literally smiled. That may not seem like a lot but my sister never smiled, so this was a big deal. 
After returning from the holiday my sister would not stop talking about Sweden and about the scenery she saw there. She told me and my parents she wanted to move there when she was older, and when she talked about it I saw her eyes glow like never before. Sadly, my parents shut her down, saying she's only a 16-year-old and that life can't just be lived self-sufficiently in some remote part of Sweden, which is what my sister wanted. My sister fell deeper into her depression which lasted over two years. She never showed signs of actually going through with S aside however the worry was in the back of my mind. Until one morning I found a note she left in her room. It was her S aside note. She thanked me for the time in Sweden. I cried so much when I read it. She said she had thrown herself into the sea, because if she couldn't live surrounded by nature, she could at least die surrounded by it. I told my parents and instantly we informed the police who tried long and hard to find her out in the sea. Unfortunately it was to no avail and we had a closed casket funeral. The grieving period was very hard on our family and I fell into a depression myself. My parents ended up quitting their jobs and starting a new life away from New York. I'll admit, I blamed them a lot. I told them on one occasion that my sister died because their stupid corporate jobs were more important than their daughter's life. They both cried when I said that, and I went up to my room. I knew what I said was wrong, but was I really wrong in what I said? My parents ended up separating within the next few years and I found life to be very hard, finding it impossible to get out of bed some days. For the longest time I searched the internet hoping my sister was still out there while being in deep denial of the fact she was gone, but I never had any luck. I still have her note and I keep it with me, it's my most cherished possession. Little did I know that the note I had would turn out to be the thing. That brought back light into this world. I read it obsessively, almost every single day. It was a very long note with many paragraphs, but the structure of them never made any sense to me. I tried to solve why the paragraphs were laid out so strangely, but never did. She ended her paragraphs in places she didn't need to end them in. She would literally run a sentence into the next paragraph. It almost seemed like she wanted to make each paragraph a specific length. I would count the lines over and over and look for dates or letters of the alphabet to spell something, but it never did. I had given up on trying to solve this non-existent mystery a while ago, when recently I found my answer. The length of her paragraphs, corresponded with the effing coordinates of the place we visited in Sweden, which just happens to be a place she mentioned she wanted to live in. When I found that I started going berserk. I also found that if you put the second last letter of every line, with every last letter of every third line, she spells out a sentence about her building a cabin there for herself, but the words are jumbled up. I now know where she is, I have booked a plane ticket to go see her. I hope for the love of God this is real and I'm not crazy. I haven't told my parents yet in case I'm wrong and the false hope I gave them crushes them. Update my depressed sister faked her own death and moved to Sweden to live in a cabin in the woods that she built herself, I desperately want to get her back. So this update is one which has me feeling a way I can't even begin to describe. I ended up getting on my flight on going to Sweden, and upon my arrival I checked into a hotel to sleep for the night. To say I got more than two or three hours would be a lie however, as I got up around 4 am too excited to go back to sleep. Unfortunately there were no buses running until 7 so I stayed awake until then doing nothing but thinking and praying that this was real and I wasn't crazy. When the buses finally started running, I wasted no time and headed down to the coordinates that I found on the note. The coordinates indeed pointed to a forest, quite far into the forest actually, and when I got closer I saw something which caught my eye. It looked like a very small cabin. It seemed to be not fully finished, but it had the exterior of a cabin and it wasn't a wild stretch to imagine someone completely detached from city life to live there. I waited outside the cabin for what felt like an hour before working up the courage to knock on the door. I waited a minute without an answer, and was left rather disappointed. I knocked again however, and that's when I heard someone inside the cabin. My heart raced as I saw the door handle jingle open, and when it opened I could not believe what I was looking at. It was my sister. It really was her. I don't think I can describe the emotions I experienced. We hugged for what seemed like eternity and cried to each other. She invited me in where she spent hours explaining her life here. We talked about home life, why she did what she did, and I explained to her the consequences of what she did. There was absolutely a part of me which wanted to be mad at her and give out to her for doing what she did, but then I looked into her eyes and what I saw was my precious sister, truly happy. Smiling like she had never done before. And that's when I realized I would evoke never-ending suffering on anyone just to see her happy. My insensitive husband keeps insulting me in front of our friends to make them laugh and recently took things too far, so I took the insults further and embarrassed him. My husband is a born entertainer and always feels the need to be the comedian in the friend group. He is a funny person and I love this about him, but the fact he's willing to cross every line there is to get a laugh is something that has become a problem recently. About six months ago he started making jokes about me to our friend group. He has joked about things such as my autism or my childhood intimate trauma in private to me, and these are jokes I can laugh about with him and him only. The first time he used me as the punchline of a joke was around six months ago when six people out of our friend group were in a pub, we were all pretty drunk and he made a joke about how if anyone drinks some more they'll end up like my step-uncle and splattered on the pavement. The joke there being that my step-uncle jumped off a rooftop when drunk. Although I wasn't very close with my step-uncle, I told him not to make jokes like that and he laughed it off. The next time we were all out he made a joke about eating disorders and specifically about bulimia, stating that it's lucky he has a small pp because I used to be bulimic and now gag easily. The next time he made a joke about me getting bullied as a kid. These kinds of comments started seriously hurting me after a while and so I brought it up with him about one month ago. I asked him in the nicest way possible if he could stop making me the butt of the joke and insulting me, and he told me he never means to insult me, 
if I just happen to fall into the crossfire of a top-tier joke he is willing to make it. He told me he had no problem if I did the same thing, but I told him that just because it's not a boundary for him, doesn't automatically mean it's not a boundary for me either. We ended up actually getting into an argument and he slept in the living room for a couple of days. He did apologize however and swore that he would stop doing that. Well, about a week ago we went out to an escape room with our friend group, this was the first time we went out since he promised to stop making the jokes. Spoiler alert, he didn't stop making the jokes, in fact he took them further. During one of the puzzles the conversation in the group diverted to childhood experiences of fun things my friends have done with their parents. My husband, hearing this, decided to join in on the conversation and add, can anyone guess what my wife's best childhood experience with her dad is? And he proceeded to hump the air in an intimacy motion. Everyone stood there, and time froze for me for a second. This is something I have never told anyone except him, and no one in the friend group knew. People rushed to ask me if it was true, but I avoided every question. Instead I turned to my husband and said aloud, can anyone guess what my husband's favorite childhood experience was? Stealing money from his parents so he can pay for 60-year-old escorts despite having a girlfriend at the time. One of them ended up blackmailing him because he wouldn't pay for her to bring her son from Slovakia over. This was without a doubt the rudest thing I have ever said to my husband, but when I did say it, he went white and stopped talking for the entire escape room. The atmosphere was so tense we didn't even finish the escape room nor go to a bar after like we planned. My manipulative girlfriend invited my abusive and neglectful dad who abandoned Emmy 20 years ago over to our house without telling me, so I kicked them both out. My girlfriend and I have been together for a year and a half and when she first found out that none of my family have contact with me she freaked out. She comes from a very big and close family so I can definitely understand why it must be confusing for her, but what I could never understand are her desperate and never-ending attempts to get me back in touch with my family, specifically my father. You see, my father left me 19 years ago when I was 6 and has never contacted me since then. Up until he left, he was also very abusive to me. I still have scars from what he did on my arms and legs, and I still sometimes wake up in the middle of the night to the feeling of being roped by him. I remember one specific instance of him coming home from a casino and taking his frustrations out on me after I accidentally spilled some milk on him. That was the first ever scar he gave me. I was just 3 years old. He was an alcoholic at the time too and took his anger out on me and my mother. My mother ended up passing away when I was 5 and a year later my father was deemed unfit to care for me and I was given up for adoption. I had one aunt and uncle who didn't want to take me in however as they were not in a financial position to do so. The thing is, my girlfriend knew all of this and knew the history I had with my father, but despite this she kept insisting that I reconnect with him. She is very religious and a big believer in Christ and forgiveness. I remember we once got into a huge argument about my father, where I told her to stick Christ where the sun don't shine. She ended up becoming very angry with me however as apparently I insulted Christ. Granted I did, but I was justified in my opinion. Anyway, my girlfriend for the longest time has been going on about reuniting me with her father. When she brought up the idea of going out of her way to actually set us up for a reunion, I drew the line and told her not to do that and that if she did we would be over. Up until that point she had only talked about how nice it would be for us to reunite, but now she was talking about actually making it happen. This occurred about three months ago and things proceeded to go seriously downhill. It seemed like every week she was talking about my father, about how I will forgive him when I see him. She kept using words like when whenever she talked, so I asked her not to do that as our reunion was not happening. About a month ago we ended up getting into a massive argument over it. I had come home from a long day of work, and the first thing she said to me when I walked through the door was, so I think I found your father online and I think it would be really great if you two I cut her off immediately and told her to shut the F up about my father. She got mad and told me not to swear at her, so I swore at her again asking what the F was wrong with her. She did not take this lightly and made the remark that it's obvious my dad wasn't around because I swear like a sailor. I got so mad at that comment of hers I left the house without another word and stayed at my best friend's for the night. Just before I left though she made a comment about how she's certain I would change my attitude were I to actually meet my father. Things were already extremely rocky in our relationship and I thought we were heading for a breakup. The plummet to rock bottom in our relationship came last week. My girlfriend had not talked about my father much for the last few weeks since the incident I just described and I figured maybe she realized she was acting insane. Oh how wrong I was. While at work about a week ago I got a text message from my girlfriend telling me she has an amazing surprise for me, topped off by a winky face. I responded that I can't wait to see my surprise, figuring it was the lingerie that I had seen her looking at for the last while. Unfortunately for me, it was not the lingerie. I headed home expecting a nice surprise, and my girlfriend answered the door telling me to close my eyes and let her lead me to the kitchen where my surprise was. She took my hand and escorted me. Once in the kitchen, she told me to open my eyes. I opened them to see my surprise, which was perhaps the worst surprise anyone has ever gotten in history. I looked in disgust as I saw my dad sitting there on the chair in our kitchen smiling at me. I didn't even say anything when I saw him, but I felt a million emotions at once. My father stood up and started walking over to me for a hug, but I started yelling. I yelled at him to get the F away from me before I called the police on his or pissed behind. I asked him if he was sick in the head and deranged to think I would ever want to see him again. I then turned to my girlfriend and called her a naive stupid woman who thinks life is sunshine and rainbows and forgiveness for all. I asked them both how stupid they both had to be for them to think I'd see them and start smiling like an idiot. I yelled at both of them to get the F out. I forcefully threw my dad out, which felt really good, and yelled at my girlfriend until she left the house in tears too. 
I ended up packing her a small bag of clothes and tossing it at her out of the window too. Date my manipulative girlfriend invited my abusive and neglectful dad who abandoned Emmy 20 years ago over to our house without telling me, so I kicked them both out. So I ended up kicking my girlfriend out and the very next day her entire family pulled up to my house. Seeing the people exiting the car felt like those mean videos of about 25 clowns all exiting the same vehicle. It's almost as if the entire slew of aunts and uncles and cousins kept on coming. I knew I was in for a wild argument as soon as I saw this. My girlfriend was ultimately the one to knock on my door and despite my better judgment I answered. I asked her what she wanted and she told me she as well as her entire family thinks it's completely unacceptable that I did what I did. I told her that she must have a family of buffoons if they all think that what she did was okay, and her dad heard this and ended up storming up to the door. You think we're buffoons for supporting you getting back in touch with a good man who raised you? I looked at him for a second, and the gears in my head started turning. I looked at my girlfriend's face and realized something. I asked my girlfriend's father what she had told them all about my dad, and the answer that I got made me literally double over when laughing. According to the dad, my girlfriend described my dad as a man who had his own issues and occasionally drank, but he was there for me throughout my entire childhood and did his best to keep us afloat by working two jobs. Apparently after my mother's death he went clean however and raised me as best he could, but the reason I cut contact with him is because he ended up remarrying and I could never forgive him for it. After spending a few minutes laughing at what my girlfriend's dad had to say, I gave a brief summary of who my father was, sparing no gruesome details and even showing the scars on my arms and legs as proof. My girlfriend's dad looked horrified before asking her if she lied to them, and she admitted to maybe embellishing the story a little. He ended up apologizing to me and walked back with his daughter into the car looking infuriated. And just like they got out, I saw them all defy the laws of physics and get into the car before driving off. My best friend convinced my wife I was cheating on her, then they both got angry when they realized I was not cheating. My wife and I had a baby last December. It was a traumatic birth and my wife developed postpartum depression. She has been going to therapy weekly. With my wife home full-time after the traumatic birth, I've had to work increased hours. This is something we discussed prior to making the decision for her to stay home, and she knew this from the start. A few weeks ago, my boss approached me about a project that would require a lot of overtime in a short amount of time. It would both be great financially and for my career. I talked to my wife about it and she agreed that I should say yes to my boss. For the four weeks I'd be working on this, my mother-in-law and her best friend, Jessie, would come help out with some of the duties that I typically do. Jessie is a stay-at-home mom with a four-year-old and a two-year-old. She began coming over during the day and would watch the kids with my wife. Three weeks into the project, it became clear that we'd need a few more weeks to get it together. I went home that night and talked to my wife about it. She said she was okay with it, but got very cold in the days after. During the last week of the project, I got home one night and saw that Jessie was still at the house. I didn't think much about it, said hi to her and my wife, and then went to go check on our daughter. Before I could get to her room, I heard Jessie say something along the lines of, he doesn't even stop to greet you. Definitely a sign. I turned around and asked what it was a sign of. Immediately, my wife started crying and Jessie started accusing me of having an affair. She told me that I must hate my wife because she has PPD and am not attracted to her because she gained weight from the pregnancy. Jessie then demanded to see my phone. I told her no. She told me that's a sign that I'm guilty. I told my wife that I would let her see my phone. If she wanted to. She nodded and something inside me broke. I guess it was the thought that she actually believed I was having an affair really got to me. And that she didn't trust me after everything we've been through. Well, she looked through the phone and there was no evidence. Jessie started saying that I deleted the evidence. She started screaming and woke up our daughter, so I told her to get out of the house. Eventually, she left and I went to calm our daughter since my wife was still on the couch crying. When my daughter was asleep again, I sat down by my wife and tried to talk to her about what's been happening. She told me that she's been worried ever since I started working all the overtime. I told her that we'd talked about how good of an opportunity it was and she agreed to letting me take on this project. She said it was very suspicious to increase the length of the project. I told her that sometimes that happens. She wanted more evidence, so I showed her messages and emails with timestamps from work and pay stubs showing the overtime. She said she believed me and was sorry for doubting me, it was just that Jessie had been telling her that these were all signs that I was cheating. I asked her why she believed Jessie more than me, and why she didn't come to me with her concerns. She didn't have a real answer. It's been a couple weeks and the project is over. I actually scaled back and I'm trying to work a little less than I was before the project so I can spend more time with my wife and daughter. Date my best friend convinced my wife I was cheating on her, then they both got angry when they realized I was not cheating. That night I approached my wife and told her that I was going to find a therapist. I didn't connect it to her accusations or anything, just said that I was having a tough time and needed therapy. She shrugged and told me to do whatever. Next day, I got home from work and our room and my home office were ripped apart. Things everywhere. Important papers scattered. I don't see her but our daughter's in her room crying. My wife left her alone, her cell phone's off. I call my in-laws and a few friends, but no one's seen her. I'm starting to get worried and I call my mom to see if she can babysit while I go out and look for her. Before my mom can get home, my wife gets back, Jessie's driving. Jessie doesn't come in, she hasn't been back in the house since I kicked her out because she was offended by my behavior, but my wife does. She's clearly upset, been crying. I ask what happened. I thought at first the house might have been robbed. She starts screaming at me that I'm being unfaithful and that the therapy is a front so I can meet my mistress. I try to calm her down and tell her that's not true, but she came at me and she laid hands on me. My nose is broken. 
she kind of realized what she did and sat down on the couch and went comatose, just stared at the wall. I went into my daughter's room and locked the door. Called my mom to tell her what happened and called my mother-in-law to ask her to come over and take care of my wife. I packed a bag for my daughter and when my mom got there, we left. My wife didn't even look up. We dropped my daughter off with my dad and then went to urgent care for my nose. I got blood all over my mom's new Subaru. My daughter and I are staying with my parents for a while and my wife staying with hers. I am looking into getting a restraining order against Jesse. My wife and I are separating. I love her but. I won't live with someone who hurts me and who could potentially hurt our daughter. I am not going forward with a divorce yet, with the hopes that my wife will get the treatment she needs and we can work things out. My in-laws told me that they're looking at inpatient treatment at a local hospital. But I also have everything well documented in case of an eventual custody battle. My heart's broken because I know this isn't my wife, this is a sickness in her mind. But I need to keep myself and our daughter safe and give her the space to recover. I'm hoping that this is the right decision. Day 2, my best friend convinced my wife I was cheating on her, then they both got angry when they realized I was not cheating. I made the decision to separate from my wife, and I heard from my mother-in-law that her mental health was in an awful place. My wife passed away early Monday morning. She took her own life. Convinced by her friend Jesse that I was having an affair that I did not have, she had a mental break, which resulted in my taking our infant daughter and staying with my parents for a while. She was with her parents, who planned on taking her to the hospital for inpatient treatment on Monday. On Sunday night she came to my parents' house and demanded I give her our daughter. Because she had left her alone for several hours the last time she was responsible for her and had gotten physical with me, I refused. I offered to let her come in and spend time with her while my parents and I were present, but she didn't want to come in and wanted to take our daughter with her. She was upset but left eventually. A few hours later, she took her own life and left a note, in which she accused me of having an affair, and this was one of the contributing factors of her aside. The friend, Jesse, came to see my daughter and me yesterday. She was so angry at me and tried laying hands on me, but I managed to restrain her, once again she blamed me. However, after a while, she stopped trying to fight me and slumped into my arms. After some tears, she told me that she was planning to speak at my wife's funeral. She had already cleared it with my in-laws but was letting me know as a courtesy. I told her she would not be speaking at the funeral. We fought and she left after telling me that I was an a-hole and not the only person who loved my wife. I talked to my in-laws who were adamant that Jesse be allowed to speak. She and my wife have known each other since they were kids and my in-laws are close to her. We're all very fragile right now and I fear that pushing. This further would hurt my relationship with my in-laws, which I don't want. Still, the thought of seeing Jesse up there at my wife's funeral makes me feel sick. I don't think I can stand to listen to her, knowing that she took joy in my wife's deteriorating mental health and picked up my wife, leaving my daughter home alone. Edit, the funeral took place and Jesse spoke. And oh the tears, her speech was actually beautiful, if you did not know what she did in the first place. Then it was my turn to speak, and when it was time, I decided to rip Jesse to shreds, and so I did. I exposed her, everything she did, and how disgusting I find it that she dares taint my wife's memory in such a way, portraying herself a saint who cared so deeply for my wife, but was really the one who led her to taking her life. Following my speech, the funeral had an indescribably dark atmosphere. Needless to say, Jess and my in-laws bombarded me with calls after. Jesse showed up at my house the next day, I knew better than to let her in, so I just allowed her to yell at me and try barge her way in, she only backed off when I called the police on her. I'm thinking of getting a restraining order. What is the most terrifying thing you have experienced? I live in North Wales, UK. For anyone who has had the pleasure of visiting, it truly is a beautiful place to live, though, for an adolescent boy, it is certainly lacking in things to do. As a result, my friends and I would often find ourselves mindlessly exploring areas of countryside and coastline. Despite it being quite sparsely populated, in comparison to the closest cities, there is a dual carriageway running right along the coast from Wales into England. Also, train tracks run alongside this road for most of its course, occasionally passing overhead via a small cement bridge. Anyway, there was one night a few years ago, when about four of us randomly decided to try and explore the inside of one of these bridges, as one of the group had observed a manhole cover nearby which we believed to be the entrance. On closer inspection, we discovered that several tools would be required in order to gain entry. We returned with the necessary equipment and proceeded to unbolt the cover. This had to be done stealthily as the train track was right beside us, not close enough to be of any danger, but definitely a sufficiently small distance to cause panic for any train driver. And panic usually means police. It wasn't long before we had removed the heavy steel disc, and had started descending the ladder down into the structure. Once we had all safely reached the bottom, we decided to progress to the other side. At this point, we are totally confined into the narrow space that leads into the main area. If you are confused as to what the hell this bridge is supposed to be, you probably should be, because it was rather peculiar. I mean, I would have never known there was even an inside had we not found the manhole. So, as we squeeze and crouch, and at one point scrape along our bellies, to the other side of the structure there is a growing sense of claustrophobia between us. The distance from end to the other is surprisingly long, but by the halfway point you can look down. Through narrow gaps onto the motorway below. This was actually pretty cool, which helped keep us calm, in a strange way. At this point, apart from the mild discomfort and confinement, we were still just a group of guys on an adventure. This was about to change dramatically. No more than a few meters beyond halfway, which we could tell due to the symmetry of the passageways through the bridge, one of us claimed they could see some object in the distance at the far end. Slightly hesitantly, we agreed to investigate. Bad move. I reached the end first, and let me tell you, I have never felt the same sense of dread before or since. 
In front of me was a single fold-away chair position facing a wall. On the wall was a partially torn page from a newspaper, or a magazine, showing a fully undressed lady in a suggestive position. The reason I don't just refer to it as corn is because something was different about it. I can't put my finger on it but it seemed more sinister than attractive. If that makes any sense. More disturbingly the eyes of the woman on display had been cut from the page. Removed with precision, not just hastily ripped off. The scene that lay before us had rendered us completely speechless, and an overpowering sense of panic could be felt collectively. That was when we found the Johnny. The horrendous, gut-wrenching, blood-drenched Johnny. Needless to say we got the F out of there as fast as humanly possible, smashing our knees and shins against the sharp cement edges, that lined the path to the ladder by which we had entered. Of course, we were all praying to God that the manhole hadn't been resealed, as it was impossible to tell until you reached the ladder itself. Thankfully the exit route was clear, and we promptly dashed as far away as our legs could carry us. I'm sure this ending comes as a disappointment to some of you reading this, as we, luckily, never bumped into the twisted individual who sits in that chair, but I must stress how radically out of the norm this was given where I live. The reason I mentioned the population earlier was with purpose, there are easily enough people here to escape the realms of crazy country folk, yet nowhere near enough people to have someone clearly lose grip on society without somebody taking notice. For example, there was literally only one homeless man, who everyone in the area knew and grew fond of, eventually resulting in a mass gathering at his funeral when he passed away. I sometimes think, though not recently as I had more or less forgotten about that night entirely, about the person who climbs down into that bridge and navigates through the darkness to sit facing a wall, and do God knows what, that ends up with a Johnny full of blood. You honestly couldn't envision a more surreal situation. Who is that one stranger that you never forgot? When I was 15 years old, I ran away from home because I was pissed off at my parents for a reason I can't remember. I didn't have much money, so I decided to hop onto the Skytrain, public transport train in British Columbia, and ride it as far as it would go. I reached the end of the line in less than an hour, and decided I wanted to ride it all the way back again, while trying to formulate some kind of plan of how I wanted to live the rest of my life without my parents or anyone. At the last stop, or the first stop depending on your perspective of it, a girl came on and sat in the row right behind me. I didn't pay much attention to her at first, as I was busy writing my life plan on a napkin. It was a few minutes later that she got up and came sat next to me, curious as to what I was writing. I told her the story, and after a few laughs, we began talking about everything and anything. Her name was Amanda, 17 years old, and absolutely wonderful. She told me she was getting off at the last stop, which was also the first stop, depending on how you look at it. It was also the stop I had gotten on originally, and I told her we would ride to it together. The train ride took less than an hour, and what a wonderful hour indeed. When the last stop did come, we both knew we probably wouldn't see each other ever again, this was before the days of cell phones, and I was a shy little kid afraid to make moves. As we got to the end of the sidewalk which split in two different directions, she went right and I went left. Before saying goodbye she turned to me and asked me a question that has become a wonderful part of my life, she asked me, tell me something you have done, or want to do, that you think I should do? It can be anything, as challenging as you want it to be, or as easy. As long as you give me the rest of my life to complete it, I promise I will do it. I was confused as to why, but I thought about it, and told her, sing an a cappella song in a room full of strangers. She said perfect and asked me if I would like a challenge as well. I told her I did, and she told me, read, from start to finish, Ulysses by James Joyce. I had never heard of it at the time, but I agreed, and we said our goodbyes. I have an awful memory, and can't remember most conversations I have with most people. But I remember all of that clearly. You know why? Because of the challenge she gave me. In the 12 years that have passed since, I have tried to read that book in over 150 different sittings. Every time I open my copy of the 780-page monster of a book, I always think of her, and I always think of that day. I've never been sure if it was her intent or not, but she left her lasting memory on me with that challenge. I soon after learned what she did, was a completely wonderful and amazing thing for me. So I decided to keep it going. I've met a lot of strangers in my life, some that have become friends, and some, due to living in different time zones and whatnot, didn't. I don't want to just have experiences and then let them go. I want to remember these meetings, and embrace the fact that they happen. So whenever I leave someone who has left an amazing impact of my life, I always make sure to add them to my Ulysses bucket list. I ask them to give me a challenge, as difficult or as easy as they want it to be, and regardless of the fact that they have done it or not, simply something their heart has wanted to do. Some have been easy and fun. I met a man in India nine years ago who told me to, for a week or a month, cook and buy twice as much food as I intend on eating, and give the other half to a stranger in need. I completed that mission eight years ago, and thought about that man and the time we had all the way through. I met a girl on a cruise six years ago, who told me to jump into a body of water on a slightly cold day, without touching or feeling the temperature of the water first. I did that the very same year. I met a couple at an outdoor music festival a few years ago that told me to wear the most bizarre outfit imaginable and walk through a public place, completely oblivious to the fact that you aren't looking normal. I did that task the very next day, at the same festival. Some have been difficult, to say the least, three guys I met in Amsterdam and smoked all night with, told me to go to a mall and give ten strangers ten presents. That one took a lot of courage, but I did it a year or so after I met them. It was nerve-wracking, but at the same time exhilarating leaving my comfort zone. A girl I met on a plane told me to skydive, I'm still in the process of getting that done. A couple I met in Cali on the beach told me to tell the five people I hated the most, that I love them and respect them. That one was very difficult because of my stubbornness, but I've come close to completing that list many times. 
still in the process, two more people to go. And some things, have had an everlasting impact on my daily life. I met a girl at a music festival, who told me that whenever I get mad at someone, walk away, sing my happy song in my head for five minutes, go back to the person I'm mad at with a clam heart in mind, and work things out. I've made this my way of life. I once met a man at a gym in a hotel I was staying at, that told me whenever your body and brain tells you that you are exhausted and done, use your heart instead and push out two more reps. I've made this my motto when working out or working on any kind of extenuating exercise in which my body demands me to quit. I also use it while working on anything, and while studying. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever received. There are many others that each brought joy to my life. There are still many tasks I have yet to accomplish, and every time I think of these tasks, I think of the people that gave them to me. It amazes me how well I remember all these people, while I can't remember so many aspects of even yesterday. These experiences, not only do I take from them a mission or a challenge, I also take from them a memory of them that never fails to appear inside of my mind. I opened my Ulysses book for probably the 300th time yesterday, and read a few pages, which prompted me to share this story with you today. I'm in the final 30 pages of the book, also known as the most dreaded of the read, in the last 40 pages or so, James Joyce doesn't use a single punctuation mark, no periods, no commas, no nothing, a straight 50-page run-on sentence. I never saw Amanda after that day, nor do I know if she ever did get a chance to sing a song to a room full of strangers. But what I do know, is that she gave me a gift that has never once stopped giving. So wherever you may be, thank you for giving me the Ulysses bucket list. And I swear I'll finish it one day. My life advice? Simple, create your own Ulysses bucket list. My insane neighbor T orchard and unalived two of her children and stored them in a freezer for over two years, then got caught because she refused to pay her rent. I lived next to my neighbor Jane for a few years and she always seemed very demented to me, with lots of yelling and arguing coming from her house all the time. I know she had four children, a 19 and 17 year old daughter and a 13 and 8 year old son, and I always saw them walking to school in dirty clothes and with marks on their faces. I remember calling the cops one time when I heard a kid crying and the sounds of something being hit, but for some reason the cops never did anything when they arrived at the house. I remember getting into a huge argument with her once when I saw her yelling outside at one of the kids when it was past midnight and she was laying hands on him severely. I ended up calling CPS on her, but once again somehow she was able to retain custody and prove that she was fit to care for the children. The kid's father was serving life in prison for unalive, and maybe that should have been a sign for things to come. I remember there came a time where for a few week period the commotion in their house was borderline insane, with things being banged constantly and what sounded like muffled screams. I called the cops again, and somehow nothing was done one more time. I had no idea how she managed to get away with it each time, but shortly after all of the sound and the commotion in the house stopped, I thought she learned her lesson. There was peace coming from her house and this peace stayed for the next few years. I thought she had cleaned up her act, but then she got evicted, the truth of why the house was now quiet came to light. When I found out what happened I literally threw up. I was right there I could have stopped it. So when the commotion within their house became insane, there was a reason. My neighbor Jane had walked in on her eight-year-old son playing with his toys in what she deemed an inappropriate manner, and she for some reason became convinced that he and her 17-year-old daughter were roping her 13-year-old son. For the next while, the commotion that came from the house was actually the sounds of the eight- and 17-year-old screaming from being tortured. The details of it made me want to puke, as apparently there was hot water used, suffocation, beatings, sharp objects and nails, everything that you can think of that is evil and horrible she did. She did this all to get them to confess to roping their 13-year-old brother. She ended up getting a confession, from the 8-year-old after she poured be eiling water on his mirrors and using a clothing iron on the 17-year-old. She ended up eventually unaliving her 8-year-old, and putting it in the freezer and forgetting about it. She did the same thing with the 17-year-old, who was still with us when put in the freezer. She ended up passing in the freezer. What's most disturbing about this, is that she recruited her 19-year-old daughter to help her with everything, and she was so terrified of her mother doing the same to her that she ended up going along with the whole thing. And just like that the commotion ended in the house a few weeks later, and the silence now came because the teacher was over. For the next two years they lived in the house and walked by that freezer every single day. I remember her getting evicted when she refused to pay her rent, and the next day police had swarmed the house and found the contents of her freezer. She is currently facing life in prison and the trial is ongoing. I'm supposed to be testifying about the awful sounds I heard and I don't know if I can do it. Date my insane neighbor T orchard and unalived two of her children and stored them in a freezer for over two years, then got caught because she refused to pay her rent. So the trial has now ended and being a part of that trial and witnessing my former neighbor speak about what she did was perhaps the most disgusting thing I have ever seen in my entire life. She showed absolutely no remorse, at one point correcting the judge, saying that this was not the day that her daughter died, this was the day that she unalived her daughter. She showed absolutely no remorse for anything she did, and the whole time she kept accusing her 17 and 8-year-old children for roping her 13-year-old. Her story had so many flaws too, and she was in such a deep state of mania that it seemed like she was believing her own lies. It was a foul thing to watch, especially as she went on to in detail describe what she did to her son and daughter. Someone in the court had to excuse themselves so they could throw up in the bathroom because they could not stomach the details my neighbor was providing. My time to testify came and I stepped up to speak, with sweaty palms and almost trembling. I gave a small speech about the noises I had heard coming from the house during the time frame when she was brutally torturing her children and how I still have nightmares about the fact that it was happening right next to me and I could have helped. I looked over to see her face and she was smiling, seemingly proud of what she had done. 
her lack of remorse and full admission to guilt, on top of it being totally clear that she was manic and delusional landed her a life sentence without the possibility of parole. I still have nightmares and often see the faces of that 17-year-old girl and 8-year-old boy. I could have helped them, I could have. My idiot brother prank called my job and got me fired, so I sold his phone and used the money myself. My brother isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. We live together in an apartment which I pay for and there have been many times where I came home to find glasses smashed, a end cat girl laying on the couch and sleeping with my brother watching TV, or even on one occasion came home to my brother having taken a pet raccoon. I ended up forcing him to get rid of the raccoon. He is unemployed and not in school, and no amount of trying to get him to contribute anything financially gets me anywhere. He is my brother and I absolutely love him, but he can be such a burden at times. The thing is, I don't even make enough money at my job to be able to afford him ordering takeout five times a week or smashing plates or glasses out of clumsiness or anger. I myself live on two meals a day with most of my food being tinned as it is all I can afford. I have talked to my brother many times about his habits and while he has promised to change, he never gets further than applying for a job. He once got an interview, but overslept and missed it as he had a hangover. The thing is, my brother and I have a history which will never allow me to kick him to the curb. Our parents died in a car crash when we were 16 and we became orphans. We stuck together and instead of turning to the authorities to find foster homes, we decided to slug it out on the streets and be homeless. We resorted to petty theft to obtain food and slowly we turned into delinquents. We both ended up serving a year in juvie when we were 17 for forcefully robbing a McDonald's by leaping over the counter and beating up the three workers there and forcing the till open before running out with the cash. Now that we are 21 and 22, we have somewhat cleaned up our act. My brother has still not got used to working and still has delinquency at his core, whereas I have managed to find a job. It was not easy to get one, as with my criminal. Record the only place who took me happened to be a crappy ice cream parlor, but it oats the bills so I can't complain. Or should I say it paid the bills? You see, my brother has always enjoyed pulling pranks on people, especially me. He has pranked me by putting water bucket over my door so it falls on me when I open it, putting salt in my coffee, things like that. Ever since I gave him one of the newer iPhones for his birthday last year he has also been pranked calling random numbers telling them he is the hat man or pretending to be a very obvious Indian scammer. So about a week ago, my brother decided to get the genius idea of prank calling my job while I was on my day off and sleeping in as I had just worked for 9 days in a row. My brother called him from his phone and did his best impression of me, which is for some reason scarily accurate and could easily be actually mistook for me. Basically, he told my boss that I was recently diagnosed with lactose intolerance and therefore would have to work a lot more carefully at the job, nor was I going to be taking ice cream for myself while on break again. The boss then asked about taking ice cream on break, and my brother stated that of course I take ice cream on break, not just one but usually three or four cones. Thing is, we can take ice cream on our break at a discount but not totally free. My brother saying this basically led to my boss believing that I have been disregarding company policy and stealing from the company, and my boss told me that I shouldn't bother coming back and I'm lucky I'm not being sued. My brother ended up waking me up and telling me the news, and I was less than amused. I shouted at my brother for being an imbecile and that my job was the reason we had a place to live. He seemed very apologetic in fairness, but rent was due and I was relying on my next two paychecks to make it, paychecks I now wouldn't be getting. So I resorted to the only thing I could think of, without my brother's knowledge I listed his phone for sale and while he was sleeping I sold it. My brother's now absolutely furious, but at least we can pay rent while I look for another job. My fiancé wants to call off the wedding because of the disturbing things his religious parents did to him when he was young, how do I help him? My fiancé Nick came to me two weeks ago and told me that we needed to talk. The thing is, he has been no contact with his parents since 18 when he moved out with a roommate and roommate's then girlfriend. We both attended a Christian school, and I knew that his parents were overly strict with him back then. He was even hit for keeping friends they didn't like, and he had wanted to move out for some time. His roommates were two years older than him, and he stayed with them for almost two years until they became engaged and wanted to move elsewhere, and Nick had a job to rent a room by that time. His roommates are great friends with us, and they even prolonged moving out together until Nick was ready. But when he wanted to talk, it was about his parents. I didn't know what he wanted to talk about, but when he said his parents, I was a little surprised. He seemed uncomfortable from the start too, but he said he wanted to apologize for something too. When I asked what for, he said he should have said it earlier but that he was afraid of losing me. He also called himself selfish and was really hard on himself, but he said he wasn't sure if he'd be able to satisfy me because he hated himself among other things too. When I asked him why, he said he did before high school and that he was getting anxious leading up to our wedding. He told me that his parents made him feel that way, and he also reached out to a therapist too who suggested being honest with me. His parents were really strict about purity growing up, but this was the first time he was specific because he was ashamed of telling anyone. His parents used to hit him for finding stains in his laundry when he was as young as 13, and they told him that that was the same as committing adultery. They also told him that emsturbating would destroy his family and future marriage, and they would have random checks of his bedsheets along with laundry too. He eventually got around them by doing laundry at night, but they also put a camera in the bathroom to make sure he wasn't emsturbating too, and he said they had a video of him emsturbating along with using the restroom. They also used to check his private area randomly too, and he began to sleep on his back because he felt guilty for feeling pleasure while he slept. He became better as he grew older, and we've made out on many occasions. He also previously said he wanted to save intimacy for when we were married, 
but admitted it was because he was afraid of letting me down because he was convinced he'd never get married. When I asked him why he thought that, he said he read things about purity ruining intimacy and that he was afraid of not being enough. I told him that I loved him regardless of anything and that I was so sorry for everything he told me. I also told him that I didn't think less of him for not saying it, until reaching out to a therapist, because it was really difficult, and I told him that it was good to reach out to a therapist too. However, he believes he'll never overcome it and that people like him shouldn't get married. I tried to tell him to not be so hard on himself, and I told him that I thought nothing less of him too. If anything, I said I thought more of him for reaching out for therapy. But he said he was miserable because everyone said he had great parents growing up and that they wouldn't believe him. He recorded some of the lectures slash punishments his parents gave him, on his phone, but believed it wasn't enough to do anything legally. He also said he was unsure of pursuing it, and breaking no contact, and was debating working on himself with his therapist instead. I told him that the choice was his and that I'd support whatever he wanted to do. But I felt that my words couldn't make him feel better even when I hugged him because of everything. He went through. I don't know how to make him feel better, and that's why I'm asking for help. Update my fiancé wants to call off the wedding because of the disturbing things his religious parents did to him when he was young, how do I help him? The main thing I was thinking about was what to do with the upcoming wedding. I had no issues delaying it and figured it could be better to postpone indefinitely for two reasons. He mentioned having anxiety as the wedding drew closer along with the real reason he wanted to wait until we were married before having intimacy due to his fears about not being enough and that people like him shouldn't get married. The second reason was that he recently sought out therapy, and I didn't want to rush that based on a wedding date. I wanted to tell him that I was more than fine with postponing, but was afraid of it coming off the wrong way. We chilled at his place and watched TV the day after we talked, and he didn't want to talk about it that day. He said we could in a few days, and we eventually talked about it again. He told me that there was another thing he didn't mention when we first spoke, and it was about his parents. When they would do their random checks of his private areas to make sure he wasn't emsturbating, they would touch it to look for dried nut when he didn't want them to, and that was in addition to underwear and sheet checks too. He said he was 12 when he first remembered it happening and that they did that for a few years. Like the other night, he struggled to tell me and said he struggled to tell his therapist too in the beginning. She was the one who told him to talk to me and be honest. I decided to tell him that I wanted to offer postponing in case it was making him anxious and to not rush his therapy progress, and he was happy that I asked because he said he didn't feel he was improving at all. Update, he's still with his therapist as of now, but he still has doubts about his progress and says he struggles to not get stuck in the past. And for that reason, he was unsure about pursuing anything. Legally with his parents due to uncertainty about re-established contact after being in no contact for so long, and he doesn't know how his mental health slash potential trauma would react to that. People from his parents' church tried to reach out when he initially went no contact with his parents at 18, and some of them were rather condescending and said he didn't appreciate having awesome parents from what little they saw on the outside due to the fear of not knowing how he would mentally handle potentially breaking no contact in hopes of anything legal, he decided not to pursue it and instead stick with therapy, and he's been with the same therapist since my last post although he has doubts about results. I told him that results don't happen overnight and that I'd support regardless of what he chose, and we're in no rush to get married either because of everything he's trying to overcome. He's been a bit depressed from time to time despite therapy, but there are some things you don't really overcome but rather learn how to carry, and I think that that'll take time in this case because of everything he's been carrying for a long time. What is the most messed up thing someone admitted to you while intoxicated? My father has always had a drinking problem, but until I was 17 or 18 I didn't really acknowledge it. He'd been such a distant part of my life by that point I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. Suddenly, when I turned 18, he started calling a lot. He started trying to convince me to come out and live with him. I wasn't biting, obviously, and I know he was just trying to reconnect with me probably but at that point I was angst, having just gone through a really bad breakup. I didn't want to move in with him. I wanted to go to college and live on my own. Didn't stop him from calling me, though, and the longer I refused the more often he would call me while he was out of it. At first it was innocent enough, his words were slurred and he jumped haphazardly from topic to topic, but it was pretty easy to get him off the phone so I didn't have to deal with it. One night I was up late finishing a paper. It was 1.30 in the morning and he called. I was tired and felt guilty for having not talked to him in about two months, so I picked up. I could damn near smell the tequila through the phone. It was so bad. I remember him sounding very somber, like he was at a funeral. He'd been crying too, I think, because his voice was kind of scratchy. Not grumbly, like a drunk person, but scratchy. He started talking about memories of when he was a kid. He described to me a time when he and my grandfather had gone fishing early one morning when my dad was about nine years old. It was a spur-of-the-moment thing, my grandfather had woken him up at about five in the morning and told him to get his overalls and tackle box because they were going and my dad had no choice. Wasn't a huge deal anyway because my dad loved his dad and he loved to fish. They got out on the lake in a rowboat and set out their lines and sat in silence for about half an hour before my grandfather spoke. He told my dad about how, shortly after him and my grandmother had gotten married, she had gotten pregnant with. What would have been my dad's older brother? About halfway through the pregnancy there were complications and my grandmother ended up miscarrying. It almost tore the two apart romantically, for obvious reasons, but they stuck it out and a year or two later along came my dad, followed in fairly quick succession by my three aunts. As he's telling me this, I'm convinced I'm dreaming. 
I had fallen asleep at my desk and was now having some sort of avant-garde nightmare. It had to be. Obviously I wasn't, but the whole thing was very surreal and only got worse. My dad went on to explain that the reason he told me that story was because he wanted to tell me something about when my mom had been pregnant with my sister who is five years older than I am. My dad has always loved music, and up until a few years after he and my mom divorced he was in a band. So he's telling me about how a few months into the pregnancy, his band was really starting to get going and everything was looking up. My mom, however, was worried because he was spending so little time at home with her, and she was pregnant so she was also worried he wouldn't be home much when the baby came either. She supported his love of playing music, but she needed him at home too. He told me that one night, when my mom was sleeping, he'd gotten home from a bar fairly drunk and had been mulling over his situation. He could keep playing all the music he wanted and live a life he had dreamed of since he was a teenager, or he could grow up and be a man. There was no middle ground with him, apparently. He couldn't just cut back on the music a little, it was either all music or all family. He said he stood over my mom for a long time with a fist clenched, contemplating whether or not he wanted to iron mic her in the stomach. He said he was so close to doing it that he had even turned her gently so he could have a clear target. He ended up not doing it, of course. He spewed some stuff about how he decided he would grow up. And be a man. How he knew what he had to do, and how God had spoken to him in that moment and guided him on his true path. I told him not to call me ever again and hung up. Students, what is the saddest event you have seen in school? When I was in middle school there was a kid who was really quiet. He didn't have friends since he looked weird and just didn't fit in with anybody so he just kept to himself. One day this group of seen kids were acting all friendly to him, like they were hanging out with him and everything. Then in the library, when it was this girl's birthday he came up to her with this little brown lunch bag and said happy birthday which just about shocked everyone because he never spoke to someone voluntarily, he always waited until someone would speak to him or ask him a question. She opened it and it was a silver necklace he made himself, it was really pretty. It had glass lined up almost in the swirl and the glass was cut to look like a little diamond and they were glued on a shell. She gave him a big hug and everyone saw that he turned red and looked a bit nauseous afterward. Months later they were found passing notes and hanging out more, some kids thought they were dating, everyone else knew he had a crush on her. The two looked cute together, they would eat, read, and laugh together. He was even there for her when she had guy trouble, some of the teachers called him her angel. Everything was going fine for them until he found out that she had been sharing their notes to their friends, some of which had really private things about him like how his father abused him when he was younger and how he had testicular cancer a couple years prior. Naturally he just blew up and confronted her. I have to say the look on his face will always stick with me, in the middle of their fight she just went out and said that they were never friends and that the reason why she acted like a friend was because he was ugly and felt sorry for him. He calmed down but was visually heartbroken so he just turned around and walked away. About a week later he just stopped showing up to classes, but people kept saying that they saw him eating his lunch outside at the end of the field. Well it turns out, that he ended up getting in school suspension for some reason, whether it was that fight he had with that girl or if he got in a fight nobody really knows. He got back to keeping to himself, you wouldn't see him with those groups of kids anymore. Less and less people started seeing him until it was like he disappeared altogether. Turns out he has been either skipping school or being locked up alone in school suspension. The school then found out that he has been getting bullied on the bus and at home. On the bus he would be thrown around from seat to seat in the back and then would be followed home while the same dirtbags would throw rocks and erasers at him. The teachers went with the same gag of there's no proof of bullying so there was nothing anyone could do but it was apparent that the bullying was getting worse. One morning he was seen eating lunch again but he was wearing a jacket, it was late April and the temperature would peak at around 90 degrees. The teachers took him to the counselor and they ended up finding out he had been hurting himself for the past month. Instead of getting him help they just stuck him in school suspension again, then came the rumors that he ate rats for lunch. It would all be over because he was found unalive in the in-school suspension room he was locked in. The school then held an assembly to announce his passing and for some reason everyone was sad. I personally was really shocked and I honestly felt at fault for not doing anything. The group that pretended to be his friends all acted like they loved him, their sounds of crying were so fake. The girl he had a crush on acted like she lost the love of her life, how he was always there for her and ended up throwing a huge pity party for herself. People who have slept with a step-relative, what was the aftermath? I had a colleague once who drunkenly confessed to sleeping with her step-brother. Eventually it developed into a serious relationship. Her parents got to know and desperately tried to get them to break up. Colleague ended up dating her step-bro in secret. It's an open secret in the office at this point. Awkward, because the stepdad was also in upper management. Her parents find out again and try to get them to break up a second time. It all gets rather public and ugly and quite embarrassing for her mom and stepdad who are now senior figures in the industry running their own company. Colleague tells us that she's been given ultimatums from her mom. Doesn't describe what they are. Suddenly, she stops showing up to work and emails her resignation. She tells HR that she's moving to the US to find some peace. Colleague also texts some folk at work to tell them that she's had enough of the drama and moving away. A few weeks pass and there's no news from her until her stepbro slash boyfriend starts contacting all her work friends. I wasn't contacted but some of my teammates were. Stepbra is desperately trying to get in touch with her, she's broken up with him via text. He wants to know if anyone's heard from her. He doesn't believe that she now lives in the US and that she'd go without telling him. Everyone writes him off as a guy who couldn't handle the rejection, until he goes to the police and files a missing persons case. Police actually made a few inquiries to everyone's surprise. In the end the cops write the stepbra off as a lovesick loon and everything settles down. For a while at least. Stepbra has gone crazy, now claiming that he thinks something bad happened to her. Says he's fallen out with his parents over it. 
no one at work wants to get involved in this family drama, especially since the parents are important people. Things die down again, until they don't. Fast forward two years and no one's heard from our colleague, until the cops come calling. They've arrested her mom's chauffeur on an unrelated charge and he confesses to taking the life of our colleague. Even leads them to the body. He doesn't however reveal a motive. He must have been stalking her. Our colleague never went to the us. Turns out the emails she sent weren't from her either. They were sent after her death. The texts, the emails and the breakup were all from her mom. She covered her tracks after she orchestrated the killing of her own daughter. All because she wouldn't stop dating her stepbrother and was going to marry him. Ex-prisoners, who was the most evil person in prison. There was this dude who was into the exploitation of children, we called him chamos in prison, who was in his fifties, overweight disgusting redneck with creepy glasses. He was in there for continuously forcing himself on his children, ranging from ages 4 to 13. Daughters and sons both. In prison, he was always staring at other men and buying guys stuff and yes there are young guys dumb enough to buy into his act and end up getting forced on, although they more or less let him do it, I knew one guy who was pretty normal but addicted to dope and Bob, that's the chamo's name, offered him dope to let him sleep with him. So the story goes that a couple of guys were out hunting and saw this creeper van and a little camp set up and could hear crying coming from the van and it was moving so it was kind of suspicious to them and they approached the van and opened it up and there was Bob, with his daughter while the other children cowered in a corner with blank stares. The men pulled him off and started to call the police and this piece of crap started crying and shouting at them that they're my kids, I can do what I want with them. Obviously, they were disgusted and hurt him, one of them actually got charged with assault when the police got there because Bob pressed charges, the police had no choice. The worst part is that this piece of trash acted like the friendliest neighbor you ever saw in prison, all smiles and going to church and preaching God's word to people, the whole while being a weirdo on young white men in there, having intimacy as often as he could. Every time I caught him staring at me I'd feel disgusted and mean mug him. Before I knew who he was, he would always say hi to me and I would think who is that, why is he always saying hello? One day I got sick of it and told him he didn't know me and to stop trying to greet me. I could tell he was a chamo but wasn't sure, then one of my friends told me the story and guys from his county had the newspapers to back it up. Also, he was very handy. Every person he ever talked to he would put his hands on any chance he got. He was in my pod for a week and I was at the microwave and he touched my back between my shoulders to ask who was behind me. That's when I angrily told him not to touch me and you don't know me and also stop trying to talk to me. I don't like you. Siblings of psychopaths when did you realize your sibling wasn't normal? My oldest sister is a psychopath. I'm the youngest of three girls and we grew up fairly poor so both parents were out of home a lot working to give us the basics. Because of this my oldest sister looked after us. My earliest memories involved me running through the kitchen in a diaper feeling so scared trying to get away from her. Anything and everything set her off. If attention was not 100% on her she would flip out, scratching, kicking, hair pulling. My parents were pretty oblivious to all this, or more my dad was also unstable, BPD who frequently went off meds, and my mom was too emotionally abused to do anything to help. She had to have presents on everyone else's birthday, had to have the same presents as everyone else on Christmas, or better ones. As I was four years younger I was much smaller than her and easy to catch. From my toddler years to 16 I had crescent scars all over my arms and ankles because she would dig her nails into my skin. The very first time it clicked in my head that no one would ever help and she could manipulate her way out of everything is when she stabbed me in the shoulder with a pen. I was about eight years old. She had yanked out a chunk of my hair so I told her to F off. The look on her face was horrifying because she looked so happy because my dad had been sleeping and woke up to me swearing which was strictly not allowed. She knew I was going to be in trouble so she grabbed the pen off the table and stabbed me then yanked it back out. I ran upstairs to get away from my dad, which was a whole different scary experience and he wouldn't believe that she had hurt me. I came downstairs a few hours later when he allowed it, with blood all over my shirt. My aunt was staying with us and saw it, pointed it out to my dad and they still believed my sister hadn't done it. I gave up all hope for help after that. That turned into eight years of her scarring any exposed skin, pulling out my hair, cornering me and screaming about how disgusting I was, taking every moment to remind me I was fat. She has been anorexic slash bulimic most of her teens and adult life, throwing things at me, telling me men will only like me because they're chubby chasers, etc. I am more of an extrovert than most of my family so I always had a lot of friends and boyfriends in elementary school and then actual boyfriends in high school. When she went away to university my mother thought it would be a great idea for me to visit her there. A whole weekend being alone in her dorm with her. She spent the first day reminding me how disgusting I was, then acted all nice until the evening. She wanted me to watch West Side Story, I think, it's the one with the opening scene of the two gangs finger snapping down the street. Me being 16 thought it was funny so I laughed. Wrong move. She started screaming, threw out all the food, cornered me and let me know how no one in my life actually likes me and they're all just putting up with me because they don't know any better, I'll only ever be in abusive relationships, I don't deserve anything better than that, I'll always be fat and disgusting, etc. Then she kicked me out and made our mother pick me up a day early. Mid-year she was home and in a rare moment of civility she wanted to talk. She asked me how you're supposed to feel sorry for other people. As in how do you feel empathy? She couldn't figure it out when her professors talked about it. I carefully got out of that conversation. Later that day after she'd done her usual you're fat and disgusting rant I decided to turn my back on her and not engage. She picked up a textbook and hit me as hard as she could over the head with it, yanked me by the back of my head and pushed me in the cupboards, to let me know you're not allowed to ignore me. I have not spoken to her since that day, I'm now 26 and she's 30. She's still living off my mother and has zero social skills. The last time I saw her she had drank a bottle of wine on Christmas Eve.
2011 and she just laid on the living room floor for the day. She's pulled a knife on our other sister, she's been evicted for trashing apartments that are in my mother's name, had so many pets die unexplainably, expects to be showered with gifts and attention by everyone around her, she will get angry if family are paying more attention to children than they are to her, she still has to refer to our mother as mummy and in that high-pitched voice, she can't hold any platonic relationship, has never had a romantic ones and she still hates me viciously for being able to have relationships. I will not be surprised if she ends up ending someone. She is the spitting image of our father in personality. She lives in another province from me, is still in school, and my mother is smart enough to never let her know where I live. Those close to me know who she is and know not to give any information. I told my abusive sister that if she attends my nephew's wedding I'll physically drag her out of it, and she did not take it well. My nephew Joey is getting married in two weeks and his mother Judy is trying to come, but I've adamantly told her not to because of how much crap she's put him through in recent years. When Joey was 18 he was in a car crash with his father. His father died a few days later and Joey was also hurt but obviously survived. I know all of this was triggered by my sister's grief and I am trying to be mindful of that. First, she purposely missed his high school graduation because she couldn't imagine being there without his father. Joey was understanding and thankfully me and his girlfriends, now fiancés, family were there for him. Judy insisted on still hosting a graduation party a week or so later. I wasn't able to get there until towards the end. When I got there, most of the guests had left and Judy was a drunken mess and was wailing about her husband's death. I told Joey to pack a bag and to come to my house for the weekend which he did. Judy swore she would do better and begged him to come back home which again, he did. A couple months went by and Joey asked if I could drive him to work because his car had been totaled. He looked terrible when I got him so I asked him what was up. He said he was working 70 hours a week because Judy had gotten laid off. I asked him how his car got totaled and he said Judy had crashed it driving intoxicated. At that point our mom and I sat down with her to try to get her into some sort of treatment or counseling and she agreed, but we later learned she never went. I take partial responsibility for not following up. Some months later Joey called me again this time for a ride to the courthouse to get Judy out of jail. All he said was she had gotten drunk and got herself arrested. But when I picked him up he had fresh cuts on his arm and jawline. Turns out she assaulted him when he refused to get her more. To drink. I begged him to come stay with me, but Judy insisted she would get help if he would stay and help her, which he did. I would call and talk to Joey once or twice a week to make sure he and Judy were safe. She didn't go into treatment, but he said things had calmed down. After a few months he stopped responding to calls and only sent short text responses. Some time later those stopped too. Throughout all of this he has been supported by his fiancé. I started getting my updates on Joey's well-being through her occasional social media posts. They got engaged and her family is paying for the small, intimate wedding and reception they've chosen to have. As far as I knew things were better. He seemed happy in her posts. I was blindsided about two weeks ago when Joey's fiancé called me. She said Joey needed my help and asked if she could drive him over to my house. When they got there he was shaking, hyperventilating, and threw up multiple times. When he finally calmed down he said his mother had gone into a drunken rage some weeks ago and started trying to rip and burn everything left of her husband's. When Joey stopped her, she started wrecking his stuff. All the while she was screaming that she wanted her husband back and wished Joey had died instead, she was blaming him for the crash, the whole nine yards. Joey said this has been going on for months and the night prior to his girlfriend bringing him to me, he came home and found that she had burned all of his father's pictures, old clothes, everything. I went to confront Judy. She agreed once again to enter treatment and this time she followed through. Joey has been staying with me since. Every time I ask about the wedding or his girlfriend goes over plans with him he turns pale and miserable. I asked him what was up with that. He wouldn't really answer, but I asked if it was because his mom. I asked if he wanted her off the guest list. He didn't have it in him to flat out say yes, but the look on his face said it all. Judy called him earlier today gushing about how excited she is for the wedding and that she's picked out her dress and wants a mother groom dance. Joey told her not to come. She went all weepy and started begging. At that point I asked him to give me the phone and I flat out told her that if she sets foot in that wedding I will personally drag her out of it. This has caused a stir in our family. Our other siblings think I have influenced Joey and I should convince him to let her come if she promises to behave. I told them all that since they've helped him very little and don't know his side of things then they can kiss my butt. My sexist boss retracted my promotion after learning that I am engaged and not interested in him, so I'm taking him to court. So about a month ago, my manager brought me into the office and offered me a promotion, she was relaying the info from the owner. The promotion was to become a shift manager at one of the other restaurants in my city. I would obviously get a pay raise, better hours and various other perks. I initially told her I needed to think about taking it, but I was definitely excited and enthusiastic. Fast forward to two weeks ago, I had a meeting with her to discuss some questions I had about the job, what benefits, where I was working, training etc. One of my questions was whether it was reasonable to request as part of my new contract to have the week of my wedding off. She said yes and would ask the owner for me if that could be written into the contract. This Wednesday. I went into her office to ask about any new info or developments. She shut the door and said that the offer had been retracted and I would not be getting the promotion. 
she explained that the owner had decided to retract the offer after learning I was getting married and that, a young woman getting married means she's going to get pregnant. She also said that if you were a man, we would not be having this conversation. I was, still am, absolutely gobsmacked. It's the first time in my life that I've ever felt sexism or discrimination based on intimacy in my entire life. I've essentially now lost my job. Still currently employed there, but I have no desire to continue working there whatsoever. I feel utterly disgusting and somewhat dirty, even though I did nothing wrong. I love working there, and all the people at my restaurant have not done anything to me, but it's the fact that I would be working for an owner that's so blatantly sexist. I've gone and sought legal advice at an equality organization in my city and am waiting for a response from the person in charge. I've also opened a complaint in my company's HR department, who have asked me to contact the owner directly to understand exactly why I haven't got this promotion. Update my sexist boss retracted my promotion after learning that I am engaged and not interested in him, so I'm taking him to court. So obviously a lot has happened in the past two years of my life since I made the decision to seek legal advice because of my sexist boss. So here's the timelines, February 2020, had an in-person meeting with my manager, the owner of the restaurant and a supposed mediator. I legally recorded the audio of the meeting. I was very unhappy with the outcome of this meeting, felt like no one listened to me and I was bullied by the higher-ups into making this all go away. March 2020, after all this went down, I sought a lawyer at a local union firm, who agreed to take on my case. Due to the laws in my country, my case was classed as a civil one, so there could be no criminal consequences and my monetary compensation would be limited to three months' salary. Between March and August 2020, lots of back and forth between my lawyer and my ex-employer, basically denying all responsibility, not wanting to do anything, etc. August 2020, again as per Swiss law, a mediation meeting was set up between myself, my boss and the lawyers in front of a judge. The judge was purely there to help keep things civil if necessary, no say whatsoever. This mediation meeting lasted 15 minutes, with my boss's lawyer refusing to budge. My boss didn't even turn up to this meeting. Since we couldn't come to an agreement, I was given permission to file a formal case, which meant a judge would hear my case and rule on it. Between August 2020 and May 2021, hardly any news from either side, so I was told to just wait while all the administrative cogs turned. May 2021, the big day. My case was heard in front of a judge, with witnesses called from both sides to testify and lots of evidence filed, from my side at least. My key piece of evidence was this audio recording, in which my boss and manager basically put their foot in it. The judge asked them both to explain themselves, with neither giving very convincing arguments to defend themselves. I stood in court and told my account of the story, staring my boss right in the face. Between May 2021 and February 2022, more waiting. I knew the law was slow, but geez louise. At this point, I had put the case to the back of my mind. February 7, 2022, my state civil court ruled in my favor. I won. I took my boss to court over discrimination and the judge found him liable. I won. I can't begin to describe how incredible it feels. I cried on the phone with my lawyer when she called me to tell me the news. It was never about the money, it was always about accountability and acknowledgement. I am so proud of myself for pursuing this despite the odds stacked against me, discrimination is incredibly hard to prove. Too bad I had that recording. My ex-employer was found guilty of discriminatory behavior in order to pay compensation. My wife and I spent years prioritizing swinging with other couples over spending time with our son and it has come back to bite us in the butt. My wife and I are swingers and we often invite a lot of people over for massive intimacy parties. Often 10 or 15 people. So, our son was returning one of our bags we left at his house a week ago. He decided to return it late at night last Saturday. Our party ended and we had people leaving at the same time. Apparently, when he reached our front door we had couples leaving and talking about the party. My wife opened the door in shock. He threw the bag on the floor here's your stuff, sorry if I interrupted your intimacy session. My wife, as usual started blowing up his phone as soon as he left. My wife had the phone on speaker. He picked up the fourth time and said, Mom we can talk about this on Friday at my place but I want to be left alone for this week. Friday came and we were sitting at his place. He let out a lot of his frustrations. He said you guys were basically gone every other weekend when I was 16 years old. Was the only time you guys were at home was because you didn't have any F buddies to suck an F? I told him to watch the way he spoke to us and that we did still spend time on the days we didn't go nor did we go for the whole weekend. He responds yeah name one time you guys did anything with me on an individual basis? You guys were attached to the hip basically. I was actually jealous of your relationship. How messed up is that? I used to think it's nice and all how much you love each other but couldn't show me the same amount of love and attention. I used to get sick seeing you snuggle with each other like teenagers whenever we used to watch a movie together. You used to tease me about it but you had no idea how I felt inside. I responded with telling him that a romantic relationship and a parent-child relationship are completely different. He got ticked off and said don't insult my intelligence. I know. That. It still doesn't change that you guys cared more about each other. I've seen how much my girlfriend's parents love her. I used to get jealous. By the way, mom, yes my girlfriend isn't a big fan of yours. She doesn't respect you as my parents. 
the reason I didn't share how I felt when I was at home was because it felt humiliating. My wife started bawling in tears and started begging for forgiveness while reaching out for a hug. He rebuked and called her a wh re. I started seeing red and I was up in his face telling him to watch his mouth. He then responds with saying what are you going to do man wh re. I shouldn't be calling you a man. Get the f out of my house before I lose control. We're now home and my wife hasn't left the bed. I've been crying all night. My son hates my guts and I don't know what to do. Date my wife and I spent years prioritizing swinging with other couples over spending time with our son and it has come back to bite us in the butt. I feel really numb right now. It's been four hours since my son invited us to talk to him again. I asked him to give us a couple of days but my wife was persistent to go to say the least. Before we got in the car, we both agreed to listen to him say his piece first. When we entered, he still seemed energetic. He said a lot for me to quote. I'll just give a summary, he first apologized for the name calling. He said he deeply regrets calling us that and wishes he could take that back. He says he isn't inherently against us being swingers, even though that's something he personally doesn't have an interest in himself. He feels though it was that our swinging took precedence over spending time with him. He understood that we couldn't have our world revolve around him. He understood we needed time as a couple to keep our marriage strong. However, according to him we checked out of the relationship we had with him at around 15. We seemed much more happy coming back from our weekend getaways and our anniversary vacation than with the family trips. The fact that we did more couples trips than family trips didn't help at all. We were practically gone every other Saturday. To him it seemed we were so happy and wrapped around each other that he sort of felt like an intruder at home. Out of fear of intruding, he never confronted us on how he felt inside. He said he felt like an accessory to our marriage, rather than a person we wanted a strong individual relationship with. It seemed like parenting was a daily chore for us. In order to deal with this he asked us for one-on-one -on -one time with either of us so he could feel like he could get our undivided attention for once. However, we rarely could because of how many swinger activities we booked. We would tell him to do stuff with his friends instead. He figured out that we were swingers when he asked to borrow the laptop when he was 17 and we had one tab open. He sort of gave up on wanting a relationship with us at that point. He outright told us that we don't know him as an individual. To us, he's a quite introverted kid who doesn't say a lot around us. However, he is much more talkative with everyone else around. The thing that shocked us was that he pretended to be happy when we called or came to visit so that he didn't hurt our feelings. He says his love for us comes out of gratitude, not because he likes being around us or because he feels close to us. He mentioned that he talks to his girlfriend's parents significantly more than us. The main reason that he blew up at us, was that we came uninvited to his place. He hated the fact that he had to pretend to actually interact with us as if we had that kind of relationship. He initially wanted to make an excuse that he had to go somewhere but he's made that excuse multiple times whenever we invited him or asked if he could come over. So, he had to bite the bullet. After four hours, we finally left. He was angry and annoyed at the same time. He finally said we left the bag at his place. Not wanting an excuse to come to his place again, he dropped the bag at night. He sort of figured it out we had one of our parties ending and it triggered him. He said what he wants from us now, unless it's for a certain occasion, don't ask him to call or visit anymore. He no longer will initiate anything from his side. He wants us to call him if there's an emergency or if we need possible financial help because he feels he owes us at least that much. Respect the fact that his girlfriend's parents will take precedence over us from now on meaning if they ever have kids, they would be the primary grandparents. He will deal with taking care of them when they get old before he looks at us. Don't ask for more or expect more out of our relationship. He doesn't want a motherson dance at his wedding. He doesn't want me giving a speech at his wedding. My wife couldn't handle it and asked us to leave. She was silent the entire time we drove home. What was your high school's biggest scandal? At my old grammar school, we had a head teacher by the name of Mr. Dingle. Around a year after our class year had left school, stories started emerging about Mr. Dingle. During his tenure at the Royal Grammar School, Tim Dingle was considered a respectable and dignified headmaster and was as straight-laced as they come. During his time at school however, it came to light that he wasn't quite as admirable as he portrayed himself. An undercover reporter managed to sting him on webcam site, where he was sharing intimate conversations with a lady, although he was then married, he was walking about how he wanted this lady to treat him like a dog and use high heels to stomp on his junk. As well as wax his junk. He was doing this using the school computers and technology. Following this investigation, the press were able to dig out some much more serious allegations via his wife. It came to light that headmaster, Mr. Dingle had been holding intimacy and substance parties at his multi-million pound house, which backs onto the school playing field. At these parties, Tim and his guests took copious amounts of snow which he had confiscated from his pupils. The pupils, who he confiscated these from would have gotten suspensions or expulsion for possession of the substances, but Mr. Dingle was quite happy dishing out the punishment, then rolling using himself. Following his dismissal from the Royal Grammar School and subsequent failure to be accepted for a prestigious Buenos Aires-based international school, Tim pursued his career in public speaking and business training for a short time, with limited success. A few years later, one of my friends from school was going through the list of acts which were to perform at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is an annual comedy and arts festival held in Edinburgh, Scotland, and who should he see on the listings but our good friend Mr. Dingle. When we were sent this over WhatsApp, the group went wild and we knew we had to see him. This is the guy who suspended me from school for a week for smoking cigarettes in the playing field, suspended a dozen boys for trading CDs on school grounds and many others for other misdemeanors. Us being in the southeast of England and Mr. Dingle performing up in Scotland, it would be difficult, if not impossible to get us all there. 
After some short searches, we found that he was doing a warm-up gig in a small venue in London. Given that his show was named Giving Brain, the tickets pretty much booked themselves. The night came and we made sure to get there early and grab front row seats, following a half dozen pints at the venue's bar beforehand. We were ready to face the man who suspended so many but was more guilty of anything we had ever done perform stand up in front of us. The headline act for the night was a comedian named Paul Foote, who is marginally famous in the UK and has done some TV appearances and so the venue was sold out, although the common consensus is that Paul Foote is genuinely not funny. Following Paul Foote, Mr. Dingle was the next biggest act performing there and was preceded by two very poor, amateur acts, who didn't go down particularly well by anyone in the crowd. So, the moment of truth arrives and the MC gets back on the mic. He gives Mr. Dingle a lengthy intro, basically outlining everything that was in the first part of my post here. The music played as his entrance was cued and we all looked at each other in excitement. The song he chose was X Gone Give It To You. I cannot make this up. What was about to happen? Would he recognize us? We all made efforts to dig out our old school ties to wear, and 90% of us managed to get a hold of one. As the music comes to its peak, we see him. He is entering from stage right and is wearing a full-length red dress, supposedly similar to the one he was caught wearing at his parties along with some knee-high ladies' boots. His routine begins. And we are all polite and haven't heckled a peep, mostly in shock about what is happening two meters in front of us on stage. Our old headmaster, once leader of one of the most prestigious schools in the UK is standing in front of us in a red dress and knee-high boots, performing an amazingly crass comedy routine. He's getting laughs too. I think mostly it is because the crowd has sat through two awful acts before and felt they need to force it out just so they don't feel shortchanged, or it could be that a front row of young lads are gradually causing more and more of a ruckus as the most mind-blowing thing is happening in front of them and this may have filtered backwards into the crowd. The routine lasted around an hour and included a PowerPoint presentation to go along with it. As far as amateur stand-up goes, he wasn't terrible. Given that he had the pressure of a dozen ex-pupils sitting in front of him, knowing everything that has come to light, he managed to keep his cool. I was invited up on stage at one point to participate and hand in my tie, which was probably one of the most surreal things I've done in my recent memory. What's your darkest secret? Many years ago, I was a teenager, it was summer and I was staying at a friend's house for a couple days. My friend wasn't around at the time, and I was sitting by myself in the kitchen. His mom, smoking attractive, late 30s or early 40s, comes out of the bathroom, having just showered and wearing only a bathrobe. The front of the robe is open low, showing off a lot of her lumps, still flushed and wet from the shower. I politely avoid looking. We start talking. Eventually she gets to asking me about what I was planning to do the next day. My friend had to go out on an errand the next day which would take a few hours, something one would assume to be very boring. She sits down at the table, across from me. The robe opens a little more, and from this angle I get a really good view. I politely avoid looking. She suggests that instead of going with him, I could stay here. I assume she just meant because the errand would be boring and she was giving me an out to just hang out here and not be dragged along. As a 16-year-old I really wanted to do something but I convinced myself there was no way this was happening. So I say that's okay, I'll go with him. After all, what would I do here? She raises one leg up and puts her foot on the seat of a chair. She has these beautiful manicured toes, and is somewhat into that I bulge there and then. The robe slides down her leg and falls away, giving me a view of her bare leg all the way to her inner thigh. I politely avoid looking. Oh, I'm sure you'd think of something to do. She says, running her fingers along her leg. I acted she meant play video games or read comics because there was not way I would do this to my friend. I explain I told him I'd come with him, and we actually have some fun things planned to do while we're out, so I wouldn't want to bail on him. She seems disappointed by my answer, and suggests somewhat half-heartedly that I could still cancel that and stay. I tell her that I'm actually looking forward to it. She seems almost dejected. She puts her leg down, sits back normally and closes her robe. At this point I could not hold it in anymore. I sat on her and said, you know what, I can stay. What followed was me losing my V-card to my friend's mother, as well as the best vacuum cleaner 3000 extra suction gawk I have ever felt. What is the cringiest thing you have ever romantically done? She was my first ever girlfriend. Crazy beautiful, awesome sense of humor, we got along really well and all that. We were in high school at the time, working at a summer job together, and I had zero experience with ladies. Before our first date I asked some friends what to do for the date. They said dinner and a movie. That seemed pretty good since all I knew about dating was what I saw on TV, which was usually dinner and a movie. So we head to a cute French place then we see the notebook. By the end of the movie we're playing footsie, heads on shoulders, my arms wrapped around her, just enjoying her perfume I can't believe it. Drop her off, gave her a box of M&Ms with an origami rose inside. She had told me she loved chocolate, I called her a few days later, all that. I ask her out again, and away we go. Cringe 1, I took her to see the notebook, again. She's cool with it though, I was able to get the tickets ahead of time so it was a surprise for her when the movie started. She snuggled right up to me. It was awesome cringe too, as I'm dropping her off at home, I brutally bomb our first kiss, I stopped the car at the last stop sign before her house, then pursed my lips real tight and smacked them into her face without anything leading up to it. But she's an incredible lady, and doesn't mind. Drop her off, everything's good, and we're talking for hours on the phone every day at this point. Cringe 3, before going to another movie on date 3, we're eating ice cream and her best friend calls her cell phone. Now, I wanted to make the impression I was the funniest thing in the history of the earth to this best friend, so I say let me answer it. And she obliges, to her horror. 
I answer in a high-pitched voice and start talking about tiny little elves who took the phone and I awkwardly laugh, she isn't laughing. About a week later she asks for time and space. I had no idea what that really meant, so I tried to win her over. Oh man, this is where I poured it out big time. Cringe 4, at the place we worked, I found her car and put a dozen roses around it, each with a note that had something I loved about her. Cringe 6, since that didn't work I asked Google how to get the girl of your dreams back. I pasted in a bunch of ideas from results into an email draft, which for some reason I addressed to her. And then clicked send out of habit. This was before the days of undo send. I emailed Yahoo Mail, desperate for them to delete it from her inbox. I tried guessing her password. But the inevitable came she replied wanting to know what was going on. I played it off like my brother asked for advice on the topic and I typed her address in by accident. She wasn't talking to me after this point, but she was nice enough to recognize at work I was hurt or confused or just plain stupid. So she tries stopping me a few days later on my way out to my car, which takes us to cringe 6, I totally ignore her outstretched hand, and walk past her loudly singing I held the pieces of my soul, I was shattered and I wanted you to come and make me whole while I walked to my car. That was the last chance I think I ever had. Soon after she went on vacation with her family to Mexico, and when she came back she made one last trip to our work, with a male co-worker who had quit a few weeks earlier. What was your walk of shame? Sophomore year of college at a big state school in the American Midwest. Fraternity toga party. I should preface this by saying I had nothing under my toga besides a pair of boxers. I gave my wallet and my phone to a friend, who smartly wore shorts under his toga. I don't remember much of the party. I pregamed with 10 beers while playing Irish poker. I lost but had a good time, two dudes got into a fight, cool stuff. The last thing I remember is being handed a four loco and being told to shotgun it as soon as I walked up to the party. Shotgunning that four loco was easily one of the most disturbing moments of my life. If you've ever had a four loco, you know what I mean. Fast forward to about 3.30 a.m. I wake up on the floor of a dorm room. Not only was I completely unclothed, but I was still extremely hammered. I got up and saw a girl passed out on the twin-sized bed. She was unclothed too, and her toes had my saliva on them. In my head I thought no, don't tell me I'm a toe sucker. I chose to scrap this information from my head. But the twin-sized bed explains why I was on the floor, a twin is way too small for two people. But that doesn't matter. After standing up I go into full panic mode. Where the hell was I? What happened? Who is this girl? I never do anything like this, at that point I had only ever slept with two people in my life. I assumed that we did the dirty, but who knows. I had never done anything like this. I was shook as hell. I start to rummage for my toga which was a dirty bedsheet, my underwear, and my shoes. I mentally slap myself for not having a phone or wallet. After I found all of my things scattered on the floor around me, I started the process of figuring out where the hell I am. Can't just open up my phone and look at the GPS, no sir. That would have been too smart. Quietly walk out of her door. To my left, a long hallway, lined with more dorm rooms, that veers off to God knows where. To my right, the door to a stairwell. Thank Christ. Oh, I should also mention that at the beginning of the night, my friend wrapped my toga for me. I had no idea how to wrap a toga. So I'm essentially holding it around my waist like a bath towel. In the stairwell, I found out I'm on the seventh floor. I descend seven flights of stairs. At one point I walk past a group of three to four intoxicated girls heading up. One of them recognizes me, and I recognize her, I say why not let me talk to her for a minute. Fast forward ten minutes her friends are nowhere to be seen and she is going down on me in the bathroom. I finish, wish her well and head out. I reach the bottom at which there's a door that leads outside. I walk outside the door and realize I'm at a dorm on the southeast side of campus. I live in the northwest. I'm two and a half miles from home. With no phone or wallet. Then begins the longest walk of shame I have ever had. A dirty bed sheet wrapped around my waist, at around four in the morning, in January in the Midwest. I did a lot of self-reflection on that walk. Eventually I got home though. Microwaved a frozen burrito and slept like a baby. What was the scandal at your high school? We had a physics teacher that was selling blow and making dope to sell to the kids on the football team. Substance dogs found stashes all over his classroom and let a manhunt to find the guy. They ended up finding him at a student's house where he was living and having an inappropriate relationship with. He was swiftly terminated and the school went ballistic. They literally pulled all of the yearbook kids from their classes in order to scrub any reference or image of him from the soon-to-be-released yearbooks. Teachers were under strict orders to not talk about him and any students that were caught talking about him would receive suspension. A creepy old guy was arrested because he was paying high school girls to sleep with him. He got arrested but the plot thickened even more. It turns out that a girl at our school was supplying the girls and making some type of profit. I don't know what happened to the girl, but I think she got off with practically nothing since minor immunity. The cheerleaders at our school had an alcohol-fueled 30-rated party at someone's house complete with surprise high school boys that turned it into a giant you-know-what. Some bright future leaders of the world decided to Instagram pretty much everything that happened and that's what got them caught. The next day, stuff not only hit the fan, but basically splattered into the vents and stunk up the whole school. Every single female student was called out of class at some point towards the end of the day along with the athletes involved in the pictures and videos. The entire female student body at my school got chewed out by our female principal, female coaches, and female vice principals for pretty much the rest of that school day on how they all need to act like ladies and not like adult entertainment workers. The athletes got a talk to but it was more like, guys, don't put pictures of yourself doing stuff like that on social media. 20. Push-ups, then go back to class. 
Neither section knew why they were getting yelled out, some of the students involved were already missing school that day. There is a plot twist and that twist is that the student whose house this was, it was the mom who supplied the booze, so she got into some legal trouble that I can't remember how it played out. We had so many fights during the beginning week of freshman year of high school that the school was almost shut down to investigate suspected gang activity. There was about seven to nine fights over four days and we were one more away from shutting down the school but no one squared up when it counted. A guy did an obscene amount of mushrooms and ran around the school in his boxers. The security, actual police, and some coaches were hunting him down when they corner him on the bed of someone's truck in the back parking lot. Come any closer and the boxers come off, yelled the high high schooler. A cop got out of the kid's field of vision, jumped off a nearby truck bed, and Batista bombed the poor kid off of the truck. The kid got suspended or transferred to another school and only had bruises and scratches from the slam. My crazy sister-in-law brutally injured and almost unalived her husband because of a joke that he made on trying to convince him to press charges. My sister-in-law has always been a little bit strange mentally, and this was something that I picked up on as soon as I met her. She claimed to be a psychic when I introduced myself to her, and she proceeded to tell me my future by reading a poem. She went on to state she foresaw a big house, then spat in my hand and told me this was the river I was going to live by. I almost ended up getting into a fight with her because of this, and it is needless to say that we have not been on great terms since this. The other times I have met her included some family gatherings, at which she would often discuss in great detail how she could feel other people's energy and could tell what their life was like based on just touching their hand. For some reason I volunteered again, and upon touching my hand she said she felt a very deep connection to the sea and could tell I always wanted to explore the waters. I informed her that I was seasick and hated the sea, and she backtracked and said that her powers couldn't account for abnormalities like that. I don't know what my brother saw in her to be honest, but he was happy with her and that's all I cared about. I saw that she made him smile, and so when he came to me asking whether or not I think she would make a good wife for him, I told him that although I find her a little strange, I can see that he is happy with her. And so they got engaged and got married a while later. It was at their wedding preparations that I saw just how bananas my sister-in-law could actually be. Before this I thought she was just a little rude and a bit of a loony, but she turned out to have anger issues too. She was a total bridezilla, expecting her bridesmaids to do all the work and even going as far as cutting contact with her own mother when she was told by her that her mother was in no financial position to fully finance the wedding. The wedding itself wasn't a total nightmare, but she did get too drunk and spill wine on herself and kicked everyone out in a fit of rage calling the wedding to come to an end way too early. I kind of had a feeling that their marriage was somewhat doomed to fail to be completely honest. My brother is a very level-headed person who is blunt and honest, and she was a psychic loony with anger issues. Apparently their honeymoon was a disaster too as she ended up assaulting a security guard of a club when he denied her entry because she was too drunk. They were married for just six months when I got a call from my brother in the hospital. He said he was badly injured and wanted me to come ASAP. When I rushed over he told me a story which just made my blood boil. I suppose my brother is somewhat of an idiot for this, but in no way was her reaction justified. My brother told me that he and my sister-in-law had just come back from a restaurant and my sister-in-law held his hand and told him his energetic vibration was a lot weaker than it usually is, which meant something was wrong. My brother told me he was being truthful when he said he was totally okay, but she wouldn't let it go. She kept nagging him about the vibration she felt as she knew something was wrong. My brother then decided to turn this into a joke. He sat down and channeled his inner Christian Bale and in the most serious voice said, to be honest. I think we need to take a break, he proceeded to go over to the cabinet of snacks and then look through it, then added the comment, but unfortunately, we don't have any Kit Kats. He laughed to himself but my sister-in-law found this far from funny. She was a little tipsy and as you have seen being under the influence makes her violent. According to my brother he couldn't even have time to register what was happening before she picked up the plate which was on the table and thumped it over his head, smashing it and making him pour red. She kept laying into him after he fell, yelling that he was an eye-hole for making a joke like that and make her believe that he was breaking up with her. She ended up leaving him with a broken rib, a broken nose, an injured skull which started leaking red so severely he was close enough to death, as well as a dislocated shoulder. My brother is now recovering and will thankfully be okay, but according to him he doesn't want to press charges. What's worse is he is willing to forgive her as he thinks he brought it upon himself by making a joke like that while knowing what she's like when she's had to drink. No amount of talking to him about it will make him realize he needs to charge the speech ASAP. Update my crazy sister-in-law brutally injured and almost unalived her husband because of a joke that he made on trying to convince him to press charges. So my brother has been discharged from the hospital and my sister-in-law did not visit him once the whole time he was there. This was the thing that ended up getting my brother to acknowledge the fact that she in fact did not care about him or love him as much as he thought she did. The sad reality was, and I explained this to my brother, she was a manipulative beach who used the fact that my brother had a lot of money to her advantage. 
I asked him to recall all the dates he went on with her and asked him if she had ever even offered to pay for anything. This was all stuff I had said to him in the past, but he never listened as he always believed that the man should pay and that was that. It was very hard on my brother and I was there for him during this time. Just a day after getting discharged he and I made a decision together to press charges on his wife, well soon to be ex-wife, and he will be filing for divorce without any questions. Not only that but we also decided to take to social media and make the events of this public. My brother said he had no problem with this at all and his was the least my sister-in-law deserved. Consequences both socially and legally. I remember that it was only when we put the post up that my sister-in-law contacted us, specifically me. The first thing she told me was not anything along the lines of asking how my brother was, but rather telling me to take the post down before she makes me. That was a conversation that ended really quickly as I informed her that my brother was going to be pressing charges on her and the only way she can contact him is through a lawyer. I then hung up and blocked her. My overprotective father ran onto the court in the middle of a game and started throwing hands with the other team because they committed a hard foul against me, so I started swinging too. My dad can be really overprotective at times, and that combined with his anger issues makes him a walking threat who even looks at me the wrong way. He is ex-military so he is fully capable of causing some serious damage too. Not only is he proficient with his fists, he is verbally skilled too, as I have seen him lay into his 34-year-old brother-in-law so aggressively with words only, that the brother-in-law cried. As far as being protective of me goes, he has done some crazy things. I remember being a sophomore in high school and getting bullied by some seniors. I told my dad and I kid you not, the very next day my dad pulled up to school during break time, walked past the teachers who were asking him where he was going and proceeded to get in my bully's face and also make him cry, once again using only words. On my 18th birthday he and I went to a bar to celebrate me being legally allowed to drink, and at the bar I was hit on by a gay guy. I informed him I'm not interested, but instead of turning back the guy kept persisting. My dad decided to turn around and call him the F slur before telling him to back off. The guy decided it was a good idea to slap my dad, which resulted in my dad not only delivering a slap which made him go limp, but also dragging his half-conscious body to the bar and forcing the guy to incoherently buy my dad and I a drink. Surprisingly, he has never gotten in trouble with law enforcement for this kind of behavior either. So I'm currently in junior college and last week we had a game against a rival school, our games usually get pretty heated and chippy. The last time we played them one of their players left with a broken nose after the guy with anger issues on our team headbutted him. Anyway, this game was a really close one, and in the fourth quarter we were up two with around five minutes left. The whole game had been pretty scrappy, and I could see my dad was red in the face with how annoyed he was with the aggression displayed by the other team. At one point I went up for a layup and instead of trying to stop the shot, the other team's player jumped and literally shoved me mid-air causing me to land on my shoulder very badly. I was on the floor writhing in pain when I heard commotion. I looked up to see my dad literally running onto the court and rugby tackling the player who committed the foul. The whole other team swarmed him trying to get him off, but like the Hulk, my dad started tossing all of these dudes. Hands started getting thrown quickly by everyone quickly. It was a full-out brawl, with both benches of the team standing up and running over to throw hands. I wasn't going to be the odd man out of course, and so I stood up and with my bandy shoulder, started clobbering away too. It took about three minutes of full-on fighting with other parents now involved too for us to separate, and we could see that one of the parents on the other team was lying unconscious. Who knocked him out you may ask? Well my dad of course. He's now facing charges sadly, but he has some connections due to his day in the army and doesn't seem worried about it in the slightest. Won two tickets to the Super Bowl and chose to take my brother with me. My girlfriend is furious I'm not going with her even though she doesn't even like football, plus update. A couple of days ago I won a trivia contest that gave me an all-expense paid trip for two to the Super Bowl. As you could imagine I was so excited, but it's gotten to the point where I wish there was a way I could sell the package and forget about it. My brother and I were together and decided to try for tickets from this local contest. I was the official contestant, but I actually ended up getting the answer I needed to win from my brother. From that point, I never even thought about who to take. Since it was something we both did and he ended up actually giving me the answer, of course he was gonna go. Plus he was a die-hard football fan. I excitedly told my girlfriend who didn't even know I was competing that I won tickets and I was going with my brother. She then got very upset that I am not taking her. The thing is, she doesn't even like football. She has no interest in watching games or learning about it. She was nagging me about it so much that my brother said he would understand if I took her and saw the problem that this is causing for me and offered his ticket to her. I didn't even tell her that he made this offer because I don't think that's the point. I think she's being selfish and putting a damper on the entire experience. I told her all this but she is not backing down and said that if you win a trip for two, it should automatically go to your significant other. Maybe that's true if it were on a romantic getaway or cruise, but this is something my brother and I did together and he's the reason I won. I think she is being selfish and she thinks I am being inconsiderate of her. Update, I had tried talking to my girlfriend and she was still clearly upset. I approached the conversation as many people said keeping an understanding that she was more disappointed than controlling and would come around. Unfortunately she was being unreasonable. She said I could go but that doing so would hurt her a great deal and that she would need some time to reevaluate things. I should have just ended things with her there but I was so sick of these tickets by this point that I didn't even have the heart to go even if I did decide to end things with her. I called up the radio station and asked if it was at all possible to transfer the tickets to my brother so he could go with his wife. 
they were totally understanding and awesome about it and said they were sorry I couldn't go but they were glad to put the tickets in my brother's name for me. I was just glad to have it behind me at that point. I told my girlfriend what I did and that I was staying here and she said that I was being dramatic and immature, she said that I transferred the tickets to my brother just so I could win the argument and look like a martyr. It was at this point I reached my breaking point. I calmly told her this relationship was over. I wasn't even mad at this point, just confused that a person I thought I knew could act this way. She said she was gonna break up with me because of the way I handled this anyway so breaking up with her didn't matter. My brother immediately told me I dodged a bullet and glad that she was out of everyone's lives. My brother's wife was totally cool about me using her ticket and didn't even question it even after I'm technically taking back my gift to her. They insisted that I go with my brother and it was their idea. So now I'm the guest of my original tickets that I won. Happy to say I arrived in the city a few days ago and I'm having the time of my life. My girlfriend didn't unfollow me on social media and I'm posting as many pictures as I possibly can. My neglectful husband decided it was more important to visit his girl best friend's brother in the hospital than be with me while I gave birth to our child, I'm now being called cruel for my response. My husband has a girl best friend named Anna. They've been friends for a long time and dated years ago in high school and were FWB in college. I've had no problem with their relationship however. Until now that is. Anna was always kind to me. However, on the day that I gave birth to my husband and I's second child, Anna's brother got into a car accident. My husband got a call from her in the middle of the night and asked him if he could drop her at the hospital her brother was at, an hour away from us, since she was too scared to drive. My husband agreed, told me quickly while I was half asleep and rushed out. A few hours later, I had contractions and called my husband. He didn't pick up after multiple attempts to call him so I gave up and called my dad, who drove me to the local hospital. I was so scared of giving birth alone since I've had three miscarriages and one stillborn. My husband texted me promising me that no matter what, he'd be there for me. Guess what? He wasn't. We called multiple times while I was in labor and when he finally picked up my dad's call when I was giving birth, saying that he'd misplaced his phone in the chaos, my dad informed him that no matter how fast he drives anymore, he's going to miss the birth of his child. Well, my husband took that as he's already screwed up, so it doesn't matter when he shows up at this point so when he finally came, our daughter was about 5 hours old and I'd already moved to the maternity ward. When he came, I refused to let him see our baby because I was so high on emotions and was shaking when I saw him and didn't want it to negatively affect my time with the baby. I wanted her birth to be a happy time and I was already struggling to feed her. My husband was in a bad state and told me to please let him see her. So I told him to stand by the window and I held the baby up so he could see her. I told him to then leave and he'll be allowed to interact with the baby at my father's home when we're both well and out of the hospital and that I was most likely divorcing him. I explained to him why I felt so hurt. I told him that Anna's brother was not in the life or death situation. He had injuries, but most were concentrated on his legs and arm. He did not even have a concussion. Anna was there along with both her parents who managed all the hospital stuff. My husband was there as emotional support for Anna. On top of that, after he learned I was giving birth, they already knew that Anna's brother was going to be alright. He spent that time making sure that Anna was okay and feeding her because she refused to eat. After being told all of this, he started bawling and apologizing and defended himself by saying that Anna's brother was in serious critical condition and although he's fine, Anna needed him. Also as a side note, we both knew the baby was due any time now so I don't understand why my husband didn't have his phone on him. Anyway, I told him that I didn't care and that his daughter had already come second to him and all she did was be born. I'm putting my daughters and my health first and won't let her be sidelined. My husband agreed and left. However, Anna called me later and said that I was being controlling and she'd never met someone as cruel as me for not letting a father see his baby. I told her that my husband made his decision and that this was his doing not mine. But now, I can't help but feel cruel in my actions and feel like I'm depriving my baby of both her parents being together. My wife cheated on me but thinks it doesn't count because she did it before we got married. Two weeks ago my wife's sister got married and my wife was at the wedding party. She spent the two weeks prior to the wedding helping her sister get everything ready. I showed up Saturday morning a few hours before the ceremony in hopes of stealing just a few minutes to see my wife. She sees me outside of her parents' house and sends her brother out to tell me that she will come out and see me in the car. She finally comes out and sits in the seat next to me and gives me a kiss, but instead of acting happy to see me, she tells me that she has to talk to me and she doesn't want it to ruin her sister's day. She informs me that at the reception I might hear some things about the best man and her and she didn't want it to be awkward or weird. I just kind of sat there stunned. She said that about four years ago she had a fling with him and that it didn't mean anything but she was aware that by nature I'm somewhat jealous and she wanted me to know in advance so that if I heard something that I wouldn't be surprised. Four years ago we had been dating for a year. I just kind of sat there, this was not how I thought my morning would go but I told her I appreciated knowing it and that it certainly wasn't a big deal now. She went back in the house and I went to eat lunch and decided to meet her at the church. As I'm eating and reading my phone it dawns on me, she cheated. My first reaction was to blow it off and think that she just told me the wrong time but the more I thought about it the more I started to remember about a year and a half of us being together she had a phase where she was really sketchy about her behavior, wasn't available when she normally was and went on two weekend camping trips that were with friends from work. I go to the wedding and sit there watching everything. After the wedding they have a line that you walk by and congratulate the bride and groom and the wedding. Party is standing in line as well. 
my wife was standing with some other guy, but the best man was there and I just went down the line and acted like it was no big deal. I get to the reception and she sits with me. I decided not to say anything as I didn't want to distract from the day. But instead of just letting it go she then tells me that each of the groomsmen and bridesmaids are going to dance and that she is going to be dancing with him. I ask why when she was not his partner for the party and she said that the maid of honor and her partner were actually married and wanted to dance with each other. At this point I'm a little more than perturbed but I try and not let it show. She talks to everyone around her and then the dance comes and he comes over and extends his arm and she gets up. I try not to watch and in fact I make it a point not to. She comes back with him in tow and they are joking like the best of friends. She decides that it would be a good idea to introduce us. The more they sat and talked and reminisced about old times and places the matter I got. Eventually I got up and went to the bathroom and when I came back he was gone. She decided to tell me that she thought I was rude which was not what I was all about hearing at the moment. I told her that this wasn't the time or place to talk about it but rest assured we would talk later. She sat there and then said that she was going to change clothes and as soon as she got back she was telling her sister that we were leaving because I had ruined her day but she didn't want me to ruin her sister's day as well. I told her that I was perfectly capable of not being a bother to her or her sister the rest of the day and that I did not want to be the cause of any drama so I would prefer to just stay. She went and changed clothes and then came back all in a huff. I have not said a word to her, I even shook the other guy's hand. I guess I just looked miserable so that is what she was basing this off of. She. At first said that we should stay but then said if I couldn't act any better I should leave. I asked how I was acting and she said it was obvious I was trying to be like a silverback gorilla wanting to fight. I didn't know whether to laugh in her face or be offended. I went back in and sat down while she mingled with the other guest. I talked with her brother for a while but then ultimately ended up back at our table talking with her grandma. We left at the same time and I arrived home just before she did. I was sitting in the living room waiting for her when she came in and did not beat around the bush. I simply asked her to retell me the story about this other guy and she said it word for word like before. After sitting and looking at her for a time I just said are you sure about the time frame and she said she was. I then reminded her that we had been together for 5 years so this fling was well over a year into our being together. Instead of being flustered or denying or anything she simply said, I know. So I asked her to explain and she tells me that they worked together and that it was just a physical thing and she felt like we weren't in a great place at the time and that she never had any feelings for him and never had any real intentions of leaving me, she just was having some fun for a few weekends. She said that it was probably a mistake on her part to tell me now but she didn't want me to get blindsided. I did not take this the way she thought I would I guess. We had a very large argument and ended when she told me I was being a child about all of this. That we were married and this happened way before that and our life together now has nothing to do with him or that time. I told her I needed time to think and she told me there was nothing to think about. We loved each other and this didn't change anything. That was two weeks ago and I still am not over it. She has been trying the past few days to get me to talk to her but I admit that for. Whatever reason I'm not viewing her the same as I did before this. Date my wife cheated on me but thinks it doesn't count because she did it before we got married. My wife finally came to the realization that I was not going to just get over this, which then brought her to the realization that I might want out of the marriage. This then brought on a near nervous breakdown from her. I thought she was having crocodile tears. But it soon became apparent to me that she wasn't acting or faking, she was having a legitimate panic attack. This led to an ER visit and that led to an overnight stay in the hospital and then to new medications and a scheduled follow-up with her doctor for later next week. This brought her family into it and that in turn led to long conversations all the way around. When we got home I asked what she wanted to do since there was a house full of people and she said she wanted to be with her mom for a while. That was fine with me as I had no desire to hang around all day with her dad or sister so I said I was going to finish up something at work and would be home later. Two hours after I get there I get a text from her begging me to please come home and that she really needs me to talk with her. When home, I was greeted on my own front porch by her dad who asks if he can talk to me for a minute. My anger level was already somewhat high but I was ready to go to war if she had dumped a sack of lies on me with her dad. We sat on our deck chairs and he floored me with his opening salvo. I was expecting to hear anything but what he said. He said that she told them what had happened and that he wanted to apologize to me because he said that he felt like he did a really bad job as a parent and that this mindset that she had was really a creation of her mother's and that while he loved both of them he said they were wrong and he had told his wife years ago that telling the girls that whatever happens before marriage doesn't count was a horrible idea and value system to install in them. He then said that he wasn't there to stand up for what his daughter did but he just wanted me to be aware that what she was saying and how she was acting was simply because she honestly believed that being married was an entirely different life and that they had romanticized marriage to the point that she wasn't understanding real life. We shook hands and he said that no matter what I decided he still thought very highly of me, which honestly made me feel really good for that moment. I then went inside and my wife was curled up in a ball on her mom's lap and you can tell she has been crying the entire time I've been gone. Mom gets up and comes and hugs me and tells me she is sorry and that she loves me and she is praying that we can work this out. My wife is laid out on the couch at this point. Her mom and dad leave and she sits there looking at me and crying. I went to her and we hugged for a long time with her telling me over and over how sorry she was. After a while when she calmed down I asked her what she wanted. She said she wanted to get everything out in the open so I didn't feel like I was being lied to or manipulated. So she wanted me to ask her questions about the affair. First I asked for dates and she remembered exactly when they occurred. Fortunately this happened a little earlier in our relationship than she told me initially and so we were not engaged when this happened. Second I asked how many times. She decided to go overboard with the explanation and recalled each time they slept in detail. This part of the conversation did not help me at all and in fact almost broke me down. Then came the hard part. Why did she do it? I could not ask this without starting to cry. I asked why wasn't I good enough. 
It was her turn to hold me because at this point everything came rushing at me. Her telling me, me having to watch them laugh with each other, her now telling me how many times they did it and where they did it. After a while of crying in her arms I composed myself. I simply told her that the betrayal was horrible but honestly her response to me when I found out was just as bad if not worse. She agreed with me and she apologized for calling me immature. She said that she honestly believed that it wouldn't matter to me now because we were married. I started to say something about it but she jumped in and said that after talking with her parents she now sees that this was very wrong of her and that cheating is cheating, but she still feels like that our happiness that we have shared since being married should count for something. I then replied that I kind of felt like that happiness was built on a lie. Day 2, my wife cheated on me but thinks it doesn't count because she did it before we got married. Last night I got home from work. We started talking at 6 p.m. and finally ended around 2 a.m. In that time frame we laid out a lot of issues that have been present and what or if we are both willing to do to move forward. Starting today I am living with my brother for the next while. She is understandably upset by all of this and I am making an effort to communicate openly with her so she does not feel abandoned or neglected. I laid out the fact that while I absolutely was upset about the cheating and yes I still consider it cheating, I was equally upset by her lack of consideration for my feelings on this. I told her that I resented being told I was immature and a child for something that objectively speaking I had every right to be upset about. Her response was to apologize and tell me she was in the wrong and that while she admits fault and sees what I'm saying that at the time she had convinced herself that because we were married that I was wrong to be upset about something that happened beforehand. Now she sees where this is wrong. I then told her that I felt very disrespected by her associating with this guy right in front of me and that I felt humiliated having to shake his hand. Her response was to once again apologize and she said that in her mind at the time she felt like she was trying to show me that there was nothing there. She said she felt like if she avoided him or acted shady around him that I would be more upset. She said that out of all of the things this is the one that has hit her the most in the face because even her sister has told her how poor this was for her to do to me and she was deeply hurt by this because it had hurt me which she never wanted to do. I then talked about her lack of remorse over being with someone else while we were together. Her only response was to say that she was very sorry, how that at the time she just used very poor judgment and if she could go back and change the past she would. Then came the talk that got the most discussion. How I felt like she really wasn't sorry for anything but that she was just sorry that I didn't just shrug my shoulders and say that everything was going to be okay. That there were going to be repercussions for what I consider to be an act of betrayal and then an act of not caring about me. She admitted that when we got home after the event she started to realize that I wasn't going to let this go and then as time went on she knew that this was an issue. Her first instinct was to be mad at me for being mad at her. But then realized even from her own point of view how stupid that was. But again she had it beat into her head that she was my wife and that I should easily forgive and forget something that happened way before we were married. She also admitted that when it became real she frankly outright panicked thinking about losing her marriage. Nobody on either side of her family is divorced so she could be the first and she admitted to that being a big factor in her panic attack. But as the week has progressed and she has spoken more to her family she is seeing that what she has put in her mind about marriage isn't the end all be all she thought it was. She also did really feel bad about bringing the guy around to me. However you will notice which I did too that she never said she felt guilty about being with him. I have set out the following steps if we are to reconcile and it is totally up to her if she wants to stay together. I don't care how illogical it seems she is to never have contact with him again. This is an absolute for me and a deal breaker and I was absolutely clear on this. We have to have couples therapy. While I am living with my brother we are still legally married and this is not an invitation or excuse for either of us to see anyone else. Again deal breaker in a second if either of us uses this as an excuse. We start over. To a point. I have to view her differently now, even if I didn't want to. I can't just forget that she chose to cheat. So that's where we are now. We are going out on a date Friday night, which she is really looking forward to. I have no idea how long I will be with my brother, hell I may not make it past Friday, but if nothing else I feel like I have some control here which I felt prior to the talk I had almost none. In the end I held her for a long time and we slept together. I do not want a broken woman. I want her to be my partner for life but I do. Date 3, my wife cheated on me but thinks it doesn't count because she did it before we got married. I've been staying with my brother for a little over a month. I have also delivered her with divorce papers. I went to a divorce lawyer and explained everything including the fact that I did not want to go through with the divorce but wanted everything in place just in case. He drew up a divorce decree and made three copies. One he kept on file, one for her and one for me. I decided to take the paperwork to her myself because I knew she would be upset and I wanted to explain to her what was happening. I gave her the paperwork in a manila envelope and explained what it was before she opened it. I also made it very clear to her that I was not going to do anything with it unless we both failed to meet the conditions we both agreed upon. I explained that I was committed to us but I really needed to see that we were headed in the right direction and that this was only there as a standby in case she didn't think I was serious. Well this did not go over as well as I had hoped and in retrospect this was a mistake on my part. She had been doing everything in her power prior to that to live up to the agreement, we had been out on several dates prior to this that were great for both of us. This led to another giant anxiety attack that we could not get under control with her meds so off to the ER. We went again. This time they gave her a shot and sent her home and we both agreed that we would keep her family out of it this time. I stayed with her for two days just to make sure she was okay. This of course came up in our counseling session and I came across looking like a manipulative a-hole. I ended up taking my copy and her copy and tearing it up in front of her. She doesn't know there is a third copy but I plan on having him discard that as well. So now I pretty much feel like a monster because the look on her face when she got the divorce papers was something I never want to see again. She was so happy to see me that day and then I gave her that and then an instant combination of sadness and terror. 
Other than that bump in the road things have actually been going very well. Well enough in fact that I am moving back home this weekend. Publicly humiliated my best friend and my wife for having an affair. My best friend Buttface and his wife Sarah have been like family to my wife and I for several years, practically ever since we moved in across the street from them. We were one big family unit. I truly saw Buttface as a brother, and my wife and Sarah were very close too. Five months ago, I was completely blindsided by the discovery of an affair between my wife and Buttface. My wife had left her email open on our computer, and I saw an email from her to her longtime therapist saying that Buttface would be joining her at an upcoming session again. My mind started racing, why in the world would Buttface be going to her therapy sessions without my knowledge? I did a search and found some other emails to and from the therapist proving that Buttface had been going to sessions together with her for about six weeks. I checked our mobile phone account and discovered that, since late summer, they had been exchanging hundreds of texts every day, peaking at nearly 500 per day by the holidays. My wife and I hosted both of our families for both Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner, and Buttface and Sarah joined us either for dinner or after dinner on both holidays. Text records show that the entire time that they were at our house celebrating with our families, my wife and Buttface were texting each other across the room. They were doing that pretty much every time the four of us hung out, for months. I confronted my wife with the evidence and she admitted that yes, she and Buttface had fallen in love. It just happened. I don't know how. But I love him and I just don't feel anything for you anymore, I'm sorry, she said. They had gone on a school district trip together, something had happened in her hotel room, and things had moved quickly from there. She explained, as I lay face down on the couch, unable to look at her, that they had already made plans to move out and divorce me and Sarah, and while they didn't plan to move in together immediately because of the kids, they'd probably do so eventually. The meetings with the therapist were supposedly mostly for the purpose of finding a way to break this to me and Sarah as gently as possible, because they were so very concerned for our well-being. My wife moved out two months ago. I was, and still am, utterly destroyed. I cry every day. So a couple of years ago, Buttface ran for a board of education seat as a pretty extreme underdog. I helped him with his campaign materials and debate prep, and my wife, a well-known school district employee, got the word out as best she could. Much to our surprise, he actually won in a squeaker, by just a few dozen votes. Being on the board became the center of Buttface's world. He joined every committee that he could. This turned into the foundation of his affair with my wife, as they were constantly going to school events and meetings together on evenings and weekends. Once I discovered the affair, my thoughts turned pretty quickly to revenge, and it occurred to me that an extramarital affair between a member of the Board of Education and an employee of the school district was at least bad politics and possibly violated district policy. Making things far worse for them was that my wife was in the running for an open administrative position, and everyone knew that she was more or less guaranteed the job and the major pay raise that came with it. She had just finished her master's degree in school administration, at the urging of her principal and the superintendent, so that she could be promoted to this specific position. I had plenty of evidence of the affair, texts from both of them admitting to it, text records showing that they were texting hundreds of times a day, emails to and from the therapist. I considered simply emailing all of the evidence to the board and the superintendent, but felt like the grieving and betrayed spouse might not be seen as a credible source. So, instead, I invented a fictitious furious friend who was planning on showing up to the next board meeting and publicly shaming the two of them for their affair. I told my wife that I'd tried to talk this person down but couldn't guarantee that they wouldn't show up and humiliate them publicly. As I expected, this led Buttface to conclude that the only option was for him to preemptively admit the affair to the board. The superintendent subsequently recommended that Buttface resign, which he did. Sarah said that he was utterly humiliated and crushed, and barely got out of bed for a few days afterward. Once word of the affair and Buttface's resignation started getting around, the superintendent contacted my wife and tearfully informed her that it was no longer politically appropriate for her to be promoted to an administrative position within the district. The position that had been lined up for her was later filled by an outside candidate. This sent waves of confusion and rumors throughout the district, as it was pretty well known that my wife was getting the job. The day after she was informed that she wasn't getting the promotion, my wife and I, despite our crumbling marriage, took our son out to breakfast together on his birthday, and a parent stopped by our table to congratulate her on her new role. She said, thanks, then excused herself to go cry in the bathroom for a while. I let the dust settle for a couple of weeks, and then, right before my wife moved out, let them in on my little secret, there was never a furious friend threatening to expose them in the first place. Just me. Word of all of this has gotten around our fairly small town, which Buttface grew up in and my wife has worked in for nearly 20 years. My wife refuses to talk to me about how things are at work now, but I've heard from some people I know in the district that her formerly spotless reputation has taken a major hit. Buttface, formerly a gregarious social presence in our neighborhood and at events and pubs in town, has completely gone underground and barely emerges to mow his lawn. He's moving out soon, to a crappy little townhouse which is all he can afford due to all the child support he's going to have to pay his wife. My wife and Buttface claim that they plan on trying to make things work together, despite all the public humiliation. My disgusting wife has taught our kids that it's okay to use their hands when eating, I blew up at her and she now says I offended her. Recently, I noticed that my fiancé Lola has been teaching our kids awful table manners and sees nothing wrong with it. I hadn't noticed this before as I didn't care much about spending time with them while they were eating actual meals as I preferred to order takeout or something, but this morning I was helping Lola make breakfast and noticed something truly disturbing. I was getting the kids ready for school while Lola brought their breakfast out for them. As they were getting ready to eat, I noticed they didn't have forks slash spoons so I told Lola I would get them, and she said there was no need. I watched instead and she gave the kids tortillas and wraps. 
she was fully okay with our kids and using their bare hands to grab the tortillas using their bare hands. I asked her what the F she was doing and that she should be giving them utensils, but she seemed shocked that I swore in front of the kids then said that's how they always eat it. I dragged her upstairs and gave out to her that she was teaching them bad manners and making them think it was okay to just grab food with their hands. She told me they do that anyway when they have chips or grapes or tacos and pizza and listed a bunch of other snacks and fast food you eat without utensils. I told her that those things are supposed to be eaten with utensils anyway and that humans are not animals. I told her that I find her way of eating pizza or tortillas gross, and reminded her of the time we watched the movie where people were eating with their bare hands. I called the characters weird and poor and told my wife she knows that eating with her hands freaks me out. She said I was being offensive by calling her way of eating gross and saying it was having bad manners, but I do think it's gross to see someone grabbing at food with their bare hands like that. She said she grew up eating like that and always made the kids wash their hands before they ate. I ended up giving my kids forks for them to eat which they didn't want to use, which made me even more frustrated with her because now they're used to this. Date my disgusting wife has taught our kids that it's okay to use their hands when eating, I blew up at her and she now says I offended her. I reflected after posting and came to the conclusion that I was wrong. I apologized to her for blowing up at her the way I did and she seemed to accept my apology. I thought things were back to normal after all of that, I did apologize after all so what else could the problem be? She did seem to be her normal self again and we didn't argue slash disagree about the topic of food anymore. In fact, we hadn't had even a minor disagreement for months after that. I thought we were happy as things seemed okay. The only thing was that she refused to eat in front of me, but I put that down to her being self-conscious of something. Well, we were originally planning to get married last year but she ended up changing her mind and saying she wanted to push back the wedding a bit. I was a bit confused and she wouldn't really elaborate on why she wanted this, she just said it was stressful to plan a wedding with toddlers and she needed some time so I agreed. Well, she just dropped a bomb on me out of nowhere a few days ago when she randomly stated that she doesn't think she wants to get married anymore. This was heartbreaking to hear of course, and I asked that we sit and talk it out. She ended up telling me that she doesn't think we are compatible, after 7 years? And that she thinks we should go our own ways and co-parent. I'm devastated. I pressed for more information, like what made you realize this? And why now? And she basically said that she felt like I didn't really know her and that I didn't want to know her. I thought this was ridiculous. I know everything about her. I know her favorite color, movie and song, I know her favorite food. I can read her body language kinda well. I do know her, we've been together for years. She said a few more things which I wasn't too focused on and apparently, she's been thinking over our relationship since that fight happened a year ago. She said it was eye-opening for her. She went on a whole irrelevant spiel about all these things she had realized about me, such as my anger issues or controlling behavior, and how she didn't think we should be together anymore. I don't even know what she means. I think I zoned out for most of her rant because I was so blindsided and hurt by this that I was trying not to break down in tears. I offered to go to couples counseling and individual counseling but she said it was too late and that I should have done that slash offer that a year ago when this all blew up. All of this just because I didn't think of therapy after a minor disagreement a year ago I'm no longer someone she wants to marry? That's insane. Date 2, my disgusting wife has taught our kids that it's okay to use their hands when eating, I blew up at her and she now says I offended her. First of all, we have broken up. She gave me back the ring even though I said she didn't have to and she could pawn it and keep the money. She didn't want to do that and gave it back to me. I think I will pawn it myself and give her the money since she has moved out of the house. She moved in with her brother and his partner, who was actually able to get her a job where he works and she is apparently starting next week. We will split our time with the kids since she said she was able to get shifts that align with my schedule so we will trade off the kids when each of us is at work and we are going to split the weekends. We are going to get a custody agreement but we talked about it and agreed to 50-50 and we are both going to be cooperative as I don't want to stress her out and I do want to see my kids. I will also be brushing up on Mexican culture so that I am able to participate in things with my children and I am looking to take some Spanish classes as well so I can communicate with them in both languages as I never bothered to learn my wife's native tongue. Two days ago, said she wanted to talk and asked me if I was serious when I claimed that I thought she wanted to break up because of the one fight about the food. I said yes, because I was serious and did think that, and she said she couldn't believe me. I asked her to elaborate and she got very mad and asked me if I was really so oblivious to my own actions. I realized that I probably have been oblivious to my own actions, and that I've been selfish and she kind blew up and said something and asked me if I needed a effing list so I could see all of the poop I've been doing. I told her I would appreciate it if she could communicate some of the issues, and there was no need for a list but she said that a list would probably lessen the chances of me losing focus. While she went on a rant. We ended up having a long talk about it and she gave me this list, when one of her nieces had a quinceanera, I kept calling it a sweet 16. She said she explained to me multiple times that they were different, had different meanings, different cultural significance, and had different practices. She said I still called it a sweet 16 when I would talk to people about it or mention it. She said I also embarrassed her at the party because she felt that I was making fun of how her relatives were dancing. I, to this day, sometimes call her Spanish instead of Hispanic slash Latina slash Mexican. She said there is a big difference in me slipping up and forgetting his bullcrap. When she was pregnant with the twins, I told her she could give them names that are pronounced in Spanish so that her non-English speaking family could say them easily and also since they are half Mexican. We agreed that she could, so long as I could choose which name was final. She said that I have not held up my end of the deal, and that when we were at Christmas with her family in December, I obsessively corrected her family members when they pronounced our daughter's name. According to her, I did this more than six times that night and she stopped keeping count. I didn't let her feed our kids some Mexican stew she had made because it looked spicy, I genuinely thought it was. 
She said she told me she hadn't used spicy peppers, but that night I fed them something else before the soup was done and she said I disrespected her and her parenting skills. She feels like she is not allowed to listen to her music slash any Spanish music because I will complain or change the song. She said she can only listen to her music when I am not home, otherwise I will always change it within a few seconds. When I asked her why she stayed with me for so long or why she didn't mention these things more, she said that she's always had low self-esteem and she thought that I was a good person slash partner other than these things so she always talked herself out of a breakup, but she was just over it now. My controlling wife embarrassed my daughter at her sweet 16 and ruined the whole party by making her cry, so my daughter and I crashed my wife's birthday a month later. My wife and I got married around two years ago and there has been one thing and one thing only which I dislike about her, and that's how controlling she is towards my daughter. She is not her bio mother but likes to act like one, often asking my daughter to refer to her as her mother. In parent-teacher conferences she addresses herself as my daughter's mother too, and it's things like that which has made their relationship sour to say the least. They often fight a lot, and these fights stem from my wife trying to place illogical boundaries on my daughter. Just a few weeks ago they had a fight about the fact that my daughter bought a crop top, and my wife told her she was presenting herself in a ratchet way. You see, within the two years that we have all lived together, my wife has made it her mission to raise my daughter in a good Christian way, just like she was raised. My wife tried policing the clothes my daughter wears, the friends she hangs out with, and given that my daughter listens to metal music, my wife says that she has satanic tendencies. I have had many conversations about this topic with my wife, saying that I too listen to metal and you don't see me practicing Satanism, yet my wife insists this is different. I remember a couple of months ago my daughter went to a heavy metal concert with her friend and her friend's dad and they didn't come home until around 1am my wife came home from work around 8pm, and by that time my daughter had already gone. After I told my wife what my daughter was up to, she completely flipped out, saying that my daughter was going to get hurt and that this behavior was unacceptable and very much grounds for being grounded. I told my wife there was no way I was grounding my daughter over this and my word is final. My wife went quiet for a second, before. Taking her keys and spontaneously deciding to drive to the concert to try to retrieve my daughter, but she was denied entry when she didn't have a ticket. She tried to buy one on the spot but they were all sold out. When she came home she and I had a huge argument and I put my foot down, saying if she says anything to my daughter when she gets home, we will be over. This made her listen, and she grit her teeth but didn't say anything to my daughter the next day. She did tell her to shut up however when my daughter was telling me how much fun she had last night. My wife and I talked that night and I mentioned to her that I was done with her controlling my daughter, she is not her mother and if she keeps this up I will put an end to our marriage. She ended up promising me that she would never again try to pull any controlling stuff. This promise of hers actually lasted, and I was very surprised to see that she was indeed following through with her word. That was until my daughter started planning a pool party for her sweet 16. We have a pool out back and my daughter's birthday is in the middle of July, and it was projected to be extremely hot. I thought it was a fun idea. The only person who of course did not approve, was my wife. She tried to privately talk to me about how she thinks it's inappropriate for her and other girls her age to have a pool party and wear bikinis around grown people. I actually figured this to be a valid concern and told her that in that case we could make sure that no other parents are present. This was not enough for her however, as she later went behind my back and asked my daughter if she planned to invite any boys to her party. The thing is, my daughter actually had a crush on this guy in her class and planned to invite him, and when my wife found out about this she flipped out. Her and I had an argument one night about it, where she voiced her concerns about him being a creep who would definitely try rope someone. I told her she was completely out of line for this and if the first thing that she thought of when she pictured a 16-year-old boy was rope there was something seriously wrong with her. I gave her one final warning and told her to stay on the sidelines for both the planning and not to ruin the party when it does come. She agreed at the time, but in hindsight I should have been able to tell that her sure was just too sarcastic to fully believe. Anyway, when the party came around everyone was having fun, my daughter was indeed having a pool party, had invited other girls and boys from her class and I was taking care of food and drinks. I don't know what went through my wife's head, but when she saw that my daughter was sitting poolside with her crush, doing absolutely nothing but talking, she went completely irate. She stormed out and started yelling at the boy, calling him all sorts of names such as creep and weirdo very loudly. After ripping into the boy for a solid minute and a half for being a creep and getting close to her daughter without a shirt on, she turned her attention to my daughter and started berating her, asking her if she has no decency to be dressed like a WH who's asking for it. One of her friends told my wife to cut it out, and my wife flipped out at the friend too, telling her that she has no right to tell my wife what to do in her own home. My wife then kicked everyone out, leaving only my daughter who re-entered the house in tears. I was actually on the toilet for this whole encounter and this was told to me by my daughter. I went downstairs to find my daughter crying and my wife looking extremely angry while watching TV. I asked my daughter what happened and she asked if we could go upstairs. I was ashamed of my wife after I heard what my daughter had to say, and I knew I had to divorce this woman. I apologized over and over to my daughter and I decided to console her by suggesting something. My final act before divorcing my wife. Came one month later, and I would say it would classify as going out with a bang. My wife was having her 40th birthday party a month later in the house, and many of the friends she had over were friends from her church. My daughter and I came into the house midway through the party, with a speaker turned on full volume blaring the loudest heavy metal music possible, with our faces painted like members of our favorite bands. My wife tried to stop us, but after a couple of minutes of satanic music, every single one of the people at her party left. I filed for divorce the very next day. My self-conscious sister got called mediocre looking by our mother and is now hurting herself, my mother won't admit that what she did was wrong. My sister is 14 years old and very self-conscious of her looks. 
She has acne like any normal 14 year old and has a very normal body type, but she does have a pretty face and is overall a fairly attractive girl in the least weird way possible. However, like any chronically online 14 year old girl, she suffers from body dysmorphia and self consciousness due to the amount of social media influence or content she consumes, which crushes her self esteem. She looks at pictures of models in bikinis or professional photo shoots, then goes in the mirror to compare herself and pick her own appearance apart. It hurts me to see this as her older brother, and I try to explain to her that social media is all lies, that this is not how those models look all the time, but she refuses to listen to me. My mother also does a very poor job of helping my sister overcome her self esteem issues. She has made jokes to my sister about her acne, using the overused pepperoni pizza or connect the dots comments to get a laugh. This never got a laugh out of my sister though, it would only make her cry. I remember just last month my mother made a comment about my sister grabbing a second slice of cake at my birthday while knowing my sister deals with body image issues, and my sister has only worn oversized hoodies around her since then. I asked her to at least apologize to my sister, but she says she has nothing to apologize for. In my mother's words, if she thinks she's so fat, maybe she shouldn't grab a second slice of cake. I told my mother that her brutal honesty can hurt at times and it isn't the best way to go about helping people deal with issues. My mother ended up scoffing at telling me that people back in her day weren't as sensitive. I never mentioned this comment of hers to my sister of course. Instead I tried talking to my sister about why the comment made her so upset, and she said that it validated everything she felt. I suggested therapy or counseling for her, but she said she's not willing to go to it. However, after yesterday's events I think she's going to have too. Yesterday was a particularly bad body image day for my sister. She said she felt bloated and puffy, and that her acne had only gotten worse. She was feeling very down and decided that she would go to her mom and vent to her. I was in school at this time so she couldn't go to me. She ended up very honestly asking her mother what she thinks of her appearance. Whether or not she's actually pretty, fat, skinny, whatever it is. And so my mother decided it would be a good thing to once again be brutally honest as that's how things were back in the day. She went on to tell my sister, word for word, I think you're mediocre looking, your face isn't ugly but isn't special and to be honest you are a little chubby not gonna lie. My sister said that when she heard that she left the room and didn't say a word after. Once I found out I went to talk to my mother immediately about how wrong of her that was to say, but she once again stated, she wanted an honest answer and she got it. I told my mother that she was going to be the reason that our sister ends up with serious psychological issues and even eating disorders, but my mother stated that those aren't even real. I think my mother's words affected my sister much more than she realizes, as it's been over 24 hours since she spoke with her and my sister refuses to eat. I also noticed a scar on my sister's arm which seems to be very fresh and brand new. I have to get her help ASAP. I yelled at my pregnant sister-in-law, and told my husband to choose between me and her. I have been married to my husband for 8 years. Two months ago I had my third miscarriage at 31 weeks. About 4 months ago, my sister-in-law came crying at her doorstep telling us she's pregnant and her boyfriend didn't want anything to do with the pregnancy, and she had nowhere to go. My husband and I openly took her in. For the first few weeks, it was really hard for her. I sat with her for hours, holding her when she cried. It was really bonding for us. But it started going downhill. I take pride in my neat, clean home. My sister-in-law on the other hand did not. She would leave her clothes all around the house, leave her dirty dishes wherever, even went as far as leaving her intimacy toys on our living room table. I tried to talk to her directly before I talked to my husband, she immediately started crying and told me she would try to be cleaner. I hugged her, told her it was okay, but this is a clear boundary for me. She told me it wouldn't happen again. But it only got worse, she told me I was expected to do her laundry, dishes, and clean her room daily because she's the pregnant one. Well, I do understand how hard it is being pregnant, I just couldn't allow feeling like a maid in my own home. Not to mention my recent loss of my child. So, I told my husband, but what he told me shocked me. His exact words were honey, she's going through a lot right now, we really should be helping her out. Plus, it might make you feel better to take care of someone who's pregnant. I was angry to say the least. While I don't want to invalidate her pain, my husband and I were also going through our own problems. Either way, we moved on, I did my best to maintain work and the household chores. My husband works from 7am to 7pm so he isn't around to help much. I work full time from home so it's been super stressful. When I even try to ask for help from my sister-in-law, she always makes excuses. The one thing that pushed me over the edge was when I went out to buy my own food that I have actually enjoyed eating after my miscarriage. I wrote my name on it and directly asked my sister-in-law to not eat it. Well, I went to go to my fridge to get it and I saw she freaking ate it. I told my husband and of course he rubbed it into my face that she's pregnant, I need to be less selfish, and life is about sacrifices. I was so upset I told him I felt like he and her were horrible roommates. He didn't take that well. A little while later, my sister-in-law planned a random baby shower party at my house without even telling me. I personally didn't know if I could even be home when this was happening. I felt so hurt that she wouldn't talk to me knowing everything that has happened and that she would just invite random strangers into another person's home before asking. My husband urged me to go, telling me it would permanently affect mine and her relationship. So, I told him I'd go. About halfway through the party my husband and sister-in-law announced that they wanted to show the nursery to everyone. I was confused, nursery? She was staying that long? What room did she turn into a nursery? They told everyone to head upstairs, that's when it hit me. They were talking about my nursery, for my baby I had just lost. A wave of emotions hit me when I saw everyone in my baby's nursery telling her what a good job they did setting it up. My setup. For my baby, that my body failed to give me. 
I just lost it. I started sobbing, then that sadness turned into pure rage. I started yelling at my sister-in-law, telling her she's the foulest human for putting me through everything she has for the last few months. Making me feel like I was a maid, or an object for her convenience. Through choked up tears I turned to my husband whose jaw was on the floor. I turned my head to see his entire family just staring at me. I lost it again. Yelling, I looked at my sister-in-law telling her, how dare she? Use my nursery, for my baby, how dare she think she has the right? What she told me made me fall to my knees sobbing. It's not my fault you couldn't produce a child, why let this go to waste, you're so selfish. My husband tried to pick me up off the floor, but I yelled again, standing to my knees, which were now shaking. I told him to pick between me and her. He had a dumbfounded look on his face. I yelled again, pick, me or her. He couldn't even muster up anything to say. I just looked at him, pure butyral, I pushed past the crowd of family and ran straight out. Date I yelled at my pregnant sister-in-law, and told my husband to choose between me and her. After all of that, I sat on my bed, wiping my tears and telling myself I will not take this disrespect. I walked downstairs shutting my nursery door on the way, I was greeted with everyone comforting my sister-in-law. I kindly asked everyone besides my sister-in-law and husband to respectfully get the F out of my house. After all the dirty looks and shaming, it was just my husband, sister-in-law and myself. They sat themselves on the couch, not saying anything. I sat with them. The silence felt like forever, none of us had anything to say, I knew I'd have to start the conversation. I looked at my husband and said, did you decide? He looked at me just staring. I asked again in a firm tone this time. He ended up mumbling some sort of insult and I couldn't really make out what he said. Something with beach. I stood up and told them both to get out, then they wanted to talk. Telling me this is all a misunderstanding, they are sorry, blah blah blah. I grabbed a backpack from my shoe closet and told them to pack their stuff. My sister-in-law told me I couldn't just make her leave, and I was a horrible person. I laughed in her face and told her this is my house, and I can do whatever I wanted. My husband stood next to me and told her it was only for a little while. I turned to him and said, oh you too, get out. He got all mad and told me we were a married couple and that this isn't how marriage works. I told him, no it is not, marriage is where two people support each other, and not treat their wife like crap. They both ended up leaving after many insults towards me. Oh, but wait, it's not over. This morning as I was getting ready for a Zoom meeting with a few other co-workers, when my husband showed up. I let him in telling him to get whatever he needed and to go because I had to work. He started apologizing and telling me he wants to make it right. I told him I just needed time away from him. Then he threw this in my face, well it's not my fault you lost our children, maybe this would have never happened. My sister was right, you are selfish. I have never ever made my husband feel like he cannot grieve with me over this, never made him feel less than because of his pain. I turned around and slapped him in the face. I never condone violence, and I'm very upset I would ever do that to another human, but I just couldn't deal with this. He took a step back and then threw all of my makeup on the floor, but then he started breaking all of my decor in my bathroom. I yelled at him to stop and that I was sorry, but he just kept going. Even going as far as punching a hole in my bathroom wall. It was like I was seeing all of his bottled up emotions from our children's death come out. But he went too far when he tried to grab me and started yelling in my face. I kicked him off and told him to get the F out. He walked out of the bathroom, and I watched him break a few more items as he left. The second he left I had a panic attack, looking at the mess he made, to even just seeing how much he hid his pain. I called my mother and told her everything that has been happening. She told me she was on her way. The second she got here, I just broke down and she held me. Then she stood up and started taking pictures of everything he broke. I asked her what she was doing, and she turned to me and said we're suing this piece of crap. I honestly didn't even argue, I was so hurt by everything my husband did to me. My mom packed up my computer and I grabbed a few outfits. My mom and I drove to a hotel, and she insisted on staying with me, while I finished up work my mom called a locksmith and my attorney. I will be divorcing him as well. My husband's anger issues are affecting our kids more than I thought they would. My 11-year-old daughter's words broke my heart today. While teary-eyed, she asked, how can you still be in love with someone like that? Referring to her dad. Then she started crying. My son, nine, was sitting across from her and started crying too. This is right after my husband came out of the hallway looking and acting very angry with a wooden paddle and seeing the baby had changed the channel from the football game he was watching. My husband does have a slight temper. He has punched a hole through our bedroom door, replaced the door, and punched another hole. The kids saw this. I didn't realize how strongly the kids feel about his behavior. As far as tonight's episode goes, it didn't seem extreme to me. I understood he was stressed from work, our dog peeing and pooping everywhere, our AC being broken for a couple days, us suffering from heat, and so he used a wooden paddle on my daughter who was being way too loud playing video games in her room. When I told my husband the kids are scared of you, can you please apologize to them? He said good, mission accomplished. They should be scared of one of us. I don't know what to make of that. Was he being sarcastic or serious? This conversation happened while he was feeding the baby. The baby kicked his food and stuck his foot in the bowl. This caused my husband to slap the baby's leg. And it was a really hard slap. The baby started crying of course. My husband actually left fingerprints and the skin bruised. When my son saw that along with hearing him say good, he started crying. I asked my son if he wanted to write down what he was feeling since he wasn't able to voice it at the moment. 
He wrote down, he always hurts the baby and hurts the dog and hurts us and he never cares about us. He only cares about himself. I feel sad when I read that, I felt heartbroken for my son feeling this way, but also confused. I know my husband loves us, spends time with us, overall I thought he was a great dad. His anger has never been directed at us. He doesn't always hurt the baby, this was maybe the third time. Since I was a little confused I asked my son what he meant by doesn't care about us. My son said dad makes jokes when we feel sad or are hurt. I don't know what to do. My kids are wondering why I'm still with my husband. I feel like my head was buried in the sand. How did I not notice their feelings? I thought we have an amazing and loving family. I know my husband won't go to therapy because if I've ever mentioned it in the past, he's just rolled his eyes. I'm honestly scared of putting my kids in therapy because of what they'll say. There is no physical mistreatment in my eyes, but the way my son views it, it seems like it's very extreme. I was stabbed and now my soon-to-be ex-husband wants to cancel the divorce. My soon-to-be ex-husband and I had been married for 12 years. We got married at 22. About four months ago he asked me for a divorce after confessing to me that he was having an affair and that he was in love with his female best friend. I never liked her and have asked him to reduce the amount of time he spent with her, to stop going on one-on-one -on -one dinners with her, but he refused. At first I took it badly, and my husband actually asked to open the relationship so he could be with us both at the same time. It was when he asked me that, that I realized my marriage had died, and no amount of begging for him to change was ever going to make him take his actions back and love me again. I decided to start the divorce proceedings. However, his mother got sick at around that time. I had to take care of her at night since the lady is quite picky with other people. She always treated me badly and never welcomed me as the wife of her son, but I still took care of her. This delayed the divorce a bit, and in hindsight I guess they were using me as a nurse or babysitter. A month and a half ago I was walking to work. It was about 6 a.m. A man in an all-black outfit ran up to me, and stabbed me. He did it three times. Once in my stomach, and twice in my arms. I didn't have much with me, just my cell phone and about $10. He robbed the phone and $10. The area was secluded but I had the strength to yell for help and luckily a random man came across me. He gave me his phone and called the ambulance and my husband. I wanted my husband with me, regardless of anything. It's been a while and I'm now better. My husband now doesn't want a divorce. He says that this altercation opened his eyes and that he really can't imagine a life without me. It was going to be an uncontested divorce since this type of divorce is totally free in my country and I'm stingy enough to not want to pay a lawyer's fees, but now he doesn't want a divorce. I'm living with my mother and my soon-to-be ex-husband comes over every day to screw up my existence. What do I do? school teacher was a huge racist. So we rebelled. When we returned to school for the new school year it wasn't long until the gossip started to spread around school that there were a few new teachers. A French teacher, a science teacher, a history teacher and a maths teacher. It wasn't long before the gossip mill started focusing on the maths teacher, due to him being an entitled piece of crap. The gossip started out that he would expect 7th grade students to understand university level mathematics and would say that if you cannot understand that much at this age then you wouldn't get anywhere in life. Pretty soon, the gossip turned to the teacher being prejudiced. Sure, there was some prejudice in the school between students at the time, but that was mild compared to what this teacher started doing. During class registration, the teacher would skip asking if black kids were in class, or ask if the kid is there, look at the kid, then mark the kid absent. I even saw the teacher refuse entry to an Asian student and told her that she's not a student and that there's no point in him teaching her. Even other students that were not obviously of foreign descent were demeaned. Stuff like when a student would ask a question he would just sigh and tell him or her that there's no point in answering the question because they wouldn't learn anything from the answer. As the teacher started settling into his job, or lack of it, complaints rolled into the main office. However, nothing happened to discipline the teacher. Several students even said that when they went to the reception desk to hand in a complaints form, they watched as the receptionist would lay it onto a large pile of what looked like other complaints forms. There was the sound of a shredder going on in plain sight. After a month of complaints and nothing happening, the entire school population was getting fed up. Even the school bullies were shocked at what was happening and were siding with the other students. They even put a hold on bullying their victims. Then all of a sudden, the entire student population rallied. At first it was a boycott on going to this nightmare teacher's lessons. When the headmaster asked why students weren't going to his lessons and was told why, he wasn't phased. When nightmare teacher was asked why his students were not going to his lessons, his response was something along the lines of, they're just idiots that don't want to learn. No point trying to teach them. After another week of boycotting his lessons and nothing happening, the rest of the maths lessons started getting boycotted. This resulted in the other maths teachers asking the nightmare teacher to teach properly but were shrugged off, blaming the students again. After several more days, us students simply raided the nightmare teacher's classroom and moved chairs into other classes where we continued our education the best that we could. Then the nightmare teacher was assigned to patrol during break times. His entitlement and pure prejudice showed yet again. We had a fenced area which we called the tennis courts, but were basically a multi-purpose area for physics education. Well, if some students brought a ball so they could have a quick game of 5A side football and the teacher saw that certain students were playing, then he'd kick them off the courts with threats of detention, while saying that they're stealing British sport. Or when students were lined up for the cafeteria he would move foreign descents to the back of the lines and refuse entry to every student until they moved. Then all of a sudden, at the end of one day, there was a crowd in the staff car park. The next morning, the gossip about the nightmare teacher is that every tire on his car was deflated. 
not slashed, just at every tire let down. Must have taken him ages to pump them back up. However, this resulted in a report going around the school that the vandals will be caught and punished. However, how could they do that? Even though there were CCTV cameras watching the area, how can black and white video pick out certain students in a sea of 200 plus students in the exact same school uniform? Well, the nightmare teacher mainly accused foreign descents of doing that, but the student gossip quietly spread that it was actually the bullies that did it. None of the students were going to rat them out to the staff. Well, the teacher didn't slow down in blaming certain students and telling others that they're idiots that won't have a future. A few days later, there was a request going around quietly that students return to school for 6 p.m. for something fun. The day after, the nightmare teacher returned to his car, smiled when he saw that his tires were fine and climbed in. However, he struggled to start his car until there was a loud bang and the car revved up a storm. Several students laughed. Apparently, his exhaust got clogged but the clog didn't hold. Yet again, reports from the school said that the vandals will be punished. The nightmare teacher continued to blame certain students and demeaning others. By now, the local newspaper had been told about the nightmare teacher and when the newspaper came to learn more, the school told them that it's just students picking on a teacher that they don't like. So this only ended up with a half-paged article the following week saying just that. Nothing about what was actually going on. This angered the student population more. Then another request for a 6 p.m. meetup. The next day, nightmare teacher arrived at his car only to find that his tires had been let down again. But that wasn't the end of it. When he plugged his tire pump into the cigarette lighter in one of his tires, he found that the pump wouldn't turn on. He sat in the driver's seat and started screaming that his battery must be dead. That was only half of it. When he popped the hood, he screamed even more. Apparently every cable and half the pipes had been unplugged. Not only that, but the rubber timing belt had been cut. His exhaust was also well and truly clogged this time. This time the main office said that the entire school has detention and no one is going home for an hour after school every day unless the vandals come forward. Well, this didn't go down well. How can so few staff stop the entire student population of over 500 from mobbing out of entrances? Even closing gates wouldn't work as eventually there were threats of setting classrooms on fire, which would mean on health and safety grounds, they would be forced to evacuate the school. The following week, some people in suits arrived and an investigation started. First they interviewed the staff from top down. At first they were getting told that it's just students at fault, but as they moved down, the teachers started telling them what was happening. Then it was the students' turn to be interviewed. Well, they just entered random classes and asked the entire class questions. The following week, the nightmare teacher never returned. They couldn't get a replacement in time, so for the rest of the year, there was a substitute maths teacher. My extremely depressed daughter took her own life due to the bullying she faced in school, her bullies are now acting like they used to be best friends and it makes my blood boil. My daughter Jane was a loving and outgoing girl from a young age, and when my wife and I had her we were hopeful for the future. Little did we know that when Jane was just 11 years old her mother would be ripped from us by a drunk driver. This event was extremely hard for Jade and I and we moved across the country to a quiet area in an attempt to leave behind the immense grief that clung to us wherever we went. We tried therapy and doing everything we could, but life without Jane's mother was nowhere near as bright as it used to be and we grew used to the dark and gloomy days. It had been three years by this point and Jane was about to enter freshman year of high school and she asked me to move again. She confessed to me that she had started hurting herself and the environment we were in was suffocating her. Despite having secured a good job at this place, I dropped it and we ended up moving ASAP. The thing is, I truly never noticed just how depressed my daughter was until she reached sophomore year in high school. She had told me that she had stopped hurting herself, and she was overall pretty quiet and introverted, but whenever I checked up on her she was always able to fake a smile. I remember coming into her room one day to find her immersed in a video game with a smile on her face. Thinking about that hurts, was that smile just a lie? When sophomore year did come around I noticed some changes in Jane that were very concerning. She was already shy and introverted, but she now started rarely leaving her room and wearing large hoodies only almost as if to hide herself away from the world. She started losing weight rapidly too and the little life she had in her eyes turned into an empty void, it was like she was staring through me most of the time. I offered therapy and she said no, I offered a helping hand and she said no, everything I offered to do for her she refused, and then one day she finally broke down and admitted the truth. She had been getting bullied relentlessly in school by a group of girls. These kids were from more affluent families and were just beaches in general, so after finding out that Jane's mother was dead, they started teasing her about it. They also teased her about her body which explained the large hoodies and weight loss. I was furious when I heard this and I called the school who said they will look into it. Well, nothing was done and my daughter would come home still complaining. I remember totally losing it when my daughter came home with gum in her hair. I marched into the principal's office the next day and tore him a new one. The principal tried his best to calm me down but I was so furious I called him a selection of names and basically threatened to do something if this problem wasn't solved. Maybe I should not have done that, but what can you do when your daughter comes home with gum in her hair and the school doesn't care? The thing is, when it came to my daughter I never believed for a single second that she was capable of SSI knew she was depressed, but I didn't think she had plans to go through with it. I remember just a couple of days after speaking with the principal I went to wake my daughter up to actually tell her I had taken the day off work, she could take a day off school and we could spend the day having a daddy-daughter date. I was excited for it. But every ounce of excitement was stripped from me when I entered my daughter's room to find her on the floor, looking extremely pale with an empty bottle of meds beside her. I desperately tried to give her CPR, I called the ambulance and spent the whole time praying to whatever religious deity there is to get my daughter back. 
I remember she came back to life for a minute in the ambulance, and that one minute was the happiest moment of my life, but just as quickly as she came back, she was gone again, and that time broke me on a level I can't explain. It's hard to describe how something like this feels, arranging her funeral was the most painful thing I have ever done. What hurt almost as much was the fact that the school was having a memorial day for my daughter. It's as if they didn't fail to protect her, as if they ever gave a single F about her. Her bully stood at the podium and gave speeches about how close they used to be with my daughter. As if they were not the ones who caused her so much pain, as if they weren't the ones who put cigarettes out on her arm and verbally ridiculed her. I've been having extremely dark thoughts recently of what I should do, and every part of me wants to burn that school to the ground. Date my extremely depressed daughter took her own life due to the bullying she faced in school, her bullies are now acting like they used to be best friends and it makes my blood boil. The last little while has been extremely hard on me, and I had many nights where I got drunk and had to seriously fend off the thoughts of coming into that school with a full clip and unleashing chaos. I know that would have solved nothing and would have made me a piece of crap, but grief combined with desire for revenge combined with alcohol is a combination which can seriously make you do some crazy things. The principal had the audacity to reach out to me and act like he cared how I was. He asked me if I appreciated the memorial, and I told him he can stick his memorial in the darkest parts of his back door. I told him I found the memorial disgusting. The bullies which drove my daughter over the edge were the ones giving speeches about how kind she was, didn't he find that sick? I have decided to move out of this town since, out of the US as a whole. I now reside in Europe as the USA simply has too many painful memories for me which I never wish to revisit. I recently went through old photos of my wife and my little girl back in the day, back when we were happy. I was drunk when I did it and I was once again so close to raising the firearm, but this time on myself. Life is very bleak right now and there is almost nothing that is getting me through every single day. I'm finding myself battling with an oncoming alcohol addiction. Maybe one day I'll get to see my girls again, and I'm afraid that I'm willing to find out sooner rather than later. I suppose this is the account of a man who has totally given up on life. I love you Jane, I love you Sarah, I'll see you soon I hope. My addict husband has been sectorly gambling away my entire paycheck and we're now almost homeless. He's now demanding money from my sister so he can win it all back. My husband and I's marriage has been rock solid for the entire seven years we have been together, but the only thing which we had fights over was his addictive personality. My husband is the type of person to try something once and get hooked on it immediately. This has happened in his past with grass and cigarettes, and even blow on a smaller scale. He finds it extremely difficult to moderate his usages, and this has caused us some issues. I remember he started smoking again to relieve stress, and one cigarette a day turned into a pack per day very quickly. Literally over the course of two weeks. We fought about it and it wasn't until I threw away his cigarettes each time he bought a pack that he made a genuine effort to quit. He was successful but his withdrawals were mad and I would often find myself on the receiving end of verbal ridicule because he was stressed out and wanted to smoke. Now onto the main issue at hand. My husband and I both work decently paying jobs. It's nothing insane but it more than pays the bills and give us some form of financial freedom. I remember my husband came home drunk one day telling me that he just lost $100 playing poker with his friends. I wasn't too mad because it was his friends and it was only $100 of his own money, but I did tell him to be careful. The next morning we talked about it and he promised he would be. However, I now know that to be far from the truth. This happened around 6 months ago, and since that time my husband has been staying late at work multiple times per week. I always wondered why he needed to stay so late after work, but now I know. I remember seeing small amounts of money come out of my account about 3 months ago and I questioned my husband about it because I knew it had to be him. He said that his card had been blocked and he needed some. Cash for takeout. I asked him if he was getting his card problem sorted and he said he was. Money was not taken out of my account again and so I believed him. It actually wasn't until yesterday that I noticed exactly what had been happening. I remember wanting to lodge a bit of money into my savings account because this is something I do occasionally, but when I logged in I had seen that my savings account had less than $500, as opposed to the $20,000 or so I had in it. I panicked and refreshed the site, but the number stayed the same. I then checked our joint savings account, and saw that this account too had been down to a few hundred dollars. I called up the bank thinking this was a mistake, but they confirmed it was not. I waited for my husband to get off work and confronted him with the newfound information. He ended up breaking down and revealing the truth. He told me that he had developed an immense gambling addiction, and that him working late was in reality him heading down to the bar to play sports bets and watch the games at the bar. I'll admit it, I lost it on him. I went through his account, my account, and our joint savings, and there had been less than $1,000 on them combined. I told my husband that I wanted divorce and went and stayed with my sister for the night. Our rent is due in two weeks too. My husband has actually started blowing up my phone and my sister's phone, saying he can make her the money back because he just found a tactic to win each time at sports betting. He is demanding my sister gives him $5,000 so he can win all the money back, and when he does he will quit gambling. That's his words anyway. My ex-wife has developed a severe substance addiction and is demanding money off me. She is threatening to falsely accuse me of assaulting her if I don't pay her, so I'm thinking of going nuclear on her. My ex-wife and I's marriage was a disaster to say the least. We had known each other for six months before we got engaged and got married within a year of dating, we were married for two years total before I broke it off when I realized she was genuinely insane. She was a pathological liar for starters, claiming she had a bachelor's degree in philosophy when she never did, and even when confronted with all the evidence in the world that she didn't, she still refused to admit she lied. She also had severe anger issues, which combined with her jealousy made her a nightmare to deal with. She would do things such as track the mileage on my car to ensure I wasn't driving around where I wasn't supposed to and cheating on her. 
She would ambush me in the middle of the night with surprise questions, hoping to get a confession out of me in my sleep. She was also a heavy drinker and spent the majority of her nights having glasses upon glasses of wine. She was a stay-at-home wife yet all she would do is complain about how I do nothing and how tired she is all the time from working so hard, even though the house was always a mess when I came home. She never cooked either, instead ordering takeout every single day. We had nasty arguments every single day which usually ended up with her laying hands on me, then later claimed she never laid hands on me, and if she did it was probably because I deserved it. She was not like this when we dated, had I known I would have left the relationship on the first date. I remember the straw that broke the camel's back came when I got home from work. I asked her before leaving for work if she could do some tidying up so we wouldn't have to spend long on it when I come home. It was our two-year anniversary and we had planned a dinner date for it. I came. Home to find her napping with the house a mess, two batches of delivery food, all the lights in the empty room still on and the end of a cigarette butt beside her as she was sleeping. I woke her up to tell her about the dinner date but she said she didn't feel like going. I'll admit, I snapped. I woke her up by just breaking down and crying, and I spent 20 minutes straight ranting to her about my feelings and how I can't keep living like this with her. Midway through me pouring my heart out, she interrupted to tell me she was going to shower. So while she showered, I packed all my essentials and left the house. I got one message from her asking if she should order takeout tonight because we clearly weren't going to the restaurant. I filed for divorce the day after. It has been a year since the divorce was finalized and I have not heard of anything from my ex-wife in that time. Life was bliss, I found a new girlfriend with whom I get along great and I'm taking things slowly. I have found a new apartment and it feels like I can breath again. However, my ex-wife reached out to me just a few hours ago and now I feel like my life is crumbling. When I first saw her text I wanted to ignore her, but out of curiosity I responded. She tried to make small talk and it was obvious she wanted something from me, so I told her to hurry up and tell me what she wants. And oh boy was it something. She told me that she hates to ask, but she needs $1,250. She said that she has developed a severe addiction to blow and has blown through her entire savings in order to sustain her addiction. She said that the money she gets from being on welfare goes to her blow addiction and she has no way pay rent. I of course told her no, but knowing my ex-wife, she didn't just take no for an answer. She tried to guilt trip me, but that didn't work. She then proceeded to turn more extreme, and decided to threaten me. She told me that either I pay her the 1250 or else she will falsely accuse me of roping her throughout our entire marriage and ruin my entire life. She said that if she's going down she will drag me down with her. I called her crazy and blocked her. Now, I know how psycho my ex-wife is and it would honestly not surprise me if she did go through with this false accusation. This is why I took screenshots of our texts as soon as she sent them, the entire conversation is saved on my phone. So I will never be convicted, however I do worry about the fact that my life will indeed be ruined even if it is proven false. I will certainly lose my job, become a social outcast and will find it extremely hard to find a new job. I'm thinking of posting the screenshots first before she gets to it so I can expose her for who she really is. Date my ex-wife has developed a severe substance addiction and is demanding money off me. She is threatening to falsely accuse me of assaulting her if I don't pay her, so I'm thinking of going nuclear on her. So I ended up talking to my best friend about the situation and his advice for me was to go to the police department with my screenshots just to protect myself and get the jump on her. I did exactly that and the officers at the police station were indeed very helpful. I also talked to my girlfriend about the whole ordeal and she knows how psycho my ex-wife is, and so she recommended to just post the screenshots online too. After all, if my ex-wife just accuses me online that still might be enough to totally ruin me, and that is not at all a chance I'm willing to take. I ended up listening to my girlfriend and posted the screenshots of the text conversations between my ex-wife and I on every social media platform I had, and I even sent it to some of her family members. Her mother actually blamed me and said I should just have given her the money because that's what a real man would have done, and this didn't surprise me. The mother-in-law was always a pain in the butt to deal with, as she was a pathological liar just like my wife. Her father however was completely on my side. He doesn't like his daughter very much and thinks she needs some serious help, but she went low contact with him 6 months after our marriage ended because he put her in a psych ward for 21 days. This was all new information to me. Her father ended up telling me that he will make sure I am safe and if push comes to shove he will undoubtedly be on my side. My ex-wife did end up seeing the posts I put up, but she has not commented or reached out to in any way. My parents abused me horrifically throughout my entire life. They are suing me for $75,000 for speaking out. Life is hell right now. I am a survivor of all forms of abuse at the hands of my parents. My life was made awful from as young as I can remember. My earliest memory is of my father shaking me before he threw me across my bedroom. My mother worked hard to gaslight anything I said growing up in order to maintain the functional facade they portrayed to the public. They look like wealthy, entitled, white Americans. I used to fall asleep sobbing for my grandmother, who knew what was going on in the home but never interfered. I was left to rot despite pleas for help. I was punished and isolated for trying to speak out or seek help. My parents would take away the books I was reading, or my sketchbooks, and force me to sit for days, weeks without stimuli. I was never allowed to keep any records within the home. My mother found my diary once when I was in high school and forced me to sit in the middle of the dining room while my father, mother, and sister took turns reading passages out loud and screaming at me. If my dad went on an unprovoked rage and broke our belongings or artwork, threw us around, or had a tantrum, my mother would rage at us for not being better. Once, 
my youngest sister spent hours in a bush at night during the polar vortex without proper clothing because she was too afraid to go home after my father lost his temper. My mother refused to call the police to look for her because she didn't want my dad to get a record. I was never allowed to use the phone or computer in the home without supervision and had no privacy, even as a teenager. My parents picked all of my class schedules in high school and kept me from getting a job so I had no money to apply to any colleges. They forced me to attend a specialized engineering college they picked at the threat of financial abandonment, and I begrudgingly completed the degree my father had failed to earn. Himself. I have almost no detailed memories from this period of my life or beforehand, it's all just a vague fog. They actively tried to keep me from going to medical school and I had to petition for independence from them citing horrific abuse to continue my education. Myself and my two sisters all have very severe, undiagnosed eating disorders because my parents didn't believe in mental health care. We were never allowed to see doctors growing up unless we were sick for weeks or severely ill. Instead, my parents would wait to hear my sisters vomiting in the bathroom and would barge in and humiliate them while they were in the shower or on the toilet, screaming that they were hurting the family with their choices. My parents do not allow my sisters to contact me. Last time I saw my youngest sister, she was 5 feet 4 inches and weighed 90 pounds. My father had numerous affairs with naive, impressionable women who were closer to me in age than my mother. Usually they were his employees. He and my mother still tried to tell my sisters and I that if they ever got divorced, it was our fault because we were so exhausting and bad. I remember a handful of times when I mentioned emancipation or running away. I was locked away in isolation for two weeks because of even mentioning it. I decided to cease contact in November of 2019. Everything was good for a while. I changed my name, I moved state and as far as they were aware, I had disappeared. I was finally starting to live life without the fear of being unalived every day. But they found me. They effing found me and have the audacity to sue me. They are suing me for $75,000 and they are attempting to permanently silence me about my childhood through the civil courts. Their lawsuit is based on a single Facebook post. A video linked to Dr. Romani's page regarding narcissistic abuse by parents which they found on my private Facebook page. This post was five days away from being past the statute of limitations when they happened to stalk my profile. Using someone else's Facebook and saw it. My parents' lawyer is a well-known alt-right lawyer. They attempted to sue me during my final year of veterinary medical school, hoping to bankrupt me during the most rigorous point in my studies. They have dragged my younger siblings who are still reliant on them for survival into the mess to testify against me, despite the level of evidence I have against them. My father calls me crazy in his legal documents against me and my mother attempts to blame me for everything wrong in her and my sibling's life. She blames me for my minor sibling having a bad high school experience when my father had an affair with his employee and got forced out of his job, so they had to relocate my sibling to another high school across the state apparently that is my fault. My affidavit is of 50 pages of detailed remembered traumas at their hands with drawings, texts, and other evidence included. Update my parents abused me horrifically throughout my entire life. They are suing me for $75,000 for speaking out. No one, including my lawyer, seems to understand how terrifying it is to be threatened with being legally silenced or being pressured to sign an agreement that says I can never countersue them for my pain and the abuse they are still perpetuating against me. I am terrified I will not be able to seek therapeutic or medical care because, if my rich parents win the effed up pay to win civil court case, I will lose my right to even disclose my history to anyone around me in speech or writing, including medical and therapy professionals. I basically have to shoulder the tens of thousands of dollars associated with going to court if I am going to have a hope at ensuring the same freedom of speech you enjoy. I have thought about opening a GoFundMe for the legal case but I am terrified I am not allowed to or that I will get in trouble for it. I reached out to Dr. Romani, and got no response. I reached out to some big profile rope lawyers, and got no response. You have to be rich to receive any legal care in this country. I was being quoted 712k as a retainer for an average lawyer plus $150 to 400 in hourly fees. I can't afford that. I am on Medicaid and living on student loans. My lawyer is working with me financially but he has clearly never worked a case like this with a victim like myself before and I am terrified what that will mean during trial. I can't even talk to my partner about the case right now and I tried to ask my lawyer if getting married would change that, and he acts like I am being silly or overdramatic. He doesn't understand my partner is my only support system and that by isolating me from him, my parents are continuing to control me like they did when I was a child. I am afraid to ask my lawyer at what point I should just go to the media because he doesn't understand my fear. After dwelling on it for a while, I decided I needed to get any physical proof left on my body from what they did to me on paper. I completely booked myself solid with back-to-back -back doctor's appointments in the two weeks after I finished school. I decided I needed to get all my chronic pelvic issues diagnosed and in the medical chart before the civil case. This was not an easy feat. I have severe anxiety and terror around doctor's offices that stem from my childhood. Firstly, my parents would lock me in my room without stimuli for weeks so being shut in a sterile room waiting for any doctor is its own kind of special hell for me. Secondly, because of my history of intimate trauma, I have had severe panic attacks and difficulty verbalizing the pain and the symptoms I have been struggling with, especially when a practitioner is trying to put something into me. Historically, I've struggled with such severe pelvic floor muscles tightening, 
that I have had difficulty even receiving pelvic exams. Additionally, I have been taken to my parents' doctors growing up, and they invalidated and terrified me at every opportunity when I did manage to speak up, my mother's gynecologist didn't care about any of the symptoms I tried to bring up to her for example, when I begged her to help me about my butt pain, she scoffed at me and told me to stop having so much backdoor intimacy, which shocked and silenced me because at the time I believed myself to be a V-card owner, not remembering that my butt pain was due to my father roping me. I made an appointment with a urologist who was a survivor herself. That made a huge difference for me. She talked to me before the exam and was very clear about what she was doing during the exam, which greatly relieved my anxiety. I explained how I have had to manually remove stool from my vault for as long as I can remember. I described how I can feel stool herniate into my womanhood and I have to put a finger in order to even pass it. I described how I constantly relive the terror and the severe pain. I hyperventilate during intimacy and historically, partners have struggled to even get inside me because my body shuts down in a rigid way. I described how I had urinary pain as a child and my mother just blamed the soap she was using on me. My grandparents described me holding my womanhood in pain for weeks before I saw a doctor. I have these pediatric records. I described how I can't, to this day, properly empty my bladder and how I have such poor urine flow, where it barely trickles out. I described how I had a memory of my father biting my pink bean so hard that I lived my teenage life honestly thinking I was born without one. She diagnosed me with severe pelvic floor dysfunction that is also causing bowel and urinary dysfunction. She said it is something they see in survivors, you get stuck in rigid fear and basically never come out. She has referred me to a pelvic floor physical therapist and I am planning on attending despite my anxiety about it. I also went to my primary care office and told them I was suspicious of ephemeral hernia because of the chronic, throbbing pain I have had in my lower right quadrant for as long as I can remember. My doctor was skeptical, but sent me for an ultrasound where they found a mild tear. My mother also had a similar hernia, but it appeared after she had three children. I have never been pregnant and I attribute the hernia to my father repeatedly stepping on me when I was little. I am being referred to a general surgeon to discuss getting it repaired. I hope all my hard work makes a difference. I am scared and tired of feeling trapped. Update 2, my parents abused me horrifically throughout my entire life. They are suing me for $75,000 for speaking out. Last summer, my estranged and abusive parents decided to attempt to sue me through civil court for 75k on six counts for a post on my private Facebook page, a link to a Dr. Romani video. I managed to find legal help and have been guided through this nonsense by someone who understands the legal system. My lawyer has been a godsend and I wish all lawyers were as upstanding as he is. The first part of any civil case is the discovery period. I had to present my stacks of evidence to my lawyer. My parents have no evidence, so they presented personal statements that were violently bitter and hateful. In these personal statements, my parents demand the courts permanently silence me as to protect their reputation and now feel as though they are entitled to 75k from me due to their emotional pain. My younger sisters, one of whom is still a minor living in their home, also wrote personal statements against me. I was initially devastated by these statements but have since grown angry. My lawyer feels I have a very strong case against all of them because of the sheer amount of evidence I have collected throughout my lifetime and all the text messages between me and my sisters that detail abuse. My affidavit is a painfully detailed list of the intimate, physical, and emotional things I have experienced by them throughout my life with associated pictures, journal entries, school work, and dated drawings as proof. Apparently, 98-99% to of civil cases settle before trial, because of the exponential costs associated with taking someone to court. Usually, the plaintiffs and defense will be encouraged by the courts to come to some sort of mediation agreement before trial ever occurs. I told my lawyer I had no intentions of mediation. As far as I am concerned, I am being further abused by the people who made my life a living hell and I owe them absolutely nothing. I am not going to go back and forth with them on whether I owe them 75k or 25k or $1. Since I was not interested in mediation, my lawyer recommended moving forward with case evaluation. Case evaluation is when a group of three unassociated lawyers, case evaluators, read over the presented evidence from both sides. One lawyer argues the plaintiff's, my parents, side, another lawyer argues the defense's, mine, side, and the third remains neutral. My lawyer and my parents' lawyer also attended this hearing. The three case evaluators then take all the information provided and predict how the dispute will play out if actually taken to court. They will then offer a value amount for what they think the case is actually worth. This value is then reported as an offer to the plaintiffs and defense. If both parties agree to the offer, the matter is considered settled out of court and neither party admits any guilt to the other's claims. If one or both parties decline the offer, then the case proceeds to further mediation or trial. My parents were demanding I pay them 75k and that the courts permanently silence me. The case evaluators came back with the recommendation that my parents' case is worth 1k. This means that if my parents and I both accept, I pay them 1k and the matter is settled before they can drag me through the emotional turmoil and financial devastation of civil court. If either myself or my parents reject this offer, we will likely be asked to further mediate or a court date will be set. I initially found myself torn on what to do. Officially, 
I have decided to accept the 1K settlement because I am living on student loans and Medicaid right now and can't afford to go to trial. Honestly, paying them a single cent makes me want to vomit blood though. I do not think I owe them 1K. I understand that the case evaluators basically took my side, compared to what my parents were trying to demand, but the thought that they still somehow think I owe them 1K after reading. Through all my testimony makes me nauseous. I guess here is where the upbeat portion comes in. No matter what, I now firmly believe that my parents are effed. They dug themselves a hole and now they get to lay in it. If they agree to the 1K, my lawyer is certain that they are taking a huge financial hit as their lawyer fees alone are likely exponential and that they will in no way make any money on this whole endeavor. If both of us accept the 1K offer, I would save tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees by not going to trial and the emotional devastation of all this will finally end. If they reject the 1K offer, I will refuse any further mediation. Again, I will not negotiate with them. It will be up to the jury what I owe my parents and I would hope to God they ruled zero dollars based on the amount of evidence I have and my credibility as a doctor. We have a month to make a decision on whether to accept or reject. Update 3, my parents abused me horrifically throughout my entire life. They are suing me for $75,000 for speaking out. I continued meeting with my lawyer, who was receiving regular notices from my parents' lawyer that he should expect an injunction to be filed against me within the week. This injunction would attempt to silence me permanently. I began contacting witnesses and preparing for trial. Seemingly out of the blue, my parents' lawyer basically sent an agreement that the case would be closed if I paid the 1K agreed upon during case evaluation or I agreed to sign the initial settlement agreement that silenced me and kept me from countersuing in the future. It was sent via email with a heavily implied threat of another case against me for all their legal fees if I was ever caught defaming them again. Meanwhile, an amazingly kind person who is a lawyer in a different state reached out to me after somehow finding my Reddit posts. They offered to reach out on my behalf to try to get some more information for me and were able to connect me to a well-recommended lawyer in my state. I met with the lawyer. She had read through my information and evidence before our meeting, and was horrified by my situation. She was worried about the constitutionality of it all and asked if she could ask around a bit for me, but I kind of doubt I will hear back. She discussed my options, I could certainly make a criminal report, but that would require me to sit down with the police who would then reach out to my parents to get their side of things and they would almost certainly sue me again. She said if I chose to make a criminal report, I would likely be dealing with a legal fallout for the foreseeable future as they will try to say I am furthering defaming them. She warned me that it would be he said, she said on the stand if I chose to go ahead with charges. She warned me that justice was rarely served when this much time had passed, but at the very least, making a report would allow me to tell my story. She said in my state, Defamation cases are being used to further silence victims who have made criminal reports. Her best advice long term was to leave the state and move somewhere with anti slap laws and protective laws for victims. She had recommended I reach out to the ACLU because my case may have implications for society at large. I don't know if I want to keep trying. At this point, I do not think I want to make a criminal report. My bones are tired. I sat down with my original lawyer today and he is certain they will re sue soon. I am trying to be optimistic. He showed me the most recent email from my parents' lawyer, who said they were going to send me to debt collection next week for the 1K settlement. It's not even the first time my parents have sent me the collections. I made a GoFundMe for my legal fees and their 1K and posted it on my Facebook profile, begging others not to share it publicly because if my parents see it they will sue me again. I am doubtful I will get much help given that most of my friends are very recent college graduates. Waited a table of two seven-year-olds on a date, it was the cutest thing I've ever seen. I work at a fancy restaurant and during my shift tonight, the hostess came up to me informing me I was assigned to two tables. One table was two mothers and the other was their two kids on a date. She told me they wanted to be at a different table so their parents wouldn't embarrass them, but their parents wanted to be nearby to supervise it and cover the check. I went to the parents' table first to make sure we were all on the same page, and they told me the kids could order whatever they want, I then turned to go to the kids, it was homecoming in my town, so I assumed it was going to be some high schoolers, but I walked up to these two seven-year-old kids just sitting at a high top. They had kids' menus, and were kicking their feet and giggling away. I asked if I could get them something to drink. The little boy was like after her. I asked if I could get any appetizers started for them, and the boy ordered mussels. When I asked them how they were enjoying it, the girl told me she had never had mussels before in her whole life, so me and the boy convinced her to try them and she loved them. And he was just beaming. I went to the parents' table and told them their kids are incredibly mature and so cute, and they told me the two were the same age, and have always lived on the same street. So they have grown up together, and have always had this crush on each other. They both got chicken tenders and fries for their dinners and they ordered our dessert special to share, a seasonal creme brulee, to finish off the evening. They captured everyone's hearts so much that, with parental approval, my manager gave them half glasses of a zero-proof champagne to toast with, with little strawberries on the glasses. They complimented my service, ate every bit of everything, drank all of the sparkling grape juice, conversed the whole time, and giggled their cute little butts off. 
I got talking. With one of the moms as they were cashing out. How you would think having a crush on each other would make them shy, but the conversation was literally non-stop. It was the best thing I've seen in my 10 years of service. Here are some health facts that I wish I knew during my teenage years. 1. Most protein products are a scam because the amount of protein listed on the label isn't the amount that you're actually consuming. Since you can't count how many grams are in a protein product, you have to estimate how much protein there should be by measuring the nitrogen balance. Usually, the more nitrogen a product has, the more protein there should be, but this can be easily faked by increasing the nitrogen balance and using cheaper substitutes. This is called amino spiking, and companies do this to lower manufacturing costs and make a quick profit from consumers. 2. Hemp bars increase your resting energy expenditure, which is the number of calories your body burns when you're not exercising. Unlike most protein products, these bars have protein and fiber, which can boost your metabolism. And because of the fiber, you can easily take out green juices from your diet and replace them with a daily hemp bar. And no, hemp has nothing to do with 420. This is also a much cheaper alternative to green juices. 3. Despite popular belief, eggs are extremely good for you. The cholesterol in eggs doesn't raise your blood cholesterol levels because dietary cholesterol doesn't always have a major effect on blood cholesterol. Also, eggs are naturally a good source of protein that is used to build muscles and improve muscle health, which helps with weight loss. 4. Drinking coffee on an empty stomach first thing in the morning isn't bad for you, and won't spike your cortisol or make you gain belly fat. Your body adapts to drinking coffee in the morning. So just enjoy your cup of joe the second you wake up, I know I will. 5. Green powders like Bloom don't actually heal your guts, if they did your mom would use them, nor do they reverse bloating. Their fiber counts are insanely high so they'll just make you drop an atomic bomb in the bathroom. You just have to eat more vegetables instead of drinking green laxatives. Every day. 6. Repeating workouts usually causes you to hit a plateau because your metabolism stops adapting, and then you're not building any muscle. Sometimes you just have to rest. Don't watch any Goggins clips while you rest though, that will only get you to go back out and hit the gym. 7. You can eat after 8 p.m. and this won't make you gain weight because weight gain depends on caloric intake, not the time you eat. The only reason people say this is because your cravings heighten at night while your inhibitions lower. So, you're just overeating, which can happen at any time of day. You're just more affected at night. 8. Your body has no idea how to tell you it's thirsty. So if you think you're always hungry and aren't drinking enough water, that's your body's way of telling you you're chronically dehydrated. Knowing the difference can keep you from snacking so much, which will help you reach your goal weight much quicker, and you'll get proper hydration. If your body is constantly sending SOS signals that you're thirsty, then you're likely one step away from looking like SpongeBob at Sandy's. My insane ex-boyfriend thought he could mess with my drink to make me loopy and drowsy, but he got way more than he bargained for. I dated Nathan in high school for two years and he and I were super similar. We were co-presidents of the same clubs, and had similar academic portfolios. But for some reason, he always made it a point to compete with me. One time, we got put in the same group for a project, and I was really excited to spend more time with my boyfriend. But instead of being happy, he told me, lucky you, getting put in the same group as me. No need to thank me ahead of time for doing all of the work. Regardless, those were years that I really valued and enjoyed because Nathan took all my firsts. We talked about going to Harvard together. I wanted to spend my college life with him, so that became my dream. I made sure not to be outdone by him, and wanted for both of us to get accepted. But once the time for college applications rolled around, he did something unbelievable. Nathan dumped me out of nowhere, saying that he needed to focus if he wanted to get into Harvard and he couldn't be distracted by me. I was heartbroken because he just called our two-year relationship a distraction, and could get over me so quickly. But our college applications were coming up, so I didn't even have time to cry over it. Instead, a fire lit inside of me and all I wanted to do was get into Harvard to show Nathan that I wasn't just a distraction. But all our tests were already over and the only event left before our applications was an international debate competition in DC. I had been preparing for this for months because this was my final chance to prove that I belonged at an Ivy League school. Everyone was tense, including me and Nathan. But I could have never prepared myself for the lengths he would go to just to beat me. It first started on the train to DC when Nathan changed seats so that we would be next to each other. It was very awkward, but I thought that this was just Nathan's way of trying to apologize for breaking up with me like that, so I ended up letting my guard down. For the remainder of the trip, Nathan tried acting like a friend. That train ride, he treated me like he used to while we were still dating. He complimented how determined I looked, and even offered to listen to my speech as practice. In fact, he made me think that he regretted his decision and wanted to make things right during this competition. By the end of the train ride, things almost felt normal, and it felt natural when Nathan showed up to my hotel room the next morning with a cup of coffee for me. I happily drank the coffee and thanked him for worrying about me. That was until I noticed something had changed in me. About halfway through the first day of the conference, I felt like I was in a hyper-focused mode, as if someone had filtered out the white noise in my brain and just left the sharpest, most productive parts behind. When I gave impromptu speeches, I found myself having extra time to think as if time was going by slightly slower than usual. And when the time for questions came, I asked the most precise, detail-oriented questions that highlighted major flaws in my opponent's arguments. Somehow, I was beating everyone in the debate room, including Nathan. By the second night, it was obvious that I was going to win. I thought he would be agitated and mad that he didn't do as well as me, and wouldn't talk to me anymore. But to my surprise, the next morning he showed up in front of my door with another cup of coffee. He looked a bit pissed off, and told me that I should drink it as soon as possible, but I didn't think much of it. And once again, I ended up destroying everyone in the competition. On the fourth and final day of the competition, everything was even more tense than usual. 
My anxiety only grew when Nathan failed to deliver me a morning coffee. I tried not to think anything of it initially because it could have just been a coincidence, but then, Nathan didn't show up to the debate at all. He completely skipped the final day of the competition. That's when I knew something was wrong. I ran to his hotel room the second the committee session ended. After banging on his door for five minutes straight, he finally let me in. But the moment I stepped inside, Nathan exploded at me, asking how it was possible for me to be performing so well. I was going to make a lighthearted joke because I genuinely had no idea how I managed to improve so much in just four days. Everything that happened during this conference put all my other work these past four years to shame, which was saying a lot. But I never got a word out, because Nathan immediately went on a chauvinistic, narcissistic tangent and revealed something truly insane. He had been trying to sabotage me from the very first day. Apparently he felt that this competition was the perfect thing to round out his application, and he really wanted it on his LinkedIn biography so he could call himself an international debate champion. The coffee that he gave me was laced and was supposed to make me not function at all. At least that's what he thought. Nathan told me that he had tried to intentionally buy me coffee with psychedelics and legal psilocybin alternatives in it, hoping that it would make me loopy, distracted, and confused. But it turns out that the coffee he had given me was the opposite of psychedelics. If anything, it was focus-enhancing, and I felt ultra-productive. I asked Nathan for the exact coffee brand he had bought and looked it up to confirm what I already knew, that the coffee he bought had nothing to do with psychedelics, and was simply a mushroom coffee fusion blend. It was called Clarity Brew and from the name I could sort of understand why Nathan might think that it was for a psychedelic type of clarity. But the actual product description made it clear that this coffee was a blessing, not a curse. The mushrooms Nathan had thought would hurt my chances of winning this competition were chaka mushrooms and lion's mane, which botanists will know are just cognitive power banks for the mind. I respected Nathan wholeheartedly until this point, but never in my life did I think that he would be capable of such a low-level IQ move. And even though Nathan had basically tried to poison me with this coffee, it worked so well on me that once I was done yelling at him, I took the clarity brew with me to confiscate it only to bring it all the way home so I could continue using the coffee until the end of senior year. That was when I discovered that the coffee didn't just make me more productive, it gave me long-lasting energy and naturally minimized the jittery effects of caffeine. Nathan had basically bought me super coffee in an attempt to drag me down. To no one's surprise, I won the competition and was later accepted to Harvard. In my interview, I revealed what had happened during the competition and they decided to reject Nathan. We still text sometimes, and he's apologized a lot for what he did. I've even started connecting him to a few people at Harvard to help him out with some research opportunities because I just want to be the bigger person here. Hopefully one day, he'll be the same way. Edit. Okay wait, thanks so much for all the comments, I think you guys are right about him just using me for networking. I've decided to block Nathan and cut contact with him permanently, because you're right, he lost the privilege of being my friend the day he tried to drug me. My ex-girlfriend's narcissist co-worker manipulated her into ending our relationship while at the same time manipulating me into trying to make the relationship work. I am now dating the co-worker and my ex is absolutely furious. I was in a relationship with my ex Julie for the last four years. She suffered from anxiety and depression at the beginning of our relationship due to her last one being very toxic and manipulative, her ex even laying hands on her. Over time however, she stopped hurting herself, thanks to the love and support we gave each other and things were phenomenal. We got on with each other's families, vacationed a lot and talked about marriage and having kids one day. She was truly the love of my life. However, I started to see changes in behavior in Julie around September of last year. She started acting distant and looked stressed, started biting her nails and wouldn't sleep or eat. It was quite noticeable and I was worried for her mental health. Around the same time, Julie's good friend and co-worker Mindy, who I was never really close to, messaged me privately and asked me if I could meet her secretly, as she wanted to tell me something very worrying about Julie. I assumed the worst, such as an affair. I met Mindy at a cafe after work. She asked me if things were going on between Julie and me because Julie seemed very off at work. She told me that Julie told her that she was planning to leave me soon. This was a total shock to me. I asked her if there was anyone else that Julie was interested in and she told me no. Julie confided in her that she was not sure about marrying me like we had previously discussed. She told me she just had to tell me this as she did not want me to be blindsided by Julie up and leaving one day seemingly out of the blue. I was devastated upon hearing this. So I did what any man in my shoes would. I started putting more effort into making our relationship more exciting and planning more dates. Mindy was also helping me. Through this time, and telling me more about what Julie told her and each time she did she said that Julie was becoming more and more sure that she did not see a future with me. Eventually before Thanksgiving, Mindy turned out to be right and Julie told me that she loved me but she wanted to take a break for a month to live alone and didn't see herself marrying me anymore. I was completely heartbroken. I asked her if she wanted to pursue someone else and she told me that was not the case, and told me I better not do anything stupid either. She loves me with all her heart, but she just wants to stay away from me to make sure that she is marrying me for love, and not because she is used to being with me. I did not understand that at all. I told her that if she is not sure after four years, if she wants to marry me, then maybe we should just break up. We had a big fight over this because I questioned her love for me, and we broke up after a few days because she texted me calling me names, which was a hard boundary of mine. As our lease was ending, we decided to part ways in December. She got a new apartment and I kept our old apartment and just took her name off the lease. After the breakup, I was feeling very lonely as I was not used to being in the apartment alone. I didn't want to keep on being sad and hence invited a bunch of friends for a New Year's party. I also invited Mindy. We had a good time and my friends were doing their best to cheer me up. 
Mindy also mingled with my friends and it was good. Mindy decided to stay back to help me clean up and we hooked up that night. I felt guilty but Mindy did cheer me up. Since then we have hung out almost daily at my place. I am still sad about Julie but I won't lie that being with Mindy does make me feel happy. She is sweet and caring. Well, last Sunday, we woke up and someone was banging on the door. I went to open it and it was Julie. She looked furious and started yelling at me. She kept on accusing me of cheating on her. I told her I most certainly did not cheat on her and she was the one who initiated our breakup. Mindy was also at my apartment at the time. Julie was just angry at both of us. She started calling Mindy a manipulative beach and told me that Mindy was the one who suggested to her that she should take some time away from me to understand her true feelings. I calmed her down and asked her to explain herself. She told me that ever since our marriage talk, she told Mindy about it and Mindy kept on asking Julie if she was sure about marrying me. Mindy then suggested she take some time to herself to understand her true feelings and that I will understand and give her space. When I said no, Mindy convinced her that I was so controlling that I could not even give her one month to herself and convinced her to say things which would make me break up with her. Mindy told me that she did not say any such things, and these were all Julie's ideas and she was just there during these conversations. She did tell Julie that she told me about some of the things so that I get a chance to make things right with her over the last few months. That made Julie more angry and she started accusing me of emotionally cheating on her. Julie told me that the last few weeks have made her realize that we were meant to be together, but she now cannot believe I could move on from a four-year relationship in a week. Was I in the wrong? Date my ex-girlfriend's narcissist co-worker manipulated her into ending our relationship while at the same time manipulating me into trying to make the relationship work. I am now dating the co-worker and my ex is absolutely furious. I told the co-worker Mindy that I needed some time and have not seen her since my ex Julie came over. I have also messaged Julie every day since then to try and talk to her but she did not reply. Mindy was constantly trying to message me asking if we could meet and talk about it. On Wednesday I decided to message Mindy. I told her to tell me everything she said to Julie truthfully. I told her I would go and see if I found out that she was lying. Mindy wanted to meet me in person or talk to me on the phone but I wanted everything in writing. She messaged me that Julie always said good things about me for all these years. When Julie told her about us talking about getting married in 2024, she was happy for both of us. However Julie started telling her that she had cold feet and was not sure if she wanted to marry me because of issues she observed about her parents' marriage. One day Julie told her she wanted to take a break from me. She was not sure about her true feelings for me. That was the time Mindy told me about Julie's behavior as she felt bad for me as we were already telling our families about the engagement plans. After our fight, she said that Julie was extremely upset and told Mindy that she would never marry me. She said that the only reason Julie came back was when she heard that I was moving on as she is jealous of us. She also said that I was a good guy and hopefully I see that what we have is something special. I just said okay and told her I needed time. I kept on messaging Julie once a day to at least talk to her once. It was heartbreaking to think that she may have blocked me and may never talk to me again. On Friday afternoon Julie finally replied. She said she wanted to meet me and told me she would come to our apartment. On Saturday afternoon. I cleaned the place up and was just feeling deep guilt from inside before facing her. When she came in, she looked like a shell of herself and completely broken. I sat on our sofa but she chose to sit away from me. We asked how we both were but it was clear that none of us were doing well. I started apologizing but she stopped me. She asked me to let her finish and not to interrupt her. She had brought her little notebook and had written down things she wanted to say to me. She told me that she truly loved me, but after we discussed getting married, she started feeling scared of the next big step. She thought those feelings were normal and would go away. So, she decided to not discuss her concerns with me. It kept on eating her from inside and she made a mistake to talk to Mindy about them. She said that she wanted to say everything to me now, so I don't get second-hand information about why she was distant and broke up with me. She said that her parents had a very rocky marriage, though they were together until her mom passed away in 2021 during the virus. Her parents argued constantly and she always thought her mom did not love her dad. However her mom was extremely dependent on him for everything, and her dad knew it and hence didn't treat her well. She never wanted to be like her mom after the marriage. However, as we lived together, she started seeing some of those issues in our relationship. For example, when we met Julie had a lot of credit card debt and was bad at managing her money. I helped her with that. Even though we have separate finances, I ended up managing all her finances to the point that she did not know or understand where her money exactly was. She also said that we always enjoy making nice meals for dinner every day. However, whenever I work late she completely loses any motivation to cook and ends up eating cheese and crackers like a toddler for dinner. She also complained that in the last four years of our relationship, I have never said no to her for buying anything. She feels that I coddle her and she just got comfortable with all the luxuries and things I can provide for her. She talked about this with Mindy and while Mindy initially just listened to her, she told her around September that one of her cousins also had the same issue. She decided to stay away from her fiancé for a month and within a week, she realized how much she missed him and never had doubts again. When Julie asked for a break, all she wanted to do was to live with her best friend for a few weeks, to see if she was just too codependent on me. She knew I was planning to propose during our Christmas trip to my parents' house, and when I told her that she could not take a break, she just freaked out and said things to end it, as she did not want to be engaged without knowing for sure that we won't end up like her parents. After this, she asked me when I started meeting Mindy, and how many times we met. I opened my chat messages with Mindy and handed her the phone. I told her I met Mindy only once in September, where she told me that Julie wanted to break up with me because she was not happy with our relationship. 
I already had noticed Julie's distant behavior and when I asked her, the only answer I got was, I am fine, we are fine. Due to my insecurities, I tried to hold on to Julie and started coddling her more, planning more expensive dates, and trying to spend more time at home. When Julie asked me for a break and to stay away from me for a few weeks, I thought that was the final step before the breakup, and broke down and fought with her, which led to our breakup and her moving out. At this point, Julie's voice started cracking up. She asked me when Mindy contacted me after the breakup. I pointed her to the messages. Mindy initially just started sending me memes to cheer me up, and I just used to respond with, thanks or a thumbs up. However, the messages started getting more frequent and she offered to talk to me in case I needed help. She asked me what I was doing for Christmas and New Year's, and when I told her I was inviting a few friends, she told me that she does not have any plans for New Year's, and I invited her. Julie stopped me there. She told me she did not need to hear the details after that. She told me that when she moved out of our house after our fight, she thought she was just not ready to get married to me. She stayed with her friend for two weeks and then got her new apartment in January. She told me that she was miserable and missed me badly. It became more acute, when she moved into the apartment alone, and could not stay there for even one night. She realized she could not live without me within a week of living there. When she asked one of our mutual friends about how I was doing, she told her about the party and told her Mindy was there. It did not make sense to her why Mindy would be at the party. She concluded that Mindy and I were having an affair during our relationship and that was the reason Mindy must have tried to break us apart, by constantly telling her that she should not get married if she had doubts. When she saw Mindy in our apartment on Sunday, she completely broke down. However, when she learned that Mindy was also talking to me and telling me the opposite things, she realized how naive she was to throw everything away without properly talking to me first. As hurt as she is seeing me with Mindy, she also does not want to lose me. She kept on calling herself an idiot and apologizing for not telling her concerns to me sooner. I sat next to her and tried to hug her, but she moved away. She asked me if I was willing to still be together, and I told her I would give anything to get her back. She told me she was also willing to forget what happened, but she had a few conditions. Her first condition was that I cut contact with Mindy. I block her everywhere and never contact her again. If I see her standing in front of me, I act as if she is invisible. I was okay with that. Secondly, she has already signed up for individual therapy and is on the waitlist. She wants us to do couples therapy so that we can talk about all the concerns we have and work through them. We also decided to hold off our engagement or marriage until we both can get into couples therapy. Finally, she wanted me to forget the last month as a bad nightmare and never talk about it again. And if I ever make a we were on a break joke, she will sock me in the face. This was the first time we both smiled. I asked her what she was going to do about Mindy as they work together. She said the biggest punishment for Mindy is to know that she did not succeed in breaking us up. She wants Mindy to see how happy she is with me, she wants Mindy to be there when she flaunts her engagement ring in the office and gets jealous when we get married. We hugged and I felt so relieved that I had a chance to make things right for her. I asked her to stay and she agreed. The rest of the evening was nice. We ordered DoorDash and watched reruns of Top Chef while cuddling on our couch. Caught my manipulative husband cheating on me with his co-worker. He says it's not cheating because I agreed to a one-sided open marriage, but I never did and he's now gaslighting me telling me that I must not remember. My husband and I's marriage has been going through a rocky patch for the last year or so. Our jobs have been super demanding and have taken a toll on us, as neither of us have enough time to spend with one another as we'd like. We don't even have enough time to do all the chores we must do, much less have dates every week like I would like to. I first made a suggestion of taking time away from work about half a year ago, but he said he did not want to as he is a workhorse who values being productive and working. I told him that taking time for us can be productive work, just because it's not work which makes money doesn't mean it's not work. Taking time for ourselves to be together is working on nurturing our relationship and that in and of itself is productive, however he scoffed and said that nurturing relationships doesn't pay the bills. And so he has refused to take time off from work. Due to this our relationship in the bedroom has also suffered, and we do it maybe once a month if we are lucky nowadays. Our bedroom is a graveyard with only the spirit of Davy Jones coming to visit once a month. This awful intimacy life was also a topic I talked to my husband about, and he did say he would like to have more intimacy but he is so exhausted from work that he is never in the mood to do it. The thing is, he absolutely can take more time off work, he just refuses to do so as he prides himself on being the workhorse of the company he is at. We had another argument about his refusal to work less. This has been our life for the last year, and about three months ago I noticed him becoming more secretive on his phone when around me. Naturally I was worried and as a test asked him to look something up on his phone, and he hesitated before saying no because it's low. On battery then ran upstairs. It wasn't even charging when I came in a few minutes later. So that night I snooped through his phone, but I did not find any evidence which even suggested anything at all. I was relieved to be honest as this was a serious concern of mine, especially given that he had cheated on me in the past but I found the strength to forgive him. Well, turns out I was incredibly wrong as last week I came home to find something I never wanted to face. I came home early from work that day and my husband also told me he was going to be home earlier than usual, which was a nice surprise. I planned to make us a dinner from scratch and create a surprise dinner date for us as it has been something I wanted to do for a while. When I walked into the house however I heard noises upstairs that sounded like the bed creaking, and when I walked into the room I found him and a co-worker of his in the bed getting it on. His co-worker seemed unfazed however and asked me if I wanted to join. I started crying and screamed at her to get out. I then yelled at my husband and asked her what the f she meant if I wanted to join, I told him he's an a-hole and I want a divorce. He stopped me midway through and told me I was okay with this. I asked him what the f he meant and he said the one-sided open marriage you agreed to. 
I laughed at him and asked him if he seriously thought I was dumb enough to fall for such manipulation, I said that while crying. He then told me I must have forgot because of my short-term memory less, at which I exploded telling him not to weaponize my struggles. He was adamant about it, telling me that a few weeks ago he came to me asking for a one-sided open marriage because he wanted intimate relief from the stress at work but wanted the emotional aspect of coming home to his loving wife. I told him I'll entertain him and ask him why he wouldn't have more intimacy with me when I asked him for it, and he said it's because he had some fantasies. He wanted to explore but knew I wouldn't be down for them. I ended up telling him to get out of our house, all while he kept on trying to convince me I agreed to this. He has been staying at his best friend's place for the last four days and every day is texting me about how I agreed to the one-sided open marriage but must have forgotten. I didn't agree to it, I can put my life on it. My lack of sleep destroyed my dreams which I worked so hard for, but my coach literally saved the day. I'm the starting senior quarterback for my high school football team, and I recently got recruited to play D1 football. I've been playing football since I was four and for years. My free time consisted of doing shuttle runs, three-cone drills, bench pressing, etc. My end goal being to go D1 for college football. I would push myself physically for hours on end every day, and with all of this vigorous training, you'd think I'd be tired and able to sleep easily, but it was actually the hardest part of my day. At the start of preseason, I was at the gym religiously, obsessing over my workouts and practicing with my team. However, something changed one night after a particularly hard day, my body forgot how to shut down properly and it took me hours to fall asleep. At first, I thought nothing of it because a little less sleep never hurt anybody, except that after only a few hours of sleep every single day, I was so out of it that I kept dropping the snap, and playing much worse overall. I thought the reason for this was nerves about the upcoming season, and the pressure to be the best, but whatever it was, I needed to fix it immediately. So, I tried various methods to get me back to my peak performance, like meditating, taking hot baths, and cutting caffeine, but nothing seemed to work. I was searching to find that one thing that would cure my lack of sleep. Little did I know, a single conversation was all it would take to change the trajectory of my football career. It was the first practice that my coach put the second string quarterback in over me. I could tell he was really disappointed and he asked why I was suddenly wasting my potential. I really didn't want him to think that, so I finally fessed up about my sleep problems and how nothing I had tried worked. He said that this wasn't worth making a fuss over, and took me into his office after practice. He handed me Portal Dream, and told me that taking it before bed would solve all my sleeping problems. I confessed I was skeptical about it, especially because I had already tried melatonin gummies, but he revealed something shocking that I still can't believe to this day. Coach has had a ton of other players struggle to play because they couldn't sleep, but he couldn't have his players lose their football career before it even started, so he did plenty of research to get them back on track. He ended up on Andrew Huberman's page, this neuroscientist with 5 million followers, and followed this guy's advice religiously. That's how he learned the exact formulation of a good sleep aid. Since Portal was the only thing that matched that formula, Coach ran with it. He even said athletes who made the switch had no problem playing games on Friday, then heading to practice on Saturday mornings. I was a lot more than willing to use it after hearing all this. I took the portal that night and after drinking it, it only took half an hour before I was knocked out, which might seem like a lot of time but I'd take that any day over staring at my ceiling for hours before nodding off. The next morning, I felt rested for the first time in a while after getting that sleep in. Even when I was woken up at 6am for morning practice, I completely balled out that practice and even coach noticed the difference. This was the turning point for me, I secured my starting spot back for the upcoming season, and we started it off with a 3-1 to winning record. At the next game, I was informed by my coach that there were D1 college scouts there, so I knew I had to lock in. I stocked up on carbs, got some extra conditioning in, and took Portal Dream literally at 8pm. The next day, we ended up getting the W after a blowout win and I had four passing touchdowns. Then, the scout who I had been in contact with came up to me and offered me a spot on their team next year. I officially signed the document to commit there a few days ago. My insane feminist sister literally roped a guy at a house party and claimed she did nothing wrong, so he and I teamed up to sue her. My sister is a very stereotypical third-wave feminist, who claims she believes in equality but really believes in women being given more power than men. She is the type to literally never cook or do laundry but want her boyfriend to do every bit of DIY, drive her everywhere and treat her like a princess. She literally ended her last relationship because her boyfriend asked her to make him lunch because he was overslept and was getting ready for work, hence had no time to make his own food. She took this as a huge insult, claiming he was a misogynist who believed she needed to slave away for him in the kitchen. I knew the guy and he was far from it. Anyway, my sister also likes to get into arguments about feminism a lot and me and me and her engage in conversations like these a lot. One of her main points is that she expects her partner to pay for literally everything. This is due to the fact that she is oppressed and can't get a job because she is a woman, not because she shows up consistently 15 minutes late to interviews. Anyway, a couple of months ago a huge fight between my sister and I broke out because she read an article online about rope. The article stated that if a man has intimacy drunk with a woman it is rope. I'm sure many can agree on that, but the article took it a step further. It stated that even if the woman is also drunk, it is also rope, matter of fact, it also stated that even if the man is very drunk and the woman is only slightly tipsy, it is also rope. Even if both parties are under the influence and the man and woman are a couple and they have intimacy, it is also rope. It stated that this is because the woman cannot consent under any circumstance if they are tipsy and any act of intimacy is assault. This is not the same for men however as they are way more physically capable and if they really did not want it they could physically resist. Whilst anyone with an unbiased thinking can deduct that this is very obvious bullcrap and propaganda, my sister, upon reading it, thought that this was a brilliant article and talked with me about it. Of course we disagreed and this led to a huge fight between us, during which she claimed I am a misogynist and even told me I was lucky she was not reporting me for rope because I had drunken intimacy with an ex of mine a couple of years ago. 
I ended up leaving the argument and refusing to engage in it after that. Since reading the article, my sister has got this notion in her head that men can't be roped because they are physically stronger. She has also simultaneously developed a crush on this guy in one of her classes and tells me about him sometimes. He is exactly her type from what I can hear and seems like a cool guy. I urged her to go for it but claimed she wouldn't because she's nervous and women don't ask men out, that's the man's job. I asked her what about equality? And she replied saying that's different. My sister has spent a lot of time gushing over this guy, so naturally when last week she found out that he was also invited to the same house party she was, she was thrilled. The party happened a few days later and my sister came home in the morning slightly hungover. She went to bed and later that night I asked her how the party went. She went on to tell me that she got with her crush. I was excited for her and I asked her to tell me how it came about. And when she started speaking my jaw started dropping until it had literally reached the floor. She said that after having some drinks she got the courage to go talk to him and so she did. They ended up hitting it off and things started escalating from there. They started talking about the possibility of coming back to his house, but at one point disaster struck. My sister says that she lost him halfway through and went around the entire house looking for him but couldn't find him. She ended up stumbling into a bedroom where the only person was her crush. However, he was clearly almost out of it and had drank way too much. He was still conscious but barely, and would barely answer my sister when she was asking him if he was okay. Instead of getting him help however, my sister decided that the only way to make him feel better was to literally make him feel better. She said that she went down on him first while he wasn't really moving, then after threw him onto the bed and proceeded to get on top. She said that he wasn't moving much and looked almost out of it the entire time, but that didn't matter because she was still able to cross the finish line. When my sister told me this I told her that she roped him, and she said no that's not possible because girls can't rope guys, and if anything he was the one who roped her because she was still tipsy. I called her insane and told her that what she did was criminal and I don't want to see her for the time being. That night I texted the guy as I had his socials asking him if he was okay. He knew I was my sister's brother and we got to talking. Turns out that what my sister did impacted him a lot and he was feeling very violated. I told him how she talked about what happened and he said that was disgusting of my sister, which I of course agreed with. I asked if he wanted to do anything about it, and he said he was considering pressing charges because although he did want to sleep with her first, when he was barely conscious he did not want to see anyone much less sleep with anyone. He said he was worried about the stigma that came with getting roped by a girl as a guy and wasn't sure whether he would be taken seriously. I told him I had his back however and urged him to follow legal action if he felt like he had to. He ended up saying he thinks he will sue her and asked me to help him out by testifying against my sister and informing the court of my sister's words and attitude towards the whole situation. I said yes and he is contacting lawyers right now date my insane feminist sister literally roped a guy at a house party and claimed she did nothing wrong, so he and I teamed up to sue her. So my sister ended up getting served with papers within a few weeks time and told she was being tried for rope. The court process was long and brutal. My sister at first tried to claim to the courts that she did nothing wrong and that she doesn't think women can rope men, but her lawyer literally stood up and twisted her words in a way which wouldn't make her sound so unbelievably stupid to the judge and jury. Her lawyer claimed that consent was given previously and that her crush was in a position to consent and while the act was going on, he did not say no or put up a physical fight to stop it, despite being conscious. This was the lawyer's main point and it was a strong one, as technically she was correct. The guy was still conscious, albeit barely, and did not actually say no. I'll admit I am a little disappointed in myself for this, but I refused to testify against my sister in the end. I don't care that she did that, I don't care that she is a radical feminist, she did many things for me in my life and covered for me whenever I needed her, and for that I can never thank her enough. It would hurt me deeply to testify against her and be the reason that she goes behind bars. This hurt the guy a lot and he seemed to be betrayed by me, but he told me he understood why I didn't do it. Nonetheless, my sister did not get away scot-free. She was given a fine but was not imprisoned, rather jailed for three months and put on the offender's list, which is still very severe and will no doubt impact her life, but her outcome would have been a lot worse had I decided to testify. Currently me and her are not on speaking terms as she believes I should have denied instead of choosing to remain silent. She ended up serving her sentence and was kicked out of school for it too. She is living with our parents and is blaming me for the entire thing. This reaction of hers makes me regret not testifying to be honest as she seems to not take any accountability for what she did to this day, not knowing that the outcome for her could have been a lot worse. There are some crazy health facts you didn't know were true. 1. Most protein products are a scam because the amount of protein listed on the label isn't the amount that you're actually consuming. Since you can't count how many grams are in a protein product, you have to estimate how much protein there should be by measuring the nitrogen balance. Usually, the more nitrogen a product has, the more protein there should be, but this can be easily faked by increasing the nitrogen balance and using cheaper substitutes. This is called amino spiking, and companies do this to lower manufacturing costs and make a quick profit from consumers. 2. Hemp bars increase your resting energy expenditure, which is the number of calories your body burns when you're not exercising. Unlike most protein products, these bars have protein and fiber, which can boost your metabolism. And because of the fiber, you can easily take out green juices from your diet and replace them with a daily hemp bar. And no, hemp has nothing to do with 420. This is also a much cheaper alternative to green juices. 3. Despite popular belief, eggs are extremely good for you. The cholesterol in eggs doesn't raise your blood cholesterol levels because dietary cholesterol doesn't always have a major effect on blood cholesterol. Also, eggs are naturally a good source of protein that is used to build muscles and improve muscle health, which helps with weight loss. 4. Drinking coffee on an empty stomach first thing in the morning isn't 
isn't bad for you, and won't spike your cortisol or make you gain belly fat, your body adapts to drinking coffee in the morning. So just enjoy your cup of joe the second you wake up, I know I will. 5. Green powders like Bloom don't actually heal your guts, if they did your mom would use them, nor do they reverse bloating. Their fiber counts are insanely high so they'll just make you drop an atomic bomb in the bathroom. You just have to eat more vegetables instead of drinking green laxatives every day. 6. Repeating workouts usually causes you to hit a plateau because your metabolism stops adapting, and then you're not building any muscle. Sometimes you just have to rest. Don't watch any Goggins clips while you rest though, that will only get you to go back out and hit the gym. 7. You can eat after 8 p.m. and this won't make you gain weight because weight gain depends on caloric intake, not the time you eat. The only reason people say this is because your cravings heighten at night while your inhibitions lower. So, you're just overeating, which can happen at any time of day. You're just more affected at night. 8. Your body has no idea how to tell you it's thirsty. So if you think you're always hungry and aren't drinking enough water, that's your body's way of telling you you're chronically dehydrated. Knowing the difference can keep you from snacking so much, which will help you reach your goal weight much quicker, and you'll get proper hydration. If your body is constantly sending SOS signals that you're thirsty, then you're likely one step away from looking like Spongebob at Sandy's. Tried to get revenge on my liquid kid's guzzling sister but she ruined her own life. When I, 29, was little like 7 years old, my dad cheated on my mother with my stepmom, Karen. After her divorce, my mom moved away and got married again. I was always under the impression that my mother abandoned me and that's what my dad told me too. Karen had a daughter at that time who was 5, Mia. Mia and I were kinda close growing up. But when we both hit puberty our personality was different. Mia was the typical girly girl. She developed beautifully. She was basically like Cassie from Euphoria. She would get all the attention. Even my relatives preferred her more than me. I was basically a nerd. I was interested in sports but I was told that I do not look bad and I am very attractive and pretty in my own way. But I was overshadowed by Mia. My dad was someone who was an opportunist. Whenever he would see an opportunity for him to shine, he would take it. Even if it meant sidelining his own daughter. He saw that Mia got more attention than me so he invested everything on her. I was kinda jealous. But I wasn't really that bothered because I believed if I did something good I would be appreciated. So, I studied hard and got into a prestigious university. That was the only time my father threw a party for me because I was the first in the family to do it. But Mia was jealous of it. So, anyways, during my last year of high school I started dating Tim, 30. He proposed to me when we were sophomores in college. But we decided to wait till our graduation. So one day during our semester break, I went to his home and I saw him effing Mia. I was shocked to say the least. I remember I was crying and screaming at him. I could never forget the smirk on Mia's face. That's when I knew Mia was a B-word. So, my dad and stepmom knew about it and guess what? My dad told me to forgive them. His logic Tim fell out of love with me so he fell in love with your sister. You should give them your blessing instead of being petty, I shouted back, of course you will say that because you cheated on mom. My dad and I had a screaming match. He told me he would disown me if I do not accept them and come to their wedding. I remember that I stormed off and I cried for days. That's the moment I realized I was alone. My dad didn't care if I was dead or alive. I started therapy after a friend of mine pushed me to it. It did help a bit but in my mind I wanted some revenge. I wanted to be petty and make her regret it. I started thinking about what I could do. My initial plan was to wear white on her wedding day. But then I ran into Mia's ex, Jay. Jay and Mia have been one of those couples who are on again off again. Mia exploited Jay a lot. The last time they broke up was when Jay caught Mia flirting with one of his friends. But there was a lot of history. So, when Jay learned about Mia and Tim he was a little angry. He kept saying he wishes he could just take revenge on all the times Mia has done him wrong. So, I had another plan. I asked him to be my plus one at her wedding. I know Mia still has feelings for Jay. It would piss her off. But we agreed that after that we would part ways. So when the wedding came, I was not in the wedding party. My dad was cordial with me because I wasn't creating trouble. So I went to her wedding with Jay and I was wearing a bright red dress because I read that red means you slept with the groom. It was also over the top. I might have made some heads turn. When Mia saw me with Jay her face turned pale. I was purposely being very touchy with Jay like whispering in his ears, touching his shoulder, dancing with him very closely. I swear Mia was just as red as my dress. I was also asked to give a speech. I kept it short, thank god I do not have more sisters otherwise Tim would have swapped Mia with one of them. You know he has a fetish of effing his fiancé's sisters behind her back. Me and Jay were asked to leave. The next day I was. Bombarded with messages and phone calls. I didn't pick any of them. As for Jay he stuck to our deal and I never saw him again. After the wedding incident, I decided I should find my mom because something in me was telling me that she didn't abandon me. It wasn't hard to find her. I found her on Facebook and we started chatting. She is married and has two boys, my half-brothers. I got the real story from her. She didn't abandon me. My father won the custody case. He used my mom's past substance abuse to take away her visitation rights too. We reconciled and for the first time in my life I felt welcomed. I also met my stepfather and my two brothers. They are amazing people. Since then, I would regularly meet them. Two years after the wedding incident, I met a guy, Andy. We met during an alumni program in our college. He also went to our college but he was five years my senior. We had a lot in common. He was kind, sweet and very mature. He knows about my past and has been really supportive. He was better than Tim in every other way. He was charming and had a really higher position in his job. 
After two years my sister contacted me out of the blue and told me she was pregnant and she now wants to bury the hatchets. I was very reluctant. I was afraid that she would try to steal Andy away from me as well. But Andy reassured me he is not that weak. Honestly, I do wanted to meet dad again. So, I gave it a shot anyways. I went on dinner with Andy. And to my surprise Tim recognized him. It was later revealed to me that Andy was basically Tim's boss. This is the fact I didn't know. My dad and stepmom brought me to a corner and said that my relationship with Andy is unacceptable because I am trying to hurt my sister by dating Tim's boss. I told them to F off. My love life is none of their business. The dinner went sour. After that I got a drunken call from Tim that he is very unhappy with my sister and that he actually wants to escape. He never knew what he lost until he saw. Me with Andy. I ignored him totally. Then the phone's calls didn't stop. First it was my dad telling me that me dating Andy is causing tension between my sister and Tim. I told him their marital life is none of my business. I got call from my stepsister who asked if she could come to my house and talk. I told her after the dinner party, I want nothing to do with any of them. That B. TCH didn't listen. Instead she went to Andy's office to convince him to talk to me. Of course Tim saw this and accused her of trying to seduce Andy like he seduced him. Long story short, Andy had to fire Tim for his misbehave. This caused even more tension. Tim became verbally abusive towards Mia and said his life was ruined because of her. They separated. Tim is trying to figure out how can he handle the divorce proceedings. After the Tim and Mia drama, my dad suddenly showed up in my apartment. He was bawling his eyes out that he caught Karen sleeping with his male cousin. He was devastated. So, I told him what he said to me when Tim cheated on me, Karen fell out of love with you so she fell in love with your cousin. You should give them your blessing instead of being petty. My dad was confused. I further told him well you taught me this remember? When I was sad about Tim cheating on me with Mia. You told me to forgive them my father's face was rotten to say the least. Now I have two family members who are going through divorce. Tim and Mia tried to reconcile but eventually they settled for divorce. My dad did apologize to me for what he did to me and mom. I told him that he deserved what's coming for him and that I have no feeling left for him. Not even pity. If the time ever comes I might forgive him but I don't want him anymore. He will not be walking me down the aisle. Andy and I are recently engaged. We are having a small ceremony with just close friends and family. I was only planning for a petty revenge but karma got them better. My ex's pick me friend lied about me and now they're crawling back. I, 26, was with my ex-boyfriend, 26, for 4 years. We moved in after 2 years of dating and were genuinely happy. I genuinely thought that I was going to marry him one day. I even moved to a different country to stay with him when his job relocated him to Europe. Throughout our relationship I noticed that one of his girlfriends, 25, didn't really like me. I've tried many times to befriend her but I gave up after constantly being on the receiving end of her cold shoulder and snarky remarks. X knew about this and told me that she didn't have that many girlfriends and probably didn't know how to be friends with another woman. She's the only woman in their clique of seven guys, who are all lovely to me. On the 31st of December 2019, both of us attended a party to celebrate New Year's. I don't drink so I was completely sober. X got completely smashed. The next afternoon I woke up to my stuff packed and him telling me that we were done and that I had to move out. I was completely blindsided and so confused. He accused me of cheating on him. I would never do that. I think it's such a terrible thing to do. I remember crying so hard and telling him that I did no such thing but he still kicked me out. My best friend and her boyfriend, without hesitation, opened up their home to me and told me that I was welcome to stay. Bless their hearts. They're the sweetest couple ever. During that dark period of time, I was trying to process everything. I was honestly so depressed. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. I felt like a zombie, like I was barely existing. I told my family what had happened and they were very upset for me and wanted me to fly back home. They live in a different country and I didn't want to travel during a pandemic and potentially put them at risk of catching this virus. While this was happening, all of our mutual friends and his family members turned against me. Choosing to believe that I was a cheater and completely cut me off in support of my ex. They posted shady stuff about me online, calling me a hoe and a cheater. Rumors started to spread and it affected me so much that I deleted all social media and blocked all of them everywhere. I just wanted to disappear. As time went on, I was one day introduced to one of my best friend's friend. He was really sweet and kind. We slowly became friends, started chatting and video calling. Fast forward to June and I feel myself slowly falling in love with him. He doesn't believe what so many people say about me being a cheater and whatnot. He asks me out on a proper virtual date and I agree. We started dating and I'm so happy. I feel like he is the light at the end of my tunnel. Well yesterday, someone from my ex's clique leaked a video on Instagram where my ex's girlfriend was boasting of how she lied and came up with this plan to break up my ex and I. She apparently paid someone to lie to my ex and tell him that I seduced him at the New Year's party and slept with him. Once that came out a lot of my ex's friends and family members have been trying to contact me. They tried contacting my best friend who basically told them to F off. My ex came to the house and was begging for me to speak to him. It was really dramatic. I feel like I don't owe them any of my time at all and just want them to leave me alone. However, my parents think that it's a little sad that my ex is outside the house crying and begging to speak to me. They think that maybe I should give him a chance to speak to me. I feel really conflicted. I feel like I'm being too harsh on him and his group of friends. Should I establish a line of communication? What should I do? My three-month-old daughter is putting creeps away in bars. My almost three-month-old daughter has been subpoenaed to testify in a criminal case. 
Last Thursday a process server came to our house and served a subpoena for a criminal case on my daughter, who was born on April 15, 2015. I called the number on it to explain how it must be a mistake because my daughter is not even three months old yet but I was told there was no mistake and my daughter is required to appear as a witness to testify on the date shown on the subpoena. I went in person with my daughter to the DA's office and was told the same thing. My husband and I thought this might be a case of identity theft. She doesn't have a social security number yet because she was born at 29 weeks, spent 11 weeks in the NICU and has only been home from the hospital for 7 days so we haven't gotten around to it yet. We checked anyway just in case and one has not been created for her or issued to her. Nothing with her credit either. We called the police about it possibly being identity theft and they are looking into it but so far there is nothing and they also told us the subpoena is legitimate. So we are very confused. My daughter has a rare and uncommon first, middle and last name, so it is very doubtful that there is someone else with her exact name. When I called the number on the subpoena and went to the DA's office I was told both times that if she doesn't show up for court a warrant will be issued for her arrest. Would the police actually arrest a baby for not showing up in court? Or would my husband and I as her parents be arrested instead? Does anyone have an explanation for what is happening here or any advice as to what we can do to solve this? My desperate sister wants me to give her my baby and my husband. She's always been entitled but it's reached a new level. It's me, 28, my husband Lucas, 39, and my younger half-sister, dad's side, Leah, 24. My husband and I met through work five years ago but didn't date right away, we tied the knot by eloping two years ago as I predicted Leah would cause wedding drama. Leah herself had a failed engagement one year ago, we gave her our condolences but she said if I really cared I would stop wearing my engagement ring around her flaunting it. I obviously did not take it off, it's a vintage ring that is an heirloom in Lucas's family. I'm now five months pregnant with a baby girl. It wasn't planned but she's a very welcome surprise. Lucas is so excited to be a girl dad it's very funny. Ever since I announced my pregnancy, Leah has been very snippy and standoffish with me. It didn't really affect me, we're not close. But then I noticed when we'd go to visit my dad, or are at family gatherings she's very touchy with Lucas, she giggles at every joke he makes. It doesn't really bother me, I'm secure in my marriage and if anything it makes her look silly. We had a blended family event with both mom and dad's side and we were discussing baby names when Leah freaked out screeching at me that she's the one who deserves a husband and a baby not me because I never wanted marriage or kids, I was focused on getting a career. And stormed off. Later on my dad and his wife said she shouldn't have shouted but I was flaunting my marriage and pregnancy when I knew she had a failed engagement and had always wanted a baby. I thought that was it but yesterday the three of them asked to talk and they came over to ours and they legitimately asked if I would give Leah my baby. Like they weren't joking they said it seriously. They said she deserved it more than me as she wouldn't neglect being a mother for a career. Lucas was stunned but then promptly got them out of our house. I heard Leah clinging too. His arm telling him she could be a good stay-at-home mom. My mom and her side of the family are furious. Leah's mom said it was malicious of me to tell my mom's family and that I had really upset Leah when we eloped so I had to make it up to her and that my mom doesn't get a say. I've turned a goose into my ARCH nemesis and we get into a fist fight every single day. So over the last two months or so, I have been involved in 28 fist fights, all of which are with this one particular effing goose. You see, I live by a very quiet canal which is pleasant to walk by. This is a walk I like to take every morning, and it also happens to be the walk where my arch nemesis, the goose, resides. It all started two months ago. I was walking down the canal when I noticed a goose. Being an animal lover, I went over and ripped off a piece of my sandwich, then gave it to the goose. He ate it, then being the little nimrod that he is, snatched the entire leftover of my sandwich out of my hand. He moved so fast I barely saw him, and as he was eating it, I tried to lunge for the sandwich to get it back. The goose then kicked me, I have never seen a goose kick before so this was new. Knowing that I will never be defeated by a goose, I tried again. By this point, the sandwich was in this greedy goose's belly, so when I came back for a rematch with this goose, he bit my hand hard. The bite was hard, so in retort I swung my other fist at the goose and missed, but I managed to graze his beak. This angered the goose, so it bit the other hand, and so I was stuck with two wounded hands and no sandwich. This round went to the goose. Annoyed, I walked off and went home, not even finishing my walk. The next day I walked again, and in the same spot who do I see, the same exact goose standing there. I know it was the same goose because it had a distinct black spot on its neck, which was here this time too. Once again I was carrying a sandwich and this time, I was going to be clever. I walked over intending to tease the goose, and that's what I did. I held out my hand with a piece of sandwich, and as the goose went to snatch it, I pulled my hand back, laughing at the idiot goose and calling it stupid as I ate the bit of sandwich that was in my hand. Well, I closed my eyes for half a second enjoying the sandwich while mocking the goose, and half a second is all it took for this goose to snatch the rest of my sandwich out of my hand. I realized what had happened and that it was me who had been bamboozled. So I tried to snatch the sandwich back out of the goose's mouth. Long story short, I ended up with a bruised forearm and no sandwich. It was now 2-0 to zero to the goose. And so I have done this dance with the goose basically every second day since that incident. I go outside with a sandwich, tease the goose with it, and try to walk off smugly without letting him have any. Unfortunately this does not always go how I planned it, as once the goose chased me until I had no choice but to throw the sandwich on the ground for the goose to eat it and leave me alone. I have won this battle a few times, but the goose ends up winning most of the time. I actually keep track of the score, currently it's 18 to 10 in favor of the goose. My entitled neighbor is demanding I put my dog down because he viciously attacked her kid. The kid deserved it and she is taking me to court over it.
I have a neighbor who embodies the Karen stereotype. She is in her 40s with the classic Karen haircut and is as entitled as they come. I remember the very first day she moved in with me she tried to negotiate with me what times her and her kid could come over to my backyard and use the pool. I of course told her she could not use my pool, but a few weeks later I came home to find her and her 6-year-old kid using my pool without any permission. When she saw me she claimed it was too hot of a day to pass up the opportunity to have a swim. I told her she is lucky I'm not calling the police for trespassing and she got in my face about being friendly neighbors and how neighbors are supposed to share things. The thing is, her six-year-old kid has grown to be just as entitled as her mother and even worse. He has on many occasions come to my doorstep demanding to use my pool, demanding to have some sweets or anything else that he thought he could have. Whenever I turned him down I was met with a barrage of tears coming from him and even sometimes screaming. A couple of minutes later his mother would join in and also give out to me for not letting her kid swim unattended in my swimming pool. I called her crazy on many occasions and have told her that this is negligence and if she keeps this up I will call CPS on her for it. She seemed to take this threat of mine seriously and has backed off for a while. However, the trouble started around six months ago when I got a new puppy, a Labrador to be exact. The first time this kid saw the puppy he went mental wanting to pet it and play with it, which was totally okay with me. However I quickly saw that the way this kid played and pet my dog was totally unacceptable, with his petting being super aggressive and his playing resorting to literally kicking my dog sometimes. The first. Time I saw this I quickly pulled him away from my dog and told him that he has no right to do that at all, and he retorted back saying he was only playing with, before reaching his foot out and trying to kick my dog again. I ended up giving out to him in a manner as gentle as I deemed possible but before I knew it, the kid was crying crocodile tears and running to his mother claiming that I verbally assaulted him and even called him the n-word, which is the dumbest thing I have ever heard because he is white. Anyways, his mother and I had an altercation and she told me not to pick on her kid anymore and I told her that her kid is not to pick on my dog anymore. Clearly however, neither the kid nor the mother had any interest in listening to me as just a few days later when I was walking my dog the kid ran over and started petting my dog very aggressively to the point that my puppy started whining. I once again told him to back off and he did, with his mother coming up to me mere minutes later to give out. This has been a cycle that has been happening for almost half a year now. However three days ago the kid took his misdemeanors way too far. I was walking my puppy and he ran up very abruptly and proceeded to swing his foot back and boot the dog in his leg, making him wince with pain. I turned around and yelled at the kid, which may not have been my place, but I swore at him asking what the f did you do that for. And the kid proceeded to toe poke me in the shin as hard as he could right after I said that. I was about to flip out when I saw my Labrador lunge at the kid and bite his leg, drawing red and making the kids fall to the ground and start crying. I ended up getting my dog to back off after he tried to bite him the second time. The kid stood up a minute or solitaire and started swearing at me, saying he was going to get his mom and she is going to whip my effing butt. Lo and behold, not even 10 minutes later, the mom is at my door ready to take my head off. As soon as I opened the door she tried to march into my house and I had to hold her back. She then started yelling at me that I was a child lover, that I was an awful man for yelling at her kid and how dare I swear to him. He's just a kid and if he wants to kick the dog he can kick the dog, it's not up to me to discipline him it's up to her. I told her that maybe she should give the john to someone else because she is clearly terrible at it. She then exploded at me, telling me not to insult her and that she wants the dog put down. I laughed in her face and told her this was not going to happen, but she yelled at me again that it would. I ended up kicking her out by threatening to call the police. She ended up leaving then. I thought this was all over to be honest as I never expected her to actually try follow through with anything, but yesterday she sent me a message letting me know she will be suing me for emotional distress and the kid's medical bills as apparently he had to go to the hospital over and will try to get a court order for the kid to put down. I am actually kind of worried now, what if she wins? Date my entitled neighbor is demanding I put my dog down because he viciously attacked her kid. The kid deserved it and she is taking me to court over it. So my entitled Karen neighbor did end up suing me and taking me to court. She sued for emotional distress and her goal was to get my dog put down as well as get her medical bills paid for. However, she made a small mistake in the fact that there were no medical bills to be paid as it turns out her and her kid never even went to the hospital, instead covering the wound with a plaster which healed in a few days. My lawyer and I were able to use this to state that suing me is nothing more than a personal vengeance which she has against me and she has no actual legal claim over this. She also tried to claim that my dog attacked her child ruthlessly unprovoked. This is exactly where she messed up. You see, I was walking my dog on the road just outside my house, and there is a security camera planted on my wall which faces exactly that direction. I was able to retrieve the footage and showcase anyone who was interested that my dog did not attack unprovoked. In fact, it was very clear to see that the kid runs up and out of nowhere thumps the dog very hard, who ends up literally falling over in pain. I then can be seen turning around looking furious, as as I start to say something the kid toe pokes my shin extremely hard. That's when my dog pounced and bit the kid, and the bite itself was not an extremely hard one, and my dog didn't hold onto the leg either. Actually, after that toe poke from the kid, my shin had started hurting a few days later so I went to the hospital and it was revealed that I have a small fracture, which I of course gave proof of in the court. So in the end not only did the entitled neighbor not get awarded anything or have my dog put down, she actually ended up having to pay for my medical bills. My boyfriend got drunk and cheated on me because I was too depressed and he couldn't deal with me anymore, but people are telling me his actions are very much justified, plus update. In the last two years a lot has happened, but I don't know what went wrong with me. I woke up one morning and for some reason didn't want to do anything and instead stayed in bed all day. That spell of me wanting to do nothing and staying in bed kept up for two years. My boyfriend of three years did all he could to help me. 
He booked nine different therapist appointments for me until I found one I liked. He didn't get angry when I lost my job for not going in and instead took up extra shifts at his job to assist with the extra expense. He got a second job to help out more. He came home after work and cleaned the house, did the laundry and cooked for us every single night. He never went off on me and I could see the care in his eyes as all he wanted was for me to get better. He paid for every therapist, doctor appointment and I never heard a complaint. I don't know what was wrong with me, even my therapist was stumped, we tried multiple types of medications but nothing worked. Even after a bunch of medical tests done on me, the doctors themselves said I am in perfect health. My previous therapist has even suggested that it's all in my head and I'm taking advantage of my boyfriend because he is so caring and I love being taken care of. I told my boyfriend afterwards and he booked me an appointment with a new therapist for the following week because I felt completely invalidated in my struggle. During this time it broke my heart to see my boyfriend come home after working 12 to 16 hours and starting to clean up and do everything around the house. I wanted to help but just couldn't. I don't know why. I just constantly felt drained. Our bedroom during this time also came to a complete standstill as I wasn't in the mood. Every plan he made I didn't want to do. Dinner, plans with friends. Vacations. All had to be cancelled because I didn't want to go and changed my mind last second, costing us a lot of money. His whole life basically for the last two years consisted of him going to work and coming home and taking care of me, taking me to appointments and therapy. Well, last week Friday he came home and saw the house. I strayed home and tried to not make a mess in the house but failed at that. I ordered myself takeout and left every dish unwashed and the sauce I spilled was still on the floor. He looked at the mess in the house and turned around, walking out saying he is going for a drink as he can't deal with this anymore. I started to call and message him because his last sentence got me scared but he didn't answer his phone. He came back Saturday morning, saying we needed to talk. He told me he can't do this anymore as he is feeling that I'm choosing not to get better at this point and he has done everything in his power and is breaking himself in the process and he is done. He also told me that he had a one-night stand with a girl he met at the bar. I wanted to get angry and shout at him but I couldn't. He asked me to please stay quiet until after he is done speaking. He let it all out, everything he has been bottling up over the last couple of months. Hearing him say all those things that he has been through and the thoughts in his head just broke my heart, all the pain he was going through and the fact that he felt like I was using him as a wallet and a servant. After he was done talking he said we should break up. Even though it was a one-night stand and it happened out of drunkenness and frustration, he still can't believe he did that. He doesn't see this relationship going any further. He hasn't once blamed me for anything or said it's my fault for him cheating. He took responsibility and took all the blame and hasn't tried to justify anything. I truly understand, and want to work this out. I don't want to lose him. He is literally. A one in a million man. Update, he didn't actually cheat on me. I got a call from his friend saying he left his watch over at his house. I asked what he meant because my boyfriend told me he went out alone. According to his friend he called him on Friday to have some drinks and got way too drunk and crashed at his house. I thought he was covering for my boyfriend but he sent me the video footage of them returning to his house drunk and falling over each other. Now I'm sitting here wondering if he really wants to get rid of me so badly that he is willing to make himself the bad guy before breaking up with me. My manipulative wife has been sleeping with her personal trainer in exchange for free classes. So I slept with mine after forgiving her. Over the past couple of years my wife suffered two miscarriages and slumped into a depression which led to her overeating a lot and packing on quite a few pounds. She became very insecure about her looks over this time and would constantly ask me for reassurance on whether or not I still thought she was beautiful. She finally had enough after her own mother told her she was built like a beanbag and joined our local gym about one year ago. She noticed a lot of progress in around six months and had lost most of the weight she had gained over the years by trying extremely hard. I was so proud of her and around six months into her gym journey, she hired a personal trainer to further help her out. She showed me a picture of him and naturally I felt a little insecure. He was in amazing shape, looked in his 30s and styled his hair just how my wife liked it. Plus my wife had already cheated on me once around six years ago so I knew she was capable of things like that, but I pushed the doubts to the back of mind and wrote them off as silly worries. Well, I started suspecting something when she came home from the gym two months after hiring the guy, exclaiming she was so good that the guy was willing to give her a discount on her sessions with him. I told her he is probably doing that because he wants to sleep with her, and she got angry at me, saying that just because she cheated once in the past doesn't mean she'll do it again. She's changed and that she thought I said I was over it. That was a rough night for the two of us. I don't know why but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was going on between them. She came home from sessions with him smiling like she had never smiled before, she woke up with a smile on her face if it was the day that he was going to train her, and when his birthday came around she decided to take him out too. Dinner. When she informed me of this fact I told her there was no way at all that I was okay with this, and she said that this was just her way to show her appreciation for everything that he has done for her. I tried to tell her no but ultimately, I could never say no to my wife, so I let her go for her dinner. She ended up coming home later that night around 10pm slightly tipsy, saying that they had a little drink and bragging about the fact that she was even able to see his abs through his white shirt when he accidentally spilled the wine on himself. She made a joke about how I should start asking him for advice on how to look as good as him. Hearing all of this was devastating as I was sure if the affair wasn't physical, it was for sure emotional at least. 
Just a few days later she came to me telling me she had some amazing news, that her trainer was willing to give her free classes if she taught him to draw. My wife is an amazing drawer and apparently he really wants to get into art, so they struck a deal where once a week they would meet up in a cafe and draw for three hours straight in return for her getting free PT sessions. I snapped and accused my wife of cheating on me, but she denied the claim and let me look through her phone and her texts with him. I actually found nothing more than them planning their PT times or sending each other cat memes. However, I was still not convinced. The day of my wife's first ever drawing session with her PT I got off early from work and followed her car using the tracker I planted in between her seats in the morning. The tracker led me from the gym to our house and I followed her quite far behind in order to avoid detection. I was able to get near our house without her noticing and unlock the door. What I saw was what I feared the worst, which was his shoes in the hallway, and what I heard was the sound of the bed creaking. I ended up catching them there and then, and the PT quickly scurried out of the house. And my wife started begging me to forgive her. This all happened two months ago and I went to stay with my best friend for a week. I returned home to my wife and told her I forgive her as long as we are never to speak of this again and she cut contact with that PT. She agreed and life went on as normal for about a week when I told my wife I wanted to join a gym, but I wanted to work out alone and joined a different gym to her. Well, I've been going for around six weeks and have hired a PT behind my wife's back. I'm a bi man and so I hired the PT who connected with my gaydar the most, and me and him got to talking on a more personal level than a PT and client. I am currently sleeping with him once or twice a week and he knows about the situation with my wife. He has also prompted me to start divorce proceedings behind her back, which I'm also doing. Date my manipulative wife has been sleeping with her personal trainer in exchange for free classes. So I slept with mine after forgiving her. So it has been a very long time since my last post and I must say that everything went way more chaotic than I ever thought it would. So it turns out that I was not the only one still cheating, as my wife was still in contact with her personal trainer and they were now hooking up in the gym bathrooms to be as secretive as possible about it. The only reason I found out is because she got too drunk one night and spilled everything to her sister who in turn told me. I ended up confiding in this information to my own PT who urged me to divorce her. He said that ultimately this is not a woman who loves me and if I ever have children, she is not someone I would want them to look up to. I knew this, but it still hurt to hear it. With the help of my PT and his lawyer brother, I ended up drawing up some divorce papers for my wife as well as acquiring some undeniable evidence of her cheating, such as pictures of her and her PT together at a mall or entering a hotel room. When I did serve my wife, she had a complete meltdown about this coming out of the blue and tried to convey to me she was loyal. She swore on her dead's grandmother's grave, and that's when I saw just what a manipulative woman my wife really was. After she said that, I started handing her pictures and recalling what her sister told me. Instead of breaking down like I expected to, she ran upstairs and locked herself in the bathroom, where she called her sister and gave out to her for telling me. While she was in the bathroom I packed some quick essentials and left for my PT's house. He lived alone and I was able to move in with him while the divorce was going on. The divorce proceedings were very messy and my wife was very hostile towards me throughout the entire thing, trying to claim I was abusive even though she had absolutely no evidence. I managed to finally divorce her, and as soon as I did I asked my PT out. We are now 6 months in and going strong. In 2011 I escaped slavery and made money most people don't ever see, but I gave it all away to be a hero and now I need your help. It started when a man came knocking at my mother's door, he told her parents that he'll put her to work all for a small price. Without my grandmother getting a say, my grandfather sold her. My mother was no longer a burden and was enslaved at a young age to provide for her family. She was sold for a couple dollars, trafficked, and has been a slave all her life. I was born into her world and it was only until years later that I was saved from hell. My job was to work on Lake Ulta, the largest man-made lake, scuba diving every day in the dirtiest of waters, working on ships, and serving under an overseer. Whenever I failed at any of these tasks, I was beaten and denied food. I watched my mother receive senseless beatings after slaving away every single day, working for scraps. I slept every night paralyzed in fear without shelter. I laid on dry grass, paranoid wondering if I was going to be eaten by the lurking wild animals. Watching the punishments and sacrifices my mother made pushed me to keep working hard because it meant we were providing. What I didn't know at the time was that I had been conditioned to think that the child labor I did was normal, necessary even, and the cruel treatments I got was all there was to life. It was only until I saw other kids much younger than I being treated terribly that I learned there was no escape from this life. There were senseless beatings, many of my friends were malnourished, and worst of all, many of them never got to grow old with me. I watched them pass over with my very own eyes. As I watched the other kids around me draw their last breaths, I constantly wondered when it would be my turn. How many more beatings would I have to take? Every day was a constant battle of trying not to sink and drown in muddy water. When I was 10 years old the entire course of my life changed. My mother, in search for a better future for, her and I, gave me away. I was taken in by the Rescue Foundation many hopes. I was taken to their recovery center and for the first time in my entire life I was given food, water, and adequate sleep, without having to worry if it'd be taken away from me. I had clothes to put on my back and I couldn't understand the generosity of the people doing this for me. I never asked for anything and they continuously kept providing me with everything I'd ever need to actually live. They took me back to my actual hometown and I was finally allowed to live with my grandmother. I was granted the opportunity to a completely free education paid by many hopes. I was happy to learn but I had so much catching up to do, I didn't even know how to hold a pencil. I was a slave for all my life and this was my first time learning anything that wasn't ships. I regularly thought about the other kids at the lake and how many of them wouldn't have a home to go to even if free. I thought about other people like my mother, who lost their childhood and worked all their life. Many hopes granted me a way out but my only job now was to work harder than everyone else in my class. I needed to do it for my mother who slaved her life away, helping me get set up, 
and for my grandmother who took me in. All of my continuous hard work paid off and I was awarded the highest honors of admission to university, all semesters and supplies paid for by many hopes. It didn't mean my struggle stopped there. Working in school through all the traumas Lake Ulta gave me was one of the biggest challenges I faced. I had many sleepless nights and this affected me in school at times. Physically I was free, but my mind wanted to take me back to the lake. I tried to forget everything about the endless murky lake, all the kids that were beaten and starved. But I had to keep moving forward, I had to break the cycle in Ghana of desperation and show that no human has a price. After graduating from university with a business degree, I was granted an incredible job working for marketing campaigns. I flew on private planes for companies like Shell Oil and Tiffany's. I did everything everyone around me thought I would never do. I worked from literal rags to riches. However, there was a gap inside me that I still couldn't fill. Though I achieved freedom, the fact is there are still kids hauling ships, moving nets, being beaten every breathing moment. I couldn't leisurely work at my job knowing I still have brothers and sisters left behind that needed a chance to be saved. I made the bold decision to quit my career and went back to Ghana and worked at the Many Hopes and Challenging Heights Rescue Center, the same exact one that saved me. When I returned to my home village of Winneba I was greeted by the children, hugged, and paraded by all of them. I knew I had the knowledge and expertise to show the kids in Ghana that they too can be like me. Right now I'm running investigations to locate kids that are trafficked, finding out where their home is, and freeing them out of slavery. The trauma, scars, mental illnesses, and stolen childhoods is almost unbearable to witness. I don't wish it upon anyone. Our Many Hopes facility receives donations till this day and every cent goes a long way to ending modern slavery. It's remarkable to think there are good people in the world that care about our cause and care about saving these kids. It's so easy to live in comfort and turn a blind eye to the rest of the world, like I almost did while I was in school. But I've seen change being made from those that pay attention. I myself am a prime example of the change made by people who care. I took in my niece because her family torment her. My nephew Josh is quite spoiled. His parents, my brother and sister-in-law show blatant favoritism towards him over his younger sister Lou. As a result, Josh has grown a little entitled. He also is quite mean to his younger sister because his parents never believe her when she tells him what he's done to her. Now, I'm usually very strict and when the kids are with me for a weekend, Josh is usually on his best behavior. Josh's birthday was yesterday. Lou had a spelling bee last week and she got first prize. Her parents brushed it off but I was very happy for her because she spent hours learning each word and I was very proud. So when I took the kids out the day before Josh's birthday so he could pick out a gift for his birthday, I got Lou a stuffed animal as a you did great. Josh picked this game that he's been wanting. The birthday party was yesterday and when I went to their house, Lou had been grounded and was not allowed to attend and the two friends she had invited were also sent back home. I thought it was extreme and asked what she had done. Turns out that Josh and her argued over the TV remote and Josh went to her room and destroyed her stuffed animal that I gave her and told her she didn't deserve it. Lou screamed at him and my brother got angry with her temper tantrum and had her pick up the pieces of the stuffed animal and throw them in the trash all the while she cried. She was then grounded. Josh's best friend was the one who spilled the beans to me and also told me that Josh goaded his parents into the punishment. I was furious and refused to give Josh his birthday present, telling him he didn't deserve it for being mean to his sister. I also told my sister-in-law and brother that they're growing insanely cruel towards their young daughter. Now my family is angry that I refuse to give Josh his birthday gift. I picked up my niece from my brother's house this morning. I called him and told him if she's being so rude to her brother, then maybe she should stay with me a couple of days to calm down. I got her a massive teddy bear which she's keeping in my house and I took her out to get McDonald's so she's smiling. Update I took in my niece because her family torment her. I did end up taking my niece with me for a few days and I sat her down and talked to her when she was calm. There were a lot of things that were happening in that house that I was not aware of. My nephew bullies her and my brother thinks it's funny when she cries. A few months ago, my niece had an accident and fractured her left arm. I was told she slipped down the stairs. She is clumsy so I thought that was that. Turned out her brother pushed her down the stairs as a prank and my brother laughed while she was crying very loudly. I verified the story from a neighbor who told me that she ended up taking her to hospital. Her father was apparently shouting at her to stop making a racket when she wouldn't stop crying. I lost it at that. I asked her if her mom knew. She said yes. I called my parents and asked them about this incident and a couple others and at first they he hawed, but then my mom admitted she knew and that it was just kids being kids. I just saw red at that point. This whole week I've been gathering any bit of evidence I can find. Finally, I invited over my brother and his wife. I told them that if they didn't get their crap together, I was posting everything on social media. I was going to email it to their companies and friends. At first my brother was furious and when he tried to attack me, I pointed towards the camera I have in my living room. I was so angry that I felt like I was numb. I knew that this would destroy my relationship with my entire family but they left a little girl screaming on the bottom of the stairs and my brother laughed. I can't get that image out of my head. I told them I could either call CPS and get Lou taken from them, or they could give her to me. The problem with this threat is that if I went the CPS route, I would lose Lou as well. I told them if they don't want a daughter, they can give her to me. They can pretend she never existed. My sister-in-law started crying about how I was taking her child from her. I admittedly got angry over that and reminded her she wanted to terminate Lou when she was pregnant. I was legit angry crying at that moment. I wanted to hurt them. My brother was just silent. He was actually considering it. 
I told them it was better than having their dirty laundry aired in public because if it did, both kids would be removed from their house. It was blackmail but I had no options. They said they'd think about it but Lou is with me for now. My sister-in-law was pretty nasty about it too. In her words, keep the little piece of poop. My friend is a lawyer and he's told me to get a voice message from them that Lou is going to stay with me. My sister-in-law said this over the voice note. Lou hasn't mentioned going home. She doesn't talk about her parents. Yesterday, she and I went out and brought this lavender color paint and we painted my entire guest room for her. I've decided to pick up more projects so that I can start saving for her. I did have some money set aside for a potential college fund for her. But I'll be picking up more work to save more and give her a comfortable life. I did get calls from my parents shouting at me. I closed the phone on them. The only person who is supportive is my cousin. He said that if CPS do get involved, he can take Lou in and I can move closer to them or something. Lou is just quiet. She's happy sometimes and sometimes she's just quiet. I fear she suffered more abuse in that house than she's letting on. My lawyer friend recommended a child therapist so I've booked a session for Monday. It's been three days and no call from my brother and sister-in-law. My parents call every now and then to yell at me but they yell at me either way so whatever. Update 2, I took in my niece because her family torment her. Lou has been removed from my care. CPS took her away four days ago. She's with my cousin and she's called me crying, multiple times because she wants to come back. I wasn't allowed to accompany her because they think that I might be a danger to her. I was wrong when I thought my brother would back down. And I was an idiot for thinking he would give over Lou so calmly. Five days ago I was home with Lou. She was watching a movie and I was working when the power cut off. I gave her my laptop and tried to calm her down as I was worried myself. At the time, I didn't really realize at that point that without the electricity my security cameras don't work. As it turns out, my brother had turned off the breaker for the electricity. He broke in. I shoved Lou into my room and made her lock the door. He laid hands on me very badly. I think he would have unalived me if my neighbors hadn't heard the commotion. Her father was home and he barged over. He got my brother off of me and my neighbor called the police. This is where things got messy. I'm still wounded and I can't put my weight on my left leg. My brother claimed that I had kidnapped Lou and was roping her, and my nephew Josh and he were here to get her back. I had evidence that they had given Lou over willingly and when it came to abuse allegations, it was Lou's word against her brother and parents. Yes, apparently Josh parroted those words. The two policemen who showed up seemed suspicious when Lou kept clinging to me, refusing to go. I don't know how I was functioning in that moment but I managed to call my lawyer who dealt with most of it. I had to be taken to the hospital. I recorded a lot of conversations. My brother's allegations and my sister-in-law's words about Lou made a weak case. But it was enough for CPS to get involved. They removed both Josh and Lou because I started talking. I had evidence, loads of it and I shoved it down their throats. I was still. In my apartment at that point. I hadn't left for the hospital. I couldn't. Lou was crying. My lawyer was on his way. If I had gone I was scared they would give Lou to my brother. I filed charges against my brother. The police accompanied me and let me keep Lou by my side. I don't have any brown bones so I was discharged the next afternoon. I would like to point out that my parents visited and tried to take Lou with them but the policeman who was with me wouldn't let them. I was also protesting. Four days ago, I got a visit from this lady from CPS who said that because of the allegations, they have to remove Lou from my care till the investigation is complete. My cousin stepped up and took her in. My parents took in Joshua this is ongoing. I don't know why they did this. My sister-in-law is telling everyone that I mistreated her children. My parents have called me but I've not answered. My lawyer wants me to go in for some evaluation. My brother is in jail because I pressed charges but I heard that my parents are going to post bail. Update 3, I took in my niece because her family torment her. The CPS lady came over this morning. She said that based on all the evidence her department has received in the interviews they have conducted from neighbors and teachers, they are confident my brother and sister-in-law's claims are baseless. It's pretty damning evidence. The biggest factor was that they took both Lou and Josh and had a child psychologist evaluate them. They don't show signs of mistreatment and Josh ended up admitting what his parents had told him to say. Both kids have now been permanently removed from my brother and sister-in-law's care. CPS lady found it disturbing how sister-in-law referred to Lou as a piece of poop in the voice note and they are considering terminating parental rights. I'm now allowed to visit Lou and I'm taking some DIY craft stuff for her and her cousins and will stay over for a night. My cousin has been really supportive throughout which makes me feel better. I spent an hour FaceTiming Lou and she was happier. I set up a small shop online to sell these digital designs when she first moved in with me and she and I had been spending hours making them together. She's very artsy so I know she enjoyed it. She kept talking about how her and her cousins have been drawing pretty designs and all three of them kept popping onto the screen. It just showed me that having her there long term might be the best solution. My cousin has mentioned that if things go the way they are going, he and his wife might consider adopting Lou. My brother lost his job too. Not just because he went to jail but because I blasted both him and sister-in-law on social media, tagging their colleagues. That didn't go over well with my family. 
My parents showed up and had a lot to say. They didn't so much as ask me how I was doing physically. They kept saying I had destroyed my brother's family because I couldn't leave well enough alone. My lawyer was over at the time and he took great pleasure in kicking them out. I have a feeling I might never get Lou back with the family that she is with might be the best option. I did book a meeting with a therapist today. It's going to be next week. I don't know much about Josh. I know none of this is his fault but a part of me resents him. I haven't reached out to him and I don't want to. My friends are telling me that once this whole thing is sorted, he will need someone by his side and if he stays with my parents, he'll go down the same path as my brother. I think they're suggesting I take him in when the time comes. I can't forget how he told CPS I was roping him. Update 4, I took in my niece because her family torment her. My name is cleared legally. I had a sit down with Josh a few days ago. I found him in front of my apartment building when I came home from my doctor's appointment last week. I didn't want to be alone with him so I asked my neighbor and her dad to linger about and I called my lawyer. There was a lot of crying. I get that his entire family unit has been destroyed. He's feeling insecure in a way. He can't see his parents. For some reason, my parents have been blaming him for what happened. That angered me. This happened because they did a crappy job of raising their own son. Josh asked if he could stay with me instead. Now the CPS lady who is in charge of this case, wanted to keep Josh and Lou separate for some reason. My lawyer called her to tell her what was happening. She arrived at my apartment within an hour. She listened to Josh and then to me privately. I expressed my concerns. However, she said that it might be better to have Josh stay here than my parents. Now that is something that has me uneasy. I told her that and she told me that if I have security cameras inside, I should get them in every room if I am worried. But the child psychologist working with Josh has said he's under too much stress. His schoolwork is suffering. He's not sleeping well. He feels safer here, despite everything. So now Josh is staying with me. I'm being normal with him but I guess I kind of messed up. When he tries to get a hug or something, I move away. I found him crying the day before yesterday about this. I feel like crap for it. I told him to give me time and that I do love him. He's shaken beyond anything and he used to be loud and brash and now he's none of those things. He has circles under his eyes and he's always tired and just quiet. I'm talking to my therapist about it and he told me to let him in bit by bit. And that he faced his own sort of trauma. I've started being more physically affectionate like I used to be and that seems to make him relieved. It's just been a week so I hope he gets better. He's asked about Lou and if he can see her but when I said not yet, he seemed to understand. He drew a card for her but I'm holding on to it for now. His psychologist says he feels guilty. There's a lot of guilt inside of him and he's not dealing with it well. I took him to the movies today. It was something he'd been waiting for for a while but he just slept through it all. I'm worried but his psychologist tells me to give him time and love. My parents were heated by the way. As was my brother and sister-in-law. I got phone calls from all of them. Sister-in-law showed up at my house and had a breakdown on my front lawn. Shen then tried barging in to see Josh and pushed past me. She actually entered my house but unlucky for her, Josh was at an extracurricular activity at school. She insisted on staying till he came home but I called the police, she knocked a few things over and threatened me before leaving. I called the police and I'm considering pressing charges. I'm considering moving. It's just not safe. My entire family is losing their shit. I have apparently destroyed their reputation. Lou is good. Lou is thriving. She used to call a lot but those calls have lessened over these past two weeks. Which is good for her I guess. She's adjusting. My cousin and his wife adore her. Her cousins like having her there. My husband cheated so I told everyone. He has nothing right now and definitely doesn't care. I'm seven months pregnant now but when I was five months I found out he was cheating, while I was at the hospital with pneumonia. He is adopted but knows his biological family, I told his adopted family, biological family, my family, my friends, his friends, etc. A lot came out when I found out, I found out he cheated on every girlfriend he's had, I'm now friends with his exes, who he lied to about everything as well. He told me he wasn't in contact with them and they found out about me when his mom passed away, and I was in her obituary because, shocker, she's my mother-in-law. He says I ruined his life, I want to, he's hiding like a coward, he won't answer messages from anyone, he tried telling my mother that he spoke to an attorney and I made him feel guilty for not being happy when he mentioned it, never happened, in fact when I asked if he was cheating, he swore on his mother's grave he wasn't, a lie, there's so much to this story but I just don't understand how some people can do this. He wanted his perfect wife and kids, and his little girlfriend on the side, he was never going to leave me and now he's not responding to my divorce attorney, I want him out of my life, since he was so unhappy, but suddenly he's too busy for the divorce he claims he wants, or it started claiming when I kicked him out of the house, when I told him to leave because he was cheating, he told me he's, been unhappy a long time and spoke to a lawyer a month ago but didn't know how to tell me, so he cheated and lied to hide it for weeks. He wanted the baby I'm pregnant with, I didn't want another for two more years, but now that we're not together, 
He says it's my choice and I can have full custody. He's mad at me because his affair partner was also cheating on her boyfriend, and I told said boyfriend, apparently, because I did that, my husband doesn't have to apologize for what he did to me because I'm trying to ruin his and his new girlfriend's life. He said he's not sorry, he doesn't regret it, and he's accepted what he's done and I need to get over it, but he can't even say the words, I cheated, just you don't know my side and I've accepted what I've done. I want him to suffer like I am, and he has no one, but, I know he doesn't care because he's twisted it in his mind so that he's justified because I told everyone what he did so clearly I'm the bad guy, if he had a side, he would tell his whole family so that they wouldn't hate him but instead he blocks their numbers, he knows he can't lie to anyone who can ask me because I have all the proof and anything he says I can disprove so he says nothing, yet, insists he's not in the wrong, I really know how to pick them, now I'm a single mom of two. My husband cheated so I told everyone, update 7 months later, thus far, I have gotten a pay raise at work, and come the new year, I'll be promoted and take over my own store with another pay raise, I've been going out more and enjoying myself, I have concert tickets and hockey tickets that I'm very excited about, I had my son in October and in January, I started eating healthier, and I've lost 20 pounds so far, I'm seeing someone, sort of, we are exclusive, on accident, just kind of stopped seeing others in favor of each other, but not official, and he makes me smile. I went to the dealership we got our cars from and found out that ex has been telling people that I cheated and was abusive, they gave me a free oil change because they felt so bad when I broke down, I proved that was a lie and talked to them for a while, I knew he would do that, but it's nice to have proof, and it's exactly why I kept everything I had. As for my husband, the judge officially signed the divorce decree in January, I've been no contact with him since June 2022, so I wasn't getting a lot of updates there until the, now, ex affair partner messaged me. I knew that his car has a repo order on it and that he was struggling dating but that he had, found someone, he has his whole family blocked, but on Thanksgiving, she messaged me that she had left him, and she was sorry, I didn't message her back until this month because I just wasn't ready, but I did and found out that he's been fired from three jobs since I left him and now he doesn't have her either. I do think he's seeing someone, and I think I figured out who, but I don't want to be involved even though I want to warn her, I'm torn, but I decided to let him do as he does because I don't want to give him a reason to reach out. He has reached out to my mother once because he was posted in a toxic men Facebook group with a warning for other girls and decided it was me, even then, he didn't even ask how our son was, he has never met him or seen him or asked about him, my in-laws are still my family, and my grandmother-in-law calls every week to talk to me, my aunt and sister-in-law are coming to my oldest son's birthday so he can see his cousins on that side and they can see me. So, in all, I'm doing good, and he is not, but, I am not official with the guy I'm seeing for a couple of reasons, I'm still paranoid, anxious, and stressed. I don't fully trust my instincts, I am aware of all of that, better things are still happening, and I am sure it will get better, I am excited to one day be fully healed and living a good life, I don't know how long that will take, but that's okay. The only thing besides all that is that he has yet to pay child support or any of the money he was ordered to pay in the divorce so we will have to go back to court to enforce that, who knows what hell that will bring. I'm going to marry her one true love. I, 29 female, was an affair baby between my mom and dad, my mom was already married to my stepdad and had my half-sister, 32 female whose name will be R, R has always hated me for some unknown reason, I never gave her any reasons to hate me as we grew up together she just did, growing up I spent more time with my mom than my dad who traveled a lot due to his work but when he was in town I always took the opportunity, it was the only time I could be away from my stepdad and R, R would always do terrible things to me, she would destroy my things, gifts and souvenirs my dad would send by mail would go to the trash, it was so bad that when I was going to enter high school she cut off my hair when I was sleeping and I had to get a bob hairstyle which reached my chin, my nose of style, my mom scolded her and stepdad enabled her even more, patting her on the back for a good job when mom wasn't looking. In high school I was in a graphic design class and that's how I met R's one true love, at first greetings I didn't know, I would stay after school to finish my in-class assignments for that class and he would be there to use the computers to do some drawing he had saved in the computer, the computer he used was right next to mine so we sat together when I would stay, we spoke once, where he said he liked my hairstyle, I was the only girl in school with really short hair so I did stand out a bit, one day my sister came to spy on him and she was furious seeing me sitting next to him, she was so mad that when we got home she slapped me on the face accusing me of wanting to steal him, after that incident I tried to stay away from him, not wanting to deal with her craziness, thankfully I only had to endure her for another year before she went off to college. My first year of college my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer and was told told he had that year, 2013, to live, my mother got news and told stepdad and R, R in response sent me a video she took from a TV show I've been told was called Shameless where there's a blonde girl peeing on a man's tombstone with a text, saying, can't wait for that mother effort to be gone, have fun cleaning the mess I'm going to make, where she sent another pic which was poop. I was so furious and disgusted that someone like her existed, someone who would be so happy to see someone's life end, my second year was rough as my dad died a few days before school started, in the end he left me with money that would help for the years to come and a few properties I rented to make extra cash, wondering if she did it, yup, sent another video for proof, 
Somehow I feel karma was real at the time, a few weeks after that I ended up bumping into the guy she was obsessed with, and still is, when I went to hang out with my friend who went to the same college as him, we spoke briefly until my friend came and we left, a few days after that my friend told me the guy she saw me with asked for my info and she gave him my snapchat knowing if I didn't want to talk him she would give him an app I don't use anymore. I'm going to be honest when she told me this I so wanted to use him and get back at my sister knowing how much she loved him, but I know how it feels to be hurt and so I added him on snapchat and texted him to meet me at a coffee shop, when we met at our local coffee shop I was honest with him on why I reached out and told him how crazy R is, he wasn't surprised, he went on telling me the things she would pull on the girls he would talk to and how she would try to sabotage his relationships when they were in high school, to her telling them they slept together while speaking or in a relationship with those girls, she was having his kid and even saying he had an STD, yeah she's nuts. To keep this short we stayed friends until a few months where we starting dated, we had a lot of similar hobbies, interests and we think alike, he says it's the power of mind meld, Star Trek, seeing how we might as well be telepathic with one another, this year we decided to get married, engaged for three, our jobs pay us really well in our respective fields where we can go big on our wedding. Now here comes an R, R sadly still stalks my fiancé, he isn't much a social media person so he doesn't post much but when he does it's on his Instagram story, he recently posted a picture of my hand with the engagement ring captioning, after three years next up the wedding ring, and yes his Instagram is private, and he has her blocked but there are a few people who tell her friends and they tell her, it can't be helped some people live for the drama. I don't talk to my mom as much seeing how she wasn't much help when my sister would bully me or when my stepdad belittled me but I do once a month for a few minutes, she had called me complaining how I was throwing a tantrum about how Jay, my fiancé, was engaged and she doesn't know who the beach is. That's when I got the idea, I'm going to let her know who the beach was, don't worry Jay is fine with this. I had her blocked on social media and I unblocked her and made my Instagram public for this occasion, after unblocking her I posted a picture of my nails without the ring, my nails that were exactly the same as the picture he put on his story, a few days later I posted inspiration pictures of wedding invitations, guess who seen them, a few days after that I put a picture of myself with my friends dressed up with the caption, my bridesmaids, and Jay a few hours later with his groomsmen with no caption but we had the same background of the restaurant the picture was taken. And behold I get messages on Instagram where she demanded to know if I was the girl Jay was going to marry, she said things like, no, he can never like girl like you, and, you know how much he means to me, I left her on read. Yesterday, I posted a picture of the two of us, the pictures were taken on Saturday where we took his family out to inform them of our wedding plans and how they are officially invited with invitation given to them, I posted three pictures, one normal one is when we first started dating, when he proposed and the one on Saturday with his family with the invitation in the air as they surround us. Caption being, proud to announce I am getting married this year to the love of my life, can't wait for a lifetime full of blessings alongside you. I got messages an hour after I posted that from R that I didn't read and calls from my mom which I declined, today, I went on Instagram and saw over 80 messages of insults from her, one being how ugly I looked with my short bob hair which I cut for this occasion, which I replied, interesting, Jay doesn't think so, funny actually, you know Jay confessed to me after our second date that he thought in high school my Alice Cullen haircut as you described it before was the reason that grabbed his attention back then. He thought I looked very cute, guess you did had a reason to feel threatened that time, as he found me attractive even then. After she read it I made my account private and blocked her, now I'm thinking about doing it again when we're getting married or changing my bio to his last name, who knows. Today I messed up by calling my fiancé daddy in front of my father and my entire family. This is the first and last time I'll share this story with people who didn't unfortunately witness it, and let me start off by saying, no, my fiancé and I don't have a daddy kink, we're freaky but that's just not what floats our boats while we make love, it's simply an ongoing joke between us because he's more than a decade older than me. Anyways, we had a family gathering today at my parents' house, not realizing anyone was outside while we were walking together, we were saying jokes that are pretty not safe for work, I called him daddy after one of them and we both laughed about it then stuck in that scenario, apparently my family decided it's a perfect day to dine outside, when I turned to see them all seated around the table, I was terrorized, my father's face was priceless, as if he was wondering just where exactly he went wrong with me, somehow my sisters, brothers and mother hearing us was so much better, my fiancé, like the a-hole that he is, only laughed harder, I wanted to kill him that moment, the family dinner was a bit awkward, I had a headache throughout it from what had happened, but I just hoped they got that we were joking, sadly, Judging by the long conversation my mother pulled me aside for suggesting that I might be in serious need for therapy because, it's not normal to refer to a partner as daddy. I don't think her Catholic heart handled it, and joke or not, all five of my siblings will for sure bully me, for life. I regret getting married every single moment. I haven't even been married six months, I 25 female and leaving my husband 30 male, disclaimer. We have discussed monogamy in detail before we got married, we both agreed we were monogamous and wanted to be in a closed relationship, one month after our wedding. He asked if he could open up our marriage, this came out of nowhere and I have been shocked and angry, I told him I was not comfortable with that, and he told me just to give it time, he has completely dismissed my apprehension and refuses to acknowledge my concerns. 
He tells me that he has not made moves on anyone, but he has swiped on dating apps with me in bed with him. He also flirts with co-workers of ours, ones who were at our wedding. Yesterday I had someone ask if I had been the one to open the marriage and I've never felt so betrayed and disrespected by my husband. He has told everyone we are in an open marriage. My stepmother is letting me stay with her for a few weeks and I'm collecting my things this evening. I can't continue this anymore. I'm in the bathroom at work crying my eyes out. I walked in on my son making love with my brother's wife. I, 44 female, walked in on my son, 18 male, making love with my sister-in-law, 34 female brother's wife, in a cabin and I think they have been making love for a while. My brother, 37 male, moved in with us in February with his wife and two children, my husband, 44 male, and I have big house on a farm, my husband is a farmer, and with everyone working from home we thought it would be a good chance to stay together as family and for my nieces to spend time on the farm. I have three children and all of them live with us the oldest is 18 male and the other two are 16 female and the 13 female. On the day my brother arrived I went to buy groceries with my son and he went to the pharmacy to get his gym supplements and I bought the food, I saw protection in my son's plastic bag when we arrived at the house, two packs with 36 each so 72 in total, didn't think anything of it, thought he had gotten a girlfriend and wanted to be safe, everything was fine everyone got along my sister-in-law and son would go on an early run around the farm everything seemed normal until last month when they left on their run but I was up baking and I never saw them make any rounds around the farm which was weird, I asked about it and they said they decided to hit the road. I thought nothing of this everything seemed normal, my sister-in-law and son seemed to have a very good bend. Yesterday I was coming from a friend's house early in the morning the sun wasn't up yet, and it was little dark but I saw that the cabin we have in the farm was open and the light was on, I thought maybe one of the employees had forgotten to lock up, so I went to close the door and switch off the light as I got closer I heard people making love and I took a peek, it was my son and sister-in-law making love, I didn't confront them I was so in shock. I still haven't told anyone what I saw and I don't know what to do, should I confront them, should I tell my brother, should I tell my husband I'm so confused, I've been doing a lot of thinking and I'm sure they have been making love for a while from the protection, my son was always at the house never brought a girlfriend, the morning runs around the farm, do they really go on a run or do they make love, the close relationship, update, I walked in on my son making love with my brother's wife. We confronted our son with what I saw, he already knew what was going on as he saw my reddit post and put two and two together, he didn't deny anything he confessed, he told us him and sister-in-law have been making love since February last year, he was 17 at the time, my son said it started on sister-in-law's birthday party he attended, they got drunk and made love in a bathroom, and they have been meeting at hotels ever since and sneaking off at family gatherings. After my son's confession my husband just lost it and told my son to leave the house and go into our condo in town as he didn't want to see him in front of him at this moment, when my son was gone my husband stormed into my brother's room and told my brother everything, sister-in-law was not in the house at that moment. My brother lost it and packed his stuff took the kids and left, he asked where my son had gone he said he wanted to teach him lesson. We didn't tell him and he eventually left, sister-in-law didn't return, I think my brother might have called her or my son, warned her and she is afraid to come back, her things are still in the house. In all the screaming and shouting, my daughters heard everything and are devastated that their family might be ruined, they miss their brother and are afraid my husband won't ever let him in the house again, my husband hates all forms of infidelity to the core and has always drilled this in our two eldest children that they must never cheat on anyone or be in a relationship with someone in a relationship. I know I did nothing wrong in this but how will I ever look my brother in the eye again, he won't answer and calls or text my husband said I should give him time to heal, my son has left the condo because he is afraid of what my brother will do to him and is now hiding at a friend's and he won't tell us which friend, no word on sister-in-law. My girlfriend thought I was joking when I told her about a deformity I had as a child, and now nothing can convince her it was real. My girlfriend won't believe I was born with two buttholes, I mess around with her a lot, and I guess she thinks it's another joke, I really tried to convince her I was being honest, but it's pretty much impossible because I don't have medical records, it was a minor procedure, and it was done when I was a very young infant, so there's no scarring and my butthole looks totally normal according to her, she even got out ahead of me by saying she wouldn't believe my mom if she confirmed it, it's really eating me up inside because she kept demanding that I admit it was a joke so I gave up and told her it was a joke so it would just be over with, but she kept bringing up the butthole thing so I told her the real truth that I only said that to end the whole saga, and then she thought I was elaborately gaslighting her, I don't really know where to go from here so I'm thinking of just having my mom tell her I was not born with two buttholes, I wish I never would have said anything about it. Having doubts on if my daughter is biologically mine and don't know if I should take a paternity test and risk my marriage. Me and my wife of three years have a baby girl she's two. They're my world and honestly I've been beating myself up even having these thoughts but recently I've doubted if she's really my biological daughter. We have similarities but there are certain things that have me second guessing. My wife and I both have green eyes I'm mixed and she's Italian and American. My baby has brown eyes I know it's impossible for two green-eyed parents to have a brown-eyed baby but I've read it's rare. A few years back I had to travel for work and I had my suspicions of my wife cheating but the thought alone brought me to tears, I discussed it with her and she assured me she was loyal to me, she has cheated in her previous relationship but I didn't want to judge based on that because she was in high school and we've all done dumb shit we regret as kids. 
I have discussed my concerns with her and to say I caused an argument would be an understatement. She got extremely upset and asked me how I could insinuate that she would ever cheat on me or that my baby isn't mine. I've spoken to her in the past ab my doubts and she told me she would never cheat. I brought it up again and said I had my doubts but I'll drop it and apologized. She got very defensive and started crying saying, I guess you want a paternity test since you don't believe me. I said no but after speaking with my family about it I think I may want one just to clear my mind. If she's mine I'll hate myself for ever being doubtful but if she's not I still haven't thought about the consequences that can bring. She is my daughter and I love her no matter what but what will that do to my marriage? This has caused me so much internal conflict and I've spent nights crying thinking I could be making the biggest mistake of my life. If anyone has any advice or has been in a similar situation from mine or my wife's perspective it would be greatly appreciated. Update, this conversation with my wife isn't new, but from the point where I made the comment she's been very cold and threatening our marriage saying I better not get the test done behind her back and she also would not allow it to happen at all. I read comments from a lot of women saying they'd be pissed too either way if the test positive or negative for mistrust, so I thought that was the case. We did have a long conversation this morning. She looked through my phone last night and found the post. That's what sparked the conversation again. She said she was hurt I would keep bringing this up and I should trust her and leave my insecurities behind. It was long conversation, a lot of tears and words were said, I offered marriage counseling and dropped the topic of the DNA test, she refused and said it's ridiculous and doesn't want to involve anyone else in our marriage. I read a lot of comments and stories saying sometimes the guilt will get to them and they'll just confess without needing to do a test. I didn't think that would happen in my case but it did. She told me that she didn't want this to happen but she did cheat on me and my daughter is not mine. She said she wanted me to be the father and loved me and thought this would be her best option. She didn't want me to take a test and find out on my own which I wish she would have come clean way before. I didn't know how to respond but asked who the father was because my mind already is making a million assumptions. She didn't tell me and began crying more telling me to not hate her and not end the marriage. I didn't say anything again waiting for an answer. This happened early this morning and I didn't an answer until this afternoon. I had to leave for work this morning so when I came back she had calmed down a bit and was ready to tell me, her answer was probably the last thing I was expecting. She cried while saying this but said a few years back when I went on a business trip, she slept with my father who she, ran into on a drunk night, I don't believe it, my father passed away in December from a colon cancer when he was 45, he did meet my daughter, half-sister, his daughter I don't know, but never said anything clearly, she said they both decided it was a dumb mistake, a major understatement, and it'd be best to erase it and play me as being the father. Me and my father never had the best relationship I grew up with my single mom but he was present in my life and when he passed it hurt my family a lot, so hearing this broke me, I am currently staying with my brother, I haven't spoken about what I've learned with anyone even him, I don't think I've fully processed so coming here to write this felt like a good place to get my thoughts out. I didn't say anything after she told me that and just left after she finished explaining, I don't know where I even go from here, I don't want to abandon my child while she's technically my half-sister but do need time to process this, I don't think any amount of marriage therapy will fix this so divorce is my next step, I'm going to seek a therapist for myself and help myself so I can be there for my daughter. My wife is a ticking time bomb and I want out. We're in our 40s and married for 17 years with four kids, wife had a rough relationship with her parents growing up, neglecting mom and abusive dad, so she tends to get back at people by doing something that will drive them nuts. She ran away and had a relationship with a convicted felon, basically went for the worst guy she could find, parents were furious and of course she realized this guy was nuts and abusive too and left him. I came along and we hit it off, she wanted to get her life right and I am as straight laced as they come, responsible, walks old ladies across the street, etc. We marry and she decided she wants a big family and be a stay at home wife, I say if that's what you really want that's great, I work hard and earn enough to let her stay home. First few years it's great but I slowly see she is overwhelmed, I am very hands on and take over as much as I can when I get home from work, she insists this is what she wants to keep doing, life is so busy and we just press on. Eventually she breaks down and decides I have made her miserable and forced her to live this life she hates, stops talking to me and the kids for two years and stops doing anything, by this time I work at home so I am basically doing everything, school, groceries, cooking, cleaning, bills, etc. She slowly begins to come back around, we've given her her space and just try to care for her as much as we can, she sees a therapist and it is helping, life seems to be okay again. So now she is more involved but when there is any hint of something negativity she explodes on anyone nearby, we try to understand but it is completely draining, a child says she's tired from homework, she will scream at them, if I have a long day and say it was tiring she screams and says it's all about me. The other day she came home tired and I said well at least dinner is made for you and kids and she basically screamed my head off and said I'm so selfish to make dinner and rub it in her face, even got upset at me for asking what food she wants me to get, said I give her too many choices and it's infuriating to her. This goes on dozens of times a week, even when I take out trash or do the dishes she will find a way to scream at me for doing it wrong, I tried to talk to her and said let's communicate calmly but she explodes more and says the only thing wrong is me, she said my most annoying trait is I ask her too many questions. Now she resorts to threatening divorce and she knows I hate that so uses that consistently, I try to understand and love her because of her harsh past but I am almost wishing I'd not be here anymore somehow, my day is basically survive with the kids and don't set off mom. So happy that my ex-wife is miserable. 3 years ago I, 48 male, found out my wife, 46 female, was having an affair, 
She met a guy at work and came home one day telling me she was in love with him, no longer loved me and wanted a divorce, this was a guy she'd only known for 3 months at the time, she and I had been together since we were in our 20s, we have 3 kids, 28 male, 26 male and 23 female. Well I tried to fight for my marriage and didn't want a divorce but she simply would not stop seeing this guy, after one weekend where she disappeared from Friday afternoon to Sunday night I ended up throwing her out of the house, she immediately moved in with this guy, the only excuse she ever gave me was, I never wanted to hurt you, but there's just something about this guy, and, I deserve to be happy, that was it, that was the depth of her reasoning for throwing everything we built together away. We ended up finalizing our divorce in early 2022, although I had very hard feelings toward her I faked it enough to get pretty favorable divorce terms from her, it seemed she was so eager to be with her dream man that she didn't have time for a long divorce, so in the end I got to keep my pension and the house, which I had bought for my grandmother, I did have to give her half of my 401k however. The effect on our kids was pretty devastating, all three of them took it very hard, my oldest son told her that if she chose this man he'd never have a relationship with her again, as of right now neither of our sons has a relationship with their mother, our daughter does talk to her from time to time but their relationship is very strained to say the least, my daughter is a very kind person and she tries but she usually ends her conversations with her mother even more upset than when they started. About 4 months after the divorce my ex contacted me out of the blue, she told me she had made a terrible mistake and asked if she could come home, he dream man turned out to be an alcoholic who she says is verbally abusive and wasted all of her money, I used this opportunity to tell her exactly what I thought of her as a person, a wife and a mother, I told her this was her life now and to deal with it, I told her she no longer had a home at this house and to never contact me again. Then a few things happened over the last year that have driven her to start trying to contact me again, first off I met someone, my sister introduced me to a friend of hers who is also divorced and she and I hit it off, we've been seeing each other since last summer and while we've agreed that neither of us wants to get married again, we are together. Once my ex heard about this she once again tried to contact me but I ignored her, my son also got married and didn't invite his mother, she again contacted me to try to get me to intervene on her behalf, I told her I would talk to him but I never did, secretly I feel like she deserves all the pain she's feeling when it comes to our kids, she destroyed our family without so much as an afterthought, too bad, so sad. Now she recently told our daughter that she finally broke it off with the dream man because she could take his drinking and total lack of responsibility, he wasted her half of the 401k that I had to give her, he also totaled her car driving drunk, this from a man in his 40s, again she knew this guy for 3 months and torpedoed our whole family for him. On the face of it I act like I feel sorry for her but inside I really delight in the fact that she's so unhappy, call me evil or whatever I don't care, she brought this on herself and it serves her right, I actually had to sit there one Saturday night while she got ready for a date with this guy and laughed on the phone with her friend about how awkward our living situation was, I lived in hell for over a year because of her. Wait until she finds out our son and his wife are going to have a baby later this year, maybe if she had been able to keep her legs closed she'd get to meet her grandchild, enjoy your shitty one bedroom apartment and your broken down used car, me and my new partner will think of you when we're on vacation in Hawaii this summer. Hawaii was the trip my ex and I always planned to take once our daughter finished college. Maybe I'll send her pictures. Today I messed up by flirting with my future stepmother. My father, 49 male, wanted me, 28 male, his only child to meet his fiance, 34 female, before their wedding, so I took a flight to the city they're at. Mind you I've never even seen a picture of the woman, then headed later on that night to the restaurant we planned on meeting in. A beautiful blonde lady was sitting alone by the bar, and my schlong decided to guide me towards her. I offered to buy her a drink cause I wanted her number, she didn't entertain me much but she laughed clearly flattered when I guessed her age to be 25 after she asked me to, she pointed at the ring on her finger and told me she's engaged, just here to meet up with her fiancé's son and that her fiancé was on his way but got stuck in a meeting. Yeah that's when I knew I messed up big time, I wanted to leave the restaurant, take a flight back home and never look back, but my father walked into the restaurant and came directly towards us, guiding us to the reserve table, she froze then bursted into laughter when she realized that I am the son in question she's here to meet, she went ahead and childishly told my father that I asked for her number, he pretended to be amused but his eyes were a dead giveaway of the lack of entertainment he's feeling, dinner was awkward to say the least. My sister is dating my ex and they just got an apartment together, so I, female 24, met this guy, male 22, a few years ago, we became friends and then eventually started dating, we dated for a little while and then decided to move in together, after moving in together, I started realizing things that were not going to work, such as chores not being split appropriately and I had to do more work or the trash not being taken out when I had asked him a ton of times, really just incompatibilities, so I decided to end the relationship a few months after living together. While together, we spent a lot of time with my sister, female 16, she would hang out at my house for days on end and we would all go do stuff together, she got close with Ryan but I had never been concerned that they were doing anything more than that. Well, fast forward to the breakup, it was messy, he told me he felt blindsided and didn't understand why this was happening, he told me he loved me and couldn't see his life without me, this led to him breaking down my front door, my sister was in the house with me but then decided to leave with him and calling me names for breaking up with him on the way out. After a few weeks I found out through my family members that my sister and him were living together and that my mom had found them sleeping together, this was months ago and now they have decided to get an apartment together, my sister is now 17 by the way. My family doesn't necessarily support them but when I talk to my mom she says things like, well I don't like it, 
but it doesn't seem like he's mean to her, and my grandma just brushes it off as though it isn't a problem, is it just me, am I crazy for being upset about this? I'm considering ending my relationship with my partner due to her $250,000 in debt. I am a 30-year-old male, I have a well-paying job, roughly $100,000 per year, no debt, my girlfriend has $250,000 in private student loans, from undergrad private school, with a variable interest rate, recently the interest hit over 11% and doing the math on the loans has me devastated. With how fast it is growing, she will need to put $25,000 a year into it just to keep it in the same place, that basically guarantees that I will never have financial help during our relationship. Additionally, with how much she will need to work just to pay on the loans, I won't have much help around the house or with our kids, if and when we have some, either. I keep blaming myself that I can't just deal with it, it's just money right, but at the same time when I look at the reality of the situation I can't help but feel I need to walk away from this situation. Additionally, she is going back to school in the fall for a higher paying job, probably 60 to 85,000 income at the end realistically with the possibility of 125,000 a year if she works herself to death. But this program will add another approximately 30,000 in federal loans, I think this is a bad decision, but it's also the only option she seems to have to up her income. I feel like I don't want to wait until I'm 45 when this debt, might, be paid off to have children. I don't want to put my life on hold in this way, but I also love her a lot. We've talked a lot about this and about her plan to pay it down etc. It now feels like my options are either accept that this is reality and it will be many years before she's free of this debt, or end the relationship, any advice. Update, wanted to give an update, after reading all your comments and picking up a book about decision making in regards to money and love, will share if interested, I have come to the decision that I do, sadly, need to end the relationship, she is a wonderful girl and honestly my best friend, but the reality of her choices financially will alter the course of my life in such a profound way that all I can see is resentment in the end, I have to stop guilting myself into sacrificing myself for others to the point of my own mental turmoil. I grew up in a foster to adopt family as the oldest and I think I learned then to forget myself and care for others to earn love. Part of this decision is learning how to remember myself again. Thank you all for the advice. Slapped my wife on her face. I've been feeling sick with remorse and feel like the crappiest person on earth. I had nightmares all night long and stomach aches all day. What had happened was we were goofing around with each other. My wife went to bite my butt. Please don't judge. This is how we interact with each other during intimate moments or just in general. She bit me really hard and I said ouch. Then she bit even harder. She's never bitten me that hard before and it was so painful that without thinking, I swung my hand back, I was facing away from her when I did this, and hit my wife on her cheek, I didn't hit full force but it was definitely enough to suck the air out of the room as I realized what I had done and as she realized what I had done. I immediately fell to the floor and cried and apologized profusely, my wife started crying too saying that I hit her, I kept apologizing and begging for forgiveness, promising that I would never ever on my life hit her on purpose for any reason, she said it felt like I was swatting a bug away, I kept apologizing and as the night went on she said she forgives me but I still feel like crap, cried myself to sleep. This morning my wife brought it up again, and I've been apologizing non-stop, I take full responsibility for this incident, I feel so terrible about how it all happened, I never thought I would be someone who hits their spouse. Today I messed up by accidentally ghosting the girl I was supposed to go out with and not showing up at our date, so the plan was to go to a friend's birthday barbecue, go for some beer, go home, shower, rest a bit and then hang out with that girl, we'd probably go for a walk and then watch some movie at her house or something, I haven't seen her for quite a while, two weeks I think, and I was really looking forward to it. However my dumb arse drank a little too much and when I went home I just showered and then passed out, I already told her that I was a little drunk and told her to call me if I didn't reply to her messages at said time but that obviously didn't work cause I was too deep in sleep, 7 texts 5 phone calls. Worst thing is my dad came to wake me up at 10.30 and I said some crap like, okay 2 minutes, and I don't even remember saying that, she texted me at 9 o'clock, which was date time, and I replied to her, but I don't remember doing that either, the fact that I replied while I was half asleep, maybe even asleep, I don't even know, must have made her think that I wasn't actually asleep or something and that I intentionally just ghosted her after that and didn't show up, I woke up at 11.30 and tried to apologize but she was and probably still is mad, she has to wake up early tomorrow for a test and her parents go to bed kinda early, so going to her house at 11.30 wasn't possible. I don't blame her, I am a huge prick, I knew that drinking before hanging out with her wasn't the best idea but I thought that the worst thing that could happen would be me saying some dumb shite during our date and making her laugh and I love her laughter so I didn't really count the beers and wine I had, what hurts more is the fact that my idiocy made her even worry about me, she literally texted me, you're making me nervous, I don't know how to properly apologize, I can't see her till next weekend because we both got exams and tons of studying and all I can do now is text her, I do anything for her but what I did was really effing horrible, especially from her point of view, so I don't know if I deserve forgiveness, she went to bed before I managed to explain myself which means she has way too much time to over think it and get sadder which really sucks. My boyfriend is going to cry and I don't feel bad about it. In fact, I'm excited. I have been with my boyfriend for a little over three years now. I don't even think there are words to describe how I feel about him. My life changed in an unimaginable way when he entered it. There is no one on the planet that could ever make me feel the love I feel when I look at him. I never thought I would find someone who treats me this way or that I even deserved a partner like him. He never fails to remind me that he thinks about, loves, and adores me. The other day he made a passing comment that any experience he has ever had is always so much better if my presence is there. So, my boyfriend is a huge fan of Legos, like, massive, 
He always buys smaller sets from Target and builds them in his free time to relax, anytime we go to the mall. He always wants to walk around the Lego store just to marvel at the big sets, he can afford them, but he's the type not to spend money on himself, every time we go in, I always catch him staring at the Star Wars Cantina set, he always talks about how one day, maybe he'll muster up the courage to put the $400 down and fulfill his dream. But he won't have to do that, I just ordered it off the Lego's website, because I spent more than $150, I get a small Santa set, so what my plan is, I'm just going to gift him the Santa set, and when we are alone, I'm going to surprise him with the Cantina. He has done so much for me this year, and I can't imagine not giving this to him, so yeah, he's going to cry, but I'm excited about it, thanks for listening. Update one month later, we did our normal gift giving with my family, and I ended up putting the throne room under the tree, which he lost his shit when he opened it because he's been talking about that set for a while, after everyone settled down after gift giving and started to eat and watch Christmas movies, I asked him if he could help me do something upstairs quickly. When we got upstairs, I told him I had forgotten to put something under the tree, When I pulled the box out from under my bed he looked confused but started to unwrap it slowly, when he had pulled the paper back and saw the words most icely cantina, he stopped moving for a few seconds because I don't think his brain was even fully registering what was in front of him at the time, his eyes started watering slightly, and he kept saying things like no way before he started grinning and tearing all the paper away. He started hugging me and kept asking why I would spend so much money on him, and I told him it was because I loved him and wanted him to be happy, he went through a mixture of jumping and excitement, hugging me and crying for a few minutes. He kept talking about his plans to clear out the shelf behind him and put it on display in his work background. He then ended up surprising me by saying he had also not put something under the tree because he wanted to have it be an intimate moment between the two of us, he went into the closet and was laughing about how he had put it on the top shelf because he knew I wouldn't be able to reach it or see it, I'm very short lol, when he came out, he was holding a tiny box, and when I opened it there was a beautiful diamond necklace inside, which obviously made me cry like a baby, after he put it on me and we shared a nice moment together kissing and hugging. I told him that I purposely saved the points I got from buying the set so he could get $50 off his next Lego set, he told me he wanted to get me a set so he could spend the duration of building his set while I also built a set next to him, he has always really cherished building a set with me or building one at the same time as me, so over the weekend, we went to the Lego store, and despite me saying I was happy with a smaller set that I would build slowly so I wouldn't finish before him, because I felt bad since he bought me a literal diamond necklace, he insisted on getting me a big one and bought me the Bowser because he knows it's one of my favorite characters. We had a great Christmas and have been having lots of fun having designated building time together. I've been a side chick for 5 plus years, I didn't know he had another girlfriend until about 2 and a half years into the relationship, keep in mind, by this time I was already so deep in love with this man and thought I'd marry him, lost my v-card to him and everything, we met when I was young and he was a bit older and the effect he had on me was insane, to cut a long story short, I was so in love with him already that I couldn't bear the thought of being without him, so I stayed, f me, I know. She doesn't know about me but I know about her, his excuse for this whole thing is that he needs to stay with her because he's getting a permanent visa via their relationship, and that once he gets it, he'll leave her and we'll be together, I know this is effing awful but I literally love this man so much I don't know how to leave. But I know I must leave, and I've been slowly building the courage, it's especially hard because I have an insane level of chemistry with him, we're so compatible in every way, besides the fact that he is someone else, he helps me financially and emotionally and I love being around him and the love making is great, but I know this effed up situation has to end and I need to move on, he lives with her too, they own a house and share a bed but he claims they don't sleep together. I guess what's tipped me over the edge is that I just found out they adopted a dog together, we would always speak about adopting a husky together one day but he's gone and end that with her behind my back, this, relationship, was doomed from the beginning and I know what I have to do, the thought of living my life without him is almost too painful to think about, but it can't be much worse than crying myself to sleep every night knowing he's in bed with another woman, and yes I know I'm a homewrecker and a loser but what else is this sub for? My daughter doesn't want to go on our date and I'm trying not to be sad. I, male 35, have a daughter who recently turned 13, her mom passed away when she was only 3, throughout the years I have always made sure to empower my daughter just to make sure she is an independent young and smart woman. But even though my daughter is smart, I as a dad worry about her ending up in a bad and toxic relationship, so over the years I made it a thing for twice a year I take her out on a date somewhere fancy for dinner, I always get her flowers and let her always order whatever she wants from the menu, we have done this since she was 5 so it has been going on for twice a year for about 8 years. Last night I asked her where she wanted to go for our date so I can start make reservations, she asked if we had to do that, I told her of course we didn't have to but also asked why she didn't want to, she said she thinks it's becoming babyish and she thinks she's too old to still be going on daddy daughter dates, I told her I get it and we don't have to anymore. I tried to play it off and act like I didn't mind but man does this hurt, soon she probably won't want to hang out with me at all and I get she is growing up but man she is still a little girl in my eyes. My stepdaughter wants her real dad to give her away. My stepdaughter will be getting married on August 3rd. The wedding planning has consumed most of her and her mother's life. I say her mother because we aren't married, though we've lived together for 10 years, for the past 6 months. 
My stepdaughter graduated last December from university, I paid for her to go to college, though it was a state school, it still ran $40,000, she does not have a job and has been living with us for the duration of her college career and since her graduation, I also bought her a car to get back and forth from school when she finished high school. From time to time her deadbeat father would pop into her life and she would fawn all over him, although he has not contributed a cent to her education or paid any child support, though that is my girlfriend's fault as she was not part of the settlement, she still loves him and wants him in her life, he stays long enough to break her heart by skipping town and breaking some promise that he made her. The wedding venue holds 250 people max, I gave them a list of 20 people that I wanted invited, you know, since I was paying for everything, they told me that was no problem and they'd take care of it, so I let these people know they'd be getting an invite and they should save the date, Saturday, I saw one of my friends on this list at the golf course and asked if he was coming, he told me that he wasn't invited, he told me that he got an announcement, but not an invitation, he had it in his back seat, along with probably 6 months of mail, and showed it to me, sure enough, it was just an announcement, and my name was nowhere on it, it had her dad's name and her mom's name and not mine. This led to a pretty big fight with my girlfriend, as I found out that none of my list of 20 made the cut for the final guest list because 250 people is very tight, I was pissed, but not a hell of a lot I could do because the important people in my life had already been offended, my girlfriend said if some people didn't RSVP yes, I might be able to get a couple people in, but that is an ultimate slap in the face in my opinion, so, I was boiling on Saturday. Yesterday, we had a Sunday dinner with the future in-laws family and us and a surprise guest, the real dad, at this little dinner my stepdaughter announced that her real dad was going to be able to make it to her wedding and that now he'd be able to give her away, this was greeted with a chorus of oh how great and how wonderfuls. I don't think I have ever felt so angry and so disrespected, I was shaking, I took a few seconds to gather my composure, because I honestly wasn't sure if I would cry or start throwing punches or both, once I was sure I'd be able to speak I got up from my chair and said I'd like to make a toast, I can't remember exactly what I said but the gist of it was this. I'd like to make a toast, the sound of spoons against glasses ring in my ears, it has been my great pleasure to be a part of this family for the past 10 years, Ah, how sweet, at this point in my life I feel I owe a debt of gratitude to bride and groom, because they have opened my eyes to something very important, confident smiles exchanged, they have showed me that my position in this family is not what I once thought it was, and now a glimmer of confusion and shock begins to spread on the faces in the room, though I once thought of myself as the patriarch or godfather of the family, commanding great respect and sought out for help in times of need, it seems instead that I hold the position of an ATM, good for a stream of money, but not much else, as I have been replaced as host, both on the invitations and in the ceremony, I am resigning my financial duties as host to my successor, real dad, so cheers to the happy couple and the path they have chosen, I finished my drink, you all can let yourselves out. Is this selfish, I'm supposed to shell out 40 to 50 grand for a wedding that I can't invite anyone to, that I am not a part of, I'm so done with this crap, I'm done with my stepdaughter, I'm done with my girlfriend, I transferred the money out of our joint account last night, she has not had a job since she moved in with me, this morning I called all the vendors I had written checks to for deposits to refund my money, at present it looks like I'll lose around 1,500, for the venue, but the other vendors have been great about refunding. Update number 1, the immediate aftermath was tantrum and people sitting there mumbling while not actually saying anything to me, but to each other, after much yelling with the girlfriend about me being selfish, I spent the night in my home office and no one knocked on my door, not once, today's aftermath is kind of depressing for me, girlfriend brought me bride's wedding planner to show me how much work I was ruining, I thumbed through it, found a page in the music section for father-daughter dances, all of the songs were catered to real dad's taste, so I thought they were just being disrespectful, but now I'm feeling like they never really gave a crap at all, especially since the menu included two ingredients I'm allergic to, that actually made me laugh, either way, I'm glad to be done, returned the planner and asked her when she and bride could move out, also, I never promised to pay for the wedding, I offered them the use of my home when they were sure it was going to be small, but other than that, all I've heard is how it's the bride's family that should pay, so, let it be the bride's family then, aka, not me. Final update, girlfriend and bride are now moved out, they are moving in with the groom, it was very hard not to be petty with some of the belongings they took with them, but it's done and I switched out the locks and now it's time for a brew, I can't believe how popular this story got, but I feel good to be given support by so many, if I find out what happens with the wedding, I will let you know, but I can't guarantee that I will put in the effort to find out, from what I've heard they are trying to scale things back and get his parents to help out, girlfriend burned bridges when I found out she tried to write herself a check on our joint account the day after the unpleasantness, by then I had already moved money, so I guess I'm a bigger ass than her, but I could feel it coming, that's all trying to decide whether to break up with a chronically ill partner. Here's the situation, my partner, 48 female, and I, 39 male, had a bit of a row last night, over something kinda trivial, it's not what it was about, but rather a, straw that broke the camel's back, scenario. We've been together for coming up on 10 years now, and we've been living together since 2011, my partner is long-term ill with myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and hasn't been able to work since we've been together, I do work, I'm paid fairly well, but living on a single salary has been challenging. Anyway, I realized about halfway into the argument that I was done with this and just left the house, drove away because I simply couldn't be there anymore, ended up sitting in the car trying to decide what to do for several hours, couldn't really decide, hence this post. Now, our relationship has been brittle for a while, that's at least partly my fault, I've had next to no libido for months, and haven't really done anything sort of romantic or gone on a date for quite some time, I think I may have been skirting the edges of depression, 
and I haven't really been sleeping either, but either way, I work, I come home, and I'm really not keen to be doing much at all on the weekends, because I'm just weary. I do have things I end up needing to do, because the consequence of a chronic illness is that I'm pulling double duty as a part-time carer, in fairness, I don't need to do much on that front, but it's a few hours a week on top of my day job, it has been worse in the past, when the myalgic encephalomyelitis really flared up, and because I earn more than a pittance, my partner's basically not eligible for any state assistance that's means tested, the threshold is pretty low, and we live in a fairly high cost of living area. But I've been feeling, fed up I think, is the best way I can describe it, I keep having recurring moments of doubt, where I feel like I'm being exploited and taken for a fool, I mean, I've paid all the household costs and rent for pretty much 8 years, and that's not really a small amount of money, if I'm lucky, I put my 5% of my take home for my spending money, and I've only done that in the last year or so, because I realized I was being unreasonably tight with everyone else I knew, because I thought of myself as broke. If you ask me if I care for my partner, then the answer is yes, I do care for her, we have a dog together, and I know she needs me, even if she became eligible for state assistance, it's not really generous when you're persistently debilitated. But I also can't see a light at the end of the tunnel, I think that's contributing to the depression too, our future is basically me working to fund both of us, up until retirement and possibly beyond because we won't own a house, and we'll be living on a single pension, the one minor hope is that her condition will just go away one day, but it's been 10 years so far. Following our argument last night, I found myself thinking through the scenarios of what if we broke up and the prospect seems complicated, we've got a lot of shared stuff, but, it doesn't make me feel sad or upset like I feel it probably should, it'll be expensive and difficult though, as we're in a joint tenancy agreement, and like I say, we have a dog, she's non-negotiable, she's literally saved me when I've been feeling strong urges of self-harm, how do I know if we're done or whether the relationship is worth salvaging. Update 4 years later, it was 4 years ago that I posted that, and I thought I would come here and share what's happened since, I didn't break up with my partner, we're living, happily ever after. Because as a lot of commentators pointed out, I was depressed, and that was a problem, it turns out I have ADHD, have had it forever, and I'm late diagnosed at 43, treatment for depression was very beneficial, but highlighted the ADHD possibility, and that too has now been treated, and I'm happier today than I have been in a long time, possibly ever. Because I do still have my chronically ill partner, she's now my wife, she proposed to me, and she had faith in me through my depression, where I wasn't the nicest of people, I was pretty awful frankly, I was the stereotype bundle of red flags that this sub would have said, run screaming, and honestly, you'd have all been right, she probably should have done just that, I was depressed to the extreme, and well, wasn't easy to live with, a very hollow justification perhaps, but I thought it would be better this way to just push her away. But she didn't, she had faith in me, in her words, this isn't you, this isn't the man I fell in love with, the ultimatum too, get it sorted, was what I needed to get depression treated and then follow through to get my ADHD diagnosed and treated were what I needed, I didn't really deserve that, but I'm glad I got it. It took 6 months maybe to go from my lowest point to where I am today, which is happy, happier than I have ever been, I have a good job, I have a dog, I have a home, and most of all I have a loving wife who had faith in me when I was at my worst, 30 years of undiagnosed untreated ADHD are being tackled, and 20 years of depression is unraveling, it's taking a while, because there's a lot to unpack. I'm maybe not quite the man she had faith I could be, but I'm going in the right direction, I want to be that man, because we aren't just a couple, we're a partnership, and that partnership is sustaining and enriching. Friend is mad because my husband complimented her, a good friend of mine broke up with her boyfriend of 6 years after she discovered he was cheating, she has recently decided to get back into dating, but she wanted the first date to be a double date for her own comfort, her date was completely on board and they invited my husband and I, we met at a restaurant, my husband and I arrived first, and my friend showed soon after, before her date arrived, my husband made a comment to her, that dress looks elegant on you, the color is unique. Here's the thing about my husband and his family, they give compliments, it's never intimate or over the top, but they all will occasionally give nice comments to people they know and trust, regardless of gender, and they do it sensibly in my opinion, and it's not always about appearances, it's one of the things that attracts me to him. The dinner went well, we thought, my friend's date seemed to hit it off with her, but the next day, my friend texted me this, you need to tell your husband to stop making comments about other women, that's how affairs start. I told her I disagreed, she responded, as someone who was cheated on, trust me, I know, I can't believe you are okay with him looking at my dress, I was pissed off for you. I told her that if she is uncomfortable with him complimenting her then she can tell him herself and that he'll respect her boundaries and wishes, she replied with, don't come crying to me when you catch him with another woman, I'm at a complete loss for how to approach this. My best friend wants me to work with my essayer on her wedding, I have a best friend, we'll call her Tina, who I've known most of my life, we have had a strong friendship from middle school all the way until we graduated from the same college, we have always been there for each other, and I tell her pretty much everything. Back in junior year of high school, a guy, we'll call him Rod, essayed me at a house party, he never apologized for it, and it put me in a deep downward spiral to the point where I almost wanted to drop out in order to never see his face again, I told Tina about it, and she did everything she could to support me. Fast forward to early 2020, Tina and her boyfriend, Josh, announced that they were getting engaged, and Tina wanted me to be the maid of honor, I was beyond excited to do it, we've always talked about being each other's maids of honor, 
There was another detail though, Josh had a similar friendship history with his best man and they thought it would be adorable if the maid of honor and best man worked together on everything and were their own second package on the wedding day, I guess it was their way of making us feel a little more excited for weddings of our own. I found out that the best man was going to be Rod, and that he and Josh remained best friends after high school, I thought Rod was just in a friend group, but it turns out they were as close as could be, my heart sunk and I simply didn't know how to respond, they expected us to work together and be together the whole wedding process, and that sounded like literal hell. I started thinking about whether Tina never told Josh or that Josh heard and just didn't care, all I know is that I was having second thoughts about the wedding after that, I texted Tina about my concerns with Rod coming in the most polite way possible, and she sent me this in reply, I know about what happened with you guys back in the day, but Rod seems to be a great guy now, it would just really mean a lot if you can push that memory away for the duration of this, please just trust me. I didn't know how to respond to this, and luckily the wedding planning process has been at a haul since COVID, I haven't responded to her since that text but now this has really been bugging me, should I just say no, it would probably break her heart, but I just don't know if I can handle working with my rapist, help, update, my best friend wants me to work with my essayer on her wedding, reading all your comments, it seems pretty clear that how Tina was treating me was extremely inconsiderate and I should find a new friend, although it was a huge slap in the face, I came to my senses and believed that I couldn't be around someone who would do that to me. Some of you said to expose them during vows, but that's just not the kind of person I am, and it might not turn out well, a few of you gave me example texts I could send which I am extremely thankful for, but I decided to send this. I've had time to think about it, and I just can't be your maid of honor anymore, it's so hurtful that you are telling me to pack up my trauma for who knows how long until your wedding day, I just can't do it, I don't think I will come at all knowing that he's going to be there, I'm sorry. It's pretty weak, but it's probably the meanest text I've ever sent, an hour later, I get a call from Josh, he asked me what was going on with me and Tina, and that she was extremely upset, a part of me snapped and I said, I don't know, what's going on with you making someone who essayed me best man, I don't usually blurt things out like that, he was confused and I repeated myself, he was silent for a few seconds and then asked if he could come over, I was a little wary of the idea but I said sure, I know, we should be social distancing but this really needed to be discussed. He comes to my apartment 40 minutes later without Tina, I have never hung out with Josh one-on-one before, it was always with Tina, Josh always had a really cute and sweet personality, and I've always approved of him when it came to dating her, he was really only a friendly acquaintance to me though, we sat down and spoke for over an hour. Tina had told Josh that the reason I wasn't coming to the wedding was that I didn't want to work with Rod, because I had a crush on him, and thought she was forcing the relationship too much, so basically, she said we had a petty girl fight, my jaw hit the floor and I was fuming, she had obviously never told Josh what Rod did to me, I shared that Rod had essayed me back in high school, and that Tina knew about it, I asked if he knew too. He said he didn't, but at one point Rod did mention that a few, crazy beaches, falsely accused him of rape senior year, this obviously didn't include me, since I only told Tina and a few family members, Josh believed him at the time, but I guess after hearing me say it it's starting to dawn on him that his friend was a liar. Here's something that I didn't expect, Josh shared with me that he was raped when he was a kid by an older brother of a friend he had, he said that if he was forced to work with said brother on a wedding, he would absolutely refuse, he apologized heavily on behalf of Tina, but I won't forgive unless she says it herself. I know some of you may think Josh is lying, but I believe him. I could see it by Josh's face and body language that the realization really weighed down on him, and I felt bad, in a way. We were both going through a betrayal, I asked if he was okay to go home, and he said yes, he thanked me for telling him and left, I don't know if I'll stay in touch with him, but I was beyond furious with Tina at this point. I was expecting an angry text coming from her, and sure enough, I got it at like midnight, she went off saying that I'm gonna end up destroying their marriage, how could I do that to her, etc etc. I just pressed the block button and went to bed, quickest decision ever made. I'm feeling a little down in the dumps right now, yet slightly relieved, I'm going to try to connect with other friends and try to move on from this, if I'm feeling brave enough, I might try to find these, crazy beaches, and see if we can make a case against Rod, knowing that there are other victims makes me feel so guilty I want to scream, sorry it's not too happy of an ending, but I think it might have been more unhappy if I decided to go along with it, thank you Reddit. Today I messed up by telling a guy I'm going on a first date with tomorrow that my mom has a surprise for us. This happened roughly 10 minutes ago, so I, 20 female, have been talking to this cute guy for a couple weeks on Bumble, I'm really enjoying talking to him, he's super sweet and funny, and has a lot of personality. Last week, he asked me what my ideal first date was and I said coffee because I don't know, I like coffee and talking lol, and we agreed to Tuesday which is now tomorrow, I've been really busy all week and lo and behold was just scrolling through f***ing TikTok when it hit me, our date is tomorrow, and I do not know when or where we are meeting, oh no. Relevant background, my mom has also been asking me when I'm free on Tuesday for an unspecified event, she will not give me details, she is very adamant that it is a surprise, I know it was, more expensive than the zoo, but less expensive than the concert we went to a couple weeks ago, that's it right, super vague, I love my mom, she's so excited about it lol. Anyway, 
I hit old pal with this message, which I have copied and pasted straight from the source, also it just struck me that our date is tomorrow, when and where do you want to meet, I'm free until 3 p.m., my mom is apparently planning a surprise for us, but she's being very cryptic about what it is lol. Yeah, so I met my sister and I, but guess how that sounds, he just went, oh boy okay, and I was like, sorry I hit you with that out of the blue leaning bringing up the date in the middle of our conversation, but this comment did not help my case, he was like, I'm just kinda socially anxious, so I was like, oh I promise I'm really chill, I just talk a lot, we can also go to this cool back room that's not totally separate but it's quieter with some cool windows, and he went, no I'm good one on one, I'm just nervous about meeting your mom. It all clicked in that moment, I am mortified, he is relieved, thank god he was still chill about it even when he thought he was meeting my mother, on the first date, oh my god, lord have mercy on my soul, I'm gonna lose my mind, and yes, my mom did nearly piss herself laughing when I told her right before writing this post. My 9 year old daughter told her girl bestie she loves her, now her parents are banning her to see her. My, 34 female, adorable 9 year old daughter is extremely shy, don't have a lot of friends, but she has at least two friends, and one of them has been her bestie for the past three years, they do a lot of things together, playdates, homework, her parents even brought her a few times up north at their chalet for weekends and stuff, I get along really well with the mother. I always raised my kids in a way that I always refuses to put them, in a box, when they were kids, I always said, when you'll have a boyfriend or girlfriend in the future, in a way of just general discussions with them when talking about their future, not that I was emphasizing it, just as a casualty. My youngest always had an interest in, girls, since she's young, and that's fine, I still think it's hard at their age to know the difference in between loving a friend really much on like a, friendship, way, versus in the love aspect, for them, love is love you know? Well yesterday my daughter told her she loved her in a, girlfriend, way, the other girl said, sorry I love you like a friend, that was it, nothing more, no harassment, no pursuing more. Well this morning the mom told me that her daughter told her the situation and that we are clearly not raising our kids the same way, and that she doesn't want my daughter to have a bad influence on her, that's so ridiculous, she said she doesn't want our girls to play together anymore, my daughter will be heartbroken, I know she just said that, like that, without thinking it further. I'm so mad, can't believe in 2023 there's so much taboo about this, I raise my kids to accept everyone no matter their differences, choices, genders, preferences, colors, but going through this so close to home is making my heart so broken, the country slash city where I live it's so open-minded, really sad day today. My wife gave me chlamydia, I am livid, the only person I have made love with in the past 5 years has been my wife, I thought I had a bladder infection or UTI, and scoff when my doctor thought it was chlamydia, well here we are, I got the test results yesterday and I have chlamydia. Decided to start snooping and it didn't take long to find the text messages between her and her boy toy, my guess is she doesn't even know she had it as well, she thinks I stayed up all night working, but little does she know I've already emailed her little lover boy's wife all the text messages, I warned the lover boy's wife that he's been sleeping with an infected woman and to get herself tested, I'm still deciding how to process this all but wifey's going to wake up to my positive test results and the messages of her infidelity. The sun should be coming up in the next hour or two, and probably will be the end of this marriage. My wife gave me chlamydia, so I gave her divorce papers. The short of what happened was, my wife gave me chlamydia, I found out she was sleeping with a co-worker and planned to blow our marriage up that night, thankfully, my drunken mind decided to wait. I had gotten into contact with the co-worker's wife, giving her evidence of what was going on and informing her that the two cheaters probably both had chlamydia, I did this because I suspected my wife was cheating with more than one person, in her texts, her lover boy had asked her if he was the only one she was screwing at the time, and she gave a non-answer, I know this dumb broad well enough that I knew she was screwing someone else as well, luckily, the co-worker's wife got back to me first thing in the morning to explain that she figured he was seeing someone else, the two of them were privately separated at the time, and their separation agreement stated they were not to see anyone else at the time, she had her own suspicions and thanked me for reaching out, we agreed that she would not confront her husband until I could cover my own ass legally in exchange for the evidence I had of their affair together, she also confirmed to me that her husband didn't have chlamydia, at least when they were still together. I decided to not confront my wife that morning, I pretended everything was fine and dandy while I looked for lawyers and dug deeper to figure out the mystery of the chlamydia caper, I installed a keylogger on my wife's personal PC and quickly got access to a secret email, where guess what, my wife was talking with someone on a hookup website, the best part was that it solved the mystery, as the man informed her he tested positive for chlamydia and that she probably had it, even better, these emails were from months before I was infected myself, meaning she knowingly infected me with chlamydia. Disappointed that it was not in fact the chlamydia fairy that caused all this, I have a lawyer, it's not looking well for my soon-to-be ex, the fact she knowingly infected me made my lawyer salivate, along with a mountain of proof of her infidelity, the house we live in is my parents, and we've kept our finances separate since the beginning, her chances of getting much, if anything out of me is pretty slim. I served her the divorce papers last month, I bought a security camera on Amazon when this all started saying I was going to put it over our front door, I hid it in the living room the morning I decided to confront her, I decided to take one of the top comments from my first post on how to drop this on her, we were sitting and having breakfast when I said, so I'm curious, does your co-worker know you infected him with chlamydia as well? The short of it was she cried, apologized, tried to claim it was a one-time thing, 
I brought up that this was her second affair, tried to claim she loved me, tried to blame me, screamed at me that I don't make her feel loved, yada yada you get it, I served her the divorce papers and her eviction notice right after, I'm staying with my parents until she's out of the house in a few weeks just to be safe, I'm juggling if I want to try and press assault charges against her for knowingly infecting me with chlamydia, as my lawyer said it should be pretty easy to prove with the emails we have, overall though, I just want her out of my life like the STD she is. I'm Christian, but I've been in love and sleeping with my best friend for years, I don't really know what this means, I mean, I know it means I'm not exactly straight, but I mean I don't know what this means for my faith or my family or my best friend. I live in a very Christian, religious area and a lot of people here strongly dislike gay people, and if my family finds out they'll definitely disown me, except my brother, he already knows and doesn't care and has kept my secret ever since I told him when I was 16, and my parents are leaders in our church so if and when it gets out that I'm into women, it will probably spread like wildfire in the entire community and I probably won't be able to stay here cause I don't want to be treated like the scum of the earth every day. I really don't want to be the reason that my friend is officially outed, it's kind of an open secret that she's a lesbian because she honestly doesn't care and is planning to move away once she saves up enough money, but I just hate the way people talk about her behind her back, and if it comes out that we've been together, it'd get 10 times worse because she, corrupted the pastor's daughter, it's so dumb, but that's what they'd think, and they'd definitely be more hateful to her face. I still believe in God, but I also feel like I've learned more about God by being with my friend because I've learned what it actually means to love another person unconditionally. A lot of the love that comes from my community and even my parents is very conditional and I felt more acceptance, grace and support from my best friend than any of them, even my parents. I don't know, I guess in my heart, I just want to get out of this area, I haven't told my parents but once I graduate college, I'm planning on moving out, maybe with my brother and his wife for a bit until I get get on my feet, because they said their house is open to me because even they know my parents will kick me out once I come out. But once I do all that I want to take my friend out on a proper date and properly introduce her to my brother and his wife, I hate treating our relationship like a dirty secret. My girlfriend of three years doesn't know I know she's cheating but she's about two. I, 21 female, have been dating my girlfriend, 22 female, for three years, I grew up in a really small town so finding other women who liked women wasn't easy, we met at my college orientation because she was one of the group leaders showing us around, I saw her more and more as the weeks passed because we ate at similar times and we eventually became friends, she always assumed I was straight because I have a very feminine style, I'm sure others can relate to this misconception, but being friends didn't last very long when we found out we both liked women. The last three years have been great or at least I thought they were, about two months ago she started getting really cagey around her phone which was a red flag to me, before that we were both open with our phones and frequently went on them for directions, to look things up or text our friends if our phone died, two weeks ago I went through her phone when she was showering, yes yes I know invasion of privacy, it wasn't hard to find what I was looking for but what angered me the most is that besides her cheating she was making fun of me with the other girl, both of them making remarks that looking like a bimbo would only get me so far which is funny considering she constantly talks to me about how she loves my over-the-top femininity. I was honestly ready to explode right there but instead I took screenshots of their flirtatious text messages and sent them to myself, both of them are part of an internship that at least from my girlfriend's side she's been working years to get into, in hopes of getting offered a full contract when her schooling is done, as most internships or even jobs are, relationships are strictly prohibited amongst co-workers and results in termination, so the head of the program will be getting a very exciting email very soon. I also know her schedule like the back of my hand so my friends and me are going to take back all the stuff I bought for her and leave a box of the few things she bought me with a print of the messages taped on top, maybe not the coldest revenge in the world but I hope she has fun sleeping in a bed with no sheets or a duvet, also, have fun scrambling to buy the very expensive textbooks I bought for you right before finals begin. Friends with benefits brought me a care package, I've had a casual relationship with a man for the last few years, we both work crazy schedules, travel a lot for work and live on opposite sides of town, so we get together once a month or so and have some fun and enjoy a few likings, it's fun, it's easy and it's never been more than lovemaking. He was meant to come round this morning, but instead I text him from the bathroom floor around 4.30 in the morning saying we have to rain check as I've been up all night sick and had a splitting headache, he replied later saying he was sorry to hear it, asked if I needed anything, I assumed it was just one of those polite kind of things you say, didn't expect anything, so made a joke about needing a new body. He then offered to bring me soup, the thing is, this man is a top chef, he literally has a Michelin star, so it wasn't, I'll grab some from the supermarket or deli, he made chicken noodle soup as well as lentil soup from scratch, then drove an hour across town just to drop it on my doorstep, didn't come in so he wouldn't catch anything, he also brought multigrain sourdough bread, fresh orange juice, chamomile tea and a green tea with vitamin C booster in it. I was expecting a single pot of soup, not a whole care package, it honestly made me cry, it's also the best soup I've ever had in my life. My mom took my cheating ex-girlfriend's side over mine and I can never forgive her. I was raised by single mom, my dad passed two years after I was born, 
I focused on my career for the most part of my life and my mom supported me doing that. But when I was 20 I met my ex-girlfriend and we got together. We were colleagues first but she told me she'd work in a different sector soon. In her new workplace she met a new guy who she fell in love with while being in a relationship with me. I only found out because she admitted to making love with him to me after she went out for girls night with her friends. I immediately broke up with her and threw her out. A few hours of me trying to process what happened my mom called me and shouted at me that she hasn't raised me like this. I was confused and asked what she meant and she said that my ex-girlfriend accused me of cheating on her and that she found proof of that on my phone. I couldn't believe what I just heard. I tried to talk to my mother telling her that the exact opposite is true and that she has cheated on me but she didn't believe me. Part of the reason is probably because she and my mom truly loved each other. I never had a problem with that. Till then I liked how they got along with each other. My mother called me a liar and she said she'd disinherit me from her will as she's not having a cheater as a son. She said she never wants to see me again. Then later my grandparents called me to tell me how disappointed they are of me and that I deserve every bad thing that is to come. You know what the worst thing was? I found out that my cheating ex-girlfriend continued to meet with my mom after everything she did. All of this was so painful for me, the only person that sided with me was my best friend who was furious with her, I talked to him and he hugged me and I cried in his arms, I know many people would think that's unusual for two guys, but his support really helped me getting through this, one year later when I already was over it my doorbell rang and when I opened I saw my mom with teary eyes and I began to feel how my emotions are coming up and I slammed the door and started crying asking her what the f she wants here. She said she wanted to talk to me and that she was so sorry. After she begged for 15 minutes straight I gave in and opened the door. She said my ex admitted that she cheated when she was drunk. She apologized profusely and said that she knows that she failed as a mother not believing her own child. I told her that I accept her apology but I don't want to see her now and that I probably can never forgive her, even though she begged me to forgive her. Over the last few months she started calling me daily just to hear my voice as she said. She said she missed me then apologized again and asked if I could just come over. Her voice always sounded kinda painful and she always says how much she loves me and that even she could understand that I hate her she cannot live with this thought on her head. I don't even hate her, I still love her, she is still my mom but the trust is broken. I can never trust her again because what if I got into a relationship again, who says that she wouldn't just believe their word over mine again, I appreciate her efforts but I just cannot forgive her or even see her now, and I hope she understands that I need time. Today I messed up letting out gas when I thought I was alone. I, 33 female, have a new boyfriend, 40 male, I am head over heels about, he is smart and handsome and kind and so attractive, we have been going out for a couple of months and I am completely enamored, we decided to go away for a weekend to New York City and he surprised me at the hotel with the most decadent, buttery pastries and I couldn't stop myself. I ate them despite knowing my stomach wouldn't be happy after, and it wasn't, it was rumbling and cramping, but I held the gas in like a trooper, there was no way this Romeo was gonna see that side of me. So I went to to take a shower, I made sure the water was coming down nice and loud, my dream man was in the other room, door was closed, coast was clear, it was good, I would just let a few controlled toots out so there was no way he could hear it, alas, as the little trumpet let out its first notes, I felt the arms of this beautiful man wrap themselves around me from behind, he wanted to surprise and join his attractive new girlfriend in the shower, the poor man was hoping for a soapy hot babe but instead was met with wet naked farts, which are the worst kind he couldn't stop laughing, oh well. My husband doesn't know I'm playing the long game to leave him. We have been together for almost a decade, married for half of that, we have a kid, I have finally had enough of the lack of love, care, empathy, and compassion from him, he has told I am to blame for his lack of compassion and empathy, he has stated I bring up too many issues and they are nothing but immature idiocracies, therefore, he has had but no choice to stop having compassion and care for me when I behave this way. The list is endless of the abusive, neglectful, hurtful things he has done, some, yes, smaller than others, however, many small things form one big pile, the reason these items would get so dramatic is due to the fact I would not be listened to, empathized with, or understood, he would neglect the things I'd ask of him, if it wasn't neglecting chores, it was paying sex workers online and when I would go out of state. His lies are exhausting, he will continuously get caught in lies and get angry at me for asking him to explain, apologize, or be humane and respectful. I am unable to confront him about extremely hurtful behavior or even mildly hurtful behavior such as a small mocking joke that I did not find amusing, at each opportunity for growth and connection, he snaps, breaking trust, bonds, and love. He has recently started to admit he has yet to feel guilt or remorse for anything he has done to hurt me, in his opinion, I should not be hurt, upset or shocked by his behavior, they're just love-making workers, it's only a hole in the door, don't act like a, insert whatever name he decides to call me, then. Yet not a single, genuine apology, if I try to discuss these things with him he explodes again, yelling at me about how he said he wasn't sorry and will not have a conversation about it, no matter how badly I want it, the world doesn't revolve around me and I should get over myself, I'm the issue for not ignoring the problems, he, and his refusal to be a loving, healthy husband and individual, has no faults. I'm beat down and tired, he has taken an amazing partner for granted and ruined me, I would go to the ends of the earth for him but he will not even love me, I'm tired of fighting, I'm tired of being the sole partner in this marriage willing to grow, change, and evolve, the sole partner to show up, show love, show empathy, try and solve the problems, he even refuses to tell me what I do wrong when I do wrong, I ask and he tells me I do nothing, 
I apologize and he tells me he does not want my apology or that I have nothing to apologize for, all while treating me as if I slept with his best friend. But I cannot yet get out on my own two feet with our child, I do not have the funds, the support, the home, I need to play the long game and prepare for mine and my child's future away from someone who tells me to go ahead and kill myself when I state the way he treats me make me feel worthless and like I want to just die, I need stable income and a stable home. Outside of my marriage, I am either discarded for addressing issues with family or the crutch to lean on, I do not have support, I am exhausted, I cannot leave yet, I will play nice, play loving, play the perfect spouse and ask the bare minimum of him, he will be happy with that, he will think everything is okay, but as is tradition in these marriages, a man never sees it coming when his partner begs and begs and begs for years to be valued and nurtured and loved. I will be lonely and sad, I will not cheat, I will be the same good person I always have been, just without the expectation of a connected, healthy, happy marriage, he can live disconnected and content, and I will play the part. In three years, I should have my feet under me again, things have been in motion for this for a long time, before I realized this is the end, what I thought was movement towards growth for our little family, is actually movement towards me and my child being free of this toxic environment, it's sad and heartbreaking, I'm crying typing this, I never wanted it to come to this but he will not, incapable of or by stubborn choice, love me the way I deserve, and will not treat me with the respect any human deserves. I want a man who will cherish me and treat me like I hung the moon, and not just for the first four years. Someone whose heart breaks when they see they've hurt me, someone who can't stand to lose me and will be everything in them to be loving, loyal, and empathetic, someone who wants to communicate and be willing to compromise and resolve issues for longer than three months at a time. I want to be valued and cherished and loved, I'm not in this marriage. If any man sees this and wonders if this is about them, it's probably not, but it might be, so you have three years to get it together and love and value your spouse, you never know who you are, and if you do not want to be in this situation change, make huge, big, permanent changes, love your spouse, value them, go to therapy alone and with them, learn how to be healthy and kind, don't lose someone you love because you refuse to change, don't lose someone you love because you've damaged them to no return and refuse to address these issue or love them enough to put them above your desire to be petty and toxic, love your spouse, treat them right, so then maybe they won't leave you. My mom weaponized my autism today and I've never been more humiliated. My mom and I were on a flight today and because she was on standby, she works at the airport and gets free flights, we weren't able to get seated together. Her solution, tell staff that I was autistic and can't be seated by an emergency exit to get them to seat us together, they said to ask another passenger to switch, granted, on top of my autism I have OCD and social anxiety and she's my caretaker so I'd prefer if we stay together but it was embarrassing, my support needs aren't that high. She asked a guy if he was willing to give up his seat and switch with me, and he did, thank goodness but the energy changed when she mentioned my autism, he called me, bud, when giving me the okay to take his seat, the flight attendant who witnessed the switch gave me a pin at the end of the flight, I mean I like getting pins but I felt like I was being treated like a child, negative 1000 out of 10 experience, never going in public ever again. My fiancé was concerned with my bowel movements, my fiancé sat me down the other night, we have been together 3 years, living for 2 together, he asked if I pooped at work. I laughed because I didn't think he was being serious but he told me he was. I said yes and he asked how many times. I told him I don't know, sometimes once, maybe none. He said he's concerned because I don't poop at our house and that it's not healthy. He wanted me to see a doctor. I told him I poop at home all the time, sometimes with him in the next room. He said, and I quote, you're lying because I'll go in right after you and it doesn't smell and there isn't even a skid mark. I'm losing it at this point, trying to stop myself laughing. I reminded him I haven't had a gallbladder since I was 14. I told him I was so self-conscious pooping at school I learned tricks to not make it as bad, I would put down toilet paper to help reduce the chance of a skid mark and even spray perfume, now I just use poopery. That night I didn't do anything to cover up the smell and he said he was sorry he just got concerned, but it was still sweet and no doubt uncomfortable for him to being it up, today I got a text from him, the skid mark trick works, love you. Today I messed up by telling my best friend I have feelings for her, I've, 20 male, been friends with this girl, 21 female for about a year and a half now and we've grown really close, initially we actually met because I asked her out but it developed into a platonic relationship, she very much saw me as a brother figure and wanted to keep it that way, she was under the impression I had gotten over my feelings for her and I told her I did, in reality those feelings still existed and I was just repressing them because I wanted to be a good friend, I knew if she found out again things would be over because she explicitly told me how much she values having a friend who isn't interested in her romantically, I tried for so long to keep it that way but it made it impossible for me to move on. Whenever I tried to think about dating other people my feelings for her just made it impossible, I knew there was never a chance of us getting together and to be frank we would never be a good match, we're very different people who expect different things from a relationship right now, the guilt kept eating away at me for feeling this way, I truly didn't want to, I felt dishonest and ashamed because I felt like one of those guys who is only friends with a girl in hopes of dating her, was I like that? Not sure, but I never really had hope that we'd get together, I felt like I had to do this in order to give myself closure and move on with my life, it seems like that has come at the sacrifice of our friendship and she doesn't want to continue it anymore.
I feel absolutely terrible to the point that I actually have thrown up from nerves, she was the closest person in my life and I pretty much just ruined it out of the blue for my own sake, I think it would have been more admirable for me to keep it to myself and continue the friendship and learn to move on without sacrificing it. I just realized what he does every morning, my partner has to wake up around 4 in the morning for work, he has two alarms, one is at 4.30, the other is 4.35, I questioned why he had them so close together, and he said, A, it just helps me, this morning I pieced together what he's been doing every morning since he started this job two months ago. The first alarm is solely his warning signal, and he uses it to get five minutes of hugging me every morning, every, morning, this poor guy is tired as f every day, but he makes sure that every morning before work he cuddles me for at least five minutes, some days I don't get woken up by him, and it's sweet to think that no matter what he makes the time to be affectionate to me before he leaves, I adore him. My partner is weird. When her alarm goes off in the morning she literally wakes up instantly, shuts it off during the first buzz, then immediately sits up and gets out of bed, it's all one fluid movement and makes me think of a vampire rising from their coffin when I see her do it, and she's not rushing or anything, like this isn't an attempt to be quiet or hurry to shut off the alarm, she's not running late, she just does it, no hesitation, no yawn, no stretch, no sad sigh as you stare at the ceiling contemplating quitting your job and starting a new life, nothing. And it's not like she loves her job or gets up out of excitement, she hates waking up early, yet she still does this, it's so weird. Obviously I don't really care about this little quirk, I actually find it funny and endearing, but it's fascinating to see, I've asked her why she does this and she just shrugs and says she always has. I destroyed my marriage three weeks before it even started at my bachelor's party. My wedding day is March 10th, I'm getting married to the most amazing woman in the world and I've ruined it in one weekend, my bachelor party was this past weekend and me and my friends decided to go to Nashville for the weekend, we just partied, a lot of drinking and a lot of fun, when we got to the gentleman's club, I was already blasted. I was going along with everything. Eventually we went into the private room and the dancers started offering, extra services, I was so drunk I made the dumbest decision I've ever made, she offered me top for 40 bucks and I accepted, then she offered me lovemaking for another 100, and I accepted that too. I did the dancer and didn't even have a moment of clarity until the next day when I realized when I had sobered up, I feel awful and disgusted in myself, the only thing saving me is that we all are in relationships and we all did things so no one is going to snitch, I just wish so badly I could take this one mistake back, I don't know what I'm gonna do. My boyfriend is getting too comfortable, me and my boyfriend have been together for almost 3 years, and living together for almost 2, I'm at university and work as a manager, and he has a full-time job at around 30 to 40 hours a week, at the start it was your stereotypical happy and progressive relationship, he'd give me flowers, make me coffee in the mornings, I'd cook his favorite meals if he had a bad day, and we would go on dates, our friends used us as a template for the perfect relationship since we knew how to communicate and anything that almost became a fight was resolved within the day, we were both on the exact same wavelength with everything. In the past year, it's become really difficult to have good communication, I've kept doing what we've always done and brought up anything bothering me and how we can resolve it, but he started making empty promises, for example, my university semester started and I got a promotion at work, so I asked him if we could shuffle the house chores a bit since I was doing way more hours, he said yeah of course and did the normal hug and kiss, but nothing changed, if I bring it up again, he just brushes it off as yeah I'll do it later but he doesn't. I thought he might have been struggling with something that he didn't want to tell me about, so I gave him more leeway and just asked for a little bit of help here and there, so I would make dinner and just ask that he unloads the dishwasher afterwards, but he would do the same thing, agree but pretend I hadn't asked. The final straw for me was a couple days ago, we were getting a bunch of furniture moved to our house and my parents were helping us at 10am, I told my BF this and he said that's completely fine, but he's already agreed to go clubbing with our friends. I said that's fine as long as he helps me clear out the living room for the new furniture before he leaves, he says that his friends want to have a house party until 6, and I say we can't be out that late but we can stay out until 3, he says that's fine. I hadn't been on a night out in ages, so they invited me along, I had just got a new dress and I was really excited to go out. I got my dress and makeup ready and told my BF that we had to start moving furniture now if it was gonna be ready in the morning, he said sure, give him a minute to finish a fight in his video game, I started moving things and not gonna lie, really struggled with the heavy stuff, so I reminded him to help me move things, he tells me to wait, two hours go by with me struggling to lift couches and he jumps into the room, dressed up and ready to leave, he quickly tells me that he's ordered a taxi and is leaving soon, I ask what about moving the furniture, he just shrugs, I say that I can't go on a night out without moving this stuff first, he just brushes it off, I remind him to at least be back by 4am so that he won't be super hungover while helping in the morning, long story short, I had to stay home and move the furniture so we would have room in the morning, he still went out without me. I was done by about 1 a.m., and woke up at about 7 and he still wasn't home, he answered and told me he was at the house party, but he'll be home soon, he got home exactly 10 minutes before my parents arrived, in short, he promised he would be home by 3 but came home at 10 a.m., made me stay home alone to sort the furniture, and when the furniture was finally in the house he refused to help me move any of it again. This happens constantly, if he promises to make dinner, I end up making myself a sandwich at midnight because he didn't do it, if he promises to wash our clothes, he only washes clothes that he is going to wear the next day, he promises to buy me flowers again, 
but it's been almost a year since he has. I brought this up to him yesterday night, saying that I didn't feel loved, and felt you since I do everything, he again had the conversation saying he knows he's made mistakes, and he'll do anything to help me feel loved, I ask one thing, help me in the morning with chores, he promised, guess what happened, I of course ended up doing all of them myself. I'm getting so fed up of mothering him and forgiving him continuously, and this is the first time in three years I've actually thought about leaving, I know that I won't because I really do love him and his family, but nothing I do can get through to him. My boyfriend is getting too comfortable, update two months later. A lot has happened since this post, I took the words and advice of the comments and gave him an ultimatum, he needs to fix the problems in the original post or I'd leave, I sat him down and explained that he's treating me like his mother, not his partner, so I'd set up a bed in my office and sleep in a different room until he proved he didn't need me to take care of him at a whim. He was super shocked that I'd hit him with this out of nowhere, ignoring that I've been asking for help for months. I had to drag one of the spare beds up the stairs and set up the room, all while he was sitting refusing to help me, fine, nothing I'm not used to, I realized once the office was set up how happy it made me to have my own space without needing to fix all of his problems, and he did not take that happiness well, I noticed him getting snarky and aggressive whenever he saw how much I was enjoying my holiday from catering to him, and just overall being weird but still not really doing his own stuff, he'd just leave mugs and plates to get moldy in his room, or leave stuff everywhere in the living room. I noticed that he started to nitpick everything I did, and it seemed like he was trying to find something, anything to make me feel bad about to make his faults less bad, I guess, he complained about my friend group on Discord because he didn't like that I had friends that weren't through him, even though I invited him to come on with us, introduced him, and he had a good time, he also complained that I wasn't giving him enough attention or helping enough, yeah, welcome to my hellhole, but everything he tried to fault me for was quickly shot down, of course I'm friends with them, they haven't done anything wrong and I've invited you to join all the time and, of course I'm not helping you, that's the point. Shite hit the fan after only two days of me staying in the office, my discord group had decided to get drunk and play cards against humanity and I told my partner this, he just said okay and so I went upstairs, once I was already pretty tipsy, I got a message asking me to come downstairs, I told my discord to pause the game and give me 5 minutes, when I went downstairs, he looked at me with the scariest face and said, do you want to tell me anything huh, holding my old phone, in our entire relationship I have never done anything to be disloyal or anything, so I had no clue what he meant, I asked, still giggling from the drink, tell you what, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said that he knew and I should admit it to him now because he had evidence, I still had no clue so I told him this, still stumbling a bit, and asked to see the evidence, he proceeds to go through my old phone's photos until he reaches over 4 years ago, well before we were dating by the way, and shows me a picture of the person who essayed me, not a naughty picture or anything, literally a selfie, he showed me this smugly and proceeded to tell me that I cheated on him, with the guy who essayed me, before we were even together. Ladies and gentlemen, they say it's impossible to fall out of love instantly, but that's been proven false, I gave him one last chance to take it back and asked, are you jealous of him, and he confirmed that yes, he wished he had done it first, in his defense, I genuinely think he worded this badly and didn't mean he wished he had it essayed me, but holy heck my drunk brain did not like that one. I don't even remember what I properly said, but I broke up with him on the spot, I explained I'm staying in the office until I find a flat, and he is not to talk to me at all, he realized that him trying to guilt me backfired and he started crying, I just went upstairs, put my headset on and said, guess who's single? Long story short, my discord collectively decided to keep me on a video call constantly bc they had a bad feeling about me still living in the same house, and god were they right, he left to stay with his mum, who's down the road, but decided to try to kick the door down at midnight, why, everyone in the discord was flirting with me, mostly jokes, and this dude took my old phone and logged into everything to find more stuff to guilt me on. I had to phone my parents to pick me up because he had gotten in and was throwing shit around, accusing me of cheating again, I'm now staying with my parents until I find a flat, and I'm lucky to have my discord friends because if they hadn't witnessed his freak out on camera, I don't think anyone would have believed me, love you guys. My crush invited me to sit by her at lunch, but I'm going to sit by my friend. My friend had a brain tumor and it was removed, because of this, he's different from everyone else, he can't understand when people are upset or mad well as well as other things, but it's so obvious other kids don't like him he can even pick up on it, but he just doesn't know why. He began to sit by me, and while he gets on my nerves sometimes, he doesn't do it intentionally, I've never had anyone want to sit by me, I've always been the scary kid, and I've been mean to him, I've been rude, but he's never held that against me, he's always nice and says hi and asks how I am, even if all I can give him is a grunt in response. My crush invited me to sit by her, and I was honored, but she said she doesn't want my friend to sit by her, I don't want him to sit alone, I know what that feels like, it's so lonely sitting like that so I'm going to decline her and sit with my friend instead. My sister's stupidity destroyed my family. My sister let her boyfriend drive my parents' car, she took it when they were out, she only had a learner's permit so she was supposed to have a licensed adult with her, she let her boyfriend who was a year too young to have a learner's permit drive and he crashed, he passed away, my sister was seriously injured, they think one or both of her feet were on the dashboard, she is paralyzed from the chin down, 
my parents' insurance isn't covering them since my sister took the car illegally and her boyfriend's family are suing my parents. My parents tried to sue them back since he was driving but it got thrown out when they tried. We had to move to an apartment because my parents couldn't afford our house. I see them cry every day. I heard my mom say that going bankrupt doesn't get rid the lawsuit debt and their lawyers told them to try to settle before it goes to court because they will probably lose. My sister has to be in a home forever because she needs help and care 24-7 365 a year. She remembers everything and her brain is not affected at all. Her medical and nursing home bills are so much money. My grandparents are all trying to help but they are all in retirement homes and don't have much. I've seen them cry too. I know she is getting punished already because she's paralyzed almost completely but I still can't even look at her because she destroyed our entire family. Kicked out my girlfriend because she threw out my stuffed bear that my grandmother gifted me when I was young. I, male 23, have old Teddy that I got from my grandmother when I was young. She has since passed away and this is the only item that I have from her. Teddy sits on a cabinet that is next to the bed so he is always looking down on us. It's symbolic for me as it makes me feel like my gran is always looking out for me. My girlfriend has always teased me about Teddy but I never minded. I understand how it's not usual for a grown adult to keep stuffed animals in their room. I came back and found Teddy missing. I looked everywhere but I knew that he wouldn't have moved on his own. When I asked my girlfriend she said that she threw him out while she was cleaning up because I am too old to own toys. She also found it weird that he was just always there looking at us while we slept. I admit that I probably overreacted but I told her to leave and not come back unless she had Teddy with her. She went to her mom's and has not come back so Teddy is gone for good. My boyfriend of one year left me because I have periods. Exactly what the title says, it's been few weeks and I'm still so baffled and hurt, I don't know what to think, we had a future plan together, we're in the process of renting a place together too, he always seemed to be grossed out by women hygiene commercials, tampons, anything that had to do with periods and women's health after all. I didn't think much of it since he had been nothing but caring and loving and found it funny sometimes, called him childish and I'd laugh about it, he would either change the topic or just said that it wasn't that funny. We've been staying in each other's houses a lot and never made love since this one time we got all touchy, then I stopped him when we were getting to it, he backed off and asked if everything's okay and if I'm uncomfortable, I said no it's just I'm on my period, dead silence, he asked me, for how long, and I was like, what do you mean, he then backed away farther from me and sat silent sometimes looking at his phone, I got sad and confused so I laid down next to him hoping for some cuddles trying not to make it more awkward by saying something so I was keeping silent, nothing. Then he spoke, he said I should do something about it and it completely ruined the mood for him, he told me he heard Therese pills that make periods go away and, everyone uses them why can't you, I told him that it's not true, and that the pills have major side effects which I don't want to take because my periods aren't at all heavy and I rarely get cramps, after hearing about them being heavy he became completely disgusted, he told me he didn't want anything to do with it and to fix my, problems. I wasn't even angry I was just hurt and shocked, it was my boyfriend, my beloved saying stuff like that to me. I fell asleep crying and hurt that night, it sounded so stupid yet so embarrassing and hurtful, after three days of absolutely no feelings just a hug saying goodbye to him in the morning he was supposed to leave, he sent a text saying he has been thinking about me, he told me he does so much for us why can't I fix my periods so it doesn't have to be such a problem, I told him he was making it a problem, and that he should be real and not childish, he completely disagreed and called me selfish, the next morning he dumped me over a text, it's almost as if the love wasn't there, I've been crying a lot, having panic attacks, I was so so sure he was the one, this sounds so dumb, I can't believe it. So yeah, I don't want advice, I'm over him, I just wanted to rant on how some people are completely ignorant. My dad is furious that my mom slept with other people in an open marriage he wanted. My parents got married when they were super young, my dad knocked up my mom, and their parents married them off, my grandfather was able to set up some business for my dad in a big city, and they moved here soon after my birth. My mom grew up in a conservative southern town where she was taught to be a submissive wife, and even after moving to the big city, she didn't spend much time socializing, she had no friends and never went out, my dad was only there to provide for us, he was always away on business, and he wasn't there as a husband for my mom or as a father to me. My dad made a lot of money, so we never lacked anything, growing up, I became my mom's best friend, we would talk about everything, I pushed her to make friends and to find hobbies, after years of pushing, she started going to a nearby park and made her first friend, a gym trainer, encouraged by her friend and me, she decided to join the gym, she met a few more people there and started having some semblance of a social life, but she still continued to tell me everything. I think my dad's new secretary gave him the idea, but he asked my mom for an open marriage almost a year ago, he told her he wasn't happy in their marriage and that she wasn't providing him with everything he wanted, my mom, who was a Christian wife, was mortified and told me about the proposal in tears, I suggested she get a divorce, but she said she didn't believe in it and she wouldn't be the one to end their marriage. As my dad pushed, I knew exactly where this would end up if my mom agreed, her friend and I convinced her, my mom was hesitant at first, but she agreed with the condition that they would be completely transparent with each other. My dad was a middle-aged, 41 man with a belly and my mom, 39, was an athletic woman who worked out regularly, I'm a 22-year-old woman by the way, I don't know how my dad was so blind or what he thought would happen, I helped create online dating profiles for my mom almost 6 months ago, 
After getting an insane number of matches, choosing from them and chatting with them for months, my mom started hooking up with a few people, getting all this attention has provided a massive boost to her confidence and she seems better. My dad hooked up with his secretary almost immediately, he's had very little luck with other ladies, with their transparency thing, my mom tells him about all her hookups, a few weeks ago, my dad screamed at my mom for some minor thing, usually, my mom would have apologized but with her new confidence, she didn't back down. It's been constant fights the last few weeks, my dad keeps starting fights by making snide remarks about my mom's clothing or appearance, he almost even called my mom a but stopped himself, I think open marriage finally sunk in, my mom told me he tried to have a conversation about stopping their open marriage but she immediately shot it down, I think they'll split up. My dad was never there for either of us but the thought of my parents splitting up still feels weird, I don't feel bad for my dad but I wish he put effort into his family, I'm happy for my mom though.